Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 81 The wide open area had now become the crimson arena of death from the red walls, dozens and hundreds of glistening, razor-sharp tentacles exploded out. Kim Sae Jean wielded mana and covered his entire body with it, and then changed its nature to that of ultra-high temperature white flames. The numerous tentacles that tried to viciously attack the orc could not penetrate past the protective flames and all melted away well before even touching his scales. SFX for the orc's roar. From inside, the orc's brutal nature boiled over. Sae Jean charged towards the doll with a loud roar. It was the rush of a brightly burning flame that violently shook the cave and stirred the air inside it. However, even against such a terror-inducing onslaught, the doll didn't flinch from fear. It only stood there, reciting the chant and getting ready for the next magic spell. Tukwang. Arriving right in front of the doll, the orc slammed down with his mace. Accompanied by a stupendously loud explosion, the murky fog rose up and obscured the surroundings. The orc did not let up his assault on the doll even while trapped within this black dust cloud. Using the mace, he shattered the doll's barrier and then with his bare fist, fed the doll's head some knuckle sandwich. Kayak, kek. The doll let out weird noises whenever the fists connected with it. The orc continued to one-sidedly clobber the doll, but then suddenly, strange qigong began to gather up on its chest area. TL, WTF. Qigong. Really? What happened to mana? Color me confused. In that very moment, the orc's intuition rang chilling alarm bells. But even before he could take a step back, the gathered qigong became an ultra-sharp point of light and pierced his chest. Kyuk. The pain was indescribable. However, that pain instead served to awaken the orc's reckless instincts. His vision became dyed in red, and the muscles on his entire body quaked in pure rage. Condition complete, receive a near-death fatal wound 13. To become the orc chieftain. An alert window popped up, but it simply could not enter Sae Jean's cognition right now. SFX for a seriously loud orc's roar. Blinded by the heaven-shaking rage, the orc used up every single potion stored inside via spiritualization. His wounds healed up in an instant, and his vitality soared to crazy new heights. What are you doing, Captain? Keep on running. E. Hyrin pulled the hesitant Kim Yurin away. Without resistance, she got pulled along by Hyrin. It was because of the effect of skills imbued within the orc's voice. Even as the knights continued to run forward, they could clearly hear the evidence of a fierce battle taking place behind their backs the sounds of mace destroying something. The dull sounds of heavy fighting but most of all, the orc's roar that shook the ground. Whenever she heard those sounds, Kim Yurin repeatedly looked back while carrying a mixed expression. E. Hyrin had never seen such a longing gaze from Yurin before in the past ten years they'd known each other. Isn't this getting way too serious? Yurin's peculiar reactions made E. Hyrin frown deeply. Even if Yurin was unfamiliar with the matters of men, but still, just why would she and an orc, of all things? Kwahung. Right then, a white light bloomed up from behind and brightened the interior of the cave Kim Yurin's feet stopped moving all on their own, but at the same time, the orc's voice deeply embedded in her mind rang out again. Keep running that way. And so, she continued to run forward. After thirty minutes of running, the knights could finally locate the exit of this GN isolation barrier that made them wander around for the past forty hours or so. As they escaped from the exit while shouting out in joy, they were greeted by the dense, green forest, with the sunlight broken up by the leaves on tall trees shining on them. They heard the refreshing chirping of the birds. For the knights who were trapped in that dank and gloomy cave for the past forty hours, it was the most welcoming and refreshing noise there could be. By the way, where are we, exactly? But even that joy was short-lived. One of the knights came back to reality quickly, and asked out. Ah! Is anyone here still able to communicate with outside? Although the leader of this group was originally Kim Yurin, as she was doing nothing but staring at the exit while waiting for someone, E. Hyrin chose to take the lead. Please wait a moment. A knight began to rummage through his pocket to produce a crystal ball and a GPS. 
The GPS didn't work inside the cave, but now it was working just fine. Our location. However, this knight didn't reply and simply gazed at the coordinates shown on the GPS dumbfoundedly. What is it? Hey, I said, where are we? E. Hyrin. The knight only managed to swallow down his saliva only after hearing E. Hyrin's frustrated shout. We need to get out of here as soon as possible. This place is the deepest part of the monster field. We're over 50 kilometers away from the first defensive line. In an instant, all the knight's faces crumpled. E. Hyrin let out a long sigh and then grabbed the wrist of Kim Yurin who was still gazing at the cave's exit. Let's get out of here. It's dangerous here, Captain. You're right. Everyone, let's hurry and leave this area. It seemed that, even though she was in a dazed state, Kim Yurin still managed to hear what the knight with the GPS had said, as she resolutely gave out an order. Although there was very little strength behind her voice to call it an order, but still. And so, the knights ran with haste to leave the monster field. As they were still situated very deeply within the field, many powerful upper mid-tier monsters showed up, but well, threats of those levels were easily dealt with by Kim Yurin's attacks. And her attacks were unusually vicious for some reason. Are you angry? E. Hyrin cautiously asked her after a clueless manticore decided to attack the group and promptly got turned into scraps of meat. No. Not at all. Just continue running. There's no time to waste. Kim Yurin spat out before starting her running again. Hyrin dazedly watched her back getting gradually smaller before hurriedly following after her. Panting. Panting. Inside the cave where the evidence of fierce battle still remained fresh, Kim Sae Jin was breathing heavily. After three hours of intense melee combat and by utilizing every single one of skills beneficial to him in this situation, he finally succeeded in disabling the doll's operations. But his sacrifices weren't small. He just couldn't figure out what the hell was up with this damnable doll's durability if it weren't for all those potions, he'd have collapsed first from losing way too much blood. Hugh. He shoved his hand into the chest of the destroyed doll rolling around on the cave's floor. Then he grabbed and pulled out the still-beating artificial heart that felt cold to the touch. From the pierced chest of the doll, blood shot out like a fountain. S.A.E. Jean took a probing look at this thing. Even after being separated from the body, it was still somehow continuously beating steadily. Artificial Heart Item Rating, Treasure Rank an artificial heart created by taking a human heart and combining it with several hundred mana stones of monsters. It'll increase the flow of mana in one's blood vessels simply by holding it. Currently, there are a total of 2,330 magic spells stored within this heart. With enough mana, it's possible to use the heart as a medium when using magic and it'll be possible to store new type of magic spells. Hmm. Now that he had looked at it, there seemed to be a variety of uses for this thing. As it was made out of hundreds of monster mana stones, absorbing it would cause unprecedented growth in his stats, or he could use spiritualization and store it inside his body which would allow him to use magic. For now, he stored the heart inside him using spiritualization, and began moving towards the exit, as well. Around the same time. By fully abusing mana movement technique, knights were able to escape from the monster field in less than an hour. The final defensive perimeter came into view in the distance. There were black smokes rising as well as the moanings of the wounded everywhere, but the defense operation had already been concluded successfully. Ah. Uh, there are knights approaching us over there. Someone shouted out loudly while pointing towards the knights trudging out from the mountainside. Right away, thousands and tens of thousands of eyes focused there. Wow, wowie. We can finally go home. While checking out Kim Yurin's mood, E. Hyrin stretched her limbs out grandly. Unfortunately, Yurin's gloomy expression showed no signs of abating any time soon. Ah. That's Order Master Hyun Suk. Just in time, Kim Hyun Suk's face could be seen in the distance. Thinking this was a good chance, E. Hyrin quickly shouted out. Only then did Yurin's stiff expression change slightly. He must have been really worried, what are you doing? You should hurry. Eh. Uh. H, hey, wait. Hyrin didn't miss this chance and forcibly pushed Yurin's back. 
Although surprised, she still managed to quickly walk towards Kim Hyun Suk. You've safely returned. Kim Hyun Suk smiled softly while looking at her. Yes, sir. All 37 missing knights, reporting their safe return. Well done. Kim Hyun Suk was worse than a worst miser and it came to praising his own daughter, but it was different this time. He didn't lose the smile even for a second as he proudly patted her shoulders. Thank you. You worked hard. He only spoke two things. But Kim Yurin was extremely moved by the meaning behind those words. Her moist eyes, wet from the emotions repressed within her, clearly demonstrated her current feelings. Let us go home. Kim Hyun Suk. Kim Yurin carefully wiped the corners of her eyes and resolutely nodded her head. Yes, sir. Even after finishing up a press conference, Kim Yurin had to endure the harassment of hundreds of reporters on her way back home. The questions that didn't deserve an answer were repeatedly asked, and she also couldn't really figure out what they were on about when asking her about a scandal that developed inside the cave. As expected. She often thought about this, but for her it was far simpler and easier to deal with monsters rather than reporters. Fuwu. But after she had returned to her empty house, a part of her heart became rather lonesome all of a sudden. Maybe it was because the place was not inhabited for the last ten days, her house felt so cold and empty. Feeling lonely for some reason, Yurin turned on the tap for the bathtub and to liven up the quietness of the empty room somehow, she switched on the TV. It is now revealed that the one responsible for aiding the escape of the 37 knights was the hero orc. Ah! The news coming out of the news channel in that moment was talking about the hero orc. And so, Yurin ended up naturally thinking about him again. However, the orc was not here with her. Only that, his dignified scent and the manly voice remained clearly in her memories, making her heart ache deeply. She found herself wondering. Did the orc safely escape the cave alive? Or did he fail to do so and perished in the middle of the battle? I want to see him a guy, uh. Huh. After getting utterly shocked by the words involuntarily leaking out of her, Yurin hurriedly covered up her mouth. According to the testimonies of the knights present, the orc displayed a heroical demeanor by destroying isolation barrier that had trapped the knights inside, as well as providing sustenance to the starving knights. The news broadcast continued on. The memories of yesterday came back to her in full force, when she was still with the orc inside the cave. That warm blanket and the delicious food, the firm thigh as well as his gentle touches. When she remembered up to here, her heart began pounding madly away suddenly. Am I really going crazy? She quickly switched the TV off and held her crimson cheeks. Maybe it was her instinctive hunger rearing its head with vengeance after 28 years of abstinence or something. But to fall for someone who wasn't even a human wasn't that a bit wrong. SFX for water overflowing off the edge of the bathtub. By then, the water began to overflow from the bathtub. Right. Let's just take a bath and cleanse all the weird thoughts out of my head. She took off her clothes and headed straight towards the bathroom. Oh, that's good. Unfortunately for her, even after dipping herself into the suitably warm water, the thoughts of that orc didn't easily dissipate. Surely, he didn't die, right? After all, he was so strong. No, instead, she continued to think about him. The images of orc's martial prowess back then and his dependable back continued to circle around in her mind. Feeling frustrated, she closed her eyes shut and sighed out grandly below the water's surface. Bubbles floated up on the water as a result. One week later. It's not even funny with Yurin Uni's situation anymore. I mean, she's loitering around the hero orc's village every day under the pretext of hunting, you know. Wow. Seriously? At E. Hyrin's words, USAE Young made a surprised face. Mm. Serious. Every day, as soon as she's done with her duties, she goes there. Right next to USA Young, as if his throat was burning up, SAE Jean was gulping down lots of water. USA Young looked at him confusedly for a moment or two, before seizing this opening by grabbing hold of his hand. Appa, it's not to your liking. Hmm. Ah uh, no, it's nothing. Kim SAE Jean shook his head, while inwardly wondering whether he should show his face, to Yurin at least once. 
But what's the relationship between you two? Are you really dating? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin's forehead creased a little as she surveyed the two. No Kim Sae Jean. At his quick reply, Usae Young made an expression of getting really, really hurt by that. Not yet. Kim Sae Jean. As soon as he added a bit more, her expression brightened slightly. But what does that even mean? E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin sharply glared at him with the disbelieving eyes, before giving a serious warning to Usae Young. Miss Sae Young, you gotta be careful now. This is the classic case of leading people on. Yes, I'm aware. That's why, I'm gonna definitely settle this once and for all later on. Oh, please. Stop. You're still too young for that. Kim Sae Jean. As his guilty conscience got poked, Sae Jean flicked the forehead of Usae Young who had made an unnecessary declaration. Ouch. What do you mean, I'm too young? I'm an adult now. Usae Young poured out her complaints. All Sae Jean could do then, was to chuckle and overlook it. Chapter, 82 Deep under the Jungang Mountain, there existed a sanctuary belonging to Nesferatu's. It was beyond our expectations that the entire portal would completely be destroyed but, somehow, our mission is a success, sir. Unnamed Nesferatu Unlike those vampires that had blended into the human society, Nesferatu's had a different end goal. They hadn't publicly announced it yet in order to avoid the gazes of the omniscient and omnipotent lord of all vampires, but the thing was, they did not want to return to their original world. In a way, it was an expected response from them who were treated with deep disdain and contempt by the rest of the vampire species. To them, it was far more preferable to live among the humans and drink animal blood, rather than to suffer a life worse than that of a livestock where one's neck would be in constant risk of being cut off because of a single mistake. Plans are advancing much faster than our expectations. What is the response from the Lord? Sutert. The Lord is yet to awaken from his hibernation, thus he is not aware of anything, sir. So, the leader of the Nesferatus, Sutert, decided to involve humans so they could disrupt the House of Bathory's plans to open up a portal back to their home world. Of course, even he didn't expect the portal to be thoroughly destroyed like this. No, what he thought would happen was that, after the event of the Red Moon had ended, the number of monsters within the monster field would have decreased rather dramatically. And so, the knights would take this opportunity to search for their missing colleagues and then, accidentally stumble onto the portal. In case that didn't happen, then he was planning to let them know anonymously, too. On top of this, unlike the vampire lord's original plan, the Bathories were too impatient. They were thinking of completing everything before the end of the hibernation. That is why they will do everything in their power to make sure none of this blunder will enter the lord's ears. Unnamed Nisferatu Sutert stroked his lengthy beard and harumphed to himself quietly. That's why we need to be wary of the fury of the House of Bathory, not the Vampire Lord. There should not be any evidence of our involvement behind, but that Bathory woman is a simple-minded moron who moves on nothing but a feeling, after all. Unnamed Nisferatu Few seeing such a stupid woman wield so much power, makes me fear just what she might do next. Fine, that's that but, what is the progress on the order I gave you? Sutert. Sir. As you've correctly predicted, the Bathories have handed over the information regarding our sanctuary and its interior layout to the Lekan. However, both the Lekan and the SID have not shown any activity until now. Hume. Sutert fell into a deep thought after listening to the subordinate's report. The Lekan a name he'd never heard before. But in the world of mercenaries, people changing their names or acting in anonymity were as common as the stars in the night sky. And judging by the unfathomable way his actions had been so far, it was a sure thing that he had an incredible wealth of experience in dealing with such matters. A mercenary that possessed abilities to detect the omens of the Red Moon, and to sniff out and murder those hidden vampires not just any, but those incredibly dangerous members of the Bathory family only. If that's the case, there's a chance that the Lekan might have figured out our ultimate goal. At least, he could have determined that we are not a threat for now. Sutert let out a weighty exclamation of admiration while thinking, really, this Lekan is someone who exceeds my expectations. 
So, we only have to focus all of our attention on the vampire lord who should be waking up soon. The lord possessed the authority of life or death over all vampires. Of course, that didn't mean the lord possessed the literal means to control the fates of every vampire, but it wasn't too far off that notion since this being could freely control their vampiric instincts. Yes, sir. Understood. The subordinate bowed his waist in a disciplined manner before melting into the shadows. At the same time, the underground training facility of the monster. Kim Sae Jin was going through his daily martial arts training. Miss Kim Yurin. Ah, yes. What are you doing? That no, it's nothing. Unfortunately, the current state of his tutor was a bit of a mess. Kim Yurin hadn't been paying much attention to their sparring session at all, instead choosing to sniff out Sae Jin's scent as if to seek out the faint smell of the orc from him or some such. Although there were parts that were similar, scents were different in each of his forms so, he was not worried about being discovered, but still, this sort of wasting valuable time for training was proving to be somewhat troublesome for him. I am really sorry but is it okay if we end today's training here? Kim Yurin sounded rather miserable while scratching the back of her head. Her expression right then looked really complicated. For the past two weeks, the time she spent staring into nothing in a daze increased in frequency. Instead of forgetting about what had happened, her yearning only became deeper and deeper. Her worries of whether this feeling she carried around was a crush or not also deepened as well. If it indeed was affection, then she had to immediately severe it away. The reality was not a fairy tale. The beauty and the beast, or more correctly, an orc and a female knight. That would never be realized, and it should never be realized as well. But, just as they said, Belatedly blowing winds are far more terrifying until now, she had never found any man interesting, but she couldn't stop thinking about that orc. No, she couldn't help but to think about him. Whenever she switched on the TV, or when going to her night's order, the conversation regarding the orc continued on, so the memories of back then ended up stimulating her even more. Excuse me, Miss Kim Yurin. Nowadays. And, no, it's definitely not that. She even developed a sixth sense lately, in recognizing what other people wanted to ask her about and then denying it unequivocally. It's just that, I've been mentally and physically fatigued of late. It must be the aftereffects of the red moon I apologize. She couldn't even meet S.A.E. Jean's eyes. He wordlessly stared at her for a moment or two, before nodding his head briefly. I understand. I guess it can't be helped, then. He sheathed the practice sword back into the scabbard while muttering out. Thank you. Kim Yurin too lowered her sword and hurriedly shuffled towards the showers. Sae Jean looked at her back and sighed out, before shouting at her. I will be going ahead. There are matters I need to attend to. Oh, yes. It's fine. He quickly started walking. It was in order to resolve her rather serious lovesickness, even if it was by a little bit. He already knew where she'd go next. If he waited for her there, she'd show up eventually. The still chilly spring winds brushed past the forest's vegetation. Kim Sae Jin the hero orc was busy hiding behind a bush, waiting for a certain someone to show up. SFX for footsteps. After waiting for around 30 minutes, he could hear footsteps. The orc turned his head towards the direction of the sounds. It was, just as he thought, Kim Yurin. This woman, who said she was too tired and had ended the two-hour training session only after thirty minutes, came here to the monster field that would have made her more tired. Euum. Yurin got to the foot of the tall walls of the orc village, started looking around this way and that. And then, after making up her mind, she cautiously gathered mana to her feet. Pang! By using an instant combustion, she soared up into the sky and easily jumped over the wall. Ha! Huh. By eyeing up a good timing, he planned to show his face to her, but now, he had fallen into a bit of panic here. He sure as hell didn't expect her to be that proactive by actually intruding into the sleeping quarters of a man. For now, he exited from the bushes and then, decided to wait for her at a suitable distance from the wall, as she'd coming out of the village soon enough. And so, another twenty minutes flowed by. He sensed the flow of mana beyond the wall and right away, a figure of a person soared up past it. 
Kim Yurin landed softly on the overgrown weeds on the ground. Ha! It seemed like that she had confirmed the absence of the hero orc inside. She spat out a grand sigh containing all her lamentations, before dropping her head low and started walking. SFX for the sound of rustling winds. At the same time, spring winds blew by. Riding on the currents of air, the scent of the nostalgic past deeply imprinted in her heart tickled her nose. Kim Yurin hurriedly raised her head. And that's how she finally got to see the orc she so desperately wanted to meet again. Ah! Her usually large and clear eyes became twice as big as she ceased all movements, like a still from a paused video. She wasn't even breathing out in this moment. The orc ignored her for now and trudged towards the walls. X, excuse me. Figuring that the orc would walk right past her if she didn't do something, Yurin hurriedly grabbed his arm. Ah why, you managed to make it out alive. Her face red like a young girl, both her hands gathered in front of her chest she cautiously began speaking to the orc. Now that she was looking at him, she could clearly feel her heart beating powerfully. They were the heartbeats of emotions that she could barely contain. However, the orc didn't say anything. No, he was simply gazing back at her. Um, can I hear your voice one more time? They said that the person in need was more desperate. The person in need here was obviously Kim Yurin. Although she was very earnest in her plea, her actions only made Sae Jean to cringe inwardly. Without realizing it, the corners of his mouth were twitching. I'm begging you. Ah, uh, I didn't mean anything by that. It's just that, I'd like to convey my thanks for the time back then. Completely unaware of what Sae Jean was thinking, Yurin was very serious with her plea. Although, no one would be able to figure out how conveying her gratitude and him speaking out had anything to do with each other. Go away. That was the first thing the orc said. At his cold words, Kim Yurin's body shuddered briefly. She was already expecting it, but now that she had faced rejection, it still hurt. However, despite her hands shaking like leaves, she managed to pull out an item from her expanding pocket. It was another expanding pocket. This is to show my gratitude. Don't need it. The orc rejected it bluntly and tried to walk past her. He thought that she should give up if it was this much, but then, she was more tenacious than he bargained for. She powerfully grabbed the orc's hand that was as big as her head and forcibly placed it in there. I won't bother you again anymore. You'll find a lot of potions inside. Please, drink or apply them when you're injured. Then, I'll go away now. Her voice was trembling. She lowered her head and turned around to leave, her heart now torn into million pieces after receiving the orc's uncaring attitude. And the appearance of her back weakly walking away looked so pitiful and lonely. The overflowing confidence of the past Kim Yurin was nowhere to be seen. That was why, the orc let out a grand sigh, and then called out to her. Stop. Fortunately, she was a good listener. He slowly approached the stopped woman, and unfastened the wrist protector made out of corundum from his own wrist. Take. At a first glance, it looked way too big, but it had an attribute called auto-adjust, that would adjust its size to suit her. The orc handed the wrist protector over to her. But she didn't take it. Only that, her gaze continued to stare downwards, while biting on her lips. He wondered if she was too deeply hurt. Even though that was his intention to begin with, but now that he was here, he became somewhat dumbfounded. Just why the heck was this 28-year-old almost a spinster acting like a teenage girl having her first crush? Take. Think as reward, for your gifts. He spoke up to here and then lifted her chin so she could look him in the eyes. She appeared so vulnerable right then, with wetness pooling around her eyes, making her quite lovely to behold. The orc's consciousness became hazy in that moment, and the other thoughts nearly took over, but thankfully, the effects of the libido-limiting potion was still working its magic. Take. Just like what she did before, he took her hand and forcibly shoved the wrist protector there. Then, he turned around to leave. Excuse me will we meet again in the future? From his back, the winds carried her meek and hopeful voice over to him. No. Don't come here anymore. But the orc replied in a cold, indifferent manner. Despite that, 
she stood there for a long time chasing after his back with her eyes, while clutching the simple but tough wrist protector tightly. DN it all to hell. A man wearing a robe angrily slammed down on a desk. The furniture made out of marble split into two under that single fist strike. How can our portal collapse suddenly like that? The angry vampire. Lady Bathory hated wasting time. On top of that, a rumor speaking of her growing board of TV began spreading around yesterday as well. In other words, there wasn't much time left before her harsh scolding would begin in earnest. We also are not maybe, the magic spell of the lich, under the influence of the red moon, got mixed up with ours, or it's possible that a third party have gotten in the way. This son of a what happened to the artificial heart? The angry vampire. The artificial heart that literally took bloody tears and sweat to create was truly a treasure crafted by the hands of the vampires. Not only was it valuable all on its own, there was no doubt that it had become a crucial medium in opening up their portal. It was an item they could not afford to lose or let someone rob them of it. We're currently looking for ways of locating it, sir. We suspect that one of the knights who got trapped there might be in possession of it. For now, we are trying to trace the energy coming off from the heart, but. Fool. Apostle Byrne angrily massaged his temples. TL. And to make things even worse, the crystal rolling on the ground was slowly dying in red. It was the sign that Lady Bathory was calling for him. Chapter, 83. Late at night. In order to experiment with the artificial heart, Kim S.A.E. Jean headed to the underground training facility below the society's main building. Guildmaster. However, his heart nearly jumped out of his mouth when he heard a voice that shouldn't have been here in the first place. Quickly shoving the heart inside his pocket, he turned around, trying to look as unflustered as possible. Kyum. Mr. Ju Ji Hyuk. You haven't gone home yet. Oh, yes, somehow. This place has got a good environment so, well, I forgot the passage of time while training and ended up falling asleep for a bit here. Ju Ji Hyuk pointed towards the nap room and embarrassedly scratched the back of his neck. Oh, really? But isn't the dawn also famous for its great training environment as well? True, but that place doesn't even hold a candle to this place. I mean, there are three Athony dolls here in this training facility, each with different effects, after all even if I train here non-stop for 12 hours straight, I feel less fatigued than when I'm training at the Dawn's facility for less than six. S.A.E. Jean nodded his head begrudgingly. Finally, he was able to figure out why all his society members, even including Kim Yurin who wasn't, preferred to use this place instead of their own night orders facilities. And thanks to this story doing the rounds, there is a bit of chaos unfolding on the pages of the Dawn's community chat rooms, what with people wishing to tour this place. Ha ha ha. Ju Ji Hyuk let out a proud laughter. Ah, ha ha so, that's how it is. That's correct. Well then, I should get going right about now. Take care of yourself, Guildmaster. Before he knew it, the society members and the employees changed the way they addressed him, from the society chairman to that of the Guildmaster. That didn't mean that the monster was approved as a guild, though. No, instead, thanks to numerous obstructions, his society got rejected outright after not even being able to enter the upper rankings in the last year's evaluation. But the members and employees continued to call him as the guild master, probably out of a sense of belonging, or even that of the pride of working in this place. Oh yes, well. Take care. In all honesty, S.A.E. Jean liked this new term, too. Will do. Ju Ji Hyuk. After seeing Ju Ji Hyuk away, S.A.E. Jean pulled out the artificial heart from his inner pocket once more. The appearance of the heart the size of his palm still beating intermittently remained quite grotesque, even now. Isn't there something I can do about the look of this thing? Even if there were numerous ways of using this thing, as long as it looked this creepy, using it publicly was out of the question. If I decrease its overall volume, maybe I can cover its shortcoming by turning it into an accessory, like a necklace or a ring. For now, he decided to worry about that later, and poured in his mana into the artificial heart. There was a total of 23 magic spells recorded in this thing and the one he wanted to try out here was. Let's start off with the isolation barrier first. As soon as he murmured out, from the ground beneath his feet, 
a black-colored wave spread out in a circle and dyed the entirety of the training facility in black. Oh! He let out a small exclamation. If he used up mana stones as base ingredients within this space, then he'd be able to bring forth many different effects, just like how it was back then in that cave such as, that bitter coldness, or inability to use mana, etc. Hmm. It's pretty good. When he extracted all the mana from the heart, the barrier disappeared instantaneously. Next up is. It was time to try out an attack spell. Starting off with, that point of light spell the damnable doll used to pierce his heart with. Some said that good things could come out from bad situations. It definitely applied to South Korea's case, as the Red Moon proved to be a fortunate event for them in the end. The reason for the mix-up of monsters was because of the upheaval of the earth during this red moon, countless monsters tried to attack the cities, only to run into the defensive cordon and got themselves promptly killed. That led to the monster field emptying up, which in turn, gave the government the opportunity to properly divide the areas according to the monster ranks once more. All thanks to the red moon, of course. The work dividing the monster field was carried out quickly. The monster tier separation equipment submitted for evaluation by the monster defense-related company called TM, that had appeared quite suddenly, was proven to possess far better performance than already existing machines. So, the government duly awarded the contract to this new company. The previous company responsible to installation and management of the existing infrastructure tried resisting the change by using many dirty tactics. But behind this TM, there was a giant called the Dawn Corporation, so the whole affair was easily solved in the end. The knights found the defeat of the company that continued to exist solely through corruption and solicitation from this incident a wonderful event worth celebrating. And so, after some time from the end of the Red Moon had passed by, the monster field was finally reopened. This is that habitat of the hero orcs. Please be careful not to stimulate the orcs badly. It is possible that consequences will be dire, if some harm is done to the orcs. Hmm. While coming out to visit the hero orc village located at the corner of the mid-tier hunting ground during his hunting, S.A.E. Jean found this signboard out in front. He briefly wondered if the government had done this, but after a cursory inspection, he found a carefully inscribed Raven Order insignia at the back, which gave him some clues as to who put this thing here. She's really devoted, isn't she? S.A.E. Jean slowly shook his head. He did hear that Yurin still came by too, three times a week even now. SFX for an aggressive barking of a dog. It was then. He heard a voracious barking from his back. Not thinking too much about it, he turned around to see what's what. A single monster was glaring at him. A giant bipedal wild dog type creature, its entire body coated in blackish metal, the so-called iron knoll, dot. SFX for yet another aggressive barking of a dog. The knoll continued to spit out its saliva like an exploding waterfall and got ready to attack, but S.A.E. Jean simply took a look at this creature, before releasing mana from his hand. That mana noisily vibrated as it rose up on his palm, before changing into a small but ultra-sharp blue dagger. The proficiency level for the mana body has risen up quite a bit, allowing him to form such small weapons with his mana alone. Although its hardness and density fell below that of high-grade metals, but still, there were uses for such a weapon. What played out next was as exactly as recorded within his instincts. Or, was that his skill, instead? He grasped this dagger and then threw it towards the monster. The blade left his hand and drew a blue-colored trajectory before stabbing the creature's forehead. SFX for Sai yet another aggressive barking of a dog, but shorter. If it was any regular human, such a wound would prove to be fatal but the body of a knoll was quite hardy. Too bad, the effect of the dagger hadn't ended yet. Suffering from a heaven-cursing rage, the knoll tried to extract the dagger stabbing it in the forehead. But, at that very moment the creature touched the dagger, it reverted to formless mana and permeated into the open wound. And so, the mana that had entered the knoll's head, followed S.A.E. Jean's will to the letter and became a hotly burning flame. Kyuk. The monster couldn't even let out a cry in anger before falling dead with its insides thoroughly burnt to a crisp. This was one of the methods S.A.E. Jean came up with to utilize the mana body. Although this move could be seen as a one-hit kill attack, it didn't mean he could use this against every monster out there. 
First of all, monsters ranked upper mid-tier had this thing called mana skin, like most knights which meant their skin and muscles were thickly saturated with mana. With his current proficiency level, he couldn't even hope to pierce such flesh at all. As for the mid-tiers, it still remained a rather inefficient method akin to a cheap trick that would only work on monsters such as this iron knoll that only had tough exteriors but weak innards. After the ending this boring hunt, S.A.E. Jean checked out how much mana remained within him. Almost half of it was gone. As expected, the mana expenditure was too great. He should have just killed it with his sword or something. Hey! It's over th. With a good timing, a hunting party comprising of three people hurriedly arrived on the scene. It seemed they had been chasing this knoll down for a while. What happened here? It was a party of two men and one woman. They confusedly looked at the iron knoll sprawled down on the ground for a short moment. It was understandable, as they couldn't see any obvious exterior wounds on this monster. In the end, they raised their heads with expressions of utter defeat. They had been trying to lure this monster towards their carefully laid out trap for the last three hours. In other words, this monster was the entirety of their daily hunting quota. Uh. However, the woman hunter with the worst expression of all, let out a small exclamation of surprise after discovering a man looking at them from beyond the corpse of the knoll. It was the chairman of the monster, Kim S.A.E. Jean. He was a famous man in the online communities, various cafes, as well as social networking sites, well known for his tall height and manly countenance. After all, even she herself was one of his four million strong SNS followers. Belatedly, the other two recognized him as well, and they slowly approached him with their faces slightly blushed. Um, hello there, you are Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean, yes? Ah, uh, yes, I am. Hello. Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled warmly towards the nervous trio. Maybe it was because the number of strangers recognizing him had increased by a great deal, he had gotten used to dealing with people whom he had never met before, but somehow, knew him well. Um ha, have you come to hunt today? Yes, I have but this knoll wasn't part of the plan. It just jumped at me out of the blue. Oh, that. Actually. The hunters then proceeded to explain what happened in detail. The Iron Knolls were known to be particularly strong among the mid-tiered monsters thanks to their hardy exterior, and as a consequence, their remains fetched high prices. So after discovering a lone Iron Knoll, these three created a trap and tried to lure it there for the past three hours. The monster was busy chasing them, until it suddenly began sniffing the air, then it changed its direction hastily and ran off to elsewhere. Aha! Kim S.A.E. Jean realized that it was because of his scent. So that's what happened. Then, please take the remains. It's fine with me. S.A.E. Jean pointed at the dead knoll and told the trio to take it with them. The truth was, he must have had reached the limit of absorbing mana stones for the growth of his stats, since absorbing one from a mid-tier monster would raise only about a few decimal points at best. Are, really? The hunting party let out a shout of joy. Yes. It's yours. Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled graciously. The hunters carried truly moved expressions as they bowed their waists 90 degrees four times in a row before politely inquiring if they could take a group selfie if it wasn't too much trouble. S.A.E. Jean happily accepted this request as well. And the trio went home very, very satisfied from this encounter with a friendly celebrity. And exactly three hours after this incident. As S.A.E. Jean was about to head home having finished up his work, he got a phone call. It was from USA Young. Appa, someone wrote a post about you on SNS and now it's a big news. Huh. Everyone is praising you for your nice deeds. You should check it out. Kiam. The life of a celebrity it seemed that pretty much anything could become a news topic. He logged onto a news webpage while trying to look like he was suffering a bit. However, there was a wide smile pasted on his lips bright enough to light up the heavens. Before anyone knew it, the sunlight became hotter and the coldness had become a story of distant yesterdays. As Kim S.A.E. Jean took a walk outside, he could definitely sense the silent encroachment of summer. It sure does resemble a proper theme park, doesn't it? Kim S.A.E. Jean Although S.A.E. Jean had taken a step back from the society's administration, 
Currently he was walking around its grounds with So Yeo Jin in tow after she requested for it. Originally, this area was too close to the monster field less than 40 kilometers so there were plenty of knights, hunters and wizards around but never a big number of civilians. But now, he could see parents who brought along their children, couples out for a date, and even some folks who were most likely foreign tourists. The size of the so-called floating population had grown enormously. Looks like it's okay for us to stop looking around here. Eh. But we still have other facilities to look at, such as the hotel and the cinema complex. There are lots of people there too, sir. So Yeo Jean spoke as she pointed towards the group of buildings over yonder. S.A.E. Jean carried a light smile as he shook his head. I don't have enough time for that, unfortunately. Besides all that, though there are truly a lot of people here. I know, right? Maybe it's because Miss S.A.E. Young and Miss Yu Rin are busy shooting their variety show in here, the number of people coming through has quadrupled compared to last year. If we can grow a bit more, then this area can very well rival the city center where the Eden Tower is located at in a near future, sir. Honestly, we are the true reason why the real estate prices around these parts have rocketed up, you know. So Yeo Jin spoke with lots of pride in her voice. Is that so? Yes, sir. Really, we made the correct decision to forcibly increase the society's lands. The pure profit alone is so huge. He was feeling really great. He was happy in the knowledge that all these lands and buildings were all his. Oh, right. What's the progress on that assignment I gave you? He suddenly remembered something else. The special event for the orc blacksmith. Two months ago, during the fourth night of the red moon when the waves of monsters were still thick and strong. With his entire stats boosted by over twice as much under the influence of the red moon, S.A.E. Jean crafted a weapon using the orc smithing technique. And that ended up becoming an eye-poppingly amazing creation. Out of all the weapons that could be made by an orc great warrior, this must have been the pinnacle a longsword that proudly earned the treasure grade ranking. The name was the orc's longsword for now, but he'd be able to change it the moment this sword goes on sale, since the orc blacksmith would officially be recognized as a master craftsman from then. Yes, sir. It's going well. We've already began the promotion and the advertisement via Guild's homepage as well as through its SNS profile. Even Miss S.A.E. Young and Miss Yu Rin have mentioned it during the filming of their respective shows. There seemed to be a lot of interest from many nights, that's for sure. Kim S.A.E. Jean nodded his head in satisfaction. The orc blacksmith hadn't produced a weapon in the last three months or so, and people had already begun criticizing him from breaking the promise or some such. But he figured that all of them would shut their collective mouths up if he told them this sword was the reason for the lengthy delay. That's good. By the way, it seems like the orc blacksmith wishes to sell this sword through an auction. What are your thoughts regarding this, Miss Yeo Jean? S.A.E. Jean wondered just how much this treasure would go for, under the current climate where the inflation had been going through the roof thanks to monsters' appearance, as well as the advent of mysterious crafts known as wizardry and alchemy. An auction? Then, there's a chance of another country acquiring the sword. In the past, the orc blacksmith got a lot of flack for selling a branded goods graded item to another country. But this time, this weapon was something that might not be seen in another hundred years, something on the level of being a cultural asset. Naturally, So Yeo Jin got cautious as she thought about the kind of calamity that could unfold when this weapon got taken by another country. The orc specifically requested for it. Since things have come this far, he said it'd be better to spread our name internationally. I hear the best blacksmith in the world is still a person named Hippidos. We should help the orc take away that title, don't you think? Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled faintly. Chapter, 84 Will you evolve into the lycanthrope form? Kim S.A.E. Jean in his athony form was floating on the water filling up his bathtub, with his gaze firmly focused on the alert window, currently superimposed on the ceiling. The lycanthrope. At first, it was his end goal. But now, this thing where he couldn't readily decide on what to do next, had become the proverbial Pandora's box. Keying. There were two big reasons why he was so reluctant to evolve into the lycanthrope. First of all, 
there was a high possibility of his outward appearance changing after his human form and the wolf form merged. Up until now, the human Kim Sae Jin's face remained broadly the same as before, but due to the qualities of a wolf slowly encroaching on him, certain facial features did sharpen up a bit. But if he chose to become the lycanthrope, he just could not tell how his face might look like afterwards. Right now, he had made many personal connections. If he went ahead with the evolution and his appearance changed way too dramatically compared to the Kim Sae Jin of now. Now that would be the worst of all the terrible calamities he could potentially face. Second problem was the racial tendencies of the lycanthrope. The lycanthropes of the legends were infamous for their hot-blooded and violent tempers. So much so, they were even treated as the talking monsters by the fellow Suins. If he were to win against such instincts, at minimum, the human Kim Sae Jin had to level up not only his physical strength, but his mental resistance as well the so-called mentality of a human. Dot. Few few. Sae Jin shot out water gun out of his mouth. The spouts of water drew a straight line as they hit the ceiling where the alert window was superimposed on. Leveling up this athony form could also be one of the ways to balance out the lycanthrope form as well. However, the risk associated with evolving this form was far greater than any other forms. One just had to think about the real leviathan that was currently roaming out in the expansive Atlantic Ocean, or taking a nap under a tremendously great depth. The flow of time, the currents of the oceans, the blazing sun, all the things and elements provided by the Mother Nature became the foundation of this creature's strength, which made the ranking of a leviathan as unclassifiable. It wasn't an exaggeration to call the leviathan a dragon of the seas. Kim Yurin could somehow contend with the leviathan that had appeared in the Han River of Seoul only because the summoning process had greatly limited its overall might. If it appeared in the middle of the city without being summoned, but by its own volition. Then Seoul would have become nothing more than a collection of collapsed rubble by now. Now that I think about it, my body has grown a little, hasn't it? As he was thinking about Leviathan-related matters, he suddenly came to a realization. Was it because Athene was the so-called growth-type monster that leveled up simply with the passage of time while being in contact with any form of moisture? The bathtub had definitely gotten smaller for his body compared to before. Kyung. Feeling rather uneasy about this development, Sae Jin quickly changed back to human form and left the tub. He took a glance at the clock it said 11 am. The scheduled time for training was almost here. Ever since the red moon concluded, Kim Sae Jin concentrated on training that would level up his human form. Under the advent of the red moon, the orc great warrior's instincts had become harder to control, that was why but also, he was mindful of the undecided evolution towards the lycanthrope as well. The sword training was easy. His weapon mastery was now at the level of a high-class user, so there weren't too many knights who could contend with him on that regard. Every knight praised Sae Jin for being a genius with the sword, even saying things like he'd have been the world's greatest swordsman if he was born in the Middle Ages or something. Even learning martial arts for the first time in his life proved to be easier than expected as well. The warrior's special quality, had gifted him with instincts on how to move his body efficiently many martial art techniques such as breaking the fall, feet movement, hand-to-hand -hand combat, etc., etc. were deeply ingrained within his body already. As far as his physical body was concerned, it was pretty much perfect, leaving mana as his only problem to tackle. It was incredibly important to start the education on how to use mana very early in one's life. No matter how much potential one had, they said that if the golden time of around 56 years of age was missed, that person would never ever be able to store mana in his or her body so. For someone like Sae Jean who was in his twenties already, the concept of him storing mana within his body was a hugely difficult prospect, even if he cheated a little with his traits sometimes. The idea was as impossible as trying to grasp a passing cloud, and just as ambiguous and intangible as the fading morning fog. So, in order to overcome this shortcoming of his, he asked Hazeline for a favor, who just so happened to be an A-ranked wizard in her spare time. With her readily agreeing to it, a new schedule for mana tutelage was set up, the lessons happening on every second week of a month on the days of Friday and Saturday. Close your eyes, and try to receive mana into your body. Shuwuk, shuwuk. Inside the members-only training area. 
While sitting in the lotus position, S.A.E. Jean's eyes were closed as he repeatedly breathed in and out deeply. This was a part of the mana-related lessons, focusing on increasing the amount of usable mana in him. Shuwuk, Shuwuk. Please continue Shuwuk, Shuwuk repeatedly. Will this really work? Unfortunately, S.A.E. Jean's suspicions remained unanswered. He had been doing nothing but Shuwuking, Shuwuking for the past thirty minutes, after all. Just as do as you're told, please. This is a test to see how good your affinity with mana is. Too bad for him, Hazeline was adamant with her orders. Really? If that's the case, then Shuwuk, Shuwuk. S.A.E. Jean resumed this sort of but not really meditation technique slash breathing thing. And so, he repeated this for countless dozens of times until Hazeline lightly tapped on his shoulder to signal the end of the exercise. That's enough. The concentration level of mana in your breaths is equivalent to that of a low mid-tier knight. Huh. He momentarily got shocked. Even if he knew that the stat values for the magic strength and mana affinity were inferior to his physical strength-related stats, wasn't this unexpectedly low? He honestly thought it was at least at the level of a mid-tier. What's up with that expression? A high-tier hunter would never possess the equivalent mana level of a low-tier knight no matter how hard he tries. In other words, it's already very impressive that your level approaches that of a low mid-tier knight. Well then, shall we start with the real training now? As soon as Hazeline finished speaking, she activated a spell even before S.A.E. Jean had gotten ready. Kim S.A.E. Jean. In the blink of an eye, an overbearing current of mana was generated, and began powerfully pushing down on S.A.E. Jean's seated body. Perform push-ups under this pressure, please. I know it's tough, but it can't be helped, you know. After all, this is the only method left for someone like Mr. S.A.E. Jean, who has missed his ideal time for mana training by a span of decades, to increase his overall mana capacity, even if it's only by a little. When S.A.E. Jean could only whimper under the pressure, unable to reply back, she withdrew the mana pressing down on him at least for now. Please listen well. The concentration level of mana in here is very high because of the Athene doll and a mana spring, right? And I'll be compressing the mana in the air and press it down on you. So, even if it's for a short while, doesn't that mean that you, Mr. S.A.E. Jean, will be receiving the love, of mana present in the air with all of your body, no? Hazeline brightly smiled and swung her arms around in circles. Since that looked like her loosening up before activating her spell again, S.A.E. Jean became tense once more. And when you sweat during an exercise while being subjected under this kind of situation, your sweat pores will open up wide and through those open pores, mana will enter your body. It'll also become easier to absorb mana when muscles are working, too. Of course, 99% of the mana will leave your body again, but still, your mana reserve should increase this way even if it would only be a little bit. So now, please take off your clothes. Eh. Why my clothes? Seeing S.A.E. Jean covering up his chest by crossing his arms and pretending to be embarrassed, Hazeline frowned deeply. Please stop fooling around. It'll be easier to absorb mana with less layering of clothing, you see. You also know that air can't easily pass through fabrics. There's a big difference. Well, I get that, but... Please hurry up. I'll get angry if you don't listen to the teacher, you know. I came here after answering Mr. S.A.E. Jean's earnest plea, but it'll become troublesome if you're being uncooperative. I mean, do you have any idea how much is the fee for a tutelage by an A-ranked wizard? Hearing all this, S.A.E. Jean carried a complicated expression as he began unzipping his top. Even my pants. I'll let you keep that on, so for now, take off your t-shirt as well. He really did feel somewhat embarrassed, but he removed the shirt in the end. His battle-hardened, perfectly shaped and tight muscles revealed themselves in all their glory. Hmm. H.M., hmm. Hazeline's cheeks slightly reddened as she took in the sight of his broad shoulders, well-built chest, clearly defined eight-pack, and the lower abdominal muscles. M., must be thanks to your trait, since your body looks nice. Although she tried to sound normal, in all honesty, his body was already well past the level of being nice. By using her trait called Eyes of the Wizard, she could easily tell. As exactly as these words meant, 
SAE Jean's body was as close to as being perfect as possible, something not even Knight's training for the rest of their lives might achieve. Although the amount of mana circulating within his body was low, the quality of it was very high. Kume. Kim Sae Jean. What are you doing? Why aren't you getting ready? The embarrassed Sae Jean hurriedly got down to the push-up position as soon as she spoke. When he did, those already well-defined muscles on his shoulders and that broad back stood out even more. Hazeline tried her best to avert her gaze, but because she was still a member of the female species, she couldn't completely prevent her eyes from taking several quick glances. I'm activating the spell. Please, try you best. Yes percent. Again, before he got properly ready, an overwhelming atmospheric pressure pressed down on his back. However, he still began the push-up while gritting his teeth. Only ten seconds had passed by, but his arms and legs were already shaking around like leaves and sweat drops were pouring down like a waterfall. 1. Hazeline. Hazeline counted for him, but it didn't enter his ears. Whether this was his first or second, he couldn't tell, nor did he want it to know. This thing. The only words leaking out of his mouth were nothing but curses. Stop cursing. Kyuk. After hearing him swear out, Hazeline actually increased the severity of the spell. Now then. Let's do the second one, shall we? But when can you do it? Do I have to wait for an hour? Q, Yiyu. While hearing her ridicule, Sae Jean continued to exert all of his strength. Magic strength has increased by two. Mana affinity has increased by one. This was the result of today's training. Kim Sae Jean smiled brightly as he lay on the floor, roughly huffing and puffing. It was seriously a wonderful result. After all, this much increase was equal to absorbing dozens of mid-tier mana stones. It was the right decision to ask for Hazeline's aid. However, the actual person who helped him achieve this growth, Hazeline, was carrying quite a complicated expression. She wasn't sure how, but the amount of mana now staying in his body easily exceeded her initial estimates. In truth, this was an inefficient method that had a clear dead end. To use an analogy of a person's height, it was similar to trying to locate the hidden height by correcting the bone structure of a person who had already stopped growing. TL, really? Such a thing exists. Where do I sign up? But seriously, just what kind of a body is this greedy for mana? Normally, about 50% of the mana existing in the air would enter a person's body. But then, 99% of that would escape back out so, theoretically, only around 0. 5% should remain inside that person's body. But when peeking into SAE Jean's body, over 25% of the mana entering his body remained behind. No, it was more like being captured by the mana already existing within his body. Is it also because of his trait? Has a line. She couldn't get a bead on just what kind of trait he had. If mana continued to remain in his body without limit, then within a year, he'd even leapfrog her in terms of overall mana reserve. Mr. Sae Jean. Is your body feeling okay? Ah, uh, yes, of course. Miss Teacher. The results are pretty good, right? Well then can you stand? Why don't we go and eat something? Hazeline smiled bitterly as she offered her hand. Feeling satisfied, Sae Jean was about to grab the offered hand. But then. Appa, are you he? Usae Young arrived at the training facility with a spooky good timing. She began alternating her gaze between Sae Jean who was covered in buckets of sweat, and a surprised woman who was hurriedly pulling the robe to hide her face. Um you came early today. There was still an hour left until their promised time. Kim Sae Jean picked up his article of clothing and began putting them on, all the while looking at Usae Young with a slightly stupefied expression. The tracing is complete, sir. The current location of the artificial heart is inside the city near the monster field in Kongwan province, within the grounds of the monster. How troublesome. Does the society chairman, who is supposedly in cahoots with the Lican, have the heart? The Apostle Burren let out a frustrated groan after hearing the subordinate's report. We're not sure of that, sir but the likelihood of that is very high. Burin roughly massaged his temples. 
To think, the item they had to recover at any cost was unexpectedly in the hands of a big fish. What are your orders, sir? The friend of Leakin. His job description, chairman of the society, the monster this man named Kim Sae Jean was an important enough individual that even made the apostle of the House of Bathory hesitate. For now keep him under surveillance. It's possible that the Leakin is protecting him, so use pawns for this purpose. Yes, sir. I understand. The short answer from the subordinate echoed in the empty room. Chapter, 85 USAE Young continued to move her gaze between Kim Sae Jean and the unknown woman. Within her trembling eyes, many emotions such as fear, anger, irritation, anxiety, dumbfoundedness, etc. etc. tumbled around in a wild mess. Sae Jean hurriedly put his clothes back on and walked towards her. Hey, you should greet her. This is. He paused his words there. He wanted to acquire Hazeline's permission first. It's fine. Hazeline nodded her head firmly. Wah, what's fine? Unfortunately for USA Young, this entire situation was just a big messy ball of confusion. Just what kind of introductions would require an okay from the other party first? She knew she was worrying about nothing here, but still, she couldn't help but feel nervous. So, the thing is, this person is. No, wait. Stop, stop right there. USAE Young. USAE Young shouted out and stopped SAE Jean. She felt like she needed time to ready her mind, if it was to calm her erratically beating heart. This person is Miss Hazeline. You also know her too. SAE Jean. Good thing. Then, S.A.E. Jean didn't feel like extending the duration of her misunderstanding. U.S.A.E. Young's body trembled for an imperceptible amount of time, before she began remembering the name Hazeline only then did she let out a sigh of relief as she nodded her head. Oh. Wowie. Yes, of course, I know. I know well. Her eyes that were shaking in anxiety had now recovered some stability. S.A.E. Jean chuckled slightly, and then said. She's our fellow society member, so isn't it okay? While gently gazing at Hazeline with an amiable smile. Well. I've made many written communications with Miss S.A.E. Young, so. Hazeline nodded her head in reluctance before removing her hood. U.S.A.E. Young became incredibly stunned, then. As expected of an elf, her face was eye-searingly beautiful but her skin was pure white, unlike how a dark elf should be. Before such an absolute beauty, S.A. Young found herself shrinking away in awe. It's our first time meeting face to face, yes. It's a pleasure, Miss S.A. Young. Hazeline reached out with her hand for a shake. Feeling slightly inferior, S.A. Young carefully held that hand. As expected, your beauty is befitting that of an elf. U.S.A. Young. Receiving that bitter praise, Hazeline assumed a wry smile as well. I was training until now. Miss Hazeline decided to help me out. Kim Sae Jean didn't like the depressed expression of USAE Young, so he deliberately placed his arm around her shoulders and gently pulled her in closer. It was definitely gently. But USAE Young dived into his arms as if she was being shoved by a tornado or something. Why, you two seem really friendly. At this sudden embracing, Hazeline became flustered and scratched the back of her neck. Ah, that. Actually, we're really, really close. And there's a plenty of future potential for us, T. USAE Young. Kim Sae Jean quickly covered up her mouth, after realizing she was saying weird stuff that was obviously trying to ward Hazeline off of him. Our relationship is like that of a friendly older brother and younger sister. Kim Sae Jean. Meanwhile, USAE Young bit into his palm in irritation. The orc blacksmith, now registered as the 18th Master Craftsman of South Korea. A genius who has become a mast. Are only after debuting two years ago many overseas knights orders send their congratulations. The weapon that has elevated the orc as the master, will be auctioned off on June 1st in Hyenwall Auction House. Total of 200 knights orders from over 100 countries request for the participation of the auction. How chaotic. Smiling in satisfaction, S.A.E. Jean lowered the newspaper on top of the desk. Newspapers from not only Korea, 
but also from Spain, the USA, the UK, China, Japan as well as countless other countries could be found on top of his desk. The languages might be different, but their headlines were remarkably similar. All of them were about the orc blacksmith becoming a master craftsman, and the words printed within were busy expressing their curiosity towards the treasure-graded weapon he had crafted. At least, that's according to So Yeo Jin, who happened to be quite proficient in several languages. Yes sir, it is getting really hectic out there. We even received official diplomatic documentation from several Asian and Western European countries for their prime ministers and presidents who are planning to attend the auction itself. Really? That's amazing. Well, since it's a treasure-graded item we are talking about, I think this is only normal, sir. I mean, it's a first one to appear in Korea for over 30 years, you know. He must be a true genius, this Mr. Ork Blacksmith. Kim Sae Jin did his best to stop his shoulders from straightening out after hearing So Yeo Jin's praises. Kyum. That's how it is. But of course. Just as So Yeo Jin smiled brightly and nodded her head, the voice of his PA leaked out of the Society Chairman exclusive phone line. Mr. Chairman. Miss Shenarine the Wizard has called in to say that she'll be arriving on the premises shortly. Oh. Looks like it's time for your training. Then, I should return to my duties as well. So Yeo Jin. So Yeo Jin grinned brightly and left his office. Sae Jin yawned and stretched his limbs out wide, before he got up from his seat as well. Before going to the training facility, he stopped by the society's members only cafeteria. Maybe it was because this was during lunch time, there were quite a few people here. Kim Yusong's son, Kim Sien Ho, was carefully feeding his young daughter some baby food while Yi Hai Rin was looking at that scene with adoring eyes. Ju Ji Hyuk was deeply immersed in the novel he was reading, while USA Yi Yong was busy typing on the keyboard of a notebook PC while wearing a pair of glasses. She said it was a group project for school, so it must be a lot of work. Everyone looked occupied with something. And out of them, the only one remaining with some leeway who could lessen his boredom was. I see that you've come again. S.A.E. Jean. Hmm. Ah, uh, yes. Hyrin asked me to come along, so I, uh, ended up relying on you again. The food tastes really nice here, which is as expected. That person was Kim Yurin, who was already halfway to the dreamland before he interrupted her nap time. Well, it's true that our cafeteria is famous for its delicious food. After all, SAE Jean only hired those chefs with great potential, so it was par for the course, really. Of course. Kim Yurin subtly tried to read Sae Jin's mood while avoiding making a direct eye contact. Maybe because she knew that she was not the member of his society. It's fine. You don't have to be so tense like that. You are contracted with the monster entertainment, so you can come as often as you'd like. Sae Jin. Sae Jin assumed a wily smile after sitting down before her. Oh. Thank you. So, will it be all right for me to trouble you in the future as well? Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. He figured that she was referring to the society's training facility. He had witnessed Yu Rin loitering out in front of the HQ building more than once, whenever her acquaintances Yi Hai Rin or Yu Sae Young weren't around. By the way, Kim Sae Jin took a glance at the wrist protector mounted Yu Rin's arm. She saw the direction of his gaze and slowly hid the arm below the table. So, that's that thing. The one given by the hero orc. Did Hyrin tell you about it? She did. Kim Yurin let out a lengthy groan. Yes, the hero orc gave it to me. May I touch it? Sae Jin reached out with his hand while speaking to her. However, Kim Yurin promptly and swiftly turned away to the other side and shook her head slowly. Nope. You like that orc that much? T. That's not true. Not true at all. It's just. A present, is all. You are not supposed to touch someone else's gifts willy-nilly. Hmm. Sae Jean stared at her and feigned dissatisfaction for a bit, while rubbing his chin. Then, a very good idea popped up in his head. Do you want me to help you and set up a meeting with him? At his truly unexpected question, her eyes became super wide. Eh. W, 
what are you saying? It's just as I said. I told you that I can converse with monsters. That's how I got to be friendly with the hero orc. When he spoke up to here, he could see Kim Yurin visibly swallow down her saliva. But well, just because I make a request, that doesn't mean it'll happen. But surely, the possibility should be high. Of course, there would be a catch. If Miss Yurin joins my society, then maybe, just maybe. Maybe I can summon forth the hero orc at least once every couple of weeks. Kim Sae Jean smiled evilly as he studied reactions in Yurin's eyes. And they were shaking uncontrollably. However. I can't. And I shall repeat this point once more. I'm not feeling any affection towards the orc. If anything, then it's simply the emotion of camaraderie between comrades who had battled together. After all, does the notion of a human liking a monster even make sense? She continued to strongly deny everything. Yes, I understand. Well. If you change your mind later on, let me know, please. She was like an impregnable fortress. Feeling his stubbornness act up, he even thought up some really naughty things, such as appearing before her as the orc and fan the flames of yearning in her heart or something. Right then, his phone rang loudly. It was from Hazeline. Suddenly remembering the complicated history between Yurin and Hazeline, S.A.E. Jean carefully exited the cafeteria. But before that. Miss Yurin, since you refuse to join my society, you are forbidden from entering the training facility today. No ifs or buts, please. Ha. Huh. No, wait, I didn't come to train. I understand. Don't want to help him anymore. Hazeline pouted as she looked at the training Kim S.A.E. Jean who was exercising like there's no tomorrow. In all honesty, she didn't want to help him. Of course, she was very much grateful for what this man, Kim S.A.E. Jean a.k.a. the Goblin Alchemist had done to make her a real, super important big shot in the world of alchemy. It was hard to quantify just how grateful she was. However, she couldn't help but feel intense jealousy at this unfair situation. It truly was a deplorable behavior, but what could she do? Wizards were originally the type of animals that were full of petty jealousy, envy, ostracization of others better than him or her, as well as desires to monopolize. On top of this, the level of pride they had in their reserve of mana was on another plateau altogether. And not to forget, although she had taken half a step away from that profession, Hazeline was still a wizard, through and through. She had never ever even heard of, or experienced, such a wondrous growth potential before. Her mana reserves increased only after she had to go through training that literally made her sweat blood drops, until her bones felt like they were breaking under the strain. But this man, in probably over a year's time. No, maybe even less than that. In half a year's time, she estimated that this man would possess more mana than her if this rate kept up. It was the difference of such a fraudulently unfair talent, or his trait, and herself. Hugh Yuff. However, S.A.E. Jean was totally oblivious to her uncomfortable state of mind and concentrated solely on his training. At first, it was seriously tough, but now that a month had passed by, it had gotten much easier. The refreshing sensation of mana permeating throughout his body was more than enough to offset the pain from the harsh training. This just doesn't make sense. How can the rate of his increase in mana absorption actually be higher than last week? Has a line. Normally, when a person absorbed a certain amount of mana during a day, he or she be able to absorb just a bit less on the following day because the space in one's body to store up mana was limited. But it was not the same with this man. Her face became nearly tearful after wondering why he was the only exception to this rule. So, uh, shall we stop here for today? Hazeline stomped her feet on the ground in vexation and spoke to him. No way. I can push myself. A bit more. He gritted his teeth and succeeded in doing one more push-up. Hazeline shut her mouth in anger. Meanwhile, magic strength has increased by two. Mana affinity has increased by one. Only when alert windows such as this one floated up to his view a couple more times did he stop his training while feeling rather satisfied by the result. The training lasted for three hours. During that time, USAE Young went home after saying she needed to get ready for the following day's presentation, 
while Ju Ji Hyuk went out on a date with Yi Hai Rin. Let me take you home. Currently, they were in the parking lot. Sae Jean opened the car's door as he spoke. Hmm. All right. Hazeline deliberated for a bit before nodding her head. She figured that it was better to get a free ride home, since she felt a bit lightheaded from helping him out in his training although it looked simple from outside, it nevertheless required a good deal of mana from her. Please get in. Sae Jean. Hazeline climbed into the passenger side, and Sae Jean got behind the wheel. As they drove, they talked about this and that. Most of them were about you Sae Young and the monster, though. Miss Sae Young, she's really cute, isn't she? She's been messaging me all the time, asking me what I've been doing lately, and then, just drops out of the conversation for no reason. So, I thought about this for a while, trying to figure out what she wants. And I think she's trying to warn me off you. She's doing what? Well, whenever she can't contact you, it's like, she's thinking that maybe you're spending time with me instead, so she's sending those text messages to probe me. Kim Sae Jean shook his head wryly. E.I., no way. E.I.I. -I. It's the truth, you know. You know what's the first thing written on her texts. Uni, what are you doing right now? Or, it's are you meeting someone right now? It freaks me out sometimes. So, please treat her a little bit better. She seems to like you really a lot. Just as when Sae Jean glanced over at her direction with a smile. The wolf's intuition ran an alarm bell immediately. In an instant, his perception of time slowed down, and the world began flowing much more slowly. A formless matter was suddenly crashing into the side of his car. He couldn't tell what it was, whether it was a magic spell, pure mana, or even an undead. Kim Sae Jean slammed down on the brakes and then, he pulled Hazeline into his arms in haste. Within this slowed perspective of time, he could clearly decipher every little bit of changes in her expressions. It sure was fun to look at, but he couldn't focus on that right now. He quickly extracted mana from his body, and then formed a thin membrane from it which wrapped around them. As soon as the blue and circular membrane finished forming. Right then. With a violent impact, the car was flung high into the air. And on top of the airborne vehicle, enormous darkness poured down. Are you unhurt? Inside the blue-colored mana membrane, Sae Jean lightly grasped her shoulders and shook her. Frowning heavily, she massaged the back of her neck while slowly nodding. I'm more or less okay, but which sons of Fing Bees did this? Sae Jean became speechless after hearing her rough words. Just in time, they could hear the footsteps just beyond the mana membrane. They're coming. Hazeline. Hazeline angrily gritted her teeth and began summoning mana from her body. Hey, can you do something about this? Hazeline. She then asked Sae Jean while tapping his mana membrane. Oh. Please wait a moment. Since Sae Jean had never seen her this furious before, he went into maximum respect mode and politely opened up a hole in the membrane for her. The first thing they saw was the violently twisted wreckage of the car's chassis. Hazeline closed her eyes and recited an unidentifiable chant. Tang. Right away, an enormous thrust of air exploded out through the open gap of the membrane and flung away the car's chassis. It's done. Undo the whole thing. Ah, uh, yes. As he undid the membrane, Hazeline let out a low sigh as she exited out of the partial destroyed car. Come out. Who are you? Show yourselves right now, or I'll burn you alive. Hazeline's cold voice resounded from the middle of the empty road. As if reacting to her provocation, a figure of a person emerged from the darkness that had descended in front of the car. Hey you, you must be out of your mind. Don't you think this is too much for a pran? Hazeline. But it wasn't just one person. Two, three, four, five, six. Until there were eight of them. With the sudden entrance of these eight mysterious beings, Hazeline became slightly more serious as she licked her lips. So, you came prepared. Who sent you? Did the triad send you? Hazeline. It seemed that she was seriously mistaken about something. From the mafia? Right. I thought as much. Hazeline. 
Chapter, 86 Kim Sae Jin slowly approached the back of Hazeline who was busy glaring at the nine humanoid figures covered in a veil of darkness, her current face stiff. Sensing his approach, she extended her arm out and stopped him there. I'm sorry, Mr. Sae Jin. This is all because of me. I'll finish this up as soon as possible, so please, take a step back. No, wait a minute. Hush. Be quiet now. Her misunderstanding continued on as she began drawing deep breaths. Since you didn't react, I guess you're not from the Mafia, either. Then, maybe you're from Yakuza. Has a line. There was no reply this time as well. It was obvious why they were not human, to begin with. Their rotten smell of blood tickling SAE Jean's nostrils proved that much. Without replying back to her, all nine of them began chanting a spell at the same time. Seeing this, Hazeline bit her lip and then, chanted her own spell as well. Right away, black-colored lava powerfully rose up behind her, before forming a massive, lengthy spear that buzzed noisily while floating in the air. Near the constantly burning surface of the spear, space seemed to distort around as the air itself was busy melting all around it. It was the mana spear. The spell where its caster formed a spear with mana, its sole purpose was to destroy and kill its target. Rated as one of the highest class attack magic spells, not only the caster needed to pour in a great deal of mana. He or she also needed to possess excellent magic strength ability to control mana in order to maintain the shape of the spear as well as its elemental properties. This spell was powerful enough to be used as the greatest trump card that could theoretically contend against a true dragon, depending on the ability of the caster. If you're scared, then you better get lost now. I do not wish to worsen our relationship any further than it already is. If we can resolve this with dialogue, wouldn't it be simpler for both of us that way? Hazeline confidently grinned, as the mana spear split into nine and targeted all nine figures while buzzing in the air. That grin could last only for ten seconds. The reason for that was the strange wave spreading out from beneath the feet of the vampires. Spreading around like a raging black torrent, this wave thing reached out until arriving at a certain diameter, then rose up in a dome shape, separating and enclosing the space they were in from the rest of the world. This was a spell Sae Jean was quite familiar with, the isolation barrier. Ha! Huh. Hazeline. Of course, as an A-ranked wizard, Hazeline had experienced her share of barriers before. But at this moment, she could not hide her astonishment. As soon as this barrier finished forming, the sizes of the black mana spears began to gradually shrink rapidly, all the while she felt the flow of mana within her body slow down as well. At this unexpected turn of events, she quickly scanned her surroundings and gritted her teeth. What kind of trickery is this? Vampires didn't bother to answer her, even this time. Instead, from behind their back, a small and dark reddish rift in the space opened up from there, dozens of tentacles exploded out. These things slapped away the mana spears and flung themselves at Hazeline's location. Right in that moment when those grotesque-looking tentacles and their sharp edges were about to cut into her neck. Five lines of slashes, coming from unexpected claws, gleamed coldly in the air as the tentacles were sliced apart, turning to powder before dissipating into the wind. Only then did the nine vampires show some signs of being agitated. This thing. Pant, Pant Hazeline. Sensing the approach of death for the first time after a long, long while, Hazeline broke out in cold sweat, her breathing ragged and shallow. These crazy sons of bees have gone completely bonkers insane. Resorting to using shtty black magic huh? Hazeline began pointing accusatory fingers at the vampires while growling like a wounded animal, only to have a strong hand powerfully rein her back in from behind. Miss Hazeline. Please calm down first. We are at a disadvantage here. Do you know of the ways to disable a barrier like this? Sae Jean looked at her with a hardened face. Sensing the overall strengths of the nine suddenly appearing vampires via the wolf's intuition, he couldn't help but feel flustered here. In the human form, there was just no way he'd be able to fight against all of them at the same time. I've never seen a barrier like this before. It must be from the school of black magic, but I'm truly sorry. Because of me, even Mr. Sae Jean has. Hazeline's misunderstanding hadn't alleviated just yet, 
and thus she was feeling apologetic towards S.A.E. Jean as a result. Seeing her like this, some of the tension in him lightened up, causing him to smile weakly and nod his head. It's fine. I'll do my best to buy us time, so please, look for a way to. Unfortunately for the two, these vampires weren't polite enough to give them time to formulate a response. Truly out of the blue, a giant meteorite formed on the skies within the barrier and began descending down rapidly on S.A.E. Jean and Hazeline. She summoned forth a barrier of her own with what little mana she could wield, while he lengthened his claws and slashed out a whirlwind. That's how they managed to stop the meteorite, but then, an unsighted tentacle shot towards them from the side. This thing easily smashed apart the barrier and inflicted a huge wound on Hazeline's waist. Kyuk. Hazeline stumbled and collapsed on the ground. S.A.E. Jean spat out a bunch of expletives and tried to cut the isolation barrier with his claws, but as expected, his actions proved to be ineffective. I can't do this as a human. Sighing out grandly, S.A.E. Jean extracted one of the spiritualized potions out from his body and healed Hazeline's wound. You you. Miss Hazeline, are you alright? Then, he studied Hazeline's face she seemed rather relieved as the searing pain lessened a great deal. More or less Hazeline. Please listen to me carefully. Me, I'm definitely not a monster man, nor a demonic being. If it's you, Miss Hazeline, you will trust me on this one, right? A monster that could change into a person, the so-called monster man. The being straddling the boundary between a human and a monster, the demonic being. Of the two, demonic being actually was a collective term denoting all the races with violent nature and tendencies who had migrated from another world to planet Earth. These demonic beings were different from vampires and nagas in that, not one media outlet stood up for them, and thus were now classified as targets to be eliminated on sight. If lycanthropes still existed, then they would surely fall into this category as well. This was one of the reasons why S.A.E. Jean hesitated revealing his trait to the others. After all, demonic beings who died while claiming to be humans holding unique traits numbered quite a few. What do you mean by Hazeline? In the middle of her sentence, vampires attacked again. S.A.E. Jean managed to destroy the tentacles with his razor-sharp claws, but against the huge ball of black flames flying towards them, these claws weren't much of a help while he was in the human form. Kayak S.A.E. Jean hurriedly pushed Hazeline with his arm and then flung himself to the opposite side. Quahang. The ground they were standing on mere seconds ago was distorted as if lava had melted it down. For now, search for a method to break out of this isolation barrier. S.A.E. Jean. He never once believed that he'd be able to conceal his trait forever. S.A.E. Jean shouted out at her, and then assumed the form of the hero orc covered in blue scales. The physique that easily exceeded the height of two meters with the pair of burning eyes, he glared at the vampires and grasped the mace tightly. Within him, his fighting spirit, combined with rage boiled over. SFX for an orc's roar. That was why he just had to let out the roar containing all his hunger for battle. Although Hazeline was busy backpedaling in sheer fright, right now he had no interest in her plight whatsoever. He then rushed forward, slamming away the various tentacles that were coiling out of pretty much everywhere, while completely ignoring those magic spells that were powerful enough to tickle him. The damage inflicted on the orc's pristine scales were pretty much zero. His overwhelming appearance easily transcended that of a mere orc, reminding all present of a mythical demonic fiend, instead. What the f? The vampires finally lost their calmness and began falling into disorder and one even spat out some choice words. With a roar that threatened to destroy the eardrums of all who listened to it, the orc slammed down with his mace. As soon as the weapon slammed on the surface of the road, the ground gouged out in a crater, and the entire isolation barrier began to quake uncontrollably. Seven out of the nine vampires began panicking and started firing all sorts of magic spells to stop the rampaging orc at all costs. However, the remaining two vampires continued to maintain their composure. These so-called honorable apostles then raised a wall between their group and the orc, while speaking out words of calm. Stop wasting your energy and time. We'll activate the summoning procedure. But? 
When the seven believers were about to show their astonishment, the mace of the orc powerfully slammed into the artificial wall with a loud theahang and sent out a stupendous shock wave. That's probably his so-called trait, no? Well, how unexpected and irritating. Begin the summoning procedure, immediately. But, but, if we summon Lady Bathory here. I'm, um, You think I'm insane? There's no need to summon Her Majesty here. The Death Knight will be more than enough. The mace slammed into the wall once more. Cracks noisily formed on the magically created defensive wall. Hurry. There's not much time. Sensing the urgency of the situation, the nine vampires hurriedly began reciting the chant together. The language they spoke was not Korean, not English, not even Japanese, but that of another world. S.A.E. Jean's intuition immediately told him of the impending crisis, so he activated the skill warrior of reversal and attacked the magic wall even harder. Unfortunately, although the crack opened up just a bit wider, the defensive wall stood. Step aside for a second, please. It was then, he heard Hazeline's shout along with the sensation of magic energy from the back. As soon as S.A.E. Jean stepped aside, very, very thin mana spear shot past him. It slipped in through the crack and splendidly set a vampire's neck ablaze. Kirk. At this sudden and successful attack, one of the vampires met with an untimely death. However, it was still a bit too late. From the ground died in the darkest shades of black, the shape of an ebony knight slowly emerged above the surface. This was a relic of the past, straight from the vampire's previous world. The strongest undead, created out of a knight who had passed on a long time ago the death knight. SFX for sounds of glass. Shattering. As the death knight finished emerging, the defensive wall shattered like glass and S.A.E. Jean swung his mace against the still immobile death knight. Too bad for him, though those damnable tentacles got in the way of his attack and he had no choice but to retreat. You, find how to destroy, this barrier yet. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean shouted out. It was quite likely that if he started pounding on it, the barrier could collapse just like before. But there just wasn't enough time for that. I'm still looking. As Hazeline shouted back, the Death Knight completely awakened. From the gaps of the metal helm that hit its entire head, a pair of eerie red eyes lit up. As soon as its consciousness returned in full, the Death Knight unsheathed the sword mounted on its hip and slashed out. The deep red sword aura flying out in a crescent trajectory was roughly slapped away by S.A.E. Jean's mace as he dashed towards the Death Knight. Quahung. The orc's mace shattered the air as it came down on the Death Knight's head, but it swung its great sword to block the attack. In that instant, a powerful shock wave swept out and raised a huge dust cloud that blocked the view. Clang, clang. From within this thick dust cloud, the sounds of metal colliding against one another rang out continuously. In terms of both the raw strength and skill, the Death Knight was not at disadvantage at all compared to S.A.E. Jean in the orc form. On top of this, the irritating obstruction from the surrounding vampires were making this battle quite difficult as well. It was nearly impossible to defend against both the Death Knight's sword and the magic spells of the vampires at the same time. So, S.A.E. Jean tried to focus on this Death Knight and let the other attack slip by for now, but the D.N. Undead Swordsmanship was like an impregnable fortress with absolutely no opening whatsoever. This situation is too unfavorable. S.A.E. Jean gritted his teeth as the sharp nicks began appearing on the tough scales covering his body. In order to have a smoother battle, it was the correct strategy to kill off all the wizards in the rear first who were in charge of supporting fire. Unfortunately for him, the current orc form was not agile enough to get past the Death Knight. If he was in the werewolf form, it might just be possible, but he was certain that he'd not be able to withstand a single strike while transforming under this kind of intense situation. S.A.E. Jean glanced at the alert window faintly wavering just above the shoulders of the Death Knight. There was still one more method left that could potentially help him overcome this tricky situation. Will you evolve into the lycanthrope? Yes no. That DN alert window sure as hell looked incredibly alluring right about now. He thought that, whether there were pros and cons of becoming lycanthrope or not, he had to actually survive in order to experience it. Any luck? S.A.E. Jean shouted at Hazeline and glanced at her direction. 
but she was just as occupied as he was currently. Instead of searching for a way to break the isolation barrier, she was too busy engaging in a life-or-death battle against two vampires. FCK. If this unfavorable situation persisted, then both of them would perish here. There wasn't much time to decide anymore, and his reasoning of a human was quickly deserting him. Seeing those damnable vampires at the back busy shooting out those evil magic spells, his entire body quaked in violent rage, wishing nothing but to rip all their bodies asunder. SFX for another loud Orsish roar. SAE Jean roared out loudly and selected yes. In that moment, countless alert windows popped up. The windows seemed to fill up the entire the world and blocked his view completely. It was a scene he had never experienced before. Chapter 87 The ebony wolf form has now changed to lycanthrope form. All stats rise drastically after the human form and the lycanthrope form merge. A special trait of the lycanthrope, where it grows stronger the longer it is exposed to the moonlight, now applies. When in the appearance of wolf, the blood flow within the body will increase. Proficiency for all existing skills related to the wolf will rise up by a single level. A passive status constraint, the untied knot, has been acquired. After failing to suppress the wild instincts of the lycanthrope, the host must assume the appearance of the lycan wolf for 570 minutes every day, determined by the value of the stat, energy manipulation. Until the conditions are fulfilled, certain abilities of the lycanthrope will be locked and unavailable. A new passive skill, Moonlight Skin, has been acquired. Proficiency Level, F. The skin of the lycanthrope is on a different level compared to an ordinary wolf. Possessing higher resistance towards physical and magical attacks, and able to freely change its property, the host can reflect light in a certain way to hide his body. However, this part of the skill cannot be utilized while in a human's appearance. A new active skill, Eyes of the Wild, has been acquired. Eyes that can decipher the enemy's weakness. But now, with the eyes of the lycanthrope, the skill can cause effects of a curse, which can reveal the previously undetected weakness of the enemy by spending mana. However, in the appearance of the human, the skill level will be lowered by one. A new active skill, Expansion, has been acquired. The host can increase the overall size of the wolf's appearance, depending on the skill level. A new active skill, Claw Chain, has been acquired. Strikes from the host's claws will change directions according to the his will and kill the target. However, in the appearance of the human, the skill level will be lowered by one. A new passive skill. SAE Gene's view was completely filled up with all these letters. There wasn't enough time to read every single one of them, but since he was sure of his strength increasing, he rapidly changed into the lycanthrope. Almost in an instant, Silver fur began sprouting out of his body the orc had vanished and in its place, a humanoid wolf stood there instead. Possessing fur and skin that seemed to have absorbed the pure moonlight, the lycanthrope. A being that should not have existed in this world an extinct creature of legends and myths. At this sudden entrance of a lycanthrope, all the vampires fell into a state of panic. Even the death knight paused its actions briefly at this sudden turn of events. Its action came from the undead possessing some consciousness, but that proved to be its biggest mistake. The wolf took this opening and kicked the ground, heading directly towards the vampires. It raised a tremendous sonic boom in its wake, which even forced the death knight to stumble on its feet. Arriving before the group of vampires in a flash, the wolf swung its lengthy claw. The five arcs of horrifying slashes drawing in the air descended down and ripped a vampire's chest wide open and then, they snaked around before cutting down the second, and the third vampire down. And so, when the fourth vampire got ruthlessly cut down, the death knight quickly arrived, collided with claws of the wolf and blocked his advance. Unfortunately for the undead, the wolf found its sword swings incredibly slow. He tilted his body slightly to the side to avoid the sword slash, and resumed moving towards another vampire. The BD tried to hurriedly erect a magic shield of some sort, but under the barrage of claws, such magic was simply too inadequate. SFX for blood raining down. The terrifying claws of the wolf easily passed through the shield and left a fatal wound on the vampire's chest. And the BD dropped dead, unable to even make a single cry. 
All of this happened within the span of five seconds. The lycanthrope had reaped the lives of five vampires in the blink of an eye while not even leaving behind an afterimage. The remaining vampires got deeply frightened by the sight of the lycanthrope, their race's sworn enemy which they had never seen before until now, and tried to escape. Too bad, the isolation barrier they had set up earlier came back to bite them in the rear. Sir. P, please, undo the barrier. It was the moment when these vampire bastards grandly fell into a trap they themselves had meticulously set up. Kjork. At the same time, a deep scarlet-colored flame erupted from the side of the isolation barrier, accompanied by a pitiful scream. Hazeline seized the opening created when the strength of the barrier weakened due to the deaths of the vampires, and launched a spell, Hellfire, which resulted in the death of yet another bloodsucker. This damnable. In the end, the Apostle deactivated the barrier and tried to run. Of course, S.A.E. Jean the lycanthrope would not accept that. Quajik. The moonlight colored wolf easily avoided the sword swings of the Death Knight with some deft evasive maneuvers, approached next to the Apostle, and then, thrust his fangs towards the neck of the vampire. S.H.T. The Apostle didn't lose his composure even while being under the attack of the wolf and fired off a beam of lightning towards S.A.E. Jean's open maw but the wolf lightly twisted his body. Instead of hitting the wide open mouth, the beam hit the shoulder however, the wolf's moonlight skin, could negate such a pitiful attack performed in a hurry with ease. Ignoring the ineffective attack, the wolf successfully ripped the apostle's neck to shreds. With his neck bone twisted around unnaturally, the apostle died in that instant, his body going limp. The isolation barrier completely broke apart as soon as one of the two apostles supporting it was killed off. All that now remained were two vampires and a death knight. The wolf glanced at the remaining vampires with its crimson eyes and licked its lips. T, this crazy, thing thing. They tried to invoke the vampire's trademark reverse summoning magic to escape from this place. However, the lycanthrope's claws could not only render any magic ineffective, those could also cut away the flow of mana as well. The wolf slashed out towards the vivid strands of deep red mana with his claws. In a blink of an eye, the mana that was about to spirit away the remaining vampires dissipated, and Hazeline fired off a huge mana spear towards the panicking bloodsucker. The apostle managed to slap away the spear using one of those tentacles, but. Oh. SHT. But, the brightly burning spear had divided into dozens, hundreds and covered up the entire night sky. Following the apostle's will, the death knight quickly changed its target towards Hazeline, but it was blocked by S.A.E. Jean in his wolf form. And then hundreds of mana spears pierced into the remaining three enemies. Tukwang. A destructive explosion rang out. A wizard highly proficient in casting magic can accurately assign the target that would bear all of the damage from the spell. That was how, Hazeline could turn the two vampires to ash without damaging the road or the surroundings. The last one remaining was the Death Knight. Clang. When the Death Knight's sword and S.A.E. Jean's claws clashed, a cold metallic sound resounded out alongside bright sparks that flew into the air. Oh my! What is this? You're still alive. Mr. S.A.E. Jean, please take of that knight for me. Hazeline. Hazeline was about to help S.A.E. Jean out, before she changed the direction of her gaze towards the Apostle who somehow managed to hold on to his life. It seemed that he had deployed a magic barrier or shield to its absolute maximum and was able to withstand the frightening explosion of mana spears, even if it was only by a little bit. Staring back at the bloodied and mortally injured apostle who was looking at her with hate-filled eyes, Hazeline began forming a chilling smile. It was as if she had found a nice little toy for herself. Got it. S.A.E. Jean. After making a simple reply, S.A.E. Jean activated the new skill, eyes of the wild, and glared at the death knight. Then, the whole world seemed to slow down to a crawl the view became black and white, except for the small area near the right chest of the death knight which was dyed in red. He knew instinctively that was this undead's weak point. Quahang. The death knight slashed down with its great sword. As soon as S.A.E. Jean took a few steps back to evade it, the place he was standing on just now became destroyed and sunk to the ground by that powerful attack. Looks like he was a pretty famous knight back when S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean licked his lips. 
this undead was proving to be a formidable foe. Even if he had located its weak spot, this thing's swordsmanship left no gap to exploit. Your proficiency level is too low. And even though he tried to enlarge the weak spot, as his skill level was just too low, he could not affect the body of the Death Knight at all. If that's the case, he shifted his focus to the great sword swung towards his way. The weapon reflected within the eyes of the wild showed no weakness and was jet black throughout. However, at the very spot his eyes were focused on, right in the middle of the blade itself, a reddish blot began to form there. With a wicked smile on his lips, S.A.E. Jean dodged the swinging sword and then, attacked the middle of the weapon with his claws. S.F.X. for something splitting apart. As per his expectations, a crack developed on the blade. The Death Knight stumbled back in confusion. But the wolf knew no mercy. He stepped forward explosively, and slashed out at the Death Knight's sword once more. And so, it turned out that, without the sword, this undead knight was nothing more than a pretty mediocre fist fighter. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. After the battle had ended. Hazeline cautiously called out to S.A.E. Jean who was busy rummaging through the dead bodies to procure the loot. But instead of a human's face, a wolf stared back at her. Under the clear moonlight, his fur was shining but his breath was somewhat ragged and heavy. Are you surprised? The wolf quietly asked. Hazeline lightly shook her head and slowly approached him. And then. What are you doing? S.A.E. Jean. She began tickling him around his neck area as one would a young puppy. Oh. Well, uh, your fur looked so beautiful, so wow, but why is your fur so shiny and smooth? It's like touching silk. Hazeline was definitely not shocked or frightened by his appearance. Feeling relieved by this development, S.A.E. Jean stared at the elf woman who was deeply absorbed in stroking his fur, before his eyes slowly closed shut. And. Ha. Huh. H, hey. E U ark. He then fell on top of Hazeline, totally unconscious. That was the after effect of using Warrior of Reversal three times twice as the orc, and once as the lycanthrope. Kim Sae Jean opened his eyes. His eyesight was incomparably clear and the world was filled with vibrant colors. He figured that his eyes of the wolf was active currently. Although he wanted to stay still like this, there was this ticklish sensation coming from his side. So, when he turned his neck to see why, he caught the sight of Hazeline, her lips tightly shut and protruding slightly, still unnecessarily absorbed in brushing his fur. Dumbfounded, S.A.E. Jean stared at her for a while. Even then, she repeated the cycle of brushing his fur, toyed around with it, and grabbing a handful of it until finally, she realized he was looking at her. He Hazeline. Avoiding meeting his gaze out of embarrassment, she scratched the back of her neck. What are you doing? S.A.E. Jean. Wheel, your fur is so smooth and supple and soft, so it feels really nice to the touch, you know. It improves my mood so much when I'm touching it. It's kinda like popping a bubble wrap. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean narrowed his eyes and lightly flung his tail to slap her cheek. It was nothing much, but unfortunately, it seemed that in his current wolf form, the attack power was twice as strong than normal. Kayak. Has a line. After that was dealt with, S.A.E. Jean reverted back to his human appearance and searched for a mirror. This place was quite foreign to him, though. Was it Hazeline's home, he wondered. Fuwu. Finding a full-length mirror, S.A.E. Jean stood at a weird angle next to it and began breathing in deeply. He muttered out, please, please, please. It's the same. You haven't changed. Hazeline. From his back, he heard Hazeline's spoiler. He got surprised by that revelation and turned to look at her, before taking a proper good look at himself as reflected by the mirror. Thankfully, there hadn't been any noticeable changes, if he disregarded the profile of his nose which had risen up a bit. Phew. What a relief. S.A.E. Jean smiled thickly, and lightly slapped both of his cheeks. I guess people might wonder if I had some work done on my face or something. S.A.E. Jean. As he began to speak in jest, Hazeline walked and stood next to him. The reflection of her showed just how incredibly beautiful she was. 
he just could not find any blemishes on her facial features whatsoever, even with the much improved eyesight of the lycanthrope. He he. I think so too. After all, you have become even more handsome than before. Hazeline. With her eyes arching into crescent moon shape, she studied S.A.E. Jean's reflection in the mirror. And then, she began lightly stroking his shoulders and whispered softly. I'm really, really thankful for your help yesterday. Without Mr. S.A.E. Jean there, I'd probably have died then. It was a simple, and somewhat short words of gratitude from her. However, his heart beat harder the moment he sensed how sincere she was from those words. Miss Hazeline, you're taller than I thought. That's why he quickly changed the topic. Hazeline always wore a lengthy robe that covered pretty much everything from the top of her head right down to her heels, so seeing her in regular casual wear, he couldn't help but appreciate her perfectly balanced figure. Well, elves are were mostly like that. The average height of female elves are around 170, so I'm just slightly taller than the rest, is all. Hazeline blushed slightly and retreated away from S.A.E. Jean. If that is all, I shall be heading off to work now. Oh, and I'll keep Mr. S.A.E. Jean's trait as a secret between us, so you don't have to worry. Thank you very much. She picked up the large robe discarded on the couch and put it on, then left her home looking exactly like as he'd known her until now. But before she left. Ah, right. Mr. S.A.E. Jean, I'm really sorry. Because of me, you had to go through that ordeal. To think those mafiosi would resort to learning black magic. However, it seemed that her misunderstanding had not been resolved yet until now. Chapter, 88 The changes in S.A.E. Jean's life after evolving into the lycanthrope was quite varied. Firstly, his outward appearance hadn't changed all that much, but the physical abilities had gone through a massive change. Although, having said that, maybe he had become too famous or something when he made his first public appearance there were quiet rumors of him having some work done on his face whispered around. As an example, he didn't have to assume the form of a wolf in order to twist metal with his bare hands, not to mention he could also cut away mana of the knights as well. And thanks to many new passives he acquired, both the orc and the goblin forms also enjoyed increase in power along with his human form. Notably, the synergy between the goblin form and the passive skills of the lycanthrope were so good, it led S.A.E. Jean to think seriously about leveling up his goblin form in earnest. However, not every change could be classified simply as a positive one. It was during training he got scared all of a sudden, watching E. Hyrin panic after he destroyed mana with a literal single fist strike. He was scared, wondering whether he would be able to suppress the instincts of the lycanthrope which were as strong as that power he had just demonstrated unwittingly. But it seemed that S.A.E. Jean's personality had changed subtly as well without him being able to notice it, and things like his worries were quickly forgotten. Thank you for your hard work today. He began massaging Yi Hyrin's shoulders as she sat on the training facility floor, her breath shallow and heavy. It was the first time she came in physical contact aka skinship with S.A.E. Jean, but since she did not sense any ulterior motive behind his actions, not to mention it felt refreshing as well, Yi Hyrin didn't offer any resistance. Oh. Yes, my pleasure. Although she replied this way, Hyrin could definitely sense a chilly glare being shot towards her. She didn't have to check to figure out who was behind it. Well then, Miss Hyrin. I'll be leaving first. Take care during the remainder of your training, and please give the recruitment process for the new society members your consideration. S.A.E. Jean Kim S.A.E. Jean had made a request to all the current society members. Separate from the soon-to-be launched second open recruitment, he told them to select people who might serve as their own direct subordinates within the society. Yes, sir. I'm looking real hard right now. E. Hai Rin replied enthusiastically. Actually, there were already one or two people busy trying to kiss her ass, after somehow hearing about this whole thing. Heck, there were a few knights with pretty good backgrounds asking her outright if she'd like any new piece of equipment, even. Since E. Hyrin focused more on a person's nature more than anything else, such behaviors made her feel just a bit bitter inside. But still, she accepted it as the result of her society's prestige rising up so high. Ah, right. By the way, Guildmaster, didn't you make a schedule for my tattoo a couple of weeks ago? 
she then suddenly recalled it. The special treatment only the members of the monster received. The magic tattoos the thing that made pretty much every other knights and wizards go crazy with envy and jealousy the thing that some folks criticized as being a cheat that didn't even require proper hard work from its recipients. Finally, it was E. Hiren's turn after others had their fun already. Surely, you didn't forget, did you? To get a rise out of you S. A. E. Young, E. Hiren deliberately approached S. A. E. Jean with flirty steps and began lightly touching him here and there. She could hear a person gritting her teeth from somewhere, but Hiren also lightly ignored that. Of course. I didn't forget. Please come find me on next week Saturday. S. A. E. Jean smiled and replied, then stepped outside the training facility. Not too long after that, USAE Young hoofed it towards Hyrin in an angry, stomping gait. Uni, are you openly declaring war? USAE Young. USAE Young narrowed her eyes and glared, but. Mm. Mm. Do know what you mean. E. Hyrin simply replied back with an easygoing smile. Since we have snagged such an important guest for today, I've got this feeling that our ratings will go right through the roof. A current affairs show could be seen on TV. Its format was quite simple in execution, so much so that there were only a few chairs present with a black background in the studio. The MC and the guest would simply chat away on the current hot button topics. But it would be unwise to dismiss this show because of its simplicity since it was known as the best of its kind in the Republic of Korea, after all. The number one society people wish to join. The number one society employees wish to work for. On top of this, entering the world of business proper with the establishment of the corporation, TM, please welcome the society chairman of the monster, Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. When the MC finished his intro, S.A.E. Jean inside the TV screen bowed his head towards the camera. How do you do? Name's Kim S.A.E. Jean. I gotta say, I'm greatly intrigued. Didn't you refuse making an appearance on pretty much every single show out there? Why did you agree so easily to come on this one? The MC's voice was seemingly filled to the brim with pride. Well, that is the reason simple, actually. I've been a fan of this show for a while now, and it seems that our society has been in the media spotlight quite often lately. So, I've decided to come here and scratch that itch of curiosity in the audience at home. Also, this was the most important part it turns out that your show has the shortest recording time compared to others. Kim S.A.E. Jean S.A.E. Jean's actual reason for this appearance was his own curiosity. After evolving into the lycanthrope, S.A.E. Jean had lost quite a bit of inhibition in his personality. And now, having a lot of leeway with his time, he was getting rather interested in appearing on a TV show. It just happened so that this one called him up first before anybody else. Ha! Huh. You have quite a good sense of humor, sir. It's true that we don't take up a lot of time to record, though. The show started with laughter, and gradually, they moved on to other subjects. First, they talked about his family background. Secondly, the reason why he founded the monster as well as its explosive growth of late. Thirdly, the allure. Of plastic surgery. And finally, even the thing many viewers were no doubt curious about the treasure, crafted by the orc blacksmith. Kim S.A.E. Jean seen on the TV screen showed not one moment of nervousness and smoothly carried on with the conversation. It was the moment the skill's eloquence and pleasant voice showed off their true worth. To think of himself in that manner was just a bit but the truth was, the combination of his nice voice, excellent eloquence, and the handsome face as seen on the TV screen made him come across as a gentle and wonderful man. As if to reinforce that notion, the show's ratings had increased by two and a half times. The reactions of the viewers were also very positive as well. And after making that one appearance, his social media followers had increased by another 200,000. If it was by this much, then, wasn't this the proof of everyone thinking along the same thing as him and not the case of simple narcissism? Guildmaster, the auction will begin in three hours. And so, as S.A.E. Jean was deeply submerged in narcissism that wasn't, Joe Hansung opened the door and entered the waiting room. He had combed his hair up to look neat and tidy for the occasion, but as if to show how nervous he was, his fingers were trembling noticeably. What's the current situation like? S.A.E. Jean. Ha ha. 
It's no joke out there, sir. Maybe it's the first auctioning of a treasure-grade item in ages that's to blame, but regardless, I heard that there are ten helicopters flying above the Highenwall auction house as we speak. There were apparently more, but it seems that, due to safety concerns, they had to be grounded. Joe Hansung changed the channel on the TV, saying that SAE Jean should see for himself. Right now, it was Saturday evening according to regular schedule, entertainment programs should be on the public broadcasting channels, but almost all of them were covering the auction being held at the Highenwall. At 8 o'clock this evening, the auctioning process for the heaven-shaking work crafted by the Orc blacksmith will finally take place. The weapon that was unanimously judged as the genuine treasure grade by ten judges from both the local and international blacksmith associations, is now named as The Highenwall Auction House as seen within the TV screen looked really busy. There were seemingly tens of thousands of regular people gathering around the vicinity of the Sebet Island where the auction house was located on and the professional bodyguards were working tirelessly as the stream of high-value individuals continued to enter the auction venue unabated. Indeed. We can even see that the Britain's top-ranked knight, Arthur Fontra has come as well. Previously, Mr. Fontra had strongly expressed his determination to procure this treasure on his social media posts as well as on interviews with various Korean media outlets. It's a well-known fact that he has sent numerous video messages to both the chairman Kim Sae Jean and the Orc Blacks Me Oh. Oh. Over there. We just spotted the Prime Minister of Japan, Mr. Naraka, entering the auction venue. The cameras filmed the Japanese Prime Minister entering the auction venue in a hurry as if someone was busy chasing him down or something. Kim Saejin let out a hollow chuckle. That guy had shown up in the end, after all that yapping on and on about some national pride and whether he was coming or not. I hear that the Japanese Prime Minister is personally accompanied by twenty-odd knights as well. And they are all supposedly highest tiers to boot. I think the Japanese and their strong desire to acquire the merchandise is now on the national level. No matter how valuable an equipment was, if there was no one capable of using it, it would be a waste of everyone's time. Also, if a knight didn't become its new owner, there was a real danger of the sword becoming the part of the so-called future investment portfolio and rot away in some dimly lit vault somewhere. That was why SAE Jean placed a condition for purchase. The only ones eligible to buy the weapon were knights and even among them, those without ability would be eliminated from the process through the orc's evaluation. Really? S.A.E. Jean. Yes, sir. But besides that you should be getting ready, sir. Joe Hansung fiddled around the edges of his tie once more before taking in a deep breath. However, Kim S.A.E. Jean simply waited, while his gaze alternated between his phone and Hansung and after about three minutes went by like that. SFX for a mobile phone vibrating. His mobile began buzzing. Oh. Well, I, uh, will have to show up a bit later. I mean, our merchandise is the finale of the auction, anyway. SAE Jean. Leaving behind the panicking Joe Hansung, SAE Jean hurriedly moved his feet. The call was from Ubek Song. The very best timing for sharing of sensitive information was right now, when almost all the agents of the SID were assigned as the guards of the auction venue. Feeling dumbfounded, Kim Sae Jean's eyes narrowed to a slit. That is absolutely the everything I could uncover. Any more than that, well you Beksong. You Beksong pointed at the manila envelope with a slightly uneasy expression. But that wasn't the reason why Sae Jean was feeling miffed at the moment. Hey. What the hell? Do I look like a criminal to you? Although they were in Yu Beksong's house, there was a thick plate glass standing between him and her, the kind one might find in a visiting room inside a prison. No, that was not strictly accurate, as there were air holes in those glasses in the visiting room. This place was sealed up so tight, they were actually conversing through their mobile phones. Can't be helped. Your scent robs me of my judgment, after all. Fool. In any case, check out the documents first. S.A.E. Jean was deeply dissatisfied by this arrangement, but regardless, he still picked up the envelope. The contents are the results of secret autopsy procedures performed by us, the National Police Agency. I even went through the last available records to make sure, but that's all there is. He slowly absorbed the contents of the documents. 
There wasn't a lot of information to go through only three pages worth. But he did his best not to miss one single letter. And the information contained within was shocking to him, to say the least. Kim Jae-hyuk. Savagely murdered by vampires while returning home after completing his duties, his corpse ripped apart. The case is now classified as a homicide with grudge suspected of being the motive after the blood of the victim was found largely untouched within the body. The rest of the information has been erased. Analysis of Kim Jae-hyuk's blood content reveals that only 88% of it is human-based one of his ancestors is suspected to be non-human. Jean So-young. Requested for witness protection program from the SID. Her whereabouts were leaked, resulting in her rape murder by vampires. Eyewitness testimony indicates the victim was seen talking to an unknown male for a considerable length of time. The contents of the conversation is suspected to be in relation to her son. After the recovery of the influential House of Bathory symbol at the crime scene, the prime suspect is now seen as a vampire from the Bathory family. All information deleted. Something was trying to force its way out of his throat and he couldn't even swallow down his saliva. I'm sure there is much to take in. The result of the autopsy shows that, although he was a bit peculiar, your father was a human. After all, it's a bit of a stretch to call an 88% as a halfling or a quarterling, right? And since your mother was definitely human, you don't have worry about what you are you're also human. Yu Bek Song carefully continued. However, not one word could enter S.A.E. Jean's ears. He rummaged through the documents for a very long time, his hands trembling uncontrollably then he stopped. His breathing ragged and heavy, S.A.E. Jean stared at Yu Bek Song. His eyes were full of confusion and rage. Is there no other way to find out what got deleted? Those should be the most important information of them all. Yeah, well, it's impossible right now. That is the limit of my current position, after all. Your position, you say? Yeah. I told you. I have other people above me. In that case. Kim Sae Jean clenched his fist tightly. He was already well aware of his parents being murdered. But he simply had no idea how incredibly bad and agonizing their final moments were. He just could not reign in this tsunami-like waves of rage boiling in his heart. So much so, even he was beginning to think that such an anger was unusual for him. There probably was a side effect from evolving into the lycanthrope at play here, but right now, S.A.E. Jean was not in the correct frame of mind to question his current state at all. H. Hey, wait a second. What are you trying to do? S.T.O. He slammed the glass with his fist. Kwa Hang. The ultra-tough reinforced glass shattered into pieces, and Yu Bek Song looked at the result with her eyes completely round. She was wondering just how the heck the glass reinforced with magic could be breached this easily. In that case, all we have to do is to move Miss Yu Bek Song up the career ladder, no? S.A.E. Jean ripped the bothersome glass completely off, and then grasped the scruff of hurriedly fleeing Yu Bek Song's neck. Yuk. The, that isn't a simple thing at all. But besides that, let me go, right now. I can send you straight to jail if I want to, you know. For now, please be quiet. The only thing filling up S.A.E. Jean's head, now that he had lost much of his reasoning, was purest form of rage. It is simple. I'll support you. I've accumulated enough power and influence for that. His voice was trembling as the words flowed out. No matter who sits above you, push him away and take that position. Then, everything shall be resolved that way. While gently stroking her hair, the corners of his lips were lifting up in a fake smile. His brown eyes were gleaming coldly, enough to give a person goosebumps. Yu Bek Song gave up looking into those eyes. Her body was shaking all on by itself. It was the first time this white tiger had felt like this the sensation of being a prey standing before a true predator. Chapter 89 Within the VVIP hall of the Hyenwall Auction House, hundreds of important figures had gathered. They were the kind of people that held prominent positions in their chosen field of profession. Nominally, only the knights could potentially purchase the treasure-grade weapon, but there were quite a few people participating as a representative of other knights in order to build personal connections as well as to broaden their horizons. That was probably why there was such a diverse melting pot of people that ignored race, 
nationality, and species within the auction venue, where knights. Big shots from the world of politics and commerce as well as mega-celebrities the likes of which South Koreans had never experienced before were busy rubbing shoulders currently. But all these men and women of great fame were looking for one man's whereabouts in particular. And that person was Kim Sae Jin. Why isn't he coming? As the auction went underway, a worried USAE Young repeatedly looked around while asking Jo Han Sung. For some strange reason, she seemed to be shrinking away like a loser which was quite unlike her usual proud and confident self. Even I'm not well, he did say he'll come before the finale, but he also mentioned not to wait for him. Fool. S.A. Young let out a sigh. However, it was closer to a relieved sigh rather than a worried one. In all honesty, she was feeling quite worried. Currently, there were just way too many elves and fox-type suins who were famous the world over for their blinding, transcendent beauty everywhere she looked within this venue. And they were the reason why USAE Young had lost all of her usual confidence. She felt that, compared to those women, she seemed to be lacking in so many areas. Why did her face have to be so angular, and why were her legs so short? For the first time in her life, she began to feel resentment towards her dad. He's coming for sure, you'll see. Don't you worry. Ju Ji Hyuk. Ju Ji Hyuk, still clueless, tried to comfort her unnecessarily. Sae Young nodded her head lightly, pulled out her phone and then began typing a text message. The recipient was Sae Jean Appa. Dot. Only his name had the honor of having an emoticon next to it, among hundreds saved in her list of contacts. Appa, we will take very good care of the auction, so if there's something urgent going on, you don't have force yourself to come. And just as she hit send. Finally. We shall commence with the last lot of the auction, the one all you've been looking forward to. As the MC's loud voice settled down heavily on the auction venue, the orc blacksmith's masterpiece revealed itself to the world. The treasure, wrapped tightly in a thick veil, was moved to the center of the hall. The collective sounds of people swallowing their saliva echoed around the venue. The one that will go down in the annals of history. I present to you, the true treasure crafted by the brilliant orc blacksmith, the Sword Graham. TL, just in case some of you readers are not familiar with Norse mythology, Graham is the name of the sword wielded by Sigurd to slay the dragon, Fafnir. Google is your friend. Yes. A chaos broke out in the auction hall when it was revealed that the blacksmith dared to pilfer the name of the legendary artifact for his own creation. According to the blacksmith himself, he tried his very best to replicate the gram of the legends as exactly as possible. The moment MC pulled the veil off the sword, all that doubt and dissatisfaction morphed into admiration and amazement. Some knights couldn't sit still anymore and shot up from their seats, even. The lengthy, pure white mithril blade the hilt shining with an exquisite golden hue the sword that boasted a smooth and neat appearance, the gram reflected the lights from the venue to a blinding level. The now trademark symbol of the orc blacksmith the intricate carvings was absent on its exterior, making it look a bit plain, but all the knights gathered here instinctively knew. That truly was one of the greatest treasures the world have seen yet. And so, the auction will commence from now on. The starting bidding amount will be set at four. 5 million US dollars. The minimum increase will be 100,000 US dollars. Just as the MC announced this. Suddenly, the entrance to the auction hall opened. And the man who showed up from the opened gap was, without a doubt, the protagonist of this auction Kim Sae Jean himself. Looking bashful for his interruption, he quickly moved his feet and went towards his assigned seat. Of course, people wouldn't let him go by just like that. Every single one of them tried their best to engage Sae Jean in a conversation, and so, the start of the auction had to be delayed for another 20 minutes. The auction for the final item lasted for over two hours. The final hammer price was 165 million US dollars. No matter how steep the competition for it was, it truly was a ridiculous amount. TL, holy cow. That's like, an operating budget of a medium-sized Formula One team. For the whole year, no less. And the lucky bidder was. The Raven Knight's order, succeeds in finally bidding for the sword with 165 million. The uncomfortable backstory the Korean government decides to support the Raven Order. Is the Dawn Order being suppressed? 
The sword Graham, the man who reenacted the legend, the orc blacksmith is already one of the greats. It was the Raven Knight's order in other words, the Republic of Korea. Considering that it was a treasure grade item, the final bid price was slightly on the low side, but this result was somewhat within expectations. TL, eh? But you just wrote it was a ridiculous amount. Make up your mind, Mr. Author. If an overseas entity were to snap up this sword, then the real amount they would have to pay at the end of it all, would be 45 times the bidding price, thanks to special tariffs applicable to luxury goods, special tax ascribed from the special law. Value-added tax, etc., etc. Not to forget, one had to also consider policies of the Hyenwall Auction House, the ones about having to pay the entire amount in cash and keeping to a strict payment time schedule. Dot. All those representatives of nations and knights orders hoping against hoping had to return home satisfied in the knowledge that they were able to personally witness a treasure-grade sword with their own eyes. Many international media expressed their dissatisfaction and regret at the Korean government openly supporting one of their own the criticism was especially harsh from the Japanese, as they were the ones who had bidded till the bitter end. However, even then, what dominated the international headlines was not dissatisfaction, but the beautiful exterior of the treasure-graded sword, Graham. That pure white blade and that perfectly manufactured hilt. And contained within that relatively simple appearance, the power matching up to its legendary namesake. After making the hearts of every knight flutter with nothing but its name and a single photo, Graham easily took the position of 30th out of 100 best weapons in existence as voted by the Time magazine. And the orc blacksmith was admitted to the ranks of the world's greatest blacksmiths. And then, the Raven Knight's Order decided to award the sword Graham to its current order master, Kim Hyun Suk, as a loan lasting for the period of 10 years. The ceremony was broadcast live and caused quite a stir among the populace. In the end, it was a sort of victory for both the Korean government as they didn't let their treasure taken away, and for the orc blacksmith with his fame now spreading to the rest of the world. However, now that the orc blacksmith had suddenly become a hot topic of conversation, a strange and nonsensical rumor about his real identity also began circulating around, one where it was alleged that Kim Sae Jin was actually the orc all along. While the entirety of the Korean peninsula was still rumbling on from the excitement of the auction, Kim Sae Jin had to answer an emergency summons from the Monster Mercenary Company before he could come down from all that euphoria. We finally come across the information on the hotel where the vampires I've mentioned before are staying currently. Kim Yu Son. With 130 intelligence operatives and 50 field agents aka mercenaries, SAE Jeans Company now boasted a better information gathering network than most underground organizations. On the amount of secrets he knew alone, he had already surpassed most media outlets by now. The hotel is called Romance of Dawn. Not only were the strange happenings occurring on the building's top floors clearly been observed, the angry voices of a woman and traces of magic being used were recorded in the security systems installed on the corridors. Kim Yu Son. Then, just who exactly is staying there? We suspect it to be a Bathory. In that instant, killing intent flickered in SAE Jean's eyes, his fists clenching tightly. Even if it was sudden, the name Bathory was already deeply ingrained in his psyche. The cops did find a symbol of Bathory at the crime scene of his mother's death, after all. Finally, he had found the place these bastards were hiding in. So, this could be unexpectedly easy for. No, sir. Bathory's powers are far too great for us to do anything at the moment. The rumors speak of the Bathory family head possessing enough power to level a mountain with a flick of a hand and dye the sky jet black. That means, even without all that exaggeration, this prey is an incredibly powerful foe. Kim Yu Son. However, Kim Yu Son put an end to Sae Jin's thought process. I have fought against countless vampires, so I can confidently say this much the hidden strength accumulated through the passing of vampiric bloodlines is simply beyond our scope of imagination. Kim Yu Son. What Kim Yu Son was saying, was that they should be satisfied with just knowing where the vampires were and wait for the right opportunity. Is the BD really that strong? Yes. It's possible that the family head alone could equal a single knight's order. After all, these are the creatures that have sacrificed their own race's leader in pursuit of power. TL, I've no idea where this one's coming from. 
I've TL'd the line literally. Kim Sae Jin could only nod his head as this was a considered opinion from a veteran who had fought against vampires for over half of his life. Foo. Then, let's just head to the basement for now. Oh, right. Did you make sure to secure all the access points? Of course, sir. Let us hurry. The kids have grown so much lately. Sae Jin was currently in his goblin form. However, his current location was a bit unusual. It was not the usual monster field, but the basement located below the grounds of the society, the monster. Around three weeks ago, Sae Jin ordered Kim Yusone to open up a space in the basement. Of course, since the purpose of this space was not something that could be explained to the public, even the members of his society had to be kept in the dark as well. There was a variety of uses for this basement area, but the most prominent one was the village of goblins. As of now, monsters known as goblins were facing extinction in Korea. The only reason why such weak monsters were able to survive in the first place was because they had formed large packs but then, the distortion of the earth's crust happened and these creatures ended up getting separated from one another. And so, Sae Jin began taking in those goblins that had nowhere left to go, and just like his actions as the hero orc, he decided to take care of these critters as well. Besides, quite unlike those orcs who were only good for fighting, goblins had much more value to offer overall. Well, the old saying goblins are craftier than humans didn't come out of nothing, after all. First of all, if these monsters took care of crafting potions, then he'd not have to waste his precious time on doing that anymore, and as far as their witchcraft was concerned, the potential application for them was just too numerous to count. That was, as long as they leveled up properly, of course. Nice. They are quite obedient, aren't they? These creatures were pretty quick on the uptake. They were hard workers and were easy to educate as well. Well, he did threaten them a bit while in the lycanthrope form so there was that but still, they displayed unexpected amount of loyalty and honesty. Keep on making those potions as I showed you, got it? And witchcraft goblins continue on with your research. Kim Sae Jin shouted out at the goblins. They replied back with their own shouts of Kayahawk. Is it because of the good welfare benefits? They unexpectedly work so hard, said Kim Yusone, with a smile on his face. Although it was weird to say welfare benefits for monsters, it was actually happening right here. The goblins living in this place were blessed with humane living quarters, and received clean food and drinking water three times a day. The food was leftovers from the society's cafeteria, though. Well, besides that how goes the gathering of information so far? Changing back to the appearance of a human before anyone had noticed it, Sae Jean asked Kim Yusong. Sir. It seems that Miss Yubeksong's immediate superior is the minister in charge of Bureau of Monster Affairs, Kim Han Seol. As he had served as the former chief of national police, his martial prowess is considerable, and he also has many personal connections, such as members of parliament, an executive director in the Dawn Corporation, etc., etc. He is your typical ambitious, driven man. Oh, really? Kim Sae Jin fell into a thought, while scratching his chin. And exactly ten seconds later, his phone vibrated. He narrowed his brows and checked out who the caller was it was Joe Hansung. Hello. Guild Master, it's Joe Hansung. We just received a request for a meeting with a government's representative over the matter of the guild registration. And he's a minister, as well. Kiam okay, what's his name? Sae Jean couldn't help but feel rather emotional at the fact that from being an orphan, he had climbed up in the societal ladder to enjoy a private meeting with a government minister. But such an emotion only lasted for a brief moment. He's called Kim Han Seol, the minister in charge of Bureau of Monster Affairs. Oh. Well, I got it. Please inform the other party that I'd like to meet him as soon as possible. Yes, sir. I understand. Sae Jean ended the call. What's the matter, sir? Kim Yusone asked from the side. Just now, a reason to meet up with that minister just came around. Looks like I'll be able to properly check out what kind of man he is. Sae Jean smiled thickly and replied. The following day. As usual, Sae Jean headed off to the monster field. 
The first thing he did was to change into the hero orc form and went to the village to see what was what. The number of the orcs living there had increased to three digits, and judging by the fact that the two real, leader orc jaguars had seemingly leveled up to orc great warriors somehow. It was clear there was no longer a need for him to worry about their survival anymore. Feeling relieved, he then headed towards the upper mid-tier hunting ground. He then quickly began searching for monsters to smash. But during all that, he ended up running into a rather bothersome individual. Actually, he was the one who went to see them first. It was Kim Yurin. And she was currently with an unknown man. From what he could overhear from the distance, this man's name was definitely Kim Han Seol. Although they were scheduled to meet in three days' time, it wouldn't be so bad to see what this guy's attitude and personality were like beforehand. Chapter 90 The Man Named Kim Han Seol. His story was like this three years before graduating from the university, he joined the Special Investigation Division. He was 21. Blessed with a certain trait, good ability, and keen street smarts, he earned the trust of the then chief of the SID and saw a meteoric rise in his career. But in his fifth year with the organization, he was implicated in a rather ugly scandal and was fired as a result. However, for the next two years, he resolved the matter with his own two hands and made a triumphant return to the fold. Then, for the next eight years, he climbed up the ladder within the SID and became its chief. Even now, well after he had retired from the post, this man still lorded over the National Police Agency as its most powerful figure. Today was the first time Kim Sae Jin met this man face to face. Han Seol's face looked quite young, Sae Jin had heard that this man's actual age was in the late forties but he looked in his early thirties, instead. His colors aren't so bad. Both the hues of his eyes, and the aura coming off of him didn't lean particularly towards any side which meant he was neutral. Quite frankly, Sae Jean was taken aback by this revelation after all, he had been under the intense grip of this expectation. Where the person responsible for erasing all evidence of his parents' murders would turn out to be the most dastardly villain out there. In any case. I hope you're carrying out my orders well. Yes, I am. You don't have to worry. Him and Kim Yurin were talking about an unknown topic. Kim Han Seol looked energetic, but she seemed burdened by something weighty. Indeed. But there is no need for you to be that diligent. After all, it is. Sensing a presence nearby, Han Seol stopped his words and turned towards Sae Jin's direction. And as soon as confirming that presence was an orc, he unsheathed a short sword mounted on his hips. However, Kim Yurin quickly stopped him. Plus, she was gripping Han Seol's arm strong enough to send him into a bit of panic as well. What, what are you doing? Kim Han Seol. That's the hero orc. Kim Yurin. But that doesn't mean it won't fight humans, correct? Please withdraw your weapon as I'll be the one to resolve this. Kim Yurin was coldly adamant with her words, and Han Seol had no choice but to do as she said. She then observed the mood of the orc that simply stood there staring at the two of them, before lightly pushing Kim Han Seol away. Excuse me, since we hunted for a while now, how about calling it a day and head home first, alone? It might get a little tougher for you from here onwards. I'll take care of the orc. Ha. Huh. But it's only been thirty minutes. I still have more than enough energy left. Kim Han Seol. No. Please go. Kim Han Seol was dumbfounded at her sudden stubbornness, but in the end, nodded his head in understanding. Well, if you insist that much. But regardless, consider deeply what I've told you before. It's important that you do. With those parting words, Han Seol left the area. The orc's eyes chased after the escaping man's back. It's been a while. After Kim Han Seol had completely left the vicinity, Kim Yurin approached the orc while her hands were carefully gathered in front of her chest. Seeing this, the orc fell into a slight dilemma, should he just leave, or ask her what she and Han Seol were talking about. But to do the latter as an orc, that made little sense. So, the orc wordlessly turned around to leave, and that made Yurin to hurriedly reach out and grab hold of his arm. W, W, wait. Please stay still for a second. Let's, let's talk. 
Unfortunately for her, the orc didn't stop moving. And she continued to plead with him, asking him to stop all the while he dragged her around. Kim Wai. Yurin stubbornly followed him around. But she maintained a respectful distance to make sure the orc wouldn't feel uncomfortable. When he stopped walking, she stopped too, and when he moved, she did the same. Maybe it was because she hadn't seen him in over a month, although she was just following the orc around without saying a single word, a gentle smile was visible on Kim Yurin's lips. But suddenly, the orc stopped and turned around to look at her. Yurin didn't panic and met his gaze. Why meet that man? S.A.E. Jean the Orc. Ah. Oh, that. It's because of my work. There really aren't any other reasons. She began to feel happy for some weird reason when the Orc asked her a question. No, not that, but what work? S.A.E. Jean the Orc. But the Orc seemed too unwilling to let go. At this turn of events, Kim Yurin's head initially tilted to the side, before both the corners of her eyes and lips rose up in a naughty smile. Why should I tell you about that? And besides, why would an orc ask about such a thing? She came to stand before the orc, her hips swaying from side to side. The orc seemed unhappy at the fact that she was trying to match up to him and his mouth was resolutely closed shut. Can be curious. Orcs, like to know things. S.A.E. Jean the orc. Hmm. If that's the case, once every week, would you like to spar with me? Spar. Yep. It's not what you think, but simply to improve our abilities at the same time. For you, the leader of the orc tribe, and for me, a leader who will have to oversee a knight's order. Then you tell me why. Yurin thought about this for a second before energetically nodding her head. Although it was classified information, the jealous... Orc in front of her was a monster, after all. Yep. Fine. Since he wanted to strengthen the orc form anyways, there was no loss for S.A.E. Jean either way in this arrangement as well. So then, next week. No, I mean, when the sun goes down and comes back up seven times, no, wait, five times, I'll come see you at your house. Okay. Fine. Then you tell why. I'll tell you the reason later after we finish our first sparring together. Before he could do anything, Yurin quickly ran away. In her mind, she was thinking of making the orc sit tight and wait around nervously. The orc simply gazed at her disappearing back with dumbfounded eyes. After parting ways with Kim Yurin, S.A.E. Jean returned home only to deal with another visitor. This time, it was Hazeline. She came to his house while bearing a gift. Her misunderstanding from that event hadn't been cleared yet, and she simply wanted to say thanks for his timely aid, S.A.E. Jean thought that if he told her the truth. It'd be the same as dragging her into this conflict he had with the vampires, so in the end, he chose not to clear the air up. Ahem. Um, you are watching yet another repeat broadcast of yourself on TV. Hazeline. Sitting down on the living room's couch, Hazeline pointed at the TV and spoke. So, S.A.E. Jean quickly switched the channel. Ha, ha. I don't have any other hobbies beside this one, so. Really? But why did you change the channel? Why don't we watch it together? Isn't it more enjoyable sharing your hobby with someone else? Hazeline then snatched away the remote from S.A.E. Jean's hand and changed the channel again. Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean, this is not funny anymore, you know. The growth of the monster is. A talk show where the participants were gathered into one location and were told to converse was being broadcast on TV. Originally, one needed to be of an extraordinary background in order to appear alone, but S.A.E. Jean was doing exactly that, occupying the guest's table all by himself. Wow. Mr. S.A.E. Jean seems to have become this generation's top celebrity, no? Has a line. Please stop teasing me. Oops. Busted. Initially, she only changed the channel to poke fun at him, but gradually, she too got absorbed in the show as well. S.A.E. Jean's handsome face, now accentuated with makeup, just loved the attention from the overhead spotlights and the cameras. His funny and friendly eloquence was charming as well also, there were those muscles that peeked out from the gaps of his clothing every now and then, too. What the, it's already finished. Has a line. 
The final comments from the MC was coming out of the TV, meaning, she wasn't even aware of the passage of time and had dazedly smiled through the whole show. Wow. Mr. SAE Jean, so that's how you became the number one real-time search topic. Now I get it. As expected of a devilishly charming man, someone voted as the number one ideal man by the female knights. Hazeline nodded her head in deliberate showing of her understanding. A uh, number one ideal man? What on earth is that now? S.A.E. Jean. You didn't know. You've been voted as the top pick for the last three months in a row in a famous magazine for nights. Cough. Feeling embarrassed somewhat, S.A.E. Jean scratched the back of his neck while a grin he couldn't disguise broke out on his lips. Ho hot. You are so adorable. Although, I gotta say, you can feel less happy now since it's the top pick not in the looks department but regarding your abilities. After all, you can find plenty of beautiful male elf knights out there. Has a line. But, well, I knew that already. S.A.E. Jean. Ha ha. Is that so? Oh, right. This is a present. Hazeline giggled at him while her eyes were narrowed to a slit, before pulling out a small package from her bag. While sipping his tea, S.A.E. Jean accepted it. It's an artifact. Hazeline. An artifact? Yes. And its effect is to strongly suppress sexual desires. S.A.E. Jean came this close to spilling out the tea in his mouth. Cough. But why so out of the blue? I saw that you've been ordering a lot of ingredients required for that lust-suppressing potion lately. I thought you were really troubled by the whole thing, though. S.A.E. Jean opened the lid on the box. He found a simple-looking artifact styled to look like a bracelet inside. Ingesting lots of potions isn't so good for your body. So, instead, please wear this. Its effect is. Well, I'm sure the potions Mr. S.A.E. Jean makes are superior, but still. She personally fitted the bracelet on S.A.E. Jean's wrist. Its color resembled Hazeline's skin tone, pure white. Will this thing take care of my problem? To a point. But that doesn't mean I'll be the one to take care of the rest, you know. Hazeline passed off an odd joke to him. However, now that he had evolved into the lycanthrope, even a passing mention was enough to give S.A.E. Jean a huge stimulus. His body trembled noticeably for a moment or two before he let out a deliberately relaxed smile and shook his head. Ha, ha ha. Thank you for your help. Don't mention it. I've received a lot more from you, after all. Hazeline laughed genially and got up from her seat. Well then, I should get going now. Oh, right. Take care. S.A.E. Jean got up as well to see her to the door. I'll talk to you later. Putting her high heels back on, Hazeline lightly tapped on his broad shoulders and left through the front door. S.A.E. Jean was smiling in satisfaction as he watched her back. As expected, even her posterior was as eye-catching as her front. SFX for a mobile phone vibrating. Right on cue, his phone began vibrating. USAE Young had sent him a message. The contents of her message were so affectionate that it ended up making SAE Jean feel guilty for some unfathomable reason. During the night with a full moon brightening the sky. The lycanthrope's instincts proved to be incredibly difficult to contain. Doubts of him being no longer a human visited him in the middle of several nights as well. Every time that happened, his rage surged and he just couldn't remain still. So, he began roaming around outside. Changing into the appearance of the wolf, he jumped across the rooftops of tall skyscrapers while bathed in the moonlight. The leg strength of this wolf form was so great that he could easily leap over a ten-story building with single jump. And during his speedy dash across the skyline while being bombarded by the harsh night air streaming past his skin, his blues seemed to dissipate, at least for a bit. Most likely, he'd not remember what he was doing right now, come the following morning. But it did not matter at all in this moment. Fua. Before he knew it, S.A.E. Jean found himself arriving on top of a very tall building. As he stood there, drinking the cold air in this high place, some of his burning instincts had cooled down somewhat. Where is this place? While scratching the top of his head with the claws that were harder than mithril, S.A.E. Jean walked towards the roof railings. When he looked over, 
he could see nothing but deep darkness by the empty roadway, way down below. However, the silver streaks from the neon-lit letters still managed to pierce the gloomy darkness. Romance of Dawn This was the hotel where the Bathory's were staying currently. S.A.E. Jean momentarily freaked out. Did he subconsciously utilize the information gained while he was conscious? But there wasn't enough time for him to leisurely figure this out. After all, he had sensed several presences just beyond the metal access door to the roof. He was about to quickly get the hell out of there, but then, S.A.E. Jean stopped moving. There were at least ten of them behind the door, but well, none of them were strong enough to truly cause him any meaningful issues. I can use dark energy link here. He stared at the metal door while thinking about the available skill sets he could use. If he just captured one of them alive, couldn't he be able to extract valuable information on these vampire bastards? Kawa Wong The metal door to the roof flung open with a loud bang. What the? Ten henchmen hurriedly checked the situation on the roof to find the unknown creature that had allegedly breached the barrier. Maybe it was a bird or something. When one of the henchmen spoke to an apostle of his suspicion, the moonlight brightening the area suddenly wavered. It was as if the moon itself was trying to illuminate the hidden figure. Who goes there? The apostle shouted out. And at the same time, terrifying claws cut through one of the goons while drawing eerie lines in the air. It was just one attack, but then, those claws flowed around like as if they were being pulled along by chains and locked onto another vampire nearby. Kuahahak. Yuhak. In the blink of an eye, nine screams soared high into the sky. Watching all of his subordinates perish, the apostle panicked and opened his eyes ultra-wide. And finally, he spotted a certain creature standing there, reflecting the moonlight. Haya. A pair of silver eyes, and the wild mane that was the same color as the moon the protruding maws of a beast and incomparably sharp, piercing eye line and that smooth and supple fur, this beast that could talk, it could only be. This appearance was the most terrifying thing this vampire had seen. In the end, he fainted where he stood while showing the whites of his eyes and bubbles foaming out of his mouth. Chapter, 91 The ranks of vampires were divided into six. From, slave commoner henchman believer apostle and finally, the elder. And to clarify further, the rank of slaves wasn't filled by vampires. This was the class consisting of those non-vampire races under the spell of charmed magic. In other words, they were literally slaves under the beck and call of the vampires. On the other hand, a vampire had to be at least of the rank of foot soldier henchmen in order to be treated as a real fighting force the ones in this rank possessed combat prowess equal to that of low mid to mid tier knights or CD ranked wizards. From here onwards, every elevation in rank corresponded with the hike in power equal to that of knights tiers. So, at the level of an apostle, it was at least around the mid-high tier knights or the wizards with rankings around A. However if one was only strong at performing magic but not so much in physical abilities, then that person was as good as a sitting duck for the lycanthrope. That was the case with the apostle S.A.E. Jean had captured alive just now, when this guy was compared to the other apostles that attacked him and Hazeline a few days ago. The name of this poor apostle he caught was Rosradel. T.L., as he was still too young, the powers of his bloodline hadn't fully manifested yet, and thus his strength was no better than that of a believer. It's the truth. Ross Riddle. At least, according to his own mouth, that was. Well then, is that all the info you know? S.A.E. Jean the Leakin. Yes, yes. Besides the stuff already revealed to the world, and the fact that Bathory is jumping around in anger, that's all I know, I swear, ha hark. You a hark. A hack. The ever so talkative apostle began screaming his head off utterly frightened as soon as S.A.E. Jean pressed his face closer. This reaction was quite funny, so S.A.E. Jean let out a light chuckle that sounded like a threatening growl. Kehek, Kisek. Because of that, though, foams bubbled up from the corners of the vampire's mouth as if he was about to faint again. S.A.E. Jean was a bit miffed about this, thinking, is the wolf's appearance that scary? I thought I looked pretty good, especially among other wolves. Hmm. Stepping back, S.A.E. Jean lightly scratched the fur on his chest with his claws while falling into a deep thought. 
he had already finished establishing the dark energy link between himself and this vampire. Since all his skills increased in proficiency levels after his evolution to the lycanthrope, if he went around this smartly, couldn't he be able to insert a mole within the vampire's ranks? Oh, yeah. Isn't it possible to identify those slaves, normal people under the charm magic or whatever? S.A.E. Jean the Lycan. He thought of this just now. This was the one of the main reasons why vampires could exert enormous influence in the world, despite their numbers being low. Although this terrified guy did tell him that a full-fledged apostle could control up to five slaves with will, he still hadn't mentioned how big the scale of this whole thing was yet. H. Huh. I, I don't know yet, who controls which slave I haven't talked to many other apostles because I'm still too young. You don't even know your own slaves. No. No 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 no. Of course I know who they are. I can tell you all you want to know, of course. Was it because this fool was still immature? His somewhat honest attitude even took S.A.E. Gina back greatly. It was as if there was no need to even do the whole dark energy link thing at all. There are only three people under me. An entertainer named Oh Yun Hui, an assistant prosecutor for the Seoul metropolitan area, Kim Soo Ho, and finally, Yuk So Han, a recently elected member of the National Assembly. But when this apostle told him of the type of people that was under his charm spell, S.A.E. Jean couldn't help but be astonished. To think that someone like Oh Yun Hui, who was considered as the top actress in South Korea was a slave, not to mention. A prosecutor who was in direct contact with the centers of political power, as well as a member of the National Assembly, too. Didn't this mean, S.A.E. Jean now had influence on those three, too? At this unexpected bonus, S.A.E. Jean's lips quivered in happiness. Come. You only use big shots like them as slaves. Oh, no, no, no. My luck was on the better side. I charmed them before they became famous and then I quietly supported them within my means. They climbed up to where they are by their own hands. That was quite an acceptable answer. How interesting. However since I got what I wanted, you no longer have any uses for me. S.A.E. Jean the Lycanthrope S.A.E. Jean deliberately made an eerie smile and opened his palm wide. His hand, which was twice the size of the vampire's head, drew a threatening shadow across the walls. No o. E u, you hawk. P, please, weigh it. The young apostle's body writhed around while crying like a baby. At the same time, he began hurling insults towards his useless colleagues with a high-pitched voice that might split apart in a moment or two. Trashy henchmen, apostles and believers that were good for nothing, and finally, even his owners, the Bathories. How pathetic and desperate he must have been. Oi. S.A.E. Jean grabbed the apostle's face and spoke. Since his mouth was covered by that huge hand, all he could do was to nod his head urgently. Wanna live? Hubububub. Showing how much he wanted to carry on living, this vampire even began licking S.A.E. Jean's palm. Oh ho, really? Looking down on this desperately pathetic weakling, S.A.E. Jean's lips twisted in an evil smile. Five days later, the promised day with Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean waited for her to arrive in front of the orc village and when she showed up like clockwork, he quickly changed into the hero orc and received her. It seemed like Yurin wanted to genuinely converse with him, judging by how much she was yapping on and on, but the hero orc simply headed straight for the sparring arena. Although it was nominally a sparring arena, it was nothing more than some piece of land made up of rocks and earth for wrestling matches. However, the actual sparring easily transcended the shabbiness of the arena with its ferociousness that matched up to a real battle. The destructive mace attack that crushed the atmosphere itself, as well as the sword aura that cleanly carved through the air. Quahang. Humongous explosions of sounds reverberated around as if there was a mountain slide happening somewhere every time two weapons collided. With each one representing different combat style but ultimately, displaying similar levels of destructive power. But in all honesty, Kim Yurin wasn't going all out. Of course, with the exception of her trait, she was using all of her physical prowess, but her true power lay with that trait of hers. For S.A.E. Jean in his hero orc form, though he was actually giving it 100%. He didn't activate the Warrior of Reversal, 
but as the spar progressed, his reasoning gradually faded away. And in the end, watching her deftly deflect his attacks repeatedly and try to land encounters made him furious beyond words and he activated the Warrior of Reversal. As one would expect, the atmosphere changed rapidly as reddish aura oozed out from the orc's body. Kyuk. Unfortunately for him, her confused state lasted only for a blink. She struggled to deflect the mace powerfully smashing down on her, and then quickly dashed in closer to the orc before hitting him on the arm with her trait, Desideratum Active. Thack. To him, it felt like a small pebble lightly tapping on his skin. Quickly dismissing it as nothing important, the orc tried to shove her away into the distance with a shoulder tackle. However, as if he was glued to the ground, his feet wouldn't budge. Only then did his hot-headedness cool down a bit, realizing what just had happened here. She assigned purpose into her sword. The reason why she could become the youngest ever highest tier knight, even if her trait was not a growth type. She had used her trait, in the end. Since you used a skill first, I'm just returning the favor, right? Yurin looked at the struggling orc as if he was the cutest thing and then lightly tapped him in the head with her sword. It's my victory. Yurin. But you cheated. S.A.E. Jean. He was getting angrier the more he stared at Yurin's beaming smile that showed how assured she was of her victory, which made him struggle even harder instead. As long as he was the orc, there was nothing much he could do against its nature. He knew well enough he shouldn't struggle so much, yet he tried to free his feet non-stop. Muscles all over his body bulged like balloons ready to pop and blood vessels protruded visibly on his face. You should just give up now. The restraints won't be undone so easily since I spent quite a lot of mana so. But she did not count on the orc's persistence perfectly lining up with the system itself. The host tried desperately to win against the mysterious power of the world. That persistence has resulted in acquisition of the passive skill, partial resistance. The new passive skill reacts positively with the following, race lycanthrope, property mana body, and race unique skill divinity, of the leviathan form. The passive skill partial resistance has been converted to, resistance. Resistance proficiency level, F. The power that can interfere with the natural phenomena that is the foundation of the world, as well as able to resist the concept and the principle. TL, yes, this is the literal TL. For a skill acquired during a spar, there seem to be lots of words popping up into his view. However, the orc hurriedly dismissed those trivial matters and forcefully squeezed out every little drop of strength from this entire body. And then with sound of dirt falling off, his foot began to lift off the ground for real. At that moment, Yurin's face was dyed in the deep hues of utter shock. However. Groan. As expected, it was still impossible to break free out of her restraints with only an F skill. The orc faltered grandly in total exhaustion and even ended up dropping his mace. The orc became furious at the fact that his final struggle was all for naught, and at the same time, Yurin was wordlessly swallowing down her saliva. That was an event she had never experienced before. And so, she failed to understand what just happened there. Sure, there were times when she didn't have enough mana, but when her trait did activate, it would always work for her no matter what. Quarhack. While she was lost in her thoughts, the orc began throwing tantrums as if to say having his legs restrained was getting rather irritating. She only then recovered her wandering mind and tried to pacify the orc. Please wait for two more minutes. That restraint is supposed to last for three, you see. It was now the break time after the sparring had ended. The orc walked towards Kim Yurin who was busy wiping the sweat off her forehead, and handed her a wooden container with spring water in it. Oh. Thank you so much. Yurin smiled brightly and thanked him but Sae Jean lightly dismissed that while plopping down on the ground to recheck the details of the skill he had acquired. The power that can interfere with the natural phenomena that is the foundation of the world, as well as able to resist the concept and the principle. Both its name and the description sounded simple and ambiguous at the same time, but the longer he thought about it, it became clearer just how much potential there was with this skill. Able to interfere with the natural phenomena that was the foundation of the world, as well as the concept and the principle. From those words, what S.A.E. Jean could come up with was the concept of space, and the principle of time. 
The actual possibility of this skill allowing him to distort space and reverse the flow of time was pretty low. Especially considering that he earned this skill during sparring, so understandably, his faith in it took a big hit. But then again, there was this one thing that overwhelmingly restored his faith in this skill, somewhat. Skill proficiency, zero. Zero 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 percent dot. It was the amount shown on his proficiency window. It was even lower than three decimal points, and he had to really concentrate to see the actual figure of zero. Zero 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 seven five percent dot. If it was like this, then wouldn't that mean a lifetime of hard work might just get him to around the level of DE at most? You are not curious anymore. As he was submerged in these tough thoughts, she suddenly began talking to him. She was staring at the orc who seemed to have zero interest in her with a pout. What oh? Right. The reason why she met with Kim Han Seol. The orc nodded his head and asked her about it. You don't seem to be curious about it anymore but well, a promise is a promise, so. Yu Rin let out a fake cough and continued. It's simply a favor from him, asking me to investigate and compile a report on a certain man. One of my subordinates happens to be close to him. I don't like doing it, though, since it feels like I'm snooping around behind that person's back. She then subtly studied the orc's reactions. His facial expression remained the same as before, fearsome. Investigate? Oh, that. Um, explaining that is a bit complicated, so, uh, you see, we're affiliated with the government of no, wait. I have a boss, you see. And this boss wants a detailed report on some other people. The reason for that is to, uh, make governance easier well, honestly, even I don't know the real reason. I'm just doing it as I've been ordered to. If I don't, then it'll be troublesome for my order. Now that he'd heard it, the matter wasn't so important after all. Now that his misunderstanding over how serious the matter was resolved, all tension left his body and so, the orc let out a mighty yawn. Ahahaha, what is this? Even orcs yawn. Kim Yurin burst into a childlike laughter after seeing the orc's ill-timed yawn. The favor Kim Han Seol asked Yurin was nothing more than a pretext, and the truth of his intentions was revealed after a week had passed by. He was a member of the Society, Trilogy. Not only that, he was its founding member, to boot although ever since he became a government minister, he had left the Society, at least on the surface. It was Trilogy that resolved the disgraceful scandal he was suffering from in the past. We have detected a plot led by Kim Han Seol to implicate you, the Guild Master. But the matter is quite complicated and it seems that we won't be able to prevent the news from breaking out. Kim Yusone. One could say that this attempt to suppress him wasn't just from Kim Han Seol alone but from a certain guild as well. Or possibly, a scheme of someone hidden within that guild, who was from the questionable species. SAE Jean was sure of the latter option being true. It was only two weeks ago that vampires tried to ambush him, after all. It was way too close a time frame to call it a coincidence. But whatever the case may have been, SAE Jean was still under the danger of being framed. As for his crimes. He wasn't 100% sure what, but it seemed to be related to taxes. So, what's his beef with me? S.A.E. Jean. It seems that Kim Han Seol is going to use the Orc blacksmith's income tax rates. Until now, the Orc blacksmith maintained anonymity and used us here in the society to do business. The problem rises from the fact that the society's income tax rates and that of the blacksmith's preferential income tax rates are clearly different, to begin with. It was true as A.E. Jean did hear that the tax rates for blacksmiths were lower, in order to encourage more to join the profession. Right now, we've been applying the society's tax rates. But before the society grew to its current size. We calculated taxes of all proceeds from the sales of the orcs wares according to the blacksmith's preferential rates and the rest were deposited into the bank account opened under the society chairman's name. That is the most worrisome point at the moment. S.A.E. Jean was developing a migraine just listening to this. But being dragged through mud was irritating to him even more. The race of lycanthropes could not stand being on the receiving end. Honestly, even S.A.E. Jean was getting really furious right now. What can we do about it? That is I apologize, but we can't think of a response for this. 
even if we forego this blacksmith's preferential tax rates and pay up the shortfall, that in turn will be seen as a tacit admittance of your guilt plus. With the announcement date for the successful guild promotion being only a month away, whatever we decide to respond with, it will end up negative for us, sir. Kim Yusone. It seemed that the first place holder became a bunch of dirty cowards the moment second place closed in. S.A.E. Jean clenched his fists tightly. His knuckles cracked loudly. Of course, there was one way he could think of, that would potentially resolve this issue. Most likely, Kim Yusone also must have thought about it as well. Only that, as S.A.E. Jean was rather sensitive towards this topic, the veteran mercenary hadn't mentioned it yet in consideration. Looks like it can't be helped, then. If the news breaks, then I'll reveal that I'm the orc blacksmith. However if it can be blocked somehow, please give it your all. I'll do my best. For yes. By the way, there is something else. S.A.E. Jean let out a sigh. His heated breath was full of his boiling rage. At first, he wanted to use the moderate way. Rather than dragging Kim Han Seol down, he'd rather choose to forcefully push Yu Song up instead. But now. Let's do our own background investigation now. Not only Kim Han Seol, but several of his backers as well it's time for payback. The intelligence agency that was established within the shadows of the monster mercenary company now boasted over 130 agents. Most of them happened to be cat-type Suins, and according to Kim Yusone, there were three of them that were good enough to be inserted into a complicated information warfare. Obviously, it'd be too much to expect these agents to uncover top-secret information erased from the records by the leaders of the current administration. But conversely, finding out about faults of a handful of people would be easier than snatching candy from a baby. And as long as those faults were uncovered, the public and the media will do the follow-up and bury them alive. Rather obviously, the media people would choose to side with the stronger party so the whole affair might become a battle between the behind-the-scenes backers. But it'd never be a war. They would never be able to figure out who was attacking Kim Han Seol. And, what would happen under the situation where Kim Han Seol's substitute was already set in stone, someone who could swear her loyalty and obedience, on the surface at least, and also possessing twice the ability. Namely, Yu Bek Song. Which choice would they make? Whether to hold on to a walking political liability with heavy losses stacked against him, or to kick him to the curb and embrace a cleanly polished and beautiful pearl, instead? It was painfully obvious. Kim Sae Jin couldn't wait to meet Kim Han Seol two days from now. Chapter, 92 A Monster Who Levels Up Chapter 91, Truth 5. You are not doing it, for real. But you've been appearing on TV shows a lot lately. Why only not this one? This one's recording time is also short, too. USAE Young. A Certain Summer Afternoon as S.A.E. Jean was under strain from his complicated problem, U.S.A.E. Young came around holding a script from a TV talk show and started whining on and on. Plus, you'd be appearing together with me. U.S.A.E. Young. The culprit was the sudden invitation coming from the so-called couple's talk show. It should be nice for both of us, you know. That's because. S.A.E. Young. Unable to endure anymore, S.A.E. Jean finally called out to her in a low voice. Mm, mm. U.S.A.E. Young's body trembled for a second, then. Not even looking at her, S.A.E. Jean sighed out grandly while massaging his temples. Let's, let's talk about it later. I'm really busy right now. S.A.E. Jean. With what? With what work? However, U.S.A.E. Young couldn't finish her question. His facial expression and his current body language showed how truly bothered he was by her presence here. She could only gaze at him with her lips tightly shut. He looked so cold and indifferent right now, concentrating on those documents in his hands. It wasn't only this time, either. She could feel it on her skin, how much he was bothered by her. Even though S.A.E. Jean had denied it, without a doubt, he had changed. Then, I should get going. However, she just could not say anything resentful towards him. She knew all too well who held all the answers in this relationship, after all. Suddenly, she felt regret. Back then, 
Back when S.A.E. Jean couldn't suppress his desires anymore she should have just let him embrace her. Feeling remorseful, U.S.A.E. Young grasped the door handle. Wait. She heard S.A.E. Jean from her back. Her heavy emotions reverted back ever so subtly, and the strength gripping the door handle automatically left her, just like that. S.A.E. Young. Whenever she heard her name being spoken out from his lips, she felt herself flutter. S.A. Young turned around, her face slightly reddened. There's something I'd like to talk to you about. However, at his follow-up words, her face hardened slightly, instead. He wanted to talk to her. Kim S.A. E. Jean often beat around the bush like this, whenever he needed the Dawn's aid in something. What is it? Always welcome it. But for her, even being used by him was okay. Because that meant he needed her. Didn't that mean there was a chance of things developing further? All she had to do was to work harder to develop the relationship, right? Please, come sit in front of me for a while. Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled deeply and pointed at the chair in front. Several quiet days passed by, as if they were proverbial calm before the incoming storm. U.S.A.E. Young said that she'd do what she could, but she also cautioned him it would not be easy, either. After all, the moment the Dawn gets involved, then its rival corporations would probably jump into the fray as well. In other words, it was not possible to prevent the news from breaking out. And so, while he wa. S. mired in many different things, the Goblin Village was continuing to grow from strength to strength. Now, it was big enough to be called an underground town. That is some sight to behold, isn't it? Kim S.A.E. Jean broke out in a hollow chuckle, while looking at goblins playing the sport of Jaku with their short legs and small bodies. These creatures were spending the sweet downtime earned after eight hours of labor exactly like humans would. TL, Jaku is a Korean team sport which combines aspects of association football and volleyball. Google it if you're curious. Checking them out every now and then, SAE Jean thought their actions were rather adorable, somehow. Such as, one goblin who had failed to receive the ball was scratching the back of its neck while looking embarrassed. In all honesty, S.A.E. Jean wasn't expecting to find more about the fact that goblins possess the highest IQ and EQ among all the monsters out there like this. I taught them the sport. I thought it was a pity that their current living pattern only consisted of eating and sleeping. Kim Yusone. It's a good idea. Seeing how fat those potion-making goblins are now, Looks like things are going well that side but, what about the witchcraft goblins, though? The potential usages of the witchcraft goblins were truly enormous. Those witchcraft techniques that were already known to the rest of the world, including the likes of restraints, detection, protection, etc., etc., they were pretty much the same as very useful magic spells. Also, it was possible to transfer knowledge via blood thanks to goblin species-specific trait. In other words, all those techniques created by the witchcraft goblins would become his, pretty soon. Well, they are doing their best, but. The results aren't too encouraging at this point in time. It seems that the absence of a leader figure is playing a role here. Is that so? Well, even the so-called transferring of knowledge was actually the chieftain passing it on to a subordinate witchcraft goblin, after all. Just as S.A.E. Jean was about to lick his lips in regret, both his and Yusone's phones began ringing at the same time. That sure was ominous. Two of them stared at each other briefly, before rushing towards the surface. The crime of tax evasion by the monster's chairman, Kim S.A.E. Jean has now been uncovered. The amount is 46 million US dollars, proceeds from the sales of weapons. The day before the scheduled meeting with the minister, the news finally broke. As expected, it had to do with his tax. As if everything was arranged ahead of time, the news spread around rapidly, and the meeting with the minister was duly cancelled leading to this second news item, which went like, Kim S.A.E. Jean insults the government minister or some such. So, he wasn't even planning to meet in the first place, huh? Also, he now understood why Kim Han Seol asked Kim Yurin to investigate him. Meanwhile, the Special Investigation Division received reports from the National Tax Service and members of the monster. Above was a single excerpt from the article that occupied the upper sections of the portal site search results. This one sentence had an enormous ripple impact on the public. Of course, although it seemingly had nothing to do with his tax problem, 
it was not a lie that someone did make a report. So, even if Kim Yurin and Yi Hyrin tried to clear up the air belatedly, all the news publication had to say was, reporters made a mistake while rushing the story out. Dot. If Kim Sae Jin didn't know what was actually going on, then his society members would end up being alienated from one another here. Just like now. I, I didn't say anything slanderous to anyone. I'm, I'm telling the truth. E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin trembled heavily as she entered Sae Jin's office. He also heard that Kim Yu Rin was hurriedly making her way towards the HQ at the moment as well. Only thing I reported on was what I saw you, the chairman's, daily routines, and I've never even mentioned anything related to tea, tax matters. E. Hai Rin. I know. It was his first time seeing her this unsettled and fearful, so Sae Jin gently tapped her on the shoulder to calm her down. I already know that this event is some bastard scheming to screw me over, so please, do not worry. I've already begun searching for the ones behind this plot. He had already sent the linked up Apostle Rosriddle into the ranks of vampires, while his agents were working tirelessly to gather more than enough dirt on Kim Han Seol and his backers to bury them away. So, it was only a matter of time before the backlash slaps them in the face. If, if that's the case, then. Ah. Miss Kim Yurin is not that kind of person either. I also know that, very well. When he asked Yurin as the hero orc just before this incident broke out, she said, I should do this instead of someone else, so there won't be any distortion of facts. That showed that she believed in him. It was that, she too had become a victim simply by following the order to the letter. If it's not explained away properly, there might be a big blow to our public image. Kim Sae Jin formed a smile deliberately. Whether it was truth or not, matters related to taxes were a sensitive topic to the public at large. Plus, the situation was now at the point where several news articles were writing utter garbage, that he was exploiting the orc blacksmith. Miss Kim Yurin has arrived. Jo Hansung quickly informed Sae Jin. As soon as Kim Yurin arrived, every member of the society as well as its think tank gathered and began discussing emergency countermeasures. But, it was just impossible to refute every accusation thrown at their way. During the time he lived the double life as the human Kim Sae Jin and the orc blacksmith, he wasn't meticulous with keeping his secrets all the time. There were times when he didn't pay attention, such as when his society was at its infancy, and these bastards were exploiting this. And now, some employees present during this meeting, who had no clue that Sae Jin was the orc blacksmith, ended up saying that although this whole thing was a mistake, a few parts here and there did sound like tax evasion to them. Also, only after three hours passed since the breaking of the news, the media did something they were well known to do every now and then they assumed that he did defraud on his tax and began reporting as such. Seeing the number of comments shoot past 20,000, Sae Jin again realized the importance of his society, the monster, in this world. Whatever the case may have been, with the current situation as it was, even if they demand a retraction from the media outlets, that would take a figurative forever to happen. In the meantime, the public images of Sae Jin and his society would hit rock bottom. That was why, there was only one method that could solve this chaos and reverse those negative media perception and their articles. It was to reveal that Sae Jin was the orc blacksmith. The sole reason why he maintained the double identity was to preemptively prevent unnecessary rumors and questions from potentially spreading around. After all, the method the ORK utilized in crafting weapons wasn't something he could reveal to the public, thanks to how different it was compared to other blacksmiths. And now that things had devolved this far, his reasoning had become somewhat pointless. The moment he comes clean, there was a chance that the media and the public would become incredibly curious as to just what kind of trade Sae Jin had. Surely, there would be those who would outright ask him about it, too. And then, he also kind of felt embarrassed about this as well. Although he had no choice but to keep his circumstances as a secret, others might think of him being impertinent and arrogant in playing a game of deception like this. For now, I've clarified my position, saying that there was no such thing in my report. But the chaos has grown so big already and I won't offer you any excuses. I'm truly sorry. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin lowered her head in a distressed expression. Whether it was because of the order from above or not, 
it was true that she did investigate his background, after all. It's fine. It's fine so please, don't beat yourself up with this. For now. There wasn't much choice left. His head hurt way too much for a meeting like this one, and he even felt irritation bubbling up at all those reports and comments appearing in real time as well. Please call for a press conference. SAE Jean. On a clear afternoon. Countless reporters, cameras and news vans from TV stations crowded on a garden located within the monster's grounds, designated as the spot for the press conference. As an aside, this conference was being broadcast live to the rest of the country as well. Did he really defraud on his tax? Unknown reporter 1. Since this whole thing is complicated, it does sound questionable, but I think he did it. But more than that, I'm more curious about the relationship between the orc blacksmith and Kim S.A.E. Jean. Unknown reporter 2. Yeah, me too. Just what made the orc use someone like Kim S.A.E. Jean as his intermediary? To the point where he poured all his earnings to the society, even. Unknown reporter 1. I don't know. I mean, we know there is this orc blacksmith, but we don't have any concrete details about him, right? That preferential tax thing was awarded solely because of his participation in the Blacksmith Open Tournament, no. So, well, there are lots of whisperings that they are actually half-brothers, or that the orc is a slave, that he's from different species, etc., etc. But since he said all will be revealed today, let's take a proper look, shall we? Unknown Reporter 2 Reporters were busy chatting away among themselves, their conversations full of curiosity. While they were occupied like so, two female knights from the Raven Order made their appearance the two who were suspected to be the ones who have made those so-called reports. Camera flashes went off like crazy and questions were thrown at their way, but the two simply said, we've already clarified our positions so go and print retractions first and headed to the empty seats out in the front row prepared for them. And so, another twenty minutes went by, with only five more remaining before the press conference was scheduled to commence. The tension ran quite high reporters and camera crews waited with bated breaths for the arrival of Kim S.A.E. Jean to the stage. He's coming. Set off by an unknown person's shout, camera flashes went off once more, and all of the cameras focused on one place. Kim S.A.E. Jean, decked out in a formal business suit, walked like a cool supermodel. Carrying a stiff face, he stood on the prepared stage. And then, after letting out a single fake cough, he said. Tax evasion. Although there have been some misunderstandings here, it is categorically untrue. That was his opening line. Right away, camera flashes exploded and questions that sounded like roars of wild animals spread around. What is your reasoning for that? But the National Tax Agency is certain of. There are rumors that you listed the Dawn's aid to squash this allegation altogether. Do you not feel any guilt on your conscience? There could not be anything more torturous than this on his auditory and visual senses that were so much sharper after his evolution to the lycanthrope. Please, calm down first. S.A.E. Jean closed his eyes and gestured the reporters to slow down first. And then, he quickly seized the small gap between the frenzy of the reporters to continue with his words. A lot of people are curious about the orc blacksmith's identity. He produced a document from the bag carried on his side. This was the relic of the past when the orc blacksmith first made his debut the application form for the blacksmith open tournament that was returned to him as the proof of his participation. Although there were no fingerprints on it, there were a signature and the return address written on it. This is the application form from the time when the orc applied to participate in the open tournament. At the time, when the orc was guarding his identity even more fiercely compared to today, the address written on it shows the post office in Kanwan province. Ignoring the continuously exploding camera flashes, he then lifted up the scanned paper that detailed the beginning of all the transactions taken place so far. You'll see that the orc had never used his own name. Everything was done with me, Kim S.A.E. Jean, as the proxy. Since the complication with the preferential tax arises from this, I'm guessing the main issue is with this part, yes? Also, I see that there is another point that has caused a great deal of confusion, that has led to you raising many questions regarding the matter. Why would the orc blacksmith use me, Kim S.A.E. Jean, as a proxy, someone who is an orphan and has not much of a background? 
Is he really a slave that simply hands over all of his creations? S.A.E. Jean let out a lengthy sigh. To be clear, he's not a slave, nor did he appoint me as his proxy. Reporters only then began remembering that unrealistic story in their heads. That urban legend of Kim S.A.E. Jean being one and the same as the orc blacksmith. All of them believed that, although sounding feasible, that story was simply nonsensical. No, it was an impossibility. In order to produce weapons of the orc's caliber, it just wasn't enough to dedicate oneself on walking down the lonely path of the blacksmiths. Let me clarify further. S.A.E. Jean breathed in deeply and surveyed the surroundings. He saw the faces of the deeply shocked people. Among them included Kim Yurin, Yi Hai Rin, and Ju Ji Hyuk. It was understandable, really, since S.A.E. Jean hadn't told them the truth until now. I am the orc blacksmith. He thought there would be explosions of flashes. However, everything was quiet. These reporters had no room left to start snapping his pictures, after all. Chapter, 93 I am the orc blacksmith. This declaration caused the Korean peninsula as well as the whole world to boil over. Since the fame of the orc blacksmith was already widespread throughout the planet, Kim Sae Jin had become the hottest topic in the world. Ju Ji Hyuk, Yi Hai Rin and Kim Yu Rin as well as those members of the society and acquaintances who had no idea fell into quite a huge vortex of shock meanwhile. Reactions from the local media and the public were quite varied and colorful, to say the least. Among them were people who couldn't just believe it, some who were utterly amazed by it, and some who criticized and condemned him. But what hurt him the most were those critical opinions of some that began with, just how much enjoyment and sense of superiority did he derive while hiding his identity. S.A.E. Jean felt so, so embarrassed. He obviously had a valid reason why he had to conceal his identity, but whenever he read those articles, cold perspiration formed on his backside while his head went numb. All the information has been compiled, but it seems that, for now, it'll be better for us to wait, sir. Kim Yusong. While all this was happening, enough dirt on Kim Han Seol and his backers had been uncovered, the information on all the corrupt things he did in order to achieve his ambitions. Although over half of those crimes were well past the statute of limitations, but well, mass media wouldn't sweat over stuff like that. Right. We wait. Unfortunately, the huge chaos raised by SAE Jean's press conference meant that it was not possible to bury this story with another one, not just yet. The current situation had devolved to the point where even the most respected newspapers and weekly publications, such as The Guardian, The Times, etc., etc., were busy tripping over one another just to get the story out first, while the rest of news items were getting buried away in ignorance. It was likely that, even if he exposed this information, it'd get ignored just like the others. This chaos, it might carry on for a while, right? Yes, sir. It seems that way. Even if you hold more press conferences, this chaos won't die down, so perhaps it's better for you to take a couple of weeks of good rest, sir. Kim Yusong. A good rest. Fu Wu. Kim Sae Jin let out a grand sigh while staring outside his window. As there was no sign of the noise created by the huge crowd of reporters right outside his house lessening any time soon, having a good rest was simply an impossibility at the moment. Oh, and Guildmaster. Yes. Last night, I had a dream. It was seen from the eyes of a vampire. And in the dream, the vampire lord is waking up. The moment he heard those words, he swallowed down a lot of his saliva. Out of the blue, the skill eyes of the wolf activated all on its own, and his claws extended out sharply. His heart powerfully urged him on, strengthening the species-specific instincts. How do we kill it? He muttered out without realizing it. It was a simple, instinctive reaction. Sir. Ah, uh, it's nothing. I'll call you back later. Regaining his sanity back thanks to Kim Yusong's panicked voice, S.A.E. Jean quickly hung up the phone. However, his madly pounding heart showed no signs of slowing down at all. And those damn reporters camping outside his house, making so much noise were only serving to irritate him even more. A few. He let out another sigh and picked up his phone again. No matter what it took, 
he had to find a solution to these f***ing bastards outside who were preventing him from getting much needed sleep. Oh, is it you, S.A.E. Young? The call connected even before the second ring ended. From the other side, he cowl. D. hear a genuinely welcoming voice. For a week after the press conference, S.A.E. Jean shut himself in the house. He refused every single interview request made by both the local and international media outlets while saying, later. Instead, testimonies of people witnessing a strange monster began emerging between the articles related to S.A.E. Jean every now and then, before promptly getting buried away once more. The unidentified monster, its moonlight colored fur shining so beautifully, yet, leaving behind only the dark silhouette when the eyes try to locate it. What the witnesses saw was the sight of the creature kicking and gliding in the air, leaping between buildings and mountains like a bird. Although, it was nothing more than a moment's blur, for those knights who accidentally saw it, they just could not forget that mysterious monster. Of course, the culprit himself couldn't care any less even if he tried. He had to feel the wind on his face just to de-stress, like now, so why would he care about what others thought of him and become careful with his actions? That just didn't fit with his current personality. Hmm. Currently, S.A.E. Jean was in the wolf form, while sitting atop the peak of a mountain in the monster field, studying the land below. The newly improved wolf's field of view simply knew no limits and he could see not only the countless monsters, but also the knights doing their nightly hunts as well. And even the flow of mana coming off from them could not escape his vision, either. Yawn. Since none of them were vampires, he had no interest in fighting any one of those weaklings. While yawning out, he flicked his claw out and that cancelled the magic spell of a lich that was fighting a group of knights afar. S.A.E. Jean climbed down the mountain peak after confirming that the knights, who briefly stopped their actions from the shock in order to figure out why the magic had been cancelled, rushing into the lich to finish the monster off. Done with his stroll now, S.A.E. Jean returned to the cabin owned by U.S.A.E. Young. The cabin that was located deep in the woods of Kongwan's Goziang Gun easily exceeded 7,000 square feet in area alone, but it was still nothing more than one of the simple weekend getaway villas with a nice view USA Young owned. Actually, she didn't even know there was a place like this under her name until her butler informed her so. And Kim Sae Jean asked for USA Young's favor and as a result, ended up staying in this villa for the time being. He couldn't help it, since his own house was virtually under siege at the moment. And it was also no better within the society's grounds as that was completely open to the public reporters had hidden themselves in the hotel and the theme park located there. Of course, he could stay cooped up within the nap room of the HQ building, or even in the underground village, but changing to the wolf or other monster forms there obviously caused problems. And also, he definitely didn't feel like living with goblins in the underground village where sun literally didn't shine. It didn't matter that he came here with a variety of reasons, because this place proved to be just perfect. The villa was located in the middle of a mountain, so not a single sign of people anywhere as it was also right next to a lake, the air here was refreshing, too most of all, there were no prying eyes to worry about. However, the one thing he didn't fully expect, obviously. Appa, where have you been? It was USA Young. She approached him shyly while wearing a thin shirt with her black underwear peeking out a little and a really short hot pants. As if she had taken a shower just now, her cheeks were glowing and her hair moist. A stroll. But besides that, you still haven't gone home yet. You said you'd be here for a couple of days, tops. S.A.E. Jean. But this is my home already. U.S.A.E. Young. She was the sole reason why he simply had to establish the routine of going out on a stroll as the lycanthrope for the past four days. He could only stay as a human for fifteen hours so, as long as USAE Young was around the house, he had to roam around outside for the rest nine. Just what kind of a stroll lasts that long? Because I want to. But forget about that for now, when is Mr. Hyuno coming? Isn't Mr. Ju Ji Hyuk coming here soon as well? Please call them and find out what's happening. My phone died a sudden and horrible death not too long ago. Oh, really? But, uh, even I can't. Maybe something happened. I'm sure they are also busy doing all those interviews. USAE Young locked into his eyes and lied with a straight face. She had already sent text messages that read, Do not come. 
I can handle it, and well. She didn't want S.A.E. Jean to know. After all, she was utterly determined to make things happen here. I've ready breakfast. Let's go and eat. She then held S.A.E. Jean's hand and guided him towards the dining table. How is it? Good. U.S.A.E. Young asked him while her eyes sparkled in hope. Let me eat first. Unfortunately for her, he only just finished scooping out a spoonful of stir-fried rice and it wasn't even anywhere near his mouth yet. Here was the reason why his stay here the last four days was comfortable and uncomfortable all at the same time. From nine o'clock in the evening to six in the morning, he had to roam outside for nine hours in total which meant that his sleeping hours didn't line up with hers, but the rising hours did. So USA Young prepared breakfast and they always ate together. It was the same during the day as well. Since there wasn't much to do, they would spar occasionally, then watch some TV, and then talk about trivial stuff for a while. Meanwhile, USA Young would stealthily approach him and engage in skinship, such as, leaning her head on his shoulders, or using his lap as a pillow. Whenever that happened, Kim S.A.E. Jean didn't stop her. Mm. It's salty. He chewed the fried rice for a bit before ruthlessly handing out his judgment. After his evolution to lycanthrope, even his taste buds had sharpened up and most regular food just didn't taste good enough for him nowadays. Ah. Uh, really? Panicking a little, she quickly took a mouthful of the rice. According to her own tongue, it wasn't bad at all, but still. Ah, uh, you weren't kidding. It's an honest mistake. Sorry. Should I redo it? No, it's fine. Don't worry about it, really. Well, it wasn't as if he'd chase after delicious food for the rest of his life, anyways. S.A.E. Jean shoved all the fried rice down his throat in a hurry. And his plate became empty in less than three minutes, all the while U.S.A.E. Young gazed at him with a deeply moved expression. Burp. And then, he burped out loudly. But well, as the love-struck mind possessed power to transform even things like that into something utterly cool, U.S.A. Young burst out into a fit of giggles, commenting on how honest he was. After the meal had come to an end, U.S.A. Young followed S.A.E. Jean as he headed towards the door again. I'm heading out for a while. Uh. But it's only eleven now. And you just came back not too long ago. U.S.A. Young asked with a surprised face. The repeat broadcast of a talk show he starred in would be on air pretty soon. I'll be back at five o'clock. Kim S.A.E. Jean didn't say much, only smiling gently at her while standing on the doorway. That was enough to appease her unhappiness of his sudden departure. Indeed, U.S.A.E. Young said goodbye with a smile much wider than his. His schedule today was simple. He planned to roam the monster field in all of his monster forms, and if he ran into a strong-looking monster, then he'd kill it and absorb its mana stone. Then, he would meet up with Kim Yusoon on the appointed time here in the field and have a chat with him, before changing into the hero orc and head off to the orc village. Hmm. They have grown big. S.A.E. Jean felt accomplished whenever he took in the sights of the hero orc village that had clearly grown into a town. Although it wasn't cool to hear all those pig-like squeals coming out from this place instead of the Korean he taught them before, but still, this village had become a home where these mild-mannered orcs could live safely. They had divided their roles clearly, the huts built by the orcs themselves were more than passable. And there seemed to be more than 300 households here, seeing all these orcs and their growth, he started sensing the feelings of joy creep up on his mind. It was then. An unexpected alert window popped up at this completely unexpected moment. Condition complete, the mindset of a chieftain 23. Upon completion of one more condition, the host will evolve into the orc chieftain. A container where warrior souls can dwell has been created in the host's body. Maximum of 15 souls of monsters killed in battle can be stored, depending on the strength of the monster. The monster souls will add varied bonus stat points to the host's overall power depending on the original holder. Mm. The orc tilted his head. As he was checking out the alert window with a surprised face, the gates of the village creaked open and a person entered. It was Kim Yurin. It was as if she was also a resident in this place, judging by her familiarity. 
She didn't carry any particular expression, only to find the hero orc and her whole face brightened up, quickly strolling towards where he was. But, no sparring today. The hero orc kept his distance and narrowed his brows. Yurin then faintly smiled while pointing at her back pocket. I know. It's just that, there are a couple of orcs who got injured while going out on a hunt. I brought along some potions to treat them. The orc stared at her with a complicated expression. Her words implied that she had been often looking after these orcs until now. A woman who took care of monsters. The press would have a field day if they ever found out. In other words, yes, it means that I don't have any interest in you. On top of that, we Raven Knights Order has decided to protect this village from poachers, too. Completely forgetting about her uber-bright expressions of only a few seconds ago, she tried to look totally indifferent while walking past the orc. The orc chuckled to himself slightly and turned around to follow her. Hey, he's following me. Kim Yurin's lips quivered after she took a quick glance at her back. She thought that, the pushing and pulling tactic had been a success. Chapter, 94 Kim Sae Jin spent his time sparring with and taking care of other orcs together with Kim Yurin, here in the village. Since orcs were naturally drawn towards powerful individuals, so in his eyes, she had become quite a charming woman, which led to him forgetting about the passage of time and it was already very late at night when they finally separated. Oh yeah. It's all good. The clear illumination from the full moon high up on the dark and cloudless night sky coolly bathed the ground below. While savoring the brilliance of the falling moonlight, Sae Jin moved his feet. The light seemed to linger on with every footstep he left behind. And before he knew it, his dazed stroll brought him back to the villa. There seemed to be an aura of loneliness creeping around this huge house with all of its lights off. He grabbed the door handle and slowly pushed forward. SFX for noisy hinges. Past the cold, indifferent noise, he saw the wide open living room. Now that he saw it in the darkness, he realized just how unnecessarily huge this place was. Thack. When he closed the door, he sensed a person's presence, towards the living room's couch. Was she pretending to be asleep, or did he wake her up just now? Grinning slightly, he approached Yusei Young on the couch. Are you awake? Sae Jean. Yusei Young didn't even budge, her face deeply buried in the cushions of the couch. Since he could hear her heartbeat increasing rapidly, she was indeed faking it, but was she angry at him being so late? Humph. Unfortunately for her, Sae Jean simply chose to go to his room instead. He didn't feel like humoring her at all if he could help it. Euum. Appa, you came back. At the same time, Yusei Young slowly raised her head up. She pretended to be woken up just now by keeping her eyes half shut, while reaching out and holding his wrist tightly. Were you asleep? Sae Jean. Mm. Because, the guy who said he'd be back by five. Hadn't come until one in the morning, you see. He sat down on the couch and while smiling apologetically, brushed her hair. Maybe the moonlight pouring down in the darkness was to blame, but for some reason, she looked especially pretty today. On top of this, she even exuded this unfamiliar sensuality as well. Half-open eyes, deeply blushing cheeks, and most of all, a very suggestive attire she had on. She was wearing only a thin one-piece nightgown and whenever she moved her body, Sae Jean could spy on the sight of her unexpectedly rich cleavage. Why were you so late? You said you'd be home early. You Sae Young. Inside this darkened room, she continued to speak, her voice sounding weak. There was this thing I had to take care of, and I ended up being a little late. Sae Jean. It's not, a little, but, a lot. Let's get that straight. Yusei Young. Yusei Young complained as she interlocked her fingers with his. Since he felt apologetic, he didn't offer any resistance, and she kept on playing with his hands. By the way, Appa. Did you know? It's already been over two years since we first met. As if it came to her just now, she mentioned this fact, in passing. It's been that long. Sae Jean. We met during the early spring, second year of high school, and I'm twenty now, so yeah, it just about checks out. After thinking back for a bit, 
S.A.E. Jean suddenly broke out in short laughter. I remember now. You were quite rude back then. You seemed so expectant but when I introduced myself as a hunter, your face became really distorted. And, no way. I, I may have behaved like that before, but I was naive back then. Now, I'm a lot. Different? I get to hear a lot nowadays that my personality has changed, you know. It's all because of you, Appa. Now. Hmm. He feigned falling into a deep dilemma, and sure enough, USA Young began throwing a tantrum, telling him to stop teasing her. What? Your first impression of me was that I was an impolite girl. USA Young. No, an impolite rich girl. Ha. And so, from those simple and ill-timed words, the pleasant memories began to bloom brightly in their minds. When the two of them met for the first time, when they went out on a hunt together, when Kim Sae Jean revealed his identity to her, etc., etc. Time quickly flowed as they talked and soon, they had arrived at the day of Yu Sae Young's coming of age ceremony. And when Appa tried to take advantage of me. Yu Sae Young. I'm him. Oh, uh, at the time I was. Let me finish first. Back then, I said I'd wait until Appa truly likes me from the depth of your heart and left, right? I was such a world-class moron back then, you know. USAE Young. She then stopped her words, and as if she had decided on something, got right next to him while swallowing down her saliva. That night when I was leaving, I was like, I am so cool, can't you see? But, from the following week since then, I've been regretting it. Every night when I try to sleep, I regret what I've done, I kick away my duvet, and then regret that instead. Appa knows this too, don't you? That I like Appa a lot. I just couldn't stand it when I think about that great chance I messed up. As the atmosphere turned a bit strange, S.A.E. Jean ended up scratching the blameless cheeks of his meanwhile, U.S.A.E. Young took a deep breath. That's why, I'm going to say this out aloud. I really, really don't think I can wait for Appa anymore. Can't you just help me somehow? Well, look. I'm exaggerating a bit but I dream of dreams with Kim S.A.E. Jean in them seven days a week. And in them, when Kim S.A.E. Jean hates me, it turns into a nightmare, and if he likes me, then it's the sweetest dream there can be. Kim S.A.E. Jean didn't say a word while hearing her calm and composed confession, because, he could definitely sense her ardent feelings for him contained within her trembling voice. And when Appa meets with another woman, even though I don't say anything, things become really difficult for me. I struggle to fall asleep that night, and I have nightmares, too. While she gazed at him, USAE Young did her best to disguise her restlessness with a smile. So, that's why, can't we? Maybe start seeing each other. I heard from Hyrin Uni that people do fall in love while dating. As she peered into his eyes, her heart beat away like crazy in her chest. Even if Appa is not ready, I'll try harder. Honestly. Isn't it true that you won't find other woman like me anywhere else, right? She cautiously and clearly spoke all the words she wanted to say to him until now during this opportunity. However, Kim S.A.E. Jean maintained his silence. And Yu S.A.E. Young's body quivered from the fear of being rejected. A thick silence descended on the living room, accompanied by the heavy moonlight. Five minutes passed by, and then, ten. USAE Young could not endure this silence anymore, and so, completely disregarding whatever consequences there could be, threw herself aggressively into his arms. She wrapped her arms around his neck and planted her lips on his. Although she had jumped in without a thought for what would happen next, her lips were still quivering from that fear of rejection. But fortunately for her, S.A.E. Jean did not push her away. No, he gently wrapped his arms around her waist, instead. That gave her the confidence and ever so slightly, she slid her tongue between his lips. Their tongues intertwined, wetting each other's mouths. Unlike U.S.A.E. Young who only learned about romance through novels, S.A.E. Jean was much more accomplished with his kisses. Of course, he too didn't have any experience, but he simply let the instincts of the lycanthrope, the creature well versed in the pursuit of all things pleasurable, take over the proceedings. While their lips were locked tight, he touched her through the gown. He felt the silkiness of her skin and the perfect curvature of her body through the thin fabric. 
As expected of a knight, her body was firm and smooth. Ha, ah. She breathed out restlessly and actively writhed her body, so he could touch her even more. And before long, the hand touching her gown began to dig into her bare flesh. Fuwu. The more he desired her, the more she clung on to him. She breathed hotly near his ear, as if to fan the flames of his urges even more. And to show that she had succeeded, Sae Jean suddenly became a lot more harsher. He didn't simply undress her, he ripped the thin gown off and then began leaving behind his marks all over her bare flesh as if he was conquering her. Ouch! She felt a great deal of pain, as if an untamed animal was biting her, but she endured it. But even such pain was temporary. Her awakening body replaced all the painful parts into zones of pleasure. The time, two in the morning. When the moon was at her highest when, allegedly, people would be at their most vulnerable mindset. The living room couch became stained with the odd heat and saliva as two people sought to fill the void. He opened his eyes. No, his eyes opened by themselves. A woman had woken him up after continuously squirming within his arms. The world was still dark outside the window. Kim Sae Jean looked down on the naked figure in his arms and let out a long sigh. The memories of the deed itself was a bit of blur, but the sensations remained still so real. In the end, his desires won over his reasoning. Oh, well. However, he quickly shook away the feelings of regret. What's done was done already. Of course, the effects of the full moon had played some part in the things unfolding this way, but really, he had an inkling that things might turn out this way, yet, still ended up setting himself up. And well, wasn't Sae Young a wonderful woman, to begin with? She was pretty, had great abilities, and not to mention, her background could be called the best in South Korea. But why is she making that face? A loose smile broke out on Sae Jin's face. U.S.A.E. Young's face that showed how happy she was left a deep impression on him. He could tell that she was definitely asleep, yet there was a thick smile on her lips, and he even heard her rhythmic breathing that somehow sounded as if she was singing. Looked like she was enjoying a really good dream. That appearance of hers proved to be quite alluring, so S.A.E. Jean embraced her real tightly. However, a pair of soft sensations directly touching his skin ended up activating his instincts once more. Again, she was still in a deep slumber. As it was her first time, she must have been exhausted, but... He was thinking that, since she looked so happy, doing it one more time wouldn't be a problem at all. He assumed a slightly crooked smile and began twisting his body bit by bit. It was time for the second round to begin. As an aside, USA Young did wake up in the middle and in an unbridled panic, ended up scratching the hell out of his back. Since then... Three weeks went by. During these three weeks, S.A.E. Jean got to know intimately just how being newlyweds felt like. They ate together every day and also, made love regardless of time every day as well. Now that he was no longer held back by constraints, he jumped on U.S.A.E. Young whenever he got the chance. So much so, she even stopped counting how many times they did it in a day. Whenever his instincts took over, he pulled her in like a violent wild beast, but she welcomed him with a wide-open smile, instead. And so, the three weeks of honeymoon came to an end with them becoming official, lovers, and Kim Sae Jin left behind a slightly saddened Sae Young to make his return. The thing was, no matter how hot, three weeks were sufficient enough for the news to cool down. Stories related Sae Jin had gradually faded away, and eyeing this opportunity, he let the proverbial bomb go off. Minister in charge of monster affairs, Kim Han Seol, seduced by the corruption of financial world. Thrice elected member of the assembly, Kim Yo Han, illegal campaign funds. The information on Kim Han Seol and his backers, Chables and National Assembly members, were exposed to the public. And so, the powerful momentum of the winds of revenge began to gather slowly. I stake the life I've lived until now, all those reports in the media are untrue. Kim Han Seol and his backers showed off the expected response, a categorical denial. They were acting like this with the belief that they could escape out of this predicament, but that was because only a part of the information had been revealed to the public yet. The more they struggled, the deeper their graves would become, however. Miss Yu Bek Song, have you seen the news? 
Yu Bek Song didn't say a word. She was probably trying to remain respectful towards the superior officer she had been taking orders from until now. It'll be troublesome for me if you don't reply. After all, I only started this matter because of you, Miss Yu Bek Song. Hey, why are you saying this thing is for me? Let's discuss the details later on when we meet up, as I'm quite busy at the moment. When can we meet? Huh? Uh, I'm also busy nowadays, so. You don't have anything lined up for July 14th, no. Let's meet on that date. He could hear her hold her breath over the line. Since he had installed a ton of spyware as well as inserted a few spies in the midst of the SID, finding out about this much wasn't a problem at all. No, no wait, that's not. Ah, uh, I just received another call. Hold on a sec. I'll call you back some other time. He confirmed the name shown on the LCD screen and hurriedly changed his conversation partner. Oh, Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. It's a relief that you answered your phone. I'm Kim Han Seol. I saw that important announcement three weeks ago with great interest. I have to say, that sure was something else. The call was from Kim Han Seol. He sounded quite relaxed for a guy whose dirty laundry was hung out to dry for all to see. Yes, well. Thank you. Kim S.A.E. Jean also maintained his calm. Hoo hoo. And that is why, shouldn't we reschedule the cancelled meeting? After all, with the revelation of some unsavory matters, it could not be helped at the time, no. For you, I've readied quite a few nice little presents, you see. Kim S.A.E. Jean stayed silent. He just had realized it, Kim Han Seol's neutral aura he felt back then was actually this, he was the type of a person who would readily burn his bridges without hesitation if it meant fulfilling his ambitions. Kume. This is actually a secret, but well, I was never really convinced of you being implicated in the tax fraud from the very beginning. Such things don't appear on the surface unless someone wills it, no. That's why I asked one of my close associates to look into the matter. That was how this man was able to sell off his so-called comrades. Kim Han Seol probably had felt in his bones, that now was the time he changed the ship he was sailing on. Is that right? Indeed. And it's definitely a political maneuvering, this whole ordeal. Since I've uncovered those behind this plot, why don't we meet and share this info? S.A.E. Jean let this rather well-composed pleading enter one ear and flow out the other while carrying a cold smile. Just how many people did Kim Han Seol betray in this manner as this guy climbed up to his current position? Hearing this man talk, whatever little speck of sympathy S.A.E. Jean had disappeared. So, he said some noncommittal replies and hung up the phone. SFX for the doorbell chime. As soon as he ended the call, someone rang his doorbell. SFX for a door abruptly opening. Even before he could say, who is it, USAE Young opened the door and lightly walked into his house. Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. Your lover has arrived. Kim S.A.E. Jean let out a long sigh and stood up, all the while thinking, is she trying to cause a scandal or something? With the awakening of the ruler of all vampires, the vampire lord, there was no longer a leeway with the time anymore. The decision on who would fill the role of the future ruler of the species had to be made before the current, dying lord kicked the bucket. And before even that could happen, they had to connect all three dead fishers within the monster field together. Now pressured by the lack of time, Bathory had no choice but to do something quite rare. And that was to combine the might of her house and that of the El Las house and its leader, the kid named Sirenan. T.L. Hey, kid. Let's be honest here, there isn't enough time for us to wait for you to grow up. So, although we're working together, the position of the Lord shall. Prelani Bathory. Let's discuss that matter later. As the heads of our respective houses, we are on the equal position here, after all. Siren and El Las. Bathory gritted her teeth. Honestly, this little tyke was. First of all, you can't connect the portals because you don't have the artificial heart anymore, right? While the date our Lord has spoken of is fast approaching as we speak. El Las. Well, technically, it isn't exactly like that, though. Bathory. Does that mean you don't need the aid of my people, then? If that's the case, I'll be on my way. El Las. Now hold it, 
right there. For now, I'll listen to what you have to say. The skin and hair that were paler than palest white, and the pair of blood-red eyes that contrasted such paleness, possessing such appearance that even other vampires would find creepy, Sirenin maintained composure even in front of Bathory. For now, those Nisferatus are the most suspicious ones so let's combine our powers. Then, we open the portal, and then, we wait for the next command of our Lord. Thankfully, the Lord will be able to extend his life by another six months or so. Let's decide on the rest after everything's been resolved. El Loss. Bathory's forehead creased. It was like, as if this little tyke had the ambition of becoming the next lord, and thus, this boy was proving to be difficult to deal with. Fool. But there was very little she could do, at least for now. Even if it was for a short while, she needed a helper, after her truly incompetent foolish servants had messed up everything. Also, if she didn't like the way things were going, then. I'll just kill this little fker. Bathory lightly nodded her head. Chapter, 95. Korea's Proud Son. That was the title for this week's article on one of the world's most influential publications, The Times. The main character was Kim Sae Jean. Describing him as a man who possessed a variety of unexplainable abilities, the article went in depth with introducing the public to the road he had walked on to get to where he was now. As one would expect from the article focusing solely on SAE Jean, it brought about a much more explosive amount of reaction from the populace of South Korea, than compared to the USA. And by riding on the wave of this fame, the monster passed the guild evaluation and thus became a full-fledged guild in the process. Also, the price of the land the guild was on, as well as the value of the surrounding lands as the tourist attraction, reached heights previously unseen. Plus, many famous celebrities from different parts of the world personally flew over to Korea in order to meet with S.A.E. Jean, saying he was someone who could create treasures as the orc blacksmith. Hell, there were some individuals who wielded incredible influence in the world resorting to pressuring the government personnel for a chance to meet with him. Whenever he received these requests for a meeting, though, S.A.E. Jean checked out that person's personality first. In other words, he didn't meet with everyone. He figured that, if he kept on refusing, then people might start hating on him, and if he met them all, then it'd go on forever. And so, for the next three weeks or so, S.A.E. Jean held many meetings with celebrities which started off with him meeting the greatest knight in the USA named Roptis from there. He met the third crown prince of Saudi Arabia, a world-famous elf songstress which even made him cower timidly, etc., etc. S.A.E. Jean got to build personal connections with lots of celebrities. T.L., what the just who names their kid Roptes. This author really needs a better naming sense and yes, I T.L.'d it literally, as written in the raw. Initially, meeting up with all these celebrities he saw on TV and newspapers proved to be really cool, but as it continued on and on, both his body and mind became fatigued. It couldn't be helped, as those who succeeded meeting with S.A.E. Jean were all very happy, but those who failed to do so were busy slagging him off for being an arrogant prick. Finally, using the excuse of the monster becoming a guild and thus its administration requiring a specialized and dedicated touch, S.A.E. Jean stepped away from the guild master position, while also installing Zhou Hansung as his proxy. He then told everyone that he'd be taking a long break from all the stressful work and began a NEET-like existence in his house, inwardly feeling quite pleased with himself. Even though there were knights who were wholeheartedly waiting for the orc blacksmith to release new weapons, S.A.E. Jean decided to let them wait for a while. Most of all, it seemed there were too many idiots who thought that his continued show of goodwill had become their right or some such. Instead of feeling grateful for him presenting his creations to the public, these bastards were busy spewing CP like S.A.E. Jean was getting lazy and lackadaisical and whatever, when he broke the promise of releasing two weapons a month. It was because of these morons, he decided to rest for at least three months or so. Of course, he'd every now and then post a few smartly chosen words on his SNS profile, too. Hmm. Anyways. Currently, S.A.E. Jean was savoring a cup of coffee within his own house, not in the guild's HQ building, glancing through a newspaper while enjoying the early morning of his sabbatical. Kim Han Seol, after saying he'd bet his entire life, resigns from his ministerial position after the continued revelation of corruption. Is the vice chairman of Great Wisdom, Kim Jong-hyuk, also implicated in this corruption scandal? 
Kim Han Seol a man resembling an onion with layers upon layers of dark secrets continuously being revealed. It seemed that he'd be seeing the inside of a jail cell in a near future, while his backers were all getting mired in the scandal as well. No matter how one cut it, at this moment in time, one could definitely say that both SAE Jean and the Dawn Corporation had won this game outright. The Divine Beast type Suin Yu Bek Song, appointed as the commissioner of the police. And the story he had been waiting for, the rise to power of a certain someone, was also printed on the side with small letters. It's finally done. He put the newspaper down while a satisfied smile showed up on his face. Now, even without him being there, the guild would run smoothly, although that had been the case since the beginning anyways, and the idiots who didn't know their place were being escorted into a prison one by one, so. So, there was just one more issue he had to tackle now. Vampires and his parents, as well as the truth about himself. Next week. S.A.E. Jean murmured to himself as he looked at the calendar. July 14th, the date he'd meet up with Yu Bek Song. Around the same time, he heard the sound of a door opening. While carrying a smile on his lips, he waited for the woman to enter his arms. You went out on a stroll again. U.S.A.E. Young. U.S.A.E. Young walked in uneasy steps and sat on the couch before falling into his arms she wore nothing other than a thin shirt over her naked form so the sensation transmitted to S.A.E. Jean was rather stimulating. It's fine going outside while I'm still asleep, but can't you be by my side when I'm about to wake up? U.S.A.E. Young. Why don't you get dressed first? Don't wanna. She replied with a pout and lightly bit his neck. Honestly where does Appa go every night? You don't think about me who might wake up in the middle of sleep, right? Do you know how lonely it can get when when two suddenly becomes one? Now that his guilty conscience got poked, he couldn't say anything so to change the topic, he switched on the TV instead. This is an emergency alert. Near the city of Yangju, North Jiangsang Province, the monster Arteramus has appeared. Instead, he was greeted with a breaking news. Thankfully, it was a good enough topic to change the flow of this conversation. Why is there so much chaos in this country all of a sudden USAE Young? USAE Young made a worried expression as she looked on at the emergency broadcast. The news was showing the images of the bird-type monster building a nest near the North Jiangsang province. The body of the Arteramus is believed to be bigger than the entrance to the dead fissure that appeared in the North Jiangsang province before the experts have expressed their curiosity as to how such a monster could exit from that dead fissure with its massive bulk. An Arteramus was famous for being a difficult monster to deal with. Nay, it transcended the level of merely being difficult and firmly into the realm of impossibility, even. The first time this thing appeared was around 13 years ago, and the unlucky host that time was Osaka, Japan. Appearing suddenly out of nowhere as if it fell from the sky or something this monster bird used its powerful crow to cause the city to fall in utter chaos. And then using mysterious tentacles that grew on its body instead of fur, killed countless people. The Arteramus has been classified as a boss-level monster. And the Raven Order that found the monster first is forming a raid team centered around its highest tier knight, Miss Kim Yurin. As its classification said, it was a boss-level monster in the similar concept as one would find in games, right down to how heaven-defyingly impossible it was to defeat this creature with one or two knights only. Such powerful monsters would show up once every year in different countries all around the world. It's pretty close to our home, too I hope they can subjugate it without much problem. USAE Young USAE Young pretended to be a helpless young girl and sneakily leaned her head against his chest. S.A.E. Jean simply stared at the top of her head for a bit before uttering out what was on his mind. By the way aren't you supposed to go to work by now? Ha! Huh. Seriously? She gritted her teeth and glared at him. She was quite dumbstruck at the moment. S.A.E. Jean still quietly studied her current appearance. It was as if she was trying to tell how peeved she was via her facial expressions her brows were narrowed, her lips pouting. That was why he suddenly snuck in with an unexpected kiss. She was so adorable at that moment, and he didn't really feel like trying to appease her annoyance as well. As she was annoyed by him, she resisted at first, but well. She was beginning to lose to his already proficient movements. Mm -hmm. 
Her eyes closed she followed with her senses his hands that had become a lot more familiar with her lately and were busy roaming all over her body. Ha! S.A.E. Jean slowly lowered her down on the couch. Since there was only an oversized shirt to get rid of, taking her clothes off proved to be quick and easy. Wait, I. But before they could go any further, U.S.A.E. Young became shy from the early morning sunlight shining down brightly, and pushed him slightly away. You don't have to hide such a wonderful body, you know. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean couldn't understand her reaction at all. No, I mean, it's just if it's too bright, I feel a bit shy. U.S.A.E. Young's face reddened deeply and covered up her chest with both of her arms S.A.E. Jean's brows narrowed but he still closed the curtains quickly. Only then, she jumped into his arms. And so, the morning's activity resumed from there. The following day. The Arteramus that appeared in Osaka was also classified as a boss, but the one we're going to face is suspected to be a lot more powerful than that one. Within the Raven Knights Order's Team 1 conference room, the briefing was being held to hash out the subjugation detail for the boss monster that had finally appeared after a long while. Looking rather grotesque from any distance, the Arteramus resembles a jet black rooster from afar, but when studied closely, it has something like tentacles rather than fur on its body. And the bad news is, these tentacles contain a ton of concentrated mana and each one of them are strong and sharp enough to easily pierce the defenses of a knight. Unknown Knight. Tentacles grew from every part of its body, so the Arteramus possessed no blind spot in its direction of attack. That placed this bird into the category of the really, unfairly cumbersome monster to face, yet its remains fetched enormous price thanks to all of its tentacles having small mana stones embedded inside. Some even said that Japan's economic woes of the time were solved in one go with the capital earned from subjugating one Arteramus. So the composition of the team should be at minimum, high tiers, and above. E. Hai Rin. E. Hai Rin spoke with a somewhat tense face. If she participated in this raiding party, it was quite obvious that the monetary rewards would be more than sufficient. But the issue was with the inherent risk. No matter how much money she earned, she had to be alive first to enjoy it. Not too long ago, the goblin alchemist has decided to supply all the potions necessary for this raid in exchange for the small part of profits earned from the sale of the bird's remains. So you can rest your worries. Kim Yurin. Let me. I'll do it. As soon as words left Kim Yurin's mouth, Yi Hyrin quickly raised her hand up high. There was a bright smile on her lips. She felt like an idiot, right then, because it was rather obvious that the goblin alchemist would definitely help out here, since they were members in the same guild to begin with. Even though Kim Yurin was only a non-regular member, but still. To have such a reliable and capable support, now this was what she was talking about. TL, in this line, the author wrote an idiom. The direct translation of it means, thousand soldiers, ten thousand horses. I changed it at my behest. As Hai Rin was being deeply impressed by the Monster Guild's personal connections, she was. You can't. She was being ruthlessly rejected. Wah, why not? I'm also a high-tier knight, though. E Hai Rin. Your compatibility with that monster is just too low. How will you defend against all those tentacles that shoot out tens of times in a single second with that sword of yours? Kim Yu Rin. I... I can definitely defend against them. Instead E. Hai Rin. Be quiet. We'll talk about that a bit later for now, the next portion of this briefing will be done by me. Kim Yu Rin. Kim Yu Rin coldly cut E. Hai Rin's words off and took over the proceedings. While carrying documents, she stood before the podium and let out a fake cough. It was unknown what she wanted to say just yet, but one could see how nervous she was. The total number participating in the raiding team will be 10. That is the initial estimation. The plan is, of course, to pick knights with tiers at high, and within them, priority selecting the candidates with over B rank in terms of the general capability, including the combat proficiency. There weren't too many knights in South Korea that met the strict conditions Yurin had put forward. This was because, high-tier knights with general capabilities rated at B were good enough to really consider advancing to the highest tier rank. And so, the ones selected for this subjugation raid, are Song Minyu, 
from Team 2, Ju Ha Young from Team 3. Kim Yu Rin read out the names of eight people and then. N E Hai Rin. Kim Yu Rin. Phew. E Hai Rin was the ninth to enter the list. However, Yu Rin didn't name the last participant. Only just that, she was busy wetting her rapidly drying lips, while they moved up and down slightly. And who is the last one? E Hai Rin wondered out aloud. Kim Yu Rin then took a deep breath and then spoke. For the last position, I'd like to invite the hero orc. She spat out these words. For a few seconds after those words left her mouth, no one spoke up. At first, no one could quite understand what she was saying, and then, thought that she was cracking a high-level joke instead. I believe that the hero orc's martial prowess approaches that of a highest-tier knight already. And its compatibility also fits, so if the orc participates, it'll benefit us greatly. Not to forget, orcs are creatures that enjoy battling strong foes. Definitely Kim Yurin. No no no, wait a minute here. Are you, really, really serious about this? E Hai Rin. Unfortunately for the listeners, Kim Yurin's attitude was quite serious, so E Hai Rin had no choice but to step in. I've taken over the management of the hero orcs of late. Enough people saw me enter that village. Also, the whole country knows that the hero orcs are not a threat and the current situation is, people wish to call them Korean orcs instead. No, wait right there, but that's not the problem here. Hyrin shook her head hard while showing how shocked she was. But it's completely nonsensical. You're telling us to raid a monster with orcs, which are also monsters. E. Hyrin. What's wrong with that? Too bad, Kim Yurin was completely, totally serious about this. Towards her, every night gathered here in the conference room sent in stares of utter shock. Also, the weapons wielded by the orcs are special, so. However, Yurin showed not one bit of concern and carried on with the briefing. No, it was far more correct to call this a presentation, instead, to make these people accept the idea of the hero orc. Chapter, 96 You, what? It was an afternoon. Just like any other day, S.A.E. Jean in the hero orc form welcomed Kim Yurin, only to be met with quite an unexpected proposal. An aide? The changes in the orc's facial expression was probably the most honest he had shown in ages. And that displayed how absurd her proposal was. Yes. It is a very powerful monster. If Mr. Orc can fight with us, then there's a chance that the number of victims might decrease. Kim Yurin was seriously trying to convince one monster to help her slay another monster. The orc carefully studied her appearance while feeling his mouth become numb. But he couldn't spot a single sign that she was joking at all. Also, you are the perfect natural enemy of this monster bird. With that powerful shock wave you create. You, want me to fight alongside humans? Even the, human, Kim Sae Jin found this notion ridiculous. Of course, if he did choose to step up, then he'd become a powerful ally. But a cooperative hunting, a raid, needed a perfect teamwork as the lives of each and every participants were on the line. But she wanted a monster to butt in there. Not just the knights but even the regular civilians would intervene and say no. Was she under the delusion of thinking that he was a, human, since he could speak? Or was she still just too naive? The orc gazed down at her with slightly criticizing eyes. I am well aware of Mr. Orc's worries. However. Forget it. You want to talk nonsense, then go away. Even before Kim Yurin could finish, the orc coldly cut her off. Eh. Huh. Originally, orcs loved to fight, plus the hero orc helped humans out before not to mention that he was on friendly terms with her. That was why she came here to speak to him but now, she was getting flustered by his cold refusal. I played with you a few times, and now you've gone mad. I said, go away, now. She tried to say something in reply, but the orc just shook his head to show there was nothing more left to say and vacated his seat. All she could do was to blankly stare at his back. Seeing such a cold and decisive attitude, she almost thought that she saw a hologram containing the words, favorable impression with the target has fallen, rising before her eyes. Just like how someone with a particular trait had described it to her. 
The world's attention was naturally drawn towards the boss-level monster that had appeared in South Korea in ages. The date the Raven Knight's order set for the subjugation was 25th of July, which meant there was still some time left until then. So, many TV stations busily moved around, getting ready for this massive, massive event. First thing they did was to interview the 10 participants of the raiding team, starting off with Yi Hai Rin, then Song Min Yu, Ju Ha Young, Kim Yu Rin as well as other high tier and highest tier knights, and even. Yes. It's true that our guild has decided to supply the potions. S.A.E. Jean. Even including Kim S.A.E. Jean. Although his expression clearly displayed his confusion at why he was being interviewed, as he and the PD conducting this interview had a good history that went back a long way, S.A.E. Jean didn't say much and agreed to do it. But we heard that it's more than just potions, however. Aren't you letting Miss E. Hyrin borrow something quite special as well? Interviewer. Oh, that. Yes, as a fellow guild member has requested for it, I'm lending a griffin out to her. S.A.E. Jean. Three days ago, the Raven Knight's order asked to borrow a griffin for the boss raid. At first. S.A.E. Jean was curious as to why they needed one, but after receiving a call from E. Hyrin, he understood their reason. She loved being around and taking care of griffins so much so that whenever she didn't have anything lined up in her schedule, she kept riding on griffins until to the point of taking away the title of the griffin rider off Ju Ji Hyuk. So, she and a griffin together definitely presented a great tactical advantage in this raid. As an aside, the griffin in this case was not Muffin, but Muffin's male offspring. Around six months ago, Muffin got married? To a griffin that was a little bit, in other words, by a lot, younger than her and the number of cubs she produced was now sitting at thirteen so far. Well, the husband? In this case was drying up like a mummified husk thanks to Muffin's voracious sexual appetite, but whatever. Kim S.A.E. Jean selected the male griffin out of the thirteen, kids, that was the closest to E. Hyrin for this boss raid. That is so amazing. By the way, there seems to be a strange atmosphere brewing between the Raven and the Dawn currently. What are your thoughts regarding this development? Interviewer. A strange atmosphere. S.A.E. Jean. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that you, the guild master, are quite close to the dawn? Well, there are suspicions that you're switching your allegiances to the raven, after showing a great deal of support in this group hunt, the so-called boss raid. The PD was mindful of the guild's influence so he chose his words carefully. In all honesty, the PD asking such questions was the sign of how powerful, the monster, had grown. Now normally, it would be the societies that would be mindful of the knight's orders and wizard towers, but with the monster. It was the other way around, both the orders and towers were trying to make sure to get on the guild's good side instead. Well, that. Wouldn't it be great if they combined their strength together? I quite like both orders, you see. S.A.E. Jean. Since he was somewhat aware of this fact already, S.A.E. Jean decided to answer as vaguely as possible. In that case. Should we end the interview here? I have prior engagements, you see. S.A.E. Jean cut the next question from the PD right there. Today was the 14th of July, the date of a very important promise he needed to keep. Oh, yes. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview. Although there were still countless questions they wanted to ask, the filming crew and the PD quickly got ready to leave and requested for a handshake from S.A.E. Jean. Their attitudes had changed quite a bit compared to before, which only made S.A.E. Jean feel more satisfied as he began shaking hands. And now, it was the day of the fierce battle, the boss raid a one-time event that had gripped the world's attention, enough to even surpass over 30% in the overall viewing figure. The ten knights and four wizards hired for this raid entered a limo while receiving words of encouragements and well wishes from the waiting crowd, and hurriedly made their way towards the boss monster's nesting ground. After arriving at the entrance to the city of Yangju, they exited the vehicle and made the rest of the way on foot, carefully threading through the devastated cityscape. There it is. E. Hyrin shouted out aloud. Only after slaughtering masses of monsters and walking for a long while, they could finally locate the site of the black rooster at a far-off distance. Hey, isn't that much bigger than we thought? Unnamed knight. However, they felt something was wrong as they stared at it. 
The monster seemed far bigger, compared to when they were discussing about it in the mission briefing. Looks like it has grown. And also, Hyrin, do remember that you're in a battlefield. Song Minyu. But I'm doing the best that I can. E Hyrin. Yes, the best that you can play with a griffin. Song Minyu. Stop it, both of you. First of all, wizards. Both of the boss monsters' maximum attack range and aggro distance is suspected to be quite considerable. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin quickly subdued the two bickering high rank knights, Song Min Yu and Yi Hai Rin, and started the new mission briefing. So please, get to as far a safe distance as possible, hide yourselves well, and then use your magic spells. Kim Yurin. The wizards nodded their heads. And to the knights present, we will fight exactly according to how we practiced for this battle. Yes, ma'am. All the knights replied back with gusto, with the exception of one E. Hyrin who was still too absorbed in brushing the fur of her griffin. E. Hyrin. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Can you do this? Your target is its eyes. The reason for escorting. A griffin while sacrificing a part of the reward payment was to attack the monster bird's weak point. Since the creature was as tall as two ogres stacked together, it would be incredibly difficult to hit the weak points located on the creature's head with their sword auras or magic attacks, after all. But of course. Leave it to me. E. Hyrin vigorously replied, and as if to agree with her, the griffin next to her powerfully flapped its wings once. Well, then. Everyone, please drink your potions now. Kim Yurin pulled out the potion A Goblin's Courage while telling the others to do the same. This scarlet-colored liquid was rated first among the body fortification potions on sale. It was also seen as the next best item made by the Goblin Alchemist after his famed healing potions. It was in such a demand that it was difficult to buy one as it was so rarely circulated on the market. Don't hesitate because it's rare, just drink it all. Well, any remaining potions will be confiscated. Kim Yurin. At her declaration, one or two ended up drinking the whole vial of the potions all the while still feeling great regret at the same time. The obvious exception was, of course, E. Hai Rin, who was sharing her potion with the griffin. Let's go. The effects of the potion was as advertised. All the knights who had drunk the potion could feel their vitality increasing exponentially. Okay. Let's move. I'm going up ahead. E. Hai Rin. Kikiek. As they had practiced before, the griffin took E. Hai Rin on its back and flew into the sky while roaring out loudly. And when the monster bird's focus was drawn towards this sudden intrusion, the knights on the ground quickly made their way towards their target. Sensing something was amiss, the monster bird extended out its tentacles from its body, but the combination of E. Hyrin and the griffin easily avoided those while she wielded her sharp sword. There was no real need to get too close, since there was the attribute bending imbued within her sword, which allowed her to freely manipulate the attacking distance at will. SFX for a blade slashing through air. The sword light from E. Hyrin's attack drew a blue-colored trajectory as it snaked its way towards the monster's eyes. And soon afterwards, the pained roar reverberated throughout the land. Yeehaw! Thirty seconds after the battle had begun. After achieving her goal, Yi Hai Rin let out a loud shout. And the knights rushed forward towards the monster bird while the assured smile of victory formed on their faces. Someone once said that one should wait until the end before celebrating. Although the raid team successfully robbed the monster of its eyesight less than one minute into the battle, the situation afterwards then steadily became worse and worse for them. The issue was the monster's massive size. They already knew that the number of tentacles would be high because of its huge body, but still, they weren't prepared just how ridiculously high it would be in reality. No, this wasn't simply the problem of the high number of tentacles. The information clearly stated that the Japanese boss raid only required three highest tier knights back then. However, this team contained four highest tiers, six high tier knights, as well as four wizards ranked B, yet. Kyuk. Unfortunately, in this kind of situation, holding doubts of the monster's true strength was a luxury none of the knights could afford. The tentacles rushed in like a hailstorm, not even giving them time to take a breather. 
It was a mistake to believe that its eyes were the weak point, as the monster bird accurately intercepted the knights even after losing its eyesight. How can this be? Kim Yurin. The total number of tentacles sliced off already exceeded 10,000. However, no matter how many they cut, the number didn't seem to decrease at all. There was no opening in the tentacles pouring down like raindrops from the sky, and conversely, there was no chance for a counterattack as well. On top of this, these damn things steadily ate away their mana barriers surrounding the knight's bodies, which even made a rash charge forward an impossibility, too. No one said these things can eat away our mana barriers. Kim Yurin gritted her teeth as she cut down yet more tentacles. She had initially underestimated this monster, since the tentacles were the part of the creature, with the activation of her trait, she believed it would not take very long to bring this damn bird down at all. But thinking like that was clearly a mistake. Those tentacles were not the part of the monster bird but a separate entity altogether. The proof was the fact that the huge monster still remained standing even after she imbued the purpose of faint even for a little bit of time in her sword before attacking it. It was most likely that these tentacles were either parasites or symbiotes that lived off the main body. Damn it! Her roughly swung sword strike drew a crescent-shaped arc and sliced through countless tentacles, yet more replaced them. Everyone, retreat! Kim Yurin shouted out. Her voice managed to travel to the others through the gaps of the attacking tentacles, but too bad, none of them possessed any leeway to make their getaway. It simply took their all just to defend themselves from all these tentacles, after all. And so, it proved that even Yurin herself couldn't make any follow-up orders in the end as well. SFX for the crow of a rooster. That was because her consciousness shook into disarray for a short moment as soon as the loud crow shattered the surroundings. Kook. Seizing this opening, a tentacle bit into her body. But Yurin simply wrapped the bleeding shoulder with mana and continued to wield her sword. She hadn't given up, but still, the situation was easy to figure out. The flow of the battle was disadvantageous, and they couldn't even safely retreat anymore, the worst of all worst situations. As the despair crept into the minds of all the knights present here and their defeat becoming ever so a certainty. From somewhere, a loud and powerful roar assaulted them. A familiar roar, it sure sounded like the call of salvation to Kim Yurin's ears. Kwahang. Along with the roar, a massive shock wave traveled from the direction of northeast and smashed apart all the tentacles while continuously expanding towards the monster bird's main body. Kikiek. It struck the creature. The monster bird issued a short cry and retracted all of its tentacles, and that in turn gave all the knights here valuable time. Ha! The knights quickly turned to look towards the direction of the mountainside where the shock wave had come from, while trying to rein in their rough breaths. At that moment, no one had a clue what to say. Not one, not two, but dozens and dozens of orcs were busy rushing over here while raising a cloud of dust. Ah! And Yurin inadvertently let out a gasp after seeing the sight of the hero orc among the rushing orcs, overflowing with a remarkably heroic aura. It was such a cool appearance. Chapter, 97 The flow of the battle reversed in a heartbeat as soon as the band of orcs jumped into the fray. The shock wave spreading out in the air easily blew away thousands of tentacles blanketing the sky like a dissipating fog. And that lull in the constant attacks of tentacles naturally gave the knights much needed breathing room and now that their own pace had been regained, they were in the position to go on the offensive. SFX for tentacles rushing forward. However, the number of tentacles shooting out from the monster bird seemed to know no end. Still, the assault from these elite orcs were no laughing matter, either. Whenever they swung their destructive maces, tens of hundreds of tentacles turned to dust. These orcs didn't rely or care for style or technique, just focusing on brutal strength only. The orc that was the most heroic and magnificent roared out aloud and kicked the ground hard, jumping into the air. His leg strength allowed him to jump up several tens of meters with absolute ease, and he went straight towards the monster's coxcomb. SFX for tentacles shooting something out. Instinctively sensing the approaching danger, the tentacles mounted on the monster bird's body began spewing poison towards the orc while making a strange noise. But the orc didn't give a DN and simply activated the leviathan scales to the absolute maximum. Although the monster fired off the poison confidently, 
it had no effect on the scales, other than washing off the dirt and making them look more shiny than before. It's not enough. But, unless SAE Jean was in the lycanthrope form, it seemed that this was the limit of what the orc's leg strength could do he was actually aiming for the creature's weakness. It's comb, but he could only reach the edges of its waddle on the neck. Since there was little he could now, he used the skill fear strike on the waddle, instead. Thahahang. The clear and vivid roar resounded at the same time as the attack connected. The monster bird writhed in pain after its vocal cord was attacked, but it couldn't cry out that destructive crow anymore. Now the things had come to this, the plan B was proving to be better than he initially thought. SFX for tentacles attacking. However, the tentacles were not suffering from the same pain as the monster bird itself, as they were separate entities to begin with. Since its host's life was in danger, all the tentacles seemed to lose any reasoning whatsoever and focused solely on one target, rushing towards the orc that had attacked the monster bird. And well, that was the biggest mistake this monster could ever make in its life. Everyone. Pressed for time, Kim Yurin shouted out one word as she dashed towards the monster bird. Other knights shared the same thought as her and every one of the ten knights present jumped towards the monster. But in all honesty, there was no need for all ten of them. It was enough with Kim Yurin there. She squeezed out every ounce of mana from her body and activated the trait desideratum, imbuing the sword with the strongest purpose she could load the weapon with faint, never to wake up. The moment Yurin's sword struck the monster, its body began to falter to the side slowly. Huyuk. Even Yurin herself faltered and squatted down as well. As she didn't have enough mana, her trait would remain activated for ten seconds at most, but that ten was more than enough. After all, it didn't matter if those tentacles still thrashed about, as the monster bird lying on its side unmoving was no better than a chicken waiting to be slaughtered in the end. On top of this massive fallen chicken, the group of orcs and knights descended. And so, that was how Kim Sae Jean was able to read yet another feel-good alert window. The actual reason why he brought along these elite orcs to this place was quite simple. He thought that, judging from the clues he had seen until now, he might evolve into the orc chieftain if he led other orcs in a group hunt. And his expectation was right on the money. Condition complete, the group hunt. 33. The monster form orc great warrior will evolve into orc chieftain. All stats will rise drastically, and the body hair will grow accordingly. Hair. What hair? Does my hair represent the skill level or something? Initially, he felt somewhat disappointed by this. But well, when he checked his status window, his jaw hit the floor. With the exception of mana affinity and magic strength, every other stat saw an explosive increase of over 100 points each. Plus, the amount of time he could suppress the instincts of the lycanthrope, the time he could spend as the human Kim Sae Jean, had increased to over 18. Five hours so, yes, in that moment, he couldn't be more happier even if he tried. The end of the battle finally came with the orc chieftain ripping off the monster bird's coxcomb the only thing that filled this vast open space was deathly quiet stillness. Ten knights tried to control their heavy breathing, all the while staring at the group of orcs. As expected, the first one to move among them was Kim Yurin. She carefully moved her feet towards the orc chieftain. As the desolate wind blew across the land and tickled past the ankles, Yurin carefully gathered both her arms in front of her chest while looking up at the orc. That faint smile on her lips seemed to represent her current state of emotions. You did come. But you said you wouldn't. She shyly opened her mouth. The orc slightly turned his head to look down on her. The thing was, her face was caked with sweat as well as with dried and unidentifiable black blood which pretty much made her look not so good at the moment. On top of this, his sensitive nose was picking up some atrocious odor drifting out of her that reminded him of clogged up sewers. Ah, uh, I'm. However, while totally unaware of her current appearance, she became more and more abashed at the orc's pointed stares, and began twisting her body this way and that. The orc let out a hollow chuckle and turned around to leave since he became the chieftain, he got what he came here for. No need to endure the smell of sewers if he could help it. Wait, Mr. Orc. Kim Yurin was about to chase after the back of the cold and indifferent orc, but then, someone appeared out of nowhere and grasped her arm, stopping her. 
It was E. Hyrin this time as well. Yurin's face hardened as she yanked her arm loose. But E. Hyrin played this smartly, and instead of saying anything, she simply showed the reflection of Yurin's face on the polished surface of the sword. And the face that stared back was really something else. Ah. Yurin's jaws went slack after receiving a powerful mental shock, seeing that pathetic appearance. Even her consciousness wanted to blank out as well. The information embargo on the boss raid was lifted the moment the monster was defeated and all the participants returned relatively unhurt. The news media that watched the battle from a great distance all hurriedly began doing their thing. Disregarding all else, the news of the hero orcs entering the raid spread around and began snowballing into something bigger. The public didn't pay much attention towards the unexpectedly high strength of the monster bird, and rather, the event of the orcs helping out in the raid stole all the headlines away instead. Among the razor-sharp focused attention, Kim Yurin's opinion that the knights could perform the raid together with the orcs got re-evaluated favorably. But during the post-raid press conference, the person herself seemed rather downtrodden for some reason. I was tasked with watching over the village of the hero orc, and during my time there, I became friendly with the hero orc chieftain. When we were planning out this raid, I immediately thought of conducting it with the hero orc, but he ended up refusing the request. However on the day of the raid, he came to lend us an aid. Thanks to Yurin's press conference, the orc was able to get an unexpected and explosive reaction from the female half of the populace. They were saying something about him being the bad boy type that women fell for. On the other side of the spectrum, many academics became incredibly excited, saying that this event would go down in the annals of the world's history as the beginning of a new era and many of them even began writing dissertations on it as well. However, the man responsible for causing all this havoc, Kim Sae Jean, had to go to a rather weird place on the first day of August. How many? Unnamed Night One. There was a tower in the Kongwan province that rose up very high into the sky. A tower that was absolutely overwhelming in its presence among the forest of skyscrapers, and at the same time, utterly different from them in concept. This tower was often referred to as the holy land of all the knights out there, and had the name Eden attached to it. The number that passed the final preliminary elimination is 205. It's quite a lot. Unnamed Knight 2. It's no longer the level of quite, though. Unnamed Knight 1. Eden annually ran an evaluation test to officially appoint knights and assign ranks to them. And today was the day when the lowest tier knights the ones that would be assigned to the orders all over the country would be selected. Normally, the participants of this test were cadets from the Knight Academy as well as those who had awakened their traits. Cadets without traits were still allowed to participate if they presented their grades from the Academy. As for those who awakened their trait recently, one only had to prove that he or she possessed a useful trait to enter. The ratio is Unnamed Knight 1 Almost all of them know, with the exception of one, everyone else is either a cadet taking the test for the first time, or one who is repeating it. Ten of the newbie cadets possess traits, sir. Unnamed Knight 2. Anyone interesting we should look out for? Unnamed Knight 1. Yes. There are three. Unnamed Knight 2. The subordinate knight handed over a chart to his superior officer. First one is E. Eugene. A female, scored very highly in the proficiency of wielding mana. Judging by how well she can control her sword aura already, I assume she might be referred to as the new Kim Yurin or even USAE Young in the near future. Unnamed Knight 2 Is it a trend nowadays that talented female knights must look like a supermodel? Unnamed Knight 1 Haha <laughs> well, there's nothing we can do about that, sir. When a woman wields mana, that process alone always smooths out the skin tone and subtly reshapes facial structure to the so-called ideal form, after all. A thin, bitter smile spread on the superior officer's lips. He was feeling rather disappointed at this idiot subordinate of his for still believing in that superstitious nonsense. Next. Unnamed Knight 1. His name is Kim Myung Han, sir. A male, possessing a unique trait. It's been named Azura, and it lets him control surrounding mana as his own. Unnamed Knight 2. Who? And finally he's the only one who is not a cadet, sir. And he's a homeless as well. 
Apparently, his trade awakened a while ago when he was about to die from the cold and so he applied for a spot today. TL, I almost TL'd the homeless as a NEET instead. Just so you know. The superior officer frowned deeply. Such an occurrence happened every now and then, but whenever he heard of it, it pissed him off, somewhat. To think, these no-good wastrels were trying to become knights relying only on their traits and not through hard work. And what's his name? It's Jean Sehan. Remember it well, and if he acts like he's about to do something funny, kick him out. Jean Sehan. Actually, that was the fake identity Kim Sae Jean was using. It was easy to forge a fake identity with the help of the intelligence operatives he had fostered until now, but SAE Jeans was even more watertight thanks to Yu Song's intervention as well. The biggest issue with his outer appearance was also taken care of, with something called partial beastification. Obviously, there was nothing he could do about his overall facial structure, but his eye lines. The nose and the jawline were all changed slightly to resemble a wolf more closely and by extending his beard and goatee to a ridiculous degree, he certainly looked like a totally different person altogether. As for his powerful scent well, he acquired an artifact that emitted a very unpleasant odor in order to suppress his own. And the reason why he had to infiltrate Eden's night evaluation test while going so far as to change his appearance, was. One had to look back to a date four weeks ago, 14th of July. On a perfectly average summer afternoon, when Kim Sae Jean held a meeting with Yu Song within the guild's office. Now that she had relinquished the position of the chief of the SID, Yu Song's face seemed somewhat conflicted, one part sad, one part glad. And when is the date for the inauguration ceremony for the vacant ministerial position? Sae Jean. How should I know? It'll be announced when it's ready, I guess. Yu Song. Kim Han Seol was being prosecuted for taking bribes as well as for collusion among many others. Even then, he was still trying to contact Sae Jean, desperately searching for a way out, but Sae Jean remained ruthless. If you climb up to that position, you can finally find the information we talked about, yes? Sae Jean. Well, the thing is I already had it checked out. Yu Bek Song. At Yu Bek Song's words, Sae Jean's eyes went extra round. But, that. However, it's not what you've been expecting, not at all. That information is impossible even for me to access. Yu Bek Song. What do you mean? His momentary expectation morphed into cold disappointment real fast. The reason is, I still lack the qualifications. And so, all I could find out was just where the info might be buried in. Yu Bek Song. Yu Bek Song then sighed out deeply. And where could it be? SAE Jean. The second tier secret records archives, located in the upper mid floors of the Tower of Eden. It seems that your father was a knight directly working for Eden. I'm sure you know of this already. Eden is a worldwide organization and is therefore the same as any other independent nation. Obviously, it's different from country to county, but no matter what, unless you're a member of the Eden's administration, it's impossible to extract any information out from there. Kim Sae Jean held his head with a pained expression. As the things he had done until now became a waste of time, the amount of disappointment and emptiness he felt couldn't even be imagined. What came next after disappointment was anger. Besides the fact that his father was seemingly a knight who worked for Eden, just what kind of truth precipitated a need to treat the information about him as a top secret and hide it away in a location on the tower's upper mid-floors? So, in order to extract the relevant information, we need someone to become the Knight of Eden. Theoretically, yep. But just who can become a knight working for Eden at this stage? I mean, it's hard enough trying to become a knight working for regular orders, for crying out loud. Yu Bek Song. If one wanted to become a Knight of Eden, then he or she had to forget about one's aspirations and enter the organization voluntarily. Meaning, after passing the test, one had to give up the chance of going to other knights' orders and must choose to enter Eden instead. On top of this, considering the fact that the entrance was open to not just the local candidates but to the rest of the world, the entry barrier was actually a lot tougher than simply being a lowest-tier knight. Not to forget, one only got a single chance in life to voluntarily enter Eden, too. And so, the number of successful applicants that entered Eden in the past three years from South Korea was just one. 
that showed just how much Eden valued the future growth potential and abilities of its candidates. In that moment, Kim Sae Jin stared at Yu Bek Song. She too stared right back at him. Silently, a strange but knowing gaze was exchanged between the two of them. However, Kim Sae Jin already had a past record of being a hunter, and also he was just too famous, so it was not possible for him to become a knight affiliated with Eden, the group that emphasized on its members' dedication above all else. You said you can make any artifacts, right? Yu Bek Song spoke first. Although rare, artifacts that could alter a person's appearance still existed. Yes, I did. Even though he said as much, the truth was, Sae Jin didn't really need an artifact. I heard that Knights of Eden can freely commute as they please. Sae Jin. Yeah, that's right. Those people in Eden receive commission from other knights' orders and the national government, you see. So they do have a lot of free time. Kim Sae Jin began smiling in an evil manner. Wasn't this just a perfect condition for him? But can you fight, like, really well? It's one of my traits, so yes. Of course, he hadn't yet faced off against a knight who used mana at full power during sparring, but even when simply comparing on his physique as a human, he was on par with a talented mid-tier knight. It'll take some time, so will you be okay with that? Yu Bek Song. Why would it take time? Knights only value abilities, after all. As long as he was careful about the potential camp training, he'd be fine. And that's how Kim Sae Jin was able to participate in Eden's Knights Evaluation Test as Jin Sehan. Welcome, everyone. Whenever there was an evaluation, Eden would often invite famous knights to serve as temporary instructors. And the person invited this time was someone rather familiar even to Sae Jin. It was Ju Ji Hyuk. He was putting on as much airs as possible and tried to appear commanding to the crowd. You'll be participating in various tests once every day for the duration of one week. You can choose to stay in the dormitory located in Eden Tower's first floor, or alternatively, choose to commute from home. Ha! While hearing this, Sae Jean inwardly sighed out. He wasn't even shooting an episode of Undercover Boss or something like that, and yet, here he was. For now, you will take a seat and be on standby. Carry on. As Sae Jin was going through the emotions of shame, he missed the end of Ju Ji Hyuk's announcements and ended up falling into a bit of panic. What the hell? The applicants who were already familiar with one another began to form groups of same classes, those who were repeating the test, or those who came from the same neighborhood, etc., etc. There was seemingly no opening whatsoever to penetrate such tight cliques, and soon, all 204 applicants began sending chilly gazes of contempt towards Sae Jin's direction. After the rumors of him passing the initial evaluation without a hassle thanks to his great trait had permeated to everywhere already. And so, he had become a sore thumb sticking out in less than three seconds. Is he the one? To know what trait he has, but it must have been pretty nice, huh? I heard it from my mom that he's a bum. A homeless bum. Look at his beard it's so mangy and stuff. While eavesdropping on the conversations going on around him via his sensitive hearing, Sae Jean couldn't help but sigh out inwardly again. Didn't matter whether they were knights or not, the fact remained that they were still a bunch of kids. But, hmm. Don't you think he might look good if he got rid of that beard? So what? The fact is, he is still someone who didn't put in any effort unlike us, just leeching off on that lottery win of his. He then caught onto someone praising him like a ghost, and his head snapped towards the direction almost like a reflex. He saw a pair of boy and girl. He might as well call them a handsome couple or some such. There were only two of them and not one more, and there was no one else around them, either. Ha! Huh. Isn't he looking over here? Do you think he might come over? The boy spoke with an interested voice. If he comes, then tell him to scram. But the girl's was rather sardonic, instead. I'm not going there even if you beg me. After slyly appraising them over, Sae Jean shook his head and plopped down on where he stood, before he began stroking the lengthy beard that grew along his jawline. There was something quite addictive about it as he played around with it. Chapter 98 
Although there were countless cadets who chose to take the evaluation exam immediately after graduating from the academy, the number of them passing it the first time and then becoming a knight were quite low. That was because most of these new graduates simply lacked an ability compared to the so-called repeat test takers, who were sometimes referred to as nth takers, and were eliminated during the preliminaries. So, after graduating from their respective schools and the academy, quite a few cadets received further private education or trained alone by themselves while continuously applying for the exam for the period between one to four years. Beyond that point, it was tacitly understood the applicant was unable to pass and had to give up there. And those who were able to attain some form of enlightenment or even awaken a trait. Although possibility of this was extremely low would pass the exam with a good grade and enter famous a knight's order such as the Dawn, Raven, or Gorio, etc., etc. But if not, then they would have to give up on being a knight, or be satisfied with a life as a low-tier low-mid-tier knight in a small order based in some rural backwater towns. With this backstory in mind, the groups present here at the examination grounds were separated accordingly to the age of the participants. As the policy dictated, one-third of the test takers were fresh cadets straight out of the academy's graduation ceremony, but the rest were the repeat test takers who could understand one another's hardship and loneliness. But for Kim Sae Jean, who was an existence that didn't fit into either category, all he could do was to sit alone and eavesdrop on other people's conversations. Initially, cadets busily berated and mocked Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean as a person who didn't even go to the academy but relied solely on his trait to pass the preliminary. But soon enough, stopped caring about him and became lost within their own conversations. Everyone, a ten hut. As Sehan Sae Jean was about to get bored of listening in on these kids, Ju Ji Hyuk appeared with a good timing and announced the beginning of the examination proper. All the participants got up and paid him close attention. Follow in the groups of fifty as assigned before. We will be heading to the third floor for your first test. Speaking up to here, Ju Ji Hyuk led the groups forward, while three instructors who had seemingly appeared out of nowhere began silently following them. The first day's evaluation was measurement. The purpose of this was to measure the current abilities of those who had passed the preliminary and to establish a ranking of the participants, which would prove important moving forward. It would serve as a basis to decide which cadet should go through and who would be disqualified. Although having a high talent didn't mean one would be great at the actual combat situations, still. All the cadets' attitude towards this measurement was very serious, as it was definitely better to start off somewhere near the top rather than at the bottom. Today will be different from the preliminaries when your physical capabilities, talents with mana, etc., etc., were measured. Today, your actual combat ability will be put to the test. Ju Ji Hyuk. Hearing Ju Ji Hyuk speak, Sae Jin fell into a slight dilemma. Since he was in the human form, he was much weaker compared to the lycanthrope appearance, but still, his raw physical strength would easily match a upper mid tier knight. It was this massive power level that was the cause for his dilemma. Even though he was trying to become a knight of Eden, what Eden looked for from a cadet wasn't the current set of abilities, but the potential for growth and talent. However, wasn't being a upper mid tier from the get go a bit too much? Sure, their evaluation criteria for the ability of an applicant was higher than most other knights' orders, but still. And that is the monster you'll be facing off today. Ju Ji Hyuk. While he was thinking, the exam got underway. A wizard on the third floor balcony, tasked with lending an assistance to the exam procedure, summoned a monster. SFX for a dog's bark. A monster that sat on the boundary of between a normal difficulty and slightly hard within the low tier, a heavy knoll was summoned to the testing arena. Cadets all tensed up, but for SAE Jean, all enthusiasm left him, instead. A hollow chuckle even broke out of his lips, after he realized once more the fact that he was in the middle of a children's playground. Who'd like to go first? Ju Ji Hyuk scanned the cadets, smiling. And there was this one girl who energetically reacted to his calling. Let me do it. Hair vividly dyed in vibrant orange-brown razor-sharp eye lines and a nose that could slice a person. A hardened expression as if unsatisfied by something but she's was a girl whose beauty could make those features as a charming plus, instead. Name. Ju Ji Hyuk. It's Cadet E. Eugene. Oh ho. Ju Ji Hyuk. 
S.A.E. Jean could see that this girl must have been quite a famous future prospect, judging by the way Ju Ji Hyuk was reacting towards her. All right. Then go ahead. Ju Ji Hyuk. While her long hair danced with each step taken, E. Eugene enthusiastically walked towards the prepared stage. No need to wait for the signal. Just start whenever you're ready. Ju Ji Hyuk. She stood before the growling knoll and carefully surveyed her surroundings and the monster itself. And after maybe three minutes had passed, she finally unsheathed her sword. Funnily enough, though, her well crafted weapon was an item Sae Jean was rather intimately familiar with. Isn't that one of the training swords I made? The sword Sae Jean made in order to use during training out of ten knights he had asked to come and spar with him, H showed much interest in the weapon. So he told them to take it home there was this rumor he heard that the swords were being sold in the second-hand markets. Must have been a true story. Hop. Right away, E. Eugene let out a short shout and rushed towards the knoll. Ho. S.A.E. Jean. Her swordsmanship was extraordinary enough to even make S.A.E. Jean let out a light gasp of exclamation. Her sword seemed to aim at the knoll's neck but then, took a sudden turn and swung towards the monster's chest. Her style of wielding the sword, where she would sometimes switch the grip on the weapon and aim for the knoll's ankle, was completely unconventional, to say the least. Indeed, it was as far from prescribed on the textbooks as one could imagine, but perhaps because of that, her swordsmanship style was a lot more valuable than normal. SFX for a strange death howl. A small sweat drop flowed down to E. Eugene's chin and fell, and at the same time, knoll, with a hole in its chest, ceased breathing after letting out a weird cry. Good, very good. Ju Ji Hyuk clapped his hands and spoke in admiration after getting charmed by her skills. That was commendable. All right, then. From now on, no more volunteers and the person with the name I call out will go up to the arena. Ju Ji Hyuk. His admiration lasted only for a short while. Ju Ji Hyuk resumed his duty as a proctor and began calling out different names. And after around 20 people had their combat abilities measured. Next, Jin Sehan. Finally, Jin Sehan Kim Sae Jin's turn had arrived. Maybe it was due to his already eye catching outer appearance, all the gazes present focused on him the moment the name left Ju Ji Hyuk's mouth. While tensing up slightly at the possibility of Ju Ji Hyuk getting suspicious of him, Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean walked up to the arena. SFX for a dog's growl. Right away, the heavy knoll showed a particular reaction. All because his nice scent having been blended with that unpleasant odor. SFX for a dog's louder growl. The monster stomped on the ground with both of its feet and showed signs of rushing forward. Meanwhile, Sae Jean was leisurely deliberating on what to do next. How should he win this act like he was fighting a desperate battle and then pull out the hidden trump card? Or, like E. Eugene before him, overwhelm the creature from the get-go? SFX for a crazed, mad barking of a dog. Well, he couldn't stay undecided for a long time anyway. The frenzied Noel had already rushed forward and was about to arrive in front of him. With a pair of deeply interested eyes, E. Eugene gazed at the homeless bum that had walked up to the arena, Jean Sehan. He's got a good physique. Although the lengthy beard connected to his sideburns looked rather unfashionable, the muscles that could be spied from the gaps of his training suit looked better than excellent. E. Eugene didn't want to admit this, but in all honesty, even knights would struggle to obtain such a body. A body that wasn't heavy enough to restrict one's movement, but also not light enough either the perfectly balanced, so-called iron body, dot. Is his trait related to his physique? Unless it was a trait, it'd be quite difficult to explain how a homeless bum could possess such a body plus, seeing that he was empty-handed as well, it just had to be a trait at work here. That's how E. Eugene had figured, but still, as a woman herself, she found it hard to tear her eyes away from that broad and sturdy back of Jean Sehan. Oi, what's the matter with that knoll? Go Yunjong. As she was looking at the unfolding situation with interest while not caring much about the character of the person in question, her childhood friend Go Yunjong suddenly began raising a fuss. That made E. Eugene to divert her attention as well. And she saw the Noel angrily growling and threatening, 
its eyes bloodshot which was quite unlike before, as if it also intensely disliked that homeless bum or something. This is getting interesting, right? I wonder how he will react. Go Yunjong. At Go Yunjong's words, Yi Yujin shifted her focus back to Jean Sehan. He's panicking. Yi Yujin. She could tell just by seeing the back of him hesitate ever so slightly. Look, you can see quite easily. He has no idea how to respond when the monster is rushing at him. And you know why. Because traits don't teach you stuff like that. E. Eugene. She clicked her tongue and commented on what was happening up on the arena. I've said this before. Relying on only your traits will end up ruining you. That is why E. Eugene. SFX for a loud martial art shout. Tukwahang. Almost at the same time, with a loud shout, a powerful explosion resounded in the arena. And afterwards, a scene beyond the scope of her ability to understand unfolded right before her eyes. Quagagagan. It was nothing more than a single punch, yet the gnoll's body flew away like an emptiest of all empty cans in the history of mankind. TL, ha ha ha, one punch man reference, right here. SFX for steam rising up. Before long, the knoll was embedded deeply on the wall opposite side, leaving behind only its outline, and from the path it flew, hot steam slowly rose up. A single punch, one fist, caused this absolutely overwhelming scene. The only thing filling up the space was a deafening silence. Cume. That's a trait, all right. Looks like a nice trait, too. E. Eugene. Even E. Eugene was dumbstruck by what happened but recovered her wits quickly after sensing Go Yunjong's gaze on her. She nodded her head as if it was all within her expectations. I thought you were lecturing us on about panic and whatnot just now. Go Yunjong. What are you on about? It's true that he was panicking. It's just that, his trait is powerful enough to overcome it, that's all. E. Eugene. Too bad for her. A drop of cold sweat traveling down her forehead was incomparably more honest than her words. And now, after the end of the combat prowess measurement, the time was the lunch break, to fill up the empty bellies and wait for the next part of the exam. As expected, Jean Sehan was eating alone while sitting far away from the other cadets. But unlike before, he wasn't saddened by this. When he thought about it, he had no reason to feel depressed because others avoided him. Better still, no minor annoyances would bother him like this. Definitely not a made-up justification, it was. Never. Mr. Jean Sehan. Suddenly, he heard a smooth and beautiful voice coming from his back. Taken by surprise just a tad, he turned around to look, and found a pair of boy and girl staring at him. They were the ones he memorized as the handsome couple, and their names were Yi Jean and Go Yunjang. Is it fine if we sit here? E. Eugene. Since it was not a crime to do so, Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean lightly nodded his head. By the way, your trait seems really great. How amazing. E. Eugene. As soon as she sat down, E. Eugene began speaking to him. The way she spoke was open and refreshing, as if she was a man among men or something. It's uncool to ask about another person's trait, you know. Go Yunjong. And Go Yunjong stopped her with a friendly, gentle voice as he sat down next to her. It was kind of like, the role of a boy and a girl had reversed somewhat. I know that already. But like I'm saying, if he gives us just a tiny bit of a hint, then the rest of us cadets would be grateful E. Eugene. Stopping her words temporarily, E. Eugene shoved a quarter of rice on top of her food tray into her mouth. What a truly manly man she was. Gulp. So. How about it? Surely, there will be team assignments coming soon, so if you let me know, we'll help you out. E. Eugene. Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean silently studied the confident girl before slowly opening his mouth. What do you want to know? Oh. How refreshing, just like your beard. The thing is, it's nothing much, really. That punch that blew away the knoll before is that a one-time use thing, or can you use it non-stop? E. Eugene. After figuring that E. Eugene was wishing it to be a one-time use attack. It's the former. S. A. E. Jean. 
S.A.E. Jean replied thus. Since it didn't matter even if he answered differently anyway. Oh, what a relief no, that's not what I meant Eugene. Emichem. So this was where all of you were. Out of the blue, yet another person approached the table. This time, it was a devastatingly handsome and graceful young man, his black hair slightly dancing in the air. And what the FCK do you want here? E. Eugene. As if their relationship wasn't good, E. Eugene sharply shot back at this guy. We are all cadets here, right? So, we can share a meal together. However, the man whose name was Kim Myung Han, let out a slick smile and sat down on the empty seat. Well, then. You are Mr. Jean Sehan, yes. My name is Kim Myung Han. I saw your trade at work just now. Wow, that was quite something else. Even I was really surprised by it. He spoke in a somewhat polite tone. Although there were traces of jealousy and wariness hidden in his words, to S.A.E. Jean, it was not much more than this boy acting rather cute. Is that so? S.A.E. Jean. Indeed. And so, that is why if it's not too much trouble, whether that punch is a single use or not Kim Myung Han. Even this guy was asking about the exact same thing as E. Eugene. After making a half-hearted reply, S.A.E. Jean let out a long sigh. He realized once more that these kids weren't even proper knights yet they were still a bunch of little chicks. They wouldn't even be able to open their mouths if they met the real me out in the society, S.A.E. Jean. He found it a bit tough getting used to talking to these little chicks, after having kept company with big shots like Kim Yurin, Ju Ji Hyuk, Kim Yu Son, Yi Hai Rin, USA Young, etc., etc. But, watching them fight over their rankings like this is kinda adorable, too. S.A.E. Jean. Oi, why do I need to stare at your ugly mug while I eat? E. Eugene. But that isn't a problem, no. Kim Myung Han. Having an uncomfortable expression as she glared at Kim Myung Han in front of her E. Eugene. Receiving her hostile stares with much gracefulness and leisure, Kim Myung Han. You shouldn't fight during a meal, you know. Go Yun Jong. And Go Yun Jong, who was busy trying to stop the two. It was kind of interesting looking at these three. As they once said, among all the fights out there, the most fun one to observe was the one about food, after all. Chapter, 99 I thought you'd take up residence in the dormitory, too well, whatever, see you tomorrow. E. Eugene. Let's all pass this thing together, everyone. Go Yun Zhang. Exams had come to an end for the day the sky above had darkened before they realized at 8 o'clock in the evening. E. Eugene and Go Yunjong spoke their piece and headed towards the dormitory located in the Tower of Eden. Jean Sehan casually waved his hand and said his goodbyes, before making his way towards a deserted back alley quite a distance away from Eden. There, he changed back to Kim Sae Jean and headed back home. When he arrived, he found Yu Sae Young waiting for him as usual. However, saying that she was waiting for him at home was a bit incorrect now. Two toothbrushes in the bathroom a huge king-sized bed much bigger than two people could ever occupy, located in the main bedroom. Alongside a bedside dressing table several high heels within the shoe cabinet and two closets in the walk-in change room. His house that was entirely too big for a single man to live in had been filled up now, somewhat. So, at this point in time, it'd be more accurate to say they were living together now, or maybe it was more like this was a newlywed's home instead. You came. While wearing a pair of cute bunny slippers, USAE Young came to the entrance to welcome him home. He took off his coat and handed it over, and like a practiced housewife, she took it to the wash basket. Ha! Kim S.A.E. Jean let out a long sigh as he lied down on the living room couch. She then stealthily approached him without getting noticed and began shooting him a faked resentful sideways glance. The work you've been doing must be keeping you busy. I mean, you left at 8 in the morning, only to return now. Yeah, kinda. Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled bitterly. This feeling of his body being numb and fatigued, he hadn't felt it for a long time. Well, his actual physical condition was quite fine, but his mind was completely tired out. After all, it wasn't a relaxing vacation to find himself in the middle of 200 or so people while busy minding their glares and eavesdropping on others bad-mouthing him. 
I'm feeling really sleepy. While yawning out, he checked out the time. It was nine in the evening. In around three hours, he'd have to assume the monster forms and wander around outside so he didn't have much time left. Hugh M.M. USAE Young carefully observed him with meaningful gaze before jumping into his arms. Don't give up, Appa. Whenever you need the Dawn's aid, just tell me. I'll be able to do something, if it's up to somewhere around a member of a parliament well, of course it's my grandpa who's going to do something, but if I ask him nicely, he won't be able to refuse me. Within SAE Jean's embrace, she began fidgeting and showed a lot of EGO. She looked so adorable acting like this, even as tired as he was, SAE Jean just had to smile warmly at the sight. He then realized why people went through so much trouble and pursued romance, seeing how comfortable he felt when someone was beside him and giving him encouragements. Thank you. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean wholeheartedly thanked her and pulled in closer. His body was definitely bigger than hers, yet he felt safe and comfortable as if he was the one being hugged tightly. What's the point of being thankful, though? You haven't even told me yet what you're doing until now. U.S.A.E. Young. Quickly seizing this chance, USA Young began acting like a spoiled child. However, SAE Jean remained as firm as an iron wall. That later. When you grow to like me even more, I'll tell you everything. Absolutely everything. SAE Jean. Of course, he would have to tell her everything sooner or later. But to him, precisely because she was his girlfriend, he found it hard to tell her the truth. There was the matter of him changing into different monsters, but more importantly, he had to be mindful of her status as the heir of the Dawn dynasty. Technically speaking, he was a completely different species compared to her. Although the passage of time might have softened his stance, a certain anecdote still made rounds. The one about the Dawn's chairman declaring to the world that his precious granddaughter would never marry a foreigner or her name would be removed from the Yu family register altogether. She was someone he had to treasure more than anyone else out there, which only gave rise to several excuses to be reluctant about revealing the truth. But it's impossible to like you even more than now. You know. It's okay to tell me now, really. USAE Young. Totally oblivious to his inner thoughts, she maintained wide open eyes and dug deeper into his embrace, then began tickling his side. How many times should I say it? I like you a lot. I love you a lot USA Young. I know. I know, so please, be still. SAE Jean. Kim SAE Jean embraced her tightly and stopped her from complaining. And about five minutes of their hugging later. HM, hmm. Out of the blue, USA Young stealthily moved her hands and began fondling his BT. At first, her movement was over the surface of his training pants, but then, her hands invaded under the fabric and. What are you doing? S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean narrowed his eyes at the odd fondling he could feel around his ass. Well, uh, just because you're tired, that doesn't mean you should go to bed right away, but what gives? Even though I didn't want to do it, we still did it, but when it's me, you don't wanna? U.S.A.E. Young pouted and began fondling even more openly than before. As she did the deed many times with S.A.E. Jean, she had become quite more proactive compared to how she was like before. Foot. Hey, that tickles. Kim S.A.E. Jean finally exploded into a fit of giggles while looking at her as she continued to rub her body against his thighs. The time remaining for him to get a shut eye was less than three hours, but well, this monstrous body of his only needed a couple of hours to recover from all the fatigue anyway. The exams for the nights continued on. The second trial consisted of the cadets trying to escape from a bizarre space located within the tower after they were imprisoned there. The space was incredibly huge after some type of expansion magic was cast on it, enlarging it decorated to resemble the great wilderness, it contained countless monsters, wild beasts as well as numerous dangerous traps. And even trapped within this jungle-like environment, Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean broke past all trials and tribulations with empty hands. When monsters and vicious beasts appeared, he just twisted their necks off if there was an obstruction blocking his way, he blew it away with a single punch and thanks to his sharp perception, he never fell into such small things as traps. In the midst of all this, Jean Sehan didn't forget the core of this test, cooperation. If a fellow cadet was faced with danger, he helped out, 
and if another cadet fell into a trap, he helped out again. He's definitely a genius worthy of the first place in the current rankings. And since Jean Sehan was completely unmatched within the criteria of judging cadets, every single one of the high ranking officials from the various knights' orders who came to observe the proceedings were busy licking their lips, lights of greed shining in their eyes. Most of all, it is quite wonderful to see him take care of the fellow cadets. Kim Yurin. Even the highest knight from the Raven Order, Kim Yurin, was among those. Agreed, but isn't his background somewhat suspicious? Oh Jung Hyuk. This careful objection was raised by Vice Order Master of the Daebeek Knights Order, Oh Jung Hyuk. With his Knights Order stock rising every day, Oh Jung Hyuk's shoulders had straightened quite a bit with pride nowadays. Of course, the reason for this rise in prominence was due to the title of only one of four knights' orders in the country to possess an Athony doll, as well as being on friendly terms with the Monster Guild. So it was all dependent on the external factors. But the truth was, new potential recruits began placing more and more emphasis on such points instead with every passing day. No fixed address, no known family members and a homeless bum to boot but, his abilities are very good and judging from what he has shown so far his personality seems also not bad. Kim Yurin. Ho ho. Looks like Miss Yurin still believes in people a little too easily. We do not know what kind of dark ambitions sleep within that man, and since he's a bum, he might even be blinded by wealth. Although Oh Jung Hyuk was passionately and resolutely objecting to her evaluations, Yurin had seen through his charade already. He might berate the person in question but on the day of the completion ceremony, Without a doubt he'd proactively seduced Jean Sehan before anyone else had a chance. Well if he has a dark side like what you've said, then I'm sure it'll be revealed in all good time. Kim Yurin. Only one hour had passed since the test had begun. There was no way she'd have enough free time to observe this test in entirety that was scheduled to last 12 hours, but still. I should tell Hyrin to keep an eye out on the guy. Kim Yurin. The story about the leader of the current pack of cadets being a very good seedling had been spreading around already. And now that she had seen them, there were a few more that caught her eyes, so she needed to keep her wits about her and catch them. After the twelve hours long test came to an end, the majority of the cadets had fallen down to the ground like dead logs and panted heavily from the exhaustion. Among them who maintained the best condition were, of course, Jean Sehan, E. Eugene, and Kim Young won the top three picks of the invited observers. Um, excuse me. In the midst of this, five hesitating cadets suddenly approached Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean as he was loosening his neck as he sat in the cross legged position. Although he didn't know their individual names, he still remembered their faces. He did rescue them from a trap earlier in the day, after all. What's up? Sae Jean. Well, that we came to say. Thank you. Three boys and two girls lowered their heads hesitantly to express their gratitude. Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean quietly gazed the group, and then. It's cool. Sae Jean. He spoke that one line and stood up. A thin smile spread on his lips. He thought that, although they spoke badly of him due to the sense of emptiness they all felt, these cadets still hadn't let their humanity rot away yet. Oh, looks like a Jussie's popularity is on the rise. E. Eugene. Meanwhile, the energetic E. Eugene and the half-dead Go Yunjong approached him. Let's hurry up and eat. I'm too tired to even eat. Why do you complain all the time like a little girl, when you're supposed to be a man? Jean Sehan headed towards the cafeteria with the arguing duo although, it clearly was a one-sided grilling. The tests continued afterwards. On the third day, it was about hunting monsters. On the fourth day, a traditional boot camp. On the fifth day, a reenactment of historical events, etc., etc. Three more excruciatingly painful days passed by, at least from the perspective of the cadets. During this time period, the original number of 205 participants were reduced to mere 75. The rankings 205th to 76th had been all disqualified. On the other hand, Jean Sehan continued his stranglehold on the first spot with a five-point margin over the second place meanwhile. E. Eugene and Kim Myung Han constantly fought over the second and third place, only a single point separating the two. And so, on the sixth day, 
Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean was eating together with Yi Yu Jean and her circle of friends after getting more friendlier with one another. Well, it wasn't really about them getting more friendly, but actually, it was Yi Yu Jean who one sidedly approached him purely out of competitive spirit. So, even a juicy is going to volunteer for a spot in Eden? Yi Yu Jean. As they ate, he even found something in common with Yi Yu Jean. And that was, their ultimate destination being Eden. That's right. S.A.E. Jean. How uncommon. To see two knights from the same evaluation apply to enter Eden Huhu, well, I'll be. As long as people like you two exist, dreams, hopes and ideals will never perish, I guess. Kim Myung-Han. At Kim Myung-Han's cynical taunts, E. Eugene's forehead creased up in irritation. Why can't you just shut the FCK up? No wait, just get the hell away from me. E. Eugene. Haha. -ha. I was simply stating the truth. What would you do, if you fail to enter Eden and become a repeat test taker? Kim Myung Han. With the reason of having a firm conviction, Eden disapproved of wanting to enter other knights' orders. So, in the case one applied to enter Eden but failed well, while carrying the sadness of knowing one would never be able to enter Eden, one had to become a repeat test taker and wait until the following year's February. Fool. A juicy, just ignore that BD, and let's duel against each other in good faith. Even though my ranking is lower than yours, you know this too, right? That the final test gives out the highest scores. There will be enough chances for me to reverse the rankings soon enough. E. Eugene. Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean simply replied with a smile. While they were conversing away in a not very important topic, the door to the cafeteria opened and the instructor entered. The new instructor was also someone Sae Jean could recognize Kim In Su, the knight who was trying to show off before getting properly schooled by Sae Jean way back when. Sae Jean nearly laughed out loudly when he saw In Su's face, but held it back somehow. His cheeks were so chubby now just how did he gain so much weight? How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? I'm a high-tier knight from the Genesis Order, Kim In Su. Proportional to the increase in the girth of his body, his tier had increased by another level as well. We'll start the test for the sixth day soon. And the test for the day is dueling in front of the observers. With the observers from the various knights' orders watching you, you will duel against other cadets on the duel arena. Kim In Su. Right away, cadets tensed up. Obviously, a duel would best demonstrate the combat abilities of knights, but actually, the end results depended heavily on who the opponents were. There will be two types of duels. Firstly, cadets will compete with each other. In this case, the first spot in the rankings will have the first choice, and the cadet chosen by the first spot will naturally lose his or her right to chose. Kim In Su. The cadet suddenly began checking out the mood of Sae Jean's table where the first three rankers were seated. However, E. Yu Jean was only staring hard at Jean Sehan's direction. Because, this was the chance to reverse the rankings that she had mentioned just now. And the second duel will be against an expert. In order to accurately measure your abilities, we secured the aid of someone quite beautiful and important this time. Kim In Su. Wait a dn minute. Kim Sae Jean suddenly had a bad premonition. He began recollecting the conversation he had with Sae Young about two days ago. I decided to do a job my dad asked me to do, as a commemoration of me becoming an upper mid-tier. But you became an upper mid-tier because of my tattoos, though okay, fine. What kind of a job is it? Well, Appa did help me out there, that's true. But whatever, the thing is, quite a few talented newbie knights are showing up, so ah, uh, it's a secret. Appa doesn't want to tell me his, so this will be my secret. At the time, Sae Jean didn't think much about it, but. That expert is the world's youngest upper mid-tier knight, the Dawn Knight's orders Miss Yu Sae Young. Kim In Su. At this unexpected announcement of a celebrity arriving soon, all the cadets carried a stunned expression. Among them, Jean Sehan's facial change was particularly honest. Chapter, 100. A juicy, do it with me. E. Eugene. As soon as Kim In Su turned around and left, E. Eugene asked Sae Jean for a fight. On the seventh day, which would be the next day, 
it was reserved for things like measuring of mana and magic strength, psychological tests, and having interviews with knight's orders, so realistically, this was it for her to reverse the rankings. However, E. Eugene looked a bit anxious, since if S. A. E. Jean refused, then that would be the end. Unfortunately, Jean Sehan Kim S. A. E. Jean was dazedly staring at the empty air and didn't reply to her request. Feeling a little frustrated, E. Eugene grasped his arm and shook it. Only then, he turned his head towards her direction. Let's do it. E. Eugene. Do what? S. A. E. Jean. The duel. E. Eugene. Ah, uh, ah, uh, sure thing. S. A. E. Jean. At his easier than expected agreement, her expressions turned weird. But that only lasted for a short while. She began energetically smiling. As expected, a juicy is really manly and straightforward. No backing out now, right? E. Eugene. Yeah, sure. S. A. E. Jean. And so, the meal time came to an end and the cadet started performing light exercises to prepare for the upcoming duels. One hour later, all the remaining cadets gathered at a huge dueling arena on the fourth floor of the tower. Kim in Su told the cadets to greet the observers hidden from the view, and so, they bent their backs 90 degrees. That signaled the beginning of the duels. Most cadets thought that the procession might become rather tedious as there were a fair number of participants, but when the things actually got going, every battle lasted only for a way, way too brief moment. No, that didn't mean high-ranked cadets chose to fight against the low-ranked ones, though. The thing was, these high-ranked cadets were mindful of the scoring system and so, they tried not to fight against opponents with too low a rank, but then. Many low-ranked cadets who were confident of their chances in duel began provoking the high-ranked ones instead, and somehow, successfully got the duels going. SFX for lights. Falling. Oh. A flash of light shooting out from Go Yunjong's blade melted a nameless male cadet sword, thereby ending the 35th duel. And it had been only 25 minutes after the start of this whole duel thing. The ninth ranked, Go Yunjong, winner. Nicely done. E. Eugene. Elated by the victory of her friend, E. Eugene stood up from her seat and shouted out loudly. Next, E. Eugene and Jean Sehan. Come up on the arena. Her joy only lasted for a brief moment, however. As soon as her name was called out, her face became incomparably stiff. Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean made his way up on the arena first and she followed him up soon after. As the two of them faced against each other, different lines of thoughts flowed in their minds. Now how should I handle this? Do it with one punch, just like until now. Sae Jean. Surely, he has no experience in duels like this so I must not give him time to get organized and attack him right away but, something doesn't feel right. Maybe, I should take my time, and wait for a gap E. Eugene. It was kind of obvious that E. Eugene's thoughts were a lot more weighty compared to her opponents. Who do you think will win? Observers couldn't hide their excitement as the main match was about to get underway. I still believe E. Eugene would win this one. E. Eugene might have graduated from the academy at a younger age than USAE Young, but she's a knight who is willing to become a repeat test taker just for an opportunity to enter Eden. There should be quite a gap between the two as far as actual combat strength is concerned. Observers spoke out their own educated opinions. Someone said that, after using a special finishing move, the duel would end quickly, judging by what had gone before. Some disagreed and said their skill levels were similar so it might continue on for at least five minutes. But in the midst of this, out of the blue, a shout loud enough to shock everyone into stupor exploded out from the arena below them. That's the end. The first ranked, Jean Sehan, winner. Even the referee's voice was trembling, as if he was confused somewhat. What was that? Kim Yurin. Stunned by that sudden, unexpected announcement, Kim Yurin quickly got up from her seat and with her own two eyes, checked the situation at the dueling arena. There was E. Eugene toppled over, clutching her stomach, while standing in front, Jean Sehan looking at the girl, his fist clenched tight. The duel was clearly over. Kyum. S.A.E. Jean. Jean Sehan Kim S.A.E. Jean scratched the back of his neck, looking embarrassed slightly. 
He wasn't planning to finish things up this fast but even he didn't expect E. Eugene to madly dash towards him, and so, he ended up swinging his fist. And the result of that simple punch was this. Pant groan. E. Eugene was drooling all over the ground while unable to recover her wits meanwhile, all the other cadets were dumbfoundedly staring at him. M, my luck is pretty good, eh? Didn't expect you to move the way I wanted you to. Really, my luck is the best. S.A.E. Jean. He felt the need to say something under those intense gazes, so, he did. After the first stage of the duel had come to an end, cadets rested their bodies while waiting for the expert's arrival. Jean Sehan Kim S.A.E. Jean continuously chugged down bottles of water as he got nervous about running into U.S.A.E. Young. On the side, E. Eugene remained silent, totally downtrodden. There were traces of tears on the corners of her eyes, even. Oh, wowzers. It was then, USAE Young made her entrance. She was, without a doubt, an idol. Not only the quietly seated cadets stood up quickly in order to take a good look at her, even the referee for the duel, Kim in Su, stood there totally dazed as he gazed at the woman who seemed to exhibit a bit more mature charm than before. SFX for Sauls of High Heels Making Noise Despite coming to duel, USAE Young wore a pair of high heels. She ascended the arena and spoke while sweeping her gaze over the cadets. My evaluation standard is straightforward. If you can withstand one strike from me, I'll give you a fair amount of score. USAE Young USAE Young's attitude was incredibly cold and distant, which was completely different from when she was with SAE Jean in private. Since I don't have a lot of time, let's start quickly, from the bottom. The last person in the rankings, please come up. USAE Young. And the second half of the duels or, in this case, guidance, began in this manner and ended faster than the first half. None of the seventy or so cadets could receive USAE Young strike with a wooden sword, so the whole thing only needed about ten minutes or so. There were six different types of magic tattoos inscribed on her small and petite frame S.A.E. Jean finally got to see for himself just what kind of a mini-monster he had inadvertently created here. Next E. Eugene. U.S.A.E. Young. Yes, here. E. Eugene replied back loudly and quickly dashed forward. Although there was only a two-year gap between the two, seeing the overwhelming appearance of her role model, twinkling lights had returned in full force within her eyes. Well then, shall we get started? E. Eugene. USAE Young spoke as she lightly swung the wooden sword. Although it looked light and weak, the amount of pressure E. Eugene felt crashing down on her was far beyond her expectations. Ah ah. E. Eugene let out a strange shout and somehow, was able to endure the strike by the skin of her teeth. USAE Young began counting up to five while maintaining the strength and mana she imbued in the sword, and then withdrew the weapon. Hugh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Becoming dead tired after encountering that one attack, E. Eugene plopped down on the floor, her legs shaking uncontrollably. Very good. USAE Young. Cadets began clapping their hands as the second person to pass after Kim Myung Han had appeared. Okay, and next is? Finally, Kim S.A.E. Jean in Jean Sehan's disguise hesitantly entered the dueling arena. But well, the way USAE Young was staring at him seemed to indicate something was afoot. Shall we? USAE Young. Sure. SAE Jean. Since SAE Jean's voice had become deeper due to the beastification, he was not too worried, but still quite strangely, instead of attacking him, USAE Young began to carefully study his facial features. Hugh M. M. He thought he might get discovered if this continued, so he rushed forward first, instead. Her face, flushed with an unexpected surprise, and a wooden sword loaded with mana coming down right afterwards. S.A.E. Jean grasped that sword with his bare hand and stood there enduring for about ten seconds, before determining that this should be enough and let go. And to put the finishing touch, he deliberately let his legs tremble and plop down on the floor as well. U.S.A.E. Young narrowed her brows and stared at this guy, before opening her mouth. Very good, but still U.S.A.E. Young. This man, I feel like I've seen him before somewhere. However, she didn't blurt out the words that might increase her time staying here. Going home early from one's duties would only make one feel good, after all. That's it for today, then.
End of the test. I'll be on my way first. USA Young. While singing inwardly, she quickly moved her feet while happily imagining a certain someone potentially waiting for her back home. And so, that was how the night evaluation test had come to a disappointing end. Jean Sehan had refused all the earnest invitations from the various night's orders and volunteered to work for Eden and currently, he was leisurely waiting for the reply that would arrive in a week's time. The day was an ordinary summer Saturday, when the weather was really stuffy and the baking heat was infused into the blowing winds. Inside the aircon-cooled house, Kim Sae Jean was gently stroking the back of the sleeping USAE Young while quietly thinking to himself. I wonder who might win in a fight between the orc chieftain and the lycanthrope. Well, his thoughts weren't all that important, though. Whatever the case may have been, he was really enjoying these past couple days of peace. It was then, a beam of light shone from a certain crystal nearby. A magic communication from Kim Yusone had come in, so Sae Jean hurriedly picked it up. Hello. Sir, it's Kim Yusone. Yes. Kim Yusone wasn't someone who'd contact him for no reason. His voice seemed heavier than normal as well. I had a dream, sir. Whenever he said that, Sae Jean's heart felt like it would stop beating for a moment. A conditioned reflex he developed, where his anticipation and the dread of what might come next were blended together. It seems that going forward, the future might get a little difficult, sir. Can you give me the details? I saw the scenes of countless boss-level monsters flooding the world, sir. The monster bird from before was nothing more than just the beginning. And it's not just Korea, either when I saw the broken bits of news broadcast flashing by in my dreams, even the different distant countries will be suffering similar events. Kim Sae Jean became speechless as this revelation was just too sudden. That is why, there's a great need for us to prepare from here onwards. You say preparations? Yes, sir. Within the basement of our guild, we have numerous goblins, as well as griffins and hero orcs that grow stronger each passing day. However these won't be enough going forward, at least from the visions I saw in my dream. I suggest we strengthen knight's orders who are friendly with the guild. Unlike his past self, Kim Yusone's words were lengthy, disorganized and hurried, which meant Sae Jean couldn't quite grasp what the veteran mercenary was trying to say. There was a reason why Kim Yusone was feeling the urgency, however. Well, for now I don't quite understand it but regardless, I shall do what Mr. Kim Yusone has recommended. Please, talk to Mr. Joe Hansung and set a plan of action for the future. Yes, sir I understand. Kim Yusone replied powerlessly. Calamities created heroes Kim Sae Jean and his guild met the necessary conditions and possessed abilities to become exactly that with Sae Jean's abilities to pump out countless potions which would be highly sought after in the upcoming troubled times. As well as to craft fine weapons, vampires, and their sinister plans could be rendered all useless. Plus, the fame, wealth and the honor of the guild and its master, Kim Sae Jean, would literally shoot towards the heavens. However, there was a thin line separating between a hero and a monster. One wrong step, and a hero would become a monster in no time. And Kim Sae Jean's mind wasn't really settled at the moment. In the dreams Yusone had every now and then, Sae Jean was always worried and fearful. Maybe he couldn't sense it consciously, but his purest sense of self where his human and monster forms were all blended into one and rooted deeply within, was certainly feeling that way. In that case, sir, I shall give you a call again after having a meeting with Mr. Joe Hansung. Kim Yusone. Please do. Kim Yusone ended the communication with those words and let out a long sigh. The dream he experienced this time was quite lengthy. He could see the majority of it. That was why he remembered the words. TL, We Gwang Banjo. Sorry for leaving it in the raw Hanja form. The literal meaning is the sun's light brightening up the sky just before it sets. Basically, one's mind clearing up moments before death, or something close to that effect. Coep. Suddenly, he sensed something rushing out of his throat, so he quickly covered up his mouth with his hand. Dark crimson liquid escaped between his fingers and dripped down to the floor. Kuhiam. After throwing up the blood, Yusone quietly gazed at the crimson stain on the floor. 
he could clearly feel that he didn't have much time left this DN vampire's curse that was eating away what little life he had left. I hope that my son, Sunho, can do a good job after I'm gone. Yu Son had properly educated his son before all this, and he, Sun Ho, was already performing a lot of work as the head of the mercenaries. So, he'd have little trouble continuing on with his legacy. But still, he seemed to have trouble dealing with Kim Sae Jean. Sae Jean didn't mind letting someone else take charge. No, he was the type of person who actually welcomed it as long as there were no ulterior motives. This came about because of a lot of fear accumulating within him that made him worry about making the wrong decisions especially more so, if the effects of his decisions could create large ripples. I should create an opportunity for a sit-down soon. With darkened eyes, Kim Yusong stared at the world outside the window. The bright and fine sunlight cascaded down to earth. It was truly a beautiful image, worthy to be titled The Ordinary Life. Chapter 101 after finishing up the magic communication with Kim Yusong, Sae Jin shared breakfast with Yu Sae Young. Ah, uh, right. Appa, a few days ago, I saw a person who looked strangely like you. Although his head was still aching due to the serious nature of the communication he had just now, those words coming out of Yu Sae Young's mouth held more than enough power to make him pay close attention. What do you mean by that? Sae Jin. Feeling guilty, Sae Jean responded as quick as the flash of light as soon as she finished saying her words. Ah, well, the thing is, I took on the job of an instructor for the night evaluation exams duels. That's where I saw that person. U.S.A.E. Young. Really? M.M. On top of that, even though he was supposed to be a cadet, I was really surprised because he was so much stronger than any other cadets there. Maybe it's true that there's a doppelganger resembling each of us out there somewhere. With Appa, and that guy, it was really strange, you know. It was super interesting. While speaking, USAE Young took a sneaky glance at SAE Jean's direction to see his reaction, whether he'd show some form of jealousy with this however, all he did was put the spoon down rather coldly without showing an expression. What's the matter? It doesn't taste good again. USAE Young. Seeing this, USA Young asked, slightly worried. Ah, uh, no. It's not that, just. Kinda curious, since you say he resembles me. So, what happened to that cadet? SAE Jean. Oh, that. Well, even I'm unhappy regarding that part. I was planning to persuade him at the completion ceremony, you know. But it turns out, he had already refused invitations from all the other knight's orders, including the raven. I asked around, and apparently, he's applying to enter Eden. USAE Young. Really? She then nodded her head. Ing, right. Eden's entry barrier is uselessly tough, but then, their treatment of the members is lots worse when compared to the Dawn Shore. Your ranks might rise nice and easy during the evaluation exams since there's the special consideration applied when working for Eden, but still, I can't understand why he made a choice like that. She began to sing like a canary all on her own. But she still hadn't spoken about the most important part yet. So, does that mean Eden is going to drop him, then? S.A.E. Jean. Ha. Huh. What have you been listening to, Appa? I said, even I was surprised by him, you know. He's obviously been accepted. USAE Young. For real? Yeah. I asked directly, they're my dad. I was planning to snag him after a half year's wait if he got dropped, but, oh well. USAE Young. Maintaining the best poker face he could make, SAE Jean nodded. It was done. As soon as he displayed an almighty growth without restraint and reached the upper mid-tier, then. Appa, you weren't listening to me again just now, were you? What were you thinking about? Is it another woman? USAE Young. Ha. Huh. What are talking about? Didn't you say you are going somewhere with Hazeline Uni soon? Weren't you thinking about the trip? USAE Young. She was making a joke but her words still contained a slight amount of her true feelings and a bit of worry. No way. Besides, that's just for business. You know, related to alchemy. And so, at the sudden and swift change in the topic of conversation, 
Sae Jean began hastily giving away his best excuses. One week later. Just like the USAE young spoiler, Kim Sae Jean could become an honored knight of Eden as Jean Sehan. It seemed that the Eden's insignia, made out of pure platinum, possessed a certain magnetic charm that made knights of other top orders take envious glances at its wearers. Ajusi, let's do a good job. Standing right next to him during the accolade, the knighting ceremony, was E. Eugene. He still could clearly remember that after getting defeated at the duels, she cried her eyes out with the thought of failing to enter Eden taking a toll on her. However, her sole aim for the past six years studying in the academy was just to enter Eden and it seemed such a conviction was rated highly enough by the management of Eden in the end. S.A.E. Jean. We'll be seeing each other lots more in the future, so I don't think it's okay to not say anything to your colleague, though. E. Eugene. During the accolade as well as after its end, when they were walking out of the tower, E. Eugene yapped on and on non-stop. But her chattiness couldn't continue on forever. They are coming out. The matter of two knights emerging from a single exam who got accepted by Eden, was a great source of pride for the whole country, especially considering that there was only one successful entrant in the last three years. What the hell is this? E. Eugene. Already, countless reporters were camping out in front of the tower. E. Eugene and Kim S. A. E. Jean both narrowed their brows at the same time as the camera flashes exploded all around the two and loud shouts disguised as questions were thrown at them. But they never entered the tower's grounds before E. Eugene. Both of you. We'd like to hear your thoughts on becoming Eden's knights. Unnamed Reporter 1. We heard that the knight Jean Sehan was originally a homeless unnamed reporter too. Knight E. Eugene, please turn your pretty face this way. Unnamed Reporter 3. S.A.E. Jean had always felt this, but the people from the station MBS who asked that last question were truly a swarm of smelly houseflies. Wow, just what is the heck this? E. Eugene. E. Eugene panicked and stopped moving as the huge wave of people descended down on her. It was then, Kim S.A.E. Jean, as Jean Sehan, sent a meaningful gaze towards her and bravely stepped forward. In all honesty, though, there was no bravery involved here. He had done so many press conferences already, it was like they had become a part of his life at this point in time. He's coming. Another unnamed reporter. The waves of reporters then diverted towards Jean Sehan instead. Please tell us your thoughts. Are you satisfied with becoming an Eden's knight? What are your goals, hey move aside, man. Now that you've become an Eden's knight your goal. E.U. Ark. Help. My goal is let's rescue that guy first before he's crushed to death. S.A.E. Jean. Phew woo. T. Thank you very much. Unnamed reporter. My goal is quite simple. It's to rise to upper mid-tier within the next six months. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean had no need to lie, nor did he feel like lying in the first place. That was why, on this occasion, he replied truthfully with words that were honest from his perspective, but from the views of the gathered reporters, rather gallant and arrogant. For a short moment for about one second or so, the stillness ruled the world. But soon enough, countless camera flashes went off once more. While busy snapping S.A.E. Jean's pictures, these reporters were already cooking up headlines that could cause the maximum amount of controversy. An Eden's knight received more advantages in comparison to other knights within the same tier. After all, successfully entering Eden meant that one's abilities and future potential were greater than the others. But still, becoming an upper mid-tier knight within six months. Even a knight possessing heaven-defying talent and trait could not hope to achieve such a feat. Ha ha ha. That is quite a bold declaration. What will follow after that? The world's greatest knight. Or better still, the king of the knights. Reporter. I aim to become a high-tier knight within one year. Ah, right. When I say one year, I didn't mean one year after the six months spent in becoming a upper mid-tier. It's one year from now. S.A.E. Jean. Seemingly unaffected by the sarcastic tone of the reporter's question, S.A.E. Jean boldly replied. And the intensity of the camera flashes and questions only increased afterwards. A few. Using the gap created by the attention of reporters drawn towards Jean Sehan, 
Yi Yujin could finally escape the human barrier. Eugene. And then, Go Yunjiang, who was waiting at some distance away, approached her with a welcoming smiling that suited his personality to a T. What are you doing here? Are you waiting for me? You sure do like to waste your time, don't you? E. Eugene. Acting in an attitude rather contrary to what the bright smile blooming on her face indicated, Eugene put her arm around the shoulder of Go Yunjiang who had a similar height as her. Let's get out of here. As a celebration of becoming Eden's knights, I'll buy us a really expensive meal. E. Eugene. A new knight of Eden, Jean Sehan, aiming to become the best knight in the world within a year. Rising past the high tier and into the highest within a year. The confident new addition to the Eden's ranks. On the following day, news articles like the above flooded the airwaves. As expected, all the knights in various orders were outraged. Isn't he a crazy ashole? Disgruntled Knight 1. Not only crazy, but a GN fraud, too. Disgruntled Knight 2. For these folks, they could become a knight only after sacrificing their most important developing teenage years under the pretext of training. But now, a bloody hobo who seemingly had never put in effort in anything was looking down on the rest of knights, simply because he awakened a nice trait. A BD who doesn't even have any skills when is he going to show up at our order? Normally, an Eden's knight was given the right to enter or leave any knight's orders in the country, as they were seen as the so-called all-purpose knight. Of course, the Eden's knights could only enter non-restricted areas such as cafeterias and training grounds, but if the need arose, it was possible for them to partake in missions together with the knights from other orders. When he shows up, I'm going to rip him up a new one during a duel. Disgruntled Knight 3 and so, the man who was being bad-mouthed by not only the knights in the Dawn Order but by practically everyone else in the country, Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean was in the midst of leisurely attending a call-out. As if he was flying in the sky, he kicked the ground and soared up high, arriving at the outskirts of the Kanwan province. SFX for a loud roar of a monster. His target this time was a pair of troll brothers who were causing havoc on a road with the marking school painted on. No one knew how these two monsters had made their way this far, but to S.A.E. Jean, this event was nothing more than a day's work to fill up his performance quota. Kayak. E.U. Ark. The students leaving school to head back home began scattering away as soon as the trolls appeared, but still, a handful of girls couldn't do that as they fell on the ground, fear robbing them of their leg strength. All they could do was to cry endlessly while hoping that this was just a bad dream. SFX for pitiful sobbing. A large shadow drew upon a female student who was busy massaging her twisted ankle as she sobbed pitifully. Through her eyes, only open in a narrow slit, she confirmed the horrifying arm of the troll raised up high into the sky. It was impossible for her to think any further than this. Her head was blanking out. SFX for a loud explosion. The road trembled at the powerful shock wave. And then, the troll's arm raised up high began falling back down rather weakly. Kung. A troll collapsed on its knees and sensing something was wrong, the female student opened her tightly shut eyes ever so carefully. She saw the back of a certain man. It was the type of back that was so broad and dependable, the type that restored the peace of mind. Ah. When the female student let out a soft gasp of astonishment, the dude took a glance towards her. To her, this man looked like a model from overseas, no, a piece of an artwork, even with the lengthy beard that could be seen as a definite minus point by all women. Run away now. S.A.E. Jean. After speaking out those simple yet weighty words, he stepped forward towards the remaining troll. Watching him preparing for a fierce battle, even the troll became tensed up and it let out a loud roar. S.F.X. for a loud roar. But Kim S.A.E. Jean didn't back away. Only that, he poured all his power to take the next step forward and then, shot out like a bullet towards the monster. SFX for yet another loud roar of a troll. The troll responded by punching out. And so, a gigantic fist and a comparably puny hand met in the middle. However, the winner of this encounter was rather plainly obvious. The moment the two fists met, the troll's hand and the arm simply crumbled like a piece of soft tofu. After losing its limb with only a single strike, the troll staggered about disoriented, 
but then got its heart pierced by the subsequent punch and died on the spot. The street once filled with screams had now fallen utterly silent. Every citizen present dazedly stared at the bearded man. Cume. However, the bearded man did a fake cough as if he was embarrassed by all the attention he had garnered, and he quickly kicked the ground and left the area towards a destination unknown. Like a flittering mirage under the broad daylight, all these events had come to its swift conclusion less than one minute later. It didn't take too long a time to confirm what Kim Yusong's dream was all about. The time now was two weeks after Kim Sae Jin had killed the two trolls with the new identity as the Eden's Knight. Just about every headlines appearing on newspapers and broadcasts were shouting monster assault incidents. Throughout every corner of the country, from the densely populated cities to sparse rural areas, on average, 40 incidents of monsters assaulting citizens broke out and over 300 people lost their lives every day. The world quivered in fear at this unexplainable situation. However, during the time of unrest, heroes were destined to be born. This time, also the Night of Eden, Jean Sehan. Solo killing an ogre that appeared in the city of Kongwon. The advent of a new hero a knight who used to be a hobo the reason why attention focuses on Jean Sehan. The media couldn't control their excitement at the timely advent of a new hero. Possessing an unrivaled macho fighting style where he would kill any monster with a single punch. And with a sad backstory of being a homeless then, not pursuing wealth and instead choosing Eden a man with a dramatic life and overflowing with righteous conviction. Almost all the media outlets beautifully played around with all of these facts and thanks to that, only after three weeks since he began his activity, Jean Sehan had become the hottest news item in South Korea. Although, the truth was that many knights still denounced him as a manufactured hero, remembering that arrogant interview Jean Sehan gave after the accolade. Whatever. His fame and popularity soared higher every day. And his particular fighting style also attracted the attention of the Knight Academy. We at the Academy would like to utilize the footage of your battle style. But will it be okay with you? Oh, of course, we will pay you the appropriate royalties as well. Academy Official Eden was seen as an all-purpose knight's order, so its knights had the qualifications to participate in any and all events related to monsters. However, such qualifications meant that there were responsibilities to handle as well. Jean Sehan had to meet a representative from the Knights Academy at the request of Eden's higher-ups. You say, my footage? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. Mr. Jean Sehan's fighting style has, in its own unique way, has its own uses, and it's also popular currently as well, so our thoughts are. By using the footage of your fighting style as an educational material, won't we be able to bring forth a positive change? Ah, and also, there's the matter of profits earned from royalties. We don't hold normal type of classes but instead, they are structured as an one-on-one -on -one lecture with an instructor and so, students can choose which classes they enter. Parent seems to go with the flow of popularity, so if we take into account the fame of Mr. Jean Sehan well, I believe the profit should be substantial. Academy Official Not thinking too deeply, Jean Sehan just nodded his head. If, because of him, the talents of young cadets could blossom, then wouldn't that be a good thing, all things considered? Of course, the truth of the matter was, the fist attack was simply a bonus derived from the skill weapon mastery, but still. If someone wished to follow in his footsteps, then surely, there would be someone out there who might be able to. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. S.A.E. Jean. Oh. The representative of the academy didn't have as simple line of thought as S.A.E. Jean did, so it couldn't be helped that he got deeply stunned by Jean Sehan Kim S.A.E. Jean easily agreeing to it. Now normally, most knights tried their best to avoid showing the footage of their battles publicly the higher their tears rose. The excuse given was that their weaknesses could be revealed to the world, but really, it would not feel all that nice to see someone else copying their moves. But this Jean Sehan readily agreed to it. Despite the fact that he could remain as a unique individual, he didn't even put forward any other conditions. Even with this much, the representative had so much to be thankful for but what he heard next made his jaw drop all the way to the floor. By the way, I don't need the royalties. S.A.E. Jean. His reason was simple. He just had too much money right now. Actually, 
he would not be able to exhaust it even if he spent it willy-nilly right up until his death. Instead, make lectures with my footage free to attend, or give cadet scholarships with it. S.A.E. Jean. The representative forgot his words. This day, he felt it right down to his bones. That beard, goatee, those thick lines of his face, that fierce look they were nothing but a mere shell. This man's true personality was just like that of a generous saint, something that couldn't be compared to anyone. Well, if that is all. S.A.E. Jean. After letting the representative taste a new and fresh type of shock, Jean Sehan rose up from his seat. To realize how wrong he was when he blindly pursued the ideals of unchecked capitalism the academy official felt a huge pang of remorse as he continued to longingly gaze at the departing back of Jean Sehan. Chapter 102 The profession of alchemy is all about creating value out of things that are of little worth by themselves. Not only is it a platform for concocting potions but also Every single person present here wore thick hoods covering their heads like a bunch of criminals and here being, a conference organized by the Alchemy Association. And as expected, it was quite a boring affair. It wasn't only S.A.E. Jean who thought like this, but his companion sitting next to him, Hazeline, also thought so as well, judging by how often she yawned out and sighed deeply as the proceedings continued. Just when is this going to end? S.A.E. Jean the reason why he attended this conference as the master of the guild and not as the goblin alchemist, was rather simple. The efforts of the goblin alchemist had stirred up the other alchemists and that led to the Korean potion market going through an unprecedented boom right now. And so, with a surplus of potion supplies locally, he was planning to export to overseas markets that were suffering from acute potion shortages. Please wait for a little while longer. It'll be our turn soon to announce the innovative new plan of the Goblin Alchemist. As soon as that's done, we'll leave Hazeline. He continued to yawn out while waiting for their turn to come. And so, five minutes passed by, then ten minutes, then another twenty. His valuable time was slowly bleeding away. There is currently a certain alchemist who is receiving a lot of attention from all over the world, and he is the Goblin Alchemist. One or two among us here have either called him the inheritor of Rhodes's legacy, or as the revolutionary of the alchemical profession. Well, I should get going now. When I call for you, Mr. S.A.E. Jean should come up to the stage and read off the script we prepared before. Hazeline. Hazeline lightly tapped S.A.E. Jean's shoulder and while lowering her head, disappeared off to somewhere. And now, we would like to welcome the manager of the Yosian Alchemy House. Who had discovered that very alchemist, to the stage. Hazeline walked up on the stage. As alchemists didn't enjoy raising loud ruckus, not one of them clapped hands. Only that, a handful of them shot gazes of envy and jealousy towards the stage. Ku, Kum. Her entire body hidden under a thick robe, Hazeline surveyed the surroundings for a bit before swallowing down her saliva. H, 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 hello. E, 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 everyone. And then, a catastrophe began unfolding. Hazeline and Kim S.A.E. Jean made their announcement of exporting the Goblin Alchemist's potions overseas. As expected of a dark elf who had never stepped on a stage in front of so many people, Hazeline's speech was all over the place, full of stuttering and going off topic constantly. But since it was seen as a normal thing, alchemists simply accepted the presentation without much problem. Your new car is really nice and comfortable. Hazeline. After safely negotiating her way out of the seminar, they were currently returning home in S.A.E. Jean's new car. Hazeline was busy touching here, there and everywhere of the car's interior and admiring it. You think so? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. You made a good choice. Isn't this model from a famous brand? Hazeline. He smiled without saying anything. Not only was the brand very famous, this particular model had such a low production volume, it was very hard to buy one but he didn't feel the need to say this out aloud. Night Jean Sehan has ascended to low mid-tier. When Hazeline's curious fingers touched the stereo, the news about Jean Sehan leaked out, causing Kim S.A.E. Jean to quickly switch it off. We are hearing a lot of that guy's news nowadays. Hazeline. Seems like it. By the way, there is something that makes me curious whenever I am with Miss Hazeline S.A.E. Jean. 
He glanced at the perfect side profile of her face and carefully changed the subject. Mm. -hmm. What is it? Hazeline. Ah, uh, the thing is. But Mr. Kim Sae Jean, are you really in a position to be curious about other women? I thought you're no different from a married man now. Hazeline. Hazeline replied while smiling. So Sae Jean let out a fake cough and concentrated on driving instead. As an aside, the matter of him living together with dating USAE Young was widely known by every member of the guild by now. According to E. Hyrin's testimony, USAE Young said it herself in a slip of a tongue type of incident. Haha, <laughs> I was just kidding. It's a joke. Well, in any case I'm quite close to SAE Young, so I guess it's fine. What are you curious about? You can ask me anything. After all, SAE Jean is my benefactor and all. Hazeline. At those words, SAE Jean glanced at her once more. Well, Miss Hazeline. You are a dark elf, yes. SAE Jean. Yes, that's correct. Hazeline. But SAE Jean. Ah. Hazeline. Before he could finish saying what was on his mind, she began nodding her head slowly as if she figured it out. My skin. You are curious about that, yes? Hazeline. Yes. There were three types of elves out there regular elves, high elves, and dark elves. Here, the regular elves referred to those beautiful beings known in the mass media for possessing flawless milky skin, gorgeous facial features, as well as smooth and supple limbs. Next was the high elves. Also sometimes referred to as noble elves, they possessed rich and pure bloodlines and commanded admiration and respect from other elves. Finally, dark elves. Not only they preferred darker places, their skin tone was also darker than other elves, so they were called dark elves. M.M. -m Hazeline. Seeing Hazeline's creased brows as if this question was greatly troubling her, S.A.E. Jean ended up swallowing down his saliva. Maybe it was because of curiosity, the words you don't have to tell me if it's too troublesome circled around in his mouth before disappearing completely. Do you wish to know? Hazeline. Oh, that well. S.A.E. Jean. He deliberately hesitated. Hazeline deeply stared at him before a slight grin broke out on her lips. Since the goblin alchemist says he's curious it's actually simple, really. I brewed a certain potion, you see. Hazeline. Pardon. S.A.E. Jean. You know, a potion. A potion. A potion that whitens the skin. I almost died after drinking that thing but still, I ended up with this pale skin. Hazeline. Her words were difficult to understand, but on the flip side, he could accept some part of her explanation. After all, she didn't question him too much and believed him when he spewed out that nonsense about concocting a potion to grow taller and stuff back then. But why did you create a potion like that? Surely, Miss Hazeline would have been plenty beautiful with a darker skin tone Hazeline. Mr. Kim Sae Jean, you seem curious about a lot of things today. Hazeline. Sae Jean tried to inquire a little bit further but Hazeline cut him off with a smile. He stopped asking there after detecting a clear message of warning in the tone of her voice. The topic of conversation then changed back to their daily lives did he and USA Young move house, no they didn't how much did they earn, that was a secret. As their chatting continued, before long they arrived in front of Hazeline's house. While inwardly praising its capability that matched its million dollar price tag, S.A.E. Jean parked the car. Take care. S.A.E. Jean. I will. Thank you for your help again. Ah, right. You still remember that we are meeting again in two weeks' time, yes? We need to negotiate with the overseas contact, the one suggested by you. Looks like we'll have to fly over to the USA. Hazeline. Huh. At this unexpected revelation, S.A.E. Jean went blank-faced as he tilted his head. What's the matter? Hazeline. You mean, I, I need to fly over there on a plane? Of course. A proxy officially appointed by the alchemist must be present during the talks I thought I told you this already. Hazeline. But, that. Watching S.A.E. Jean breaking out in panic, a thick smile began to infuse on Hazeline's lips. 
well, it shouldn't be a problem, yes. Mr. S.A.E. Jean can afford a lot of time nowadays, too. Three days and two nights should be more than enough, I think. Has a line. But you know of my S.A.E. Jean. Yes, I remember. But I know Mr. S.A.E. Jean's secrets already, so it's fine. I'll personally call and tell S.A.E. Young after I finish up work tomorrow. Has a line. Tack. U.S.A.E. Young angrily slammed the spoon down on the table. There were many emotions showing up on her face anger, dismay, fear, worries, etc., etc. But do you think that even makes sense? U.S.A.E. Young. Her voice was as cold as permafrost. But it's work, though. S.A.E. Jean. Even then. No wait. If that's the case, then I'll go with you. U.S.A.E. Young. I wish that's possible, but right now, you got your mobilization orders, don't you? S.A.E. Jean. Not only the Dawn Knight's order, but everyone else except Eden, received the mobilization orders because of the ongoing monster incidents not only were they tasked with eradicating the monsters. But they had to go out on patrol and currently, Knights couldn't even sleep for more than three hours a day as a result. Ah, uh, ah, uh, but why? Does Appa have to go? Is it a problem for Uni to go alone? USAE Young. That's how important this deal is. Besides, I'll be accompanied by Mr. Sunho and a few other mercenaries, so you don't have to worry about me. SAE Jean. Dang it. USAE Young. To think the son of Kim Yusone, Kim Sunho was going too, she carried a big pout while roughly fidgeting around with the poor spoon. She had lots of things she'd like to say. Really lots. But she couldn't voice any of them in fear of being seen as a narrow minded woman. Hm, SAE Jean. S.A.E. Jean quietly looked at her for a while, before reaching out and smoothly held her hand. I'll be back soon. In fact, I'll hurry it up. Since I'll end up missing you way too much, you know. S.A.E. Jean. He spoke with a smooth baritone voice while a gentle smile hung on his lips. U.S.A.E. Young met his eyes and then, let out a long sigh. It was a fact that the person who loved more would feel more anxiety as well and she had already decided to persevere through it all anyways. You'll call every day. USAE Young. Of course. Always with slick answers I wonder if a flying monster will show up or something. USAE Young. A late evening, the day before SAE Jean's departure. He had to make his way towards the mercenary company offices after Kim Yusone urgently called for him. And before S.A.E. Jean could say words of concern regarding the veteran mercenary's pale complexion, Kim Yusone hurriedly brought up the reason for this unplanned meeting. I had another dream, sir. However, in this one I believe that we need to alert the world right away. Kim Yusone. Excuse me. S.A.E. Jean. The future world I saw in my dream was not prepared at all, sir. It was no different from a living hell. That is why, we need to raise the alertness of the world at a bare minimum. Kim Yu Son. SAE Jean became flustered slightly by the sight of Kim Yu Son, who was seemingly a lot more urgent compared to when they conversed over the magic communication crystal. Ah, that there are a lot of questions I'd like to ask, but first, will anyone believe it even if it's us saying it? SAE Jean. It was a reasonable question. When one tried to predict the advent of a huge event, there was a danger of being branded as a crazy man suffering from delusions, or be seen as a conspiracy theorist instead. Even if one used the excuse of a trait, the result might end up the same. Of course, no one would listen seriously at the words of either me or you, the guild master. However, don't we have a certain trump card that can make everyone within South Korea trust in our words? Kim Yu Son. Even Kim Sae Jin understood right away. The mercenary Leakin. We should send a letter with the Leakin signature to the SID, and then hold a press conference. Kim Yu Son. Still, even if they believe us, wouldn't the confusion within the populace be too great? I mean, since the current situation of the monster incidents are serious, we'll have to come to a compromise with the government, to SAE Jean. This could bring about mass hysteria in the form of panic buying of supplies, armed robbery, and other survival instincts of humans commonly seen during the time of conflict, or even during the quasi-state of war. 
That is just the tip of the iceberg, sir. Kim Yusun. Within the energyless eyes of Kim Yusun, impatience could be spied. Seeing such urgency from him was a first Kim Sae Jin could only nod his head in silence while looking at him. Even then, Kim Yusun showed no signs of standing up from his seat, so Sae Jin pulled out his phone and called Jo Hansung. Hello, master. It's Jo Hansung here. Although he was being treated as the real authority of the guild and received hundreds of requests a day, as usual, Jo Hansung maintained humility when talking to Sae Jin. I'm not sure when it'll happen, but no, in two months' time, the Leakin is going to announce something big, so please have a chat with the relevant government officials. And prepare accordingly as well. Sae Jin. I beg your pardon. Jo Hansung wielded considerable power and had become a person who wouldn't even bat an eyelid when hearing the names of politicians and chables, but then, the weight that name carried still seemed quite considerable. But how? Please don't ask any more than this. And. Right, there is something else. Those idiots from MBS Network. When we are holding the press conference, don't invite them. SAE Jean. As an aside, MBS was a trashy media outlet that always tried to pick a fault with the activities of SAE Jean and the Monster Guild. Although this might be seen as a cheap trick, it couldn't be helped as those bastards weren't the type of people who'd listen when spoken to nicely. I already told them we won't give them any more information whatsoever in the future unless their president comes over here and apologizes personally. Jo Hansung. As expected, you took care of that really well. Sae Jean. Thank you very much, sir. As for preparations firstly, for the venue, which place should we choose, sir? Selecting a correct place to hold a press conference was important. Rather than holding it within the grounds of the guild or the main hall of the Monster Mercenary Company. Can we get permission from the Dawn Order? SAE Jean. Lately, USAE Young had been saying this as if she was throwing it out there that he was neglecting the Dawn and was getting too friendly with the Raven instead. If she was saying this much, then her father and grandfather must have had displayed their dissatisfaction since from a while ago. Yes, sir. It shouldn't be an issue. In fact, I believe they might welcome us. With this conference being held within the Dawn's premises, SAE Jean would be able to show to the rest of the country that their relationship was still tight as ever. Then, let's go with that. SAE Jean. When Kim SAE Jean decided and ended the call, Kim Yu Son let out a relieved sigh with an equally relieved expression. Chapter 103 It was an early summer morning, but the temperature was already very high. Hazeline was waiting for Kim Sae Jin's arrival in the Incheon International Airport. Hey, isn't she an elf? A passerby one. Look at her pale skin. I think you might be right. A passerby two. Should we go and ask her? A passerby one. It was fine for her to wait, since she was the one who showed up earlier than scheduled, but still. Hazeline found it hard to endure those pointed stares of curiosity and envy thrown at her way thanks to the thick robe she happened to wear at the moment. Hell, one or two thoughtless morons lowered their line of sight and tried to take a peek at her face without holding back, even. Just like now, with these two buffoons. Hazeline wanted so bad to shower these clueless idiots and their ugly mugs with a deadly magic spell, but held herself back by relying on some superhuman endurance. My temper has gone softer by a lot, huh? Has a line. If it was in the past, she'd have caused an incident by now. While feeling amazed by her own mellowing personality, Hazeline pulled out her phone. I'll be arriving there shortly. I meant to arrive there earlier, but several paparazzi got stuck on me. She was about to call Sae Jean to find out where he was, only to see a text message from him sitting unopened in her phone. Hazeline typed a reply no need to rush without thinking too much and sent it, then began browsing the web. To appease her boredom, she began messing around various portal sites, and before long, curiosity overtook her so she typed the words Kim Sae Jean in the search engine. Kim Sae Jean. 188 cm. One of the most talked about persons. The profile pic shown was of a rather cool-looking man and the information about him popping up on the search results were good enough to slap the faces of most middle-of-the-road celebrities. 
There were lots of photos of him walking by the pavement, totally unaware stories of his daily activities and his act of kindness that no one knew about until now he even donated close to one million to the orphanage he grew up in. Miss Hazeline As she was deeply immersed in the depths of internet, she heard a voice calling out from somewhere and so, she slightly lifted her head to look. Ah, my apologies. The thing is those paparazzi. S.A.E. Jean. A tall, leggy man wearing a pair of sunglasses was walking straight towards her direction. Although he only wore a simple white t-shirt and a pair of blue jeans, his tall height and the perfect body shape brought those clothes to life. While his voice that sounded sexy no matter where it was heard caused all the attention to focus on him. Hazeline dazedly stared at the deep smile drawn on the lips visible below the sunglasses, the kind that celebrities like to wear, before waking up suddenly and glared at the man in a somewhat unhappy manner. It's fine. I only waited for twenty minutes, after all. Hazeline. The promise time was ten o'clock, but now, it was twenty past ten. Kim S.A.E. Jean could only scratch the back of his neck. I'm truly sorry. We got held up trying to deal with the paparazzi. Kim Sun Ho. From behind S.A.E. Jean, Kim Sun Ho emerged and began apologizing in his stead. I said, it's fine. Let's hurry and get going. Hazeline. Feeling awkward now, Hazeline quickly turned around and pulled her carry-on bag, heading towards the boarding gate. The airplane that used mana stones as a fuel source only needed one hour to land on the city of San Francisco's international airport. Although the trip took only one hour, thanks to time zone differences, Currently it was 8 in the evening in California. Still. Time left before needing to change, 14 hours 45 minutes 94 seconds. Since his trade operated on the internal clock instead, he had quite a bit of free time. However. Over there. SFX for countless number of camera flashes going off. The crazy explosions of camera lights and the questions from the crowd of reporters went off as soon as S.A.E. Jean's traveling party left the airport's gates, and they were more than enough to make him and his group dizzy for a brief moment. What the? S.A.E. Jean. Wah, 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 what has a line? Compared to how has a line reacted, one could say S.A.E. Jean was much more cool-headed. Seeing the throng of welcoming. Crowd filling up the airport. Her legs continued to shake uncontrollably before she dived behind S.A.E. Jean and hid there. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. D. D. Do something. I. 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 I can't. Handle. Th. This. You know. Has a line. Guild Master S.A.E. Jean. Please look this way. This way. Unnamed reporter. For this potion export deal, the current vice president scandal of the USA made an unprecedented move and sent the words of his appreciation to the Korean government and has expressed his anticipation. What are your thoughts on unnamed reporter 2? Hazeline looked like she might throw up at any moment now, yet these reporters, speaking in Korean somehow, continued with their rush. Kim S.A.E. Jean helped her stand before she collapsed and signaled Kim Sun Ho with his eyes. Please do not worry. Kim Sun Ho. As soon as the message was received, Sun Ho and the subordinate mercenaries bravely stepped forward and created the exit route. As expected of former knights, they were worth every penny, and both S.A.E. Jean and Hazeline faced no further troubles as they left the airport. After that chaos, the traveling party could just barely arrive at the luxury hotel located downtown in Los Angeles. Called Promance, almost all the floors from the ground all the way up to the penthouse suite, were booked out. And that penthouse suite occupied the entire top floor. For now looks like we'll have to form a contract with both Rockman Potions and TRYTH Potions, or at least with one of them. They are the biggest suppliers this side, after all. Hazeline. Right now, Hazeline and Kim S.A.E. Jean were holding a business meeting on the penthouse suite. They are both corporations, though. S.A.E. Jean. But of course. The way things operate can't be the same between Korea and the States, you know. Hazeline. The situation of the alchemy world in the States was rather different compared to that of South Korea. Within the border of the comparably tiny South Korea, the small to medium alchemy houses took over the duty of potion supply. But in the far, 
far bigger U.S. of A, two or three big corporations held exclusive rights to distribute potions in a given state. And since the political and financial muscles of these corporations were indeed powerful, the alchemists here couldn't maintain their anonymity as much as their counterparts in South Korea. Put simply, although this setup was better for the wider market as a whole, it was actually more disadvantageous towards the suppliers the alchemists themselves. TL, just so you know, I do not agree with this author on this point. This setup seems far better for individual alchemists if you ask me. But I'm not the one writing this novel, just a measly TLer, so. All the proposed terms sound good so far. Minus the distribution fees, 85% of profits will be handed over to us. Has a line. But Kim Sae Jin's guild was seemingly a special exception to this rule. The truth was, though, it wasn't just Kim Sae Jin, only the federal government had initiated a new policy of looking after their own alchemists quite recently. And that was due to the potion drought, obviously. A steady, near unchanging peace had been maintained throughout the world for a long time, and that led to the lessening of the dangers inherent in monster hunts. That, in turn, led to a decline in the demand and supply of potions. But now, with the sudden explosion of chaos caused by monsters happening all over the globe, the demand had gone through the roof literally overnight. But only the South Korea was able to escape this flow of events happening in the world, as its potion supply had been quite healthy for a while thanks to a certain genius alchemist's efforts the goblin. Well, in that case let's meet them first and then decide. S.A.E. Jean. If it was any other businessman, he would have to carefully assess the terms offered and the people offering them, but fortunately, S.A.E. Jean possessed a certain trump card that allowed him to decipher the true intentions of any person he met. Of course, no truly successful businessman worth their salt would be completely innocent, as it were. But still, it would be a big help if he could pick the lesser of the evils available out there. Yes, let's do that. For now, it's getting late already, so get some rest for tomorrow. Hazeline. Hazeline unhurriedly gathered the scattered documents and then got up, heading towards the adjoining room to the right side. As an aside, thanks to Kim Sae Jin's trait, it was decided that the penthouse suite would be shared between him, Kim Sun Ho and Hazeline, but it was Hazeline who ended up with the best room there. Then, let's end here for today. Sae Jin. As soon as Kim Sun Ho nodded his head, Sae Jin changed into a wolf. However, even at this sudden transformation, Sun Ho's expression didn't change. The following day, Kim Sae Jin and Hazeline went and met the representatives from the two aforementioned corporations in turn. Both of them offered the very best terms they could afford. In order to not miss out on this chance to break through the current potion drought and disregarding a few minor details meant to keep in check the rival influences, both contracts seemed quite profitable for Kim Sae Jin. Also, after the two meetings concluded, these corporations even did something wholly unnecessary and roped in a high-ranking government official from the current federal administration to stop by at the hotel and greet Sae Jin and company. Asking if there was anything he could do. We've already concluded talks with the Korean government. With this deal in place, the partnership between the Korean government and our side will strengthen even further. Unnamed government official. Is that so? Sae Jin. In all honesty, Sae Jin found it a bit burdensome by the fact that a measly little potion export deal could change the future direction of a country. But the official, the vice minister from the Monster Affairs Ministry, continuously emphasized this point in order to inflate the importance of this deal. Of course. After all, you have chosen the United States of America ahead of everyone else soon, I believe Mr. President will hold a press conference and directly announce the deal to the public. Unnamed government official. Kume. Right, by the way, I see that your Korean is really fluent. Sae Jin. But, feeling his face getting hotter, Sae Jin just had to change the topic. Honestly, it was rather mystifying to see a well-dressed white man speak so fluently in Korean. It's only a par for the course. Because of the current outbreak of all these monster-related incidents across the world, the core interest of us at the Monster Affairs Ministry is centered around on alchemy and weapons. Whether it's alchemy or weapons especially in alchemy there are a lot of disadvantages if one does not understand Korean. Unnamed government official. That's how it is. Sae Jin. 
This was probably because the website called Alchemy Page that S.A.E. Jean and Hazeline had co-founded, as well as various recipes and thesis written about ingredients they had began revealing publicly since a while ago. Yes. By relying on others to translate and explain the new information appearing in real time on Alchemy Page, isn't it the same thing as voluntarily falling behind everyone else? Unnamed Official on Alchemy Page, an alchemist-exclusive space provided by the monster, the goblin alchemist had revealed accurate information on medicinal ingredients that not many knew about. As well as recipes for painlessly concocting low- to mid-grade potions. Higher-grade potion recipes were withheld, though, since they were trade secrets, after all. Thanks to this, the internet-loving alchemists migrated en masse away from the Alchemy Cafe website and found a new home in the monster's Alchemy Page. Unlike the Alchemy Café which was full of gossip and backtalk, the new site was filled with academic discussions regarding the art and science behind alchemy, thus drawing in and educating many alchemists in the process. And now, just like what this government official was saying, many alchemists were utilizing this website not to fall behind the others. And the site had soon evolved into a world-famous academic forum where many visitors were learning the Korean language in order to make a better use of the valuable info available there. As an aside, for some weird reason, Hazeline hated the Alchemy Café, so whenever she took a look at its near-instant decline into oblivion. Compared to her own Alchemy page that was growing in popularity every day, she had this content grin etched on her face. In that case, have you decided on the contract yet? Unnamed government official. We are still deliberating on the matter. Hazeline. Hazeline replied in his stead. By the way, both of them were trying to play some kind of trivial tricks with us, you see. Hazeline. Seeing the official's expression darken, S.A.E. Jean added his words right away. But since we came all the way to the States, we do plan to make this contract happen. S.A.E. Jean. Ah, ah ha ha ha. That's a relief to hear. Unnamed government official. S.A.E. Jean also broke out in a short laughter after witnessing the color return to the official's face. Ah, that's right. If they try any other strange tricks, please do not hesitate and give me a call. Here's my card. Unnamed government official. Seeing this earnest attitude of caring about SAEG more than his own country's corporations. Of course. We'll give you a call. SAEG. SAEG didn't refuse the man and received the card. And so, all the meetings concluded by nine in the evening. Kim S.A.E. Jean, Hazeline, Kim Sun Ho as well as other mercenaries returned to their quarters, thinking that they might get to enjoy the remainder of their stay in this ultra-upmarket hotel as a paid-for holiday. A.M. Midnight Midnight Kim S.A.E. Jean's eyes snapped open in the middle of the night. There was a nearly imperceptible tremor and the ominous aura. Even while feeling uncertain, his body must have sensed the approaching dangers, as his claws had extended out already. He couldn't tell where this feelings of danger was originating from. But the instincts of the wolf told him there was no time to spare. He shot out from his own room and headed straight for Hazeline's. Kayak. As soon as she was woken by the shape of a wolf bursting into her room as if breaking the door down, Hazeline screamed her lungs out. W, 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 what do you think you're doing right now? With one hand, she pulled the blanket tightly while the other hand was getting ready to fire a magic spell. Her voice shook as she asked. Get, get out of here, right now. Kayak. M, Mr, Sun Ho, and what are you doing here, too? Before Hazeline's screams could end, even Kim Sun Ho was rushing into her room as well. And at the same time. Kugugugong. An unsettling vibration shook the entire hotel. Instinctively, all three present turned their heads to left. They had sensed something looking at them. And there, beyond the wall made of thick plate glass, they saw a pair of terrifyingly huge red eyeballs staring at their direction. On that grotesquely distorted face, the only things that seemed relatively normal were those two eyes. It was a duerkshirne. TL, well, this is a subtype of the Dakibi. There is no western equivalent that I can think of just think of a Japanese oni crossed with the attack on titan's giants. And you're halfway there. FCK. They moved really fast. 
Changing back to the human form, Sae Jean quickly embraced Hazeline and began running to the opposite direction from the huge monster. Cast the magic barrier, now. Sae Jean. And then, while shouting at Hazeline held tight in his arms, Sae Jean ran to the right and broke through another thick plate glass, descending hundreds of meters down to the ground. Chapter 104 Although he fell from the top floor of the hotel located high up, it only took briefest of moments for his airborne feet to touch the solid ground. Quahang. The ground where Kim Sae Jean landed on caved into a deep crater, and a powerful shock wave spread around to the surroundings. Are you unhurt? Sae Jean. He looked at Hazeline who had tightly wrapped her arms around his neck. Fortunately, she seemed to have activated the barrier in time, and wasn't negatively affected by the abrupt descent. Yeah. I'm fine thanks to you. However Hazeline. Indeed, there was a far more pressing matter to focus at that moment. On the road they had just landed on quite noisily, countless small and large duurkshernees were there waiting, as if to surround the duo. First time seeing one with my own eyes. Sae Jean. Me too. Hazeline. The Duerkshirne, dot. A creature of emptiness that made nary a sound or possessed substance a creature that could only be seen by the naked eye and by nothing else. Their individual sizes may have differed from one to the other, but without fail, all of them were glaring at Kim Sae Jean and Hazeline's direction with those creepy red eyes. At this rather unsettling sight, Hazeline hugged Sae Jean tighter without realizing it. Kum. At this unexpected skinship, Sae Jean even forgot how severe the current situation was and ended up getting tensed up somewhat. But then. Kong. Are you two alright? Kim Sun Ho. Belatedly, mercenaries led by Kim Sun Ho descended and landed on the ground as well. Almost at the same time, the gigantic Duerkshirne swung its equally huge arm and slammed into the hotel Kim Sae Jean and company were staying just now. Kuong. A huge explosion filled up the world, shaking the eerie stillness and ripping it apart the streets, formerly bathed with pitch-black darkness became showered in bright lights at the same time. As if that was the signal, all the small and large Duerkshirnees occupying every inch of the road began their frenzied activity. Kim Sae Jean quickly put Hazeline down on the ground and swung his fist towards a Duerkshirne that was right in front of the rushing pack. Although its face was smashed to bits in one hit, a certain unpleasant sensation came washing all over his body from coming in contact with the uniquely disgusting skin of a Duerkshirne as well as from its blackish-red blood. Yuck! While frowning deeply in disgust, Sae Jean extracted mana out of his body and then used the orc smithing technique. Susususu. Mana slowly condensed as if to form a crystal, and soon enough, it took on the shape of a blue sword. Since Sae Jean's proficiency level for mana body was still on the low, the sword's strength and overall hardness was somewhat imperfect, but as he had used mana as the base ingredient, its sharpness would still be top-notch. Shia Ak. He struck out a sword aura and it bisected a Duerkshirne cleanly in half. Unfortunately, this created for mana weapon he wielded couldn't last long. When he cut five or six monsters down, the sword dissipated away like a cloud of dust. Whenever that happened, though, Sae Jean created a weapon that could last a bit longer than before and continued to slay countless Duerkshirnees. The afterimage left behind in the wake of a sword swing was then pierced straight through by a lengthy spear. And the smooth sword aura drawn from a longsword undulated like a snake, effortlessly slicing apart limbs and bodies of the monsters coming in contact with it. A long sword, a padao, a long saber, a rapier, a main gauche, a claymore, a spear, etc., etc. All these disparate weapon types found themselves in the hands of a weapons expert and were utilized like true treasures. But how Hazeline? Hazeline dazedly stared at Sae Jean's battle as he fought relying solely on his senses while swapping his weapons out every ten seconds, before she finally woke up and began reciting the chants for a magic spell. Her target was the gigantic Duerkshirne that was currently searching for a certain someone without making a single noise. Although a totally unexpected hell had broken out, Kim Sae Jean and his party could safely survive the ensuing chaos. That was because, in less than five minutes, a statewide mobilization order had been issued by the Californian state governor. Exactly fifteen minutes after the hotel collapsed, 
army tanks and seemingly thousands of knights and hunters poured in, completely sweeping away every single Duer Chinese present. After the incident came to an end, that same vice minister from earlier arrived in haste and began explaining the reason for this unprecedented swiftness of the response that it was because the U.S. government didn't want to see the export deal going down the proverbial drain. He even made a desperate face as he implored S.A.E. Jean to not think too badly of them because of this incident. Hua. S.A.E. Jean. And so, S.A.E. Jean and his group could catch their breath while being protected by the knights. After hearing the rumors about them, all the knights present here were deeply fearful of this potion deal going down the train, so they were constantly worrying about S.A.E. Jean and company being comfortable and stuff. I was panicking then what a relief that Mr. S.A.E. Jean was there. Also, for the first time in my life, I'm now a top VIP, too I'm more used to being chased around, you know. Hazeline. There was no energy in Hazeline's voice. Are you hurt anywhere? S.A.E. Jean. Maybe because I've exhausted my mana I'm kinda of feeling dizzy and sleepy. Hazeline. She spoke up to here and slowly leaned her head against S.A.E. Jean's shoulder. Of course, her fragrant scent drifted into his nose and lightly tickled the senses. Most other women would get really alarmed and call Hazeline's actions crafty like a fox, but as a guy, S.A.E. Jean simply couldn't push her away so, all he could do was to let out a fake cough just once. Hume is that so? S.A.E. Jean. Yeah. By the way, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. You were somewhat cool back there. Since when did you become so proficient in handling weapons like that? Has a line. Recalling once more the sight of the overwhelming martial prowess he displayed, Hazeline asked, her face glowing warmly. Molding mana into various weapons such as swords, great swords, spears anyone would be deeply impressed by the coolness of him defeating all his enemies regardless of what the weapon was in his hand. Ha ha ha. Kim S.A.E. Jean simply broke out in laughter. Hazeline looked at him as if she found his demeanor rather interesting, but then, her expressions hardened. However just who summoned all those Duerkshernes here? Hazeline. A Duerkshirne was not a normal type of a monster. Special existences found in the gap between the rift and the material world, they could only be called forth with a summoning ceremony or a witchcraft of some kind. And more importantly, they would follow the command of the one who summoned them to the letter. In other words, to see a swarm of Duerkshernese suddenly attack the hotel S.A.E. Jean was staying in, there was really no need to ponder too deeply what their purpose was. S.A.E. Jean could think of someone who might be behind this incident. However, he didn't feel like saying the truth out aloud right now. Don't worry about such things and just get a good rest. He gritted his teeth and hardened his expression as well. Hazeline gazed at him for a bit longer, and then, lowered her head back down against his shoulder. While closing her eyes, she was thinking, his shoulders are so broad. Leaving the responsibility of finding out the culprits behind the mass summoning of Duerkshernese to the American government, S.A.E. Jean and Hazeline hurried with concluding the deal. Since they had already received advice from Joe Hansung, they were able to get the ball rolling faster than expected. S.A.E. Jean then signed the contract with both corporations at the same time, the distribution of potions in the west of the USA now being handled by them. To minimize the risk of getting ambushed once more, as soon as the deal was signed, S.A.E. Jean and his group rushed back to South Korea. And now, he was driving Hazeline back home towards the Kongwon province. My first impression of Mr. S.A.E. Jean was only about S.O.S.O. Hazeline. Just S.O.S.O. S.A.E. Jean. Yep. You know this too, don't you? That elves have high standards. It's the same story for dark elves, too. Hazeline. Kim S.A.E. Jean and Hazeline she was perhaps one person S.A.E. Jean had known the longest. While driving, they chatted about this and that in a friendly atmosphere, as for the past two years there was unexpectedly a lot of memories they had shared. The day they first met when S.A.E. Jean revealed his identity to her when she mistook him as the inheritor of Rhodes's legacy when those vampires suddenly ambushed them, etc., etc. Ah, that's right. Mr. S.A.E. Jean, you said you were curious, right? The reason for my skin being this color. Has a line. Mm. Oh, I was curious back then, but if it's not a comfortable subject, 
you don't have to say anything. S.A.E. Jean. At her sudden change of topic, S.A.E. Jean took a quick glance towards the passenger seat, but when their eyes met, he quickly averted his gaze. Even still. I felt that it's unfair to you, somehow. I mean, you've told me everything about your secrets, yet honestly, we even went through two life-or-death situations together. But more importantly, I wish to tell you the truth. Has a line. Ha, ha ha um, really? As an aside, he still hadn't told her the true reason behind the vampires ambushing them. Still unaware of the truth, she carried a gentle smile on her lips as she slowly continued with her words. Well, there is this old saying. That elves are pure and noble and so, can only fall in love with one person many humans think it's nothing but a lie, but actually, it's real. For elves, the meaning of love was incomparably deep. Whether it was dark elves, high elves, or regular elves, it was the same. But did you know that saying has been romantically repackaged a great deal? The reality is very different. Has a line. Different? S.A.E. Jean. Yes. For an elf, love is the same thing as obsession and persistence all rolled into one. Doesn't matter what the situations and the conditions of the target of love are like, if an elf falls in love, then that elf will not hesitate doing everything in order to be loved back. The reality of the species, who are known to possess the perfect appearance and mindset, is that we're simply the collection of imperfections. Has a line. As she spoke, her voice contained a certain feeling of utter, desolate emptiness. And so, I used to love someone. And that person liked women with lighter skin, so I lightened my own. And when I learned that he liked another woman who was gentle and loyal, I even dropped everything I was doing as a wizard. Has a line. Panicking at her sudden, impromptu confession of the past, S.A.E. Jean slowed the car's speed slightly. Meanwhile, Hazeline grandly sighed out and continued. However, that person didn't love me back. Until the end, he only had that woman in his mind, and then, died trying to protect that very woman. Back then, I've never felt sadness stronger than that before. If I didn't blame someone, I thought I might end up killing myself. So I did something really deplorable. Has a line. Kim S.A.E. Jean quietly observed her. That is why Mr. S.A.E. Jean, you should be wary of elves. You shouldn't treat us too nicely, and you must keep a safe distance away from us. Elves just don't have the strength to distance themselves from a person they find interesting. Of course, there is a big gap between interest and love, but still. Has a line. The moment her words ended, the car came to a stop. They were in front of her house. As if she found her confession embarrassing, she lightly slapped her cheeks and undid the seatbelt buckle. Well then, I'll get going now. Mr. S.A.E. Jean, thank you for always. Ah, uh, hang on a sec. S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean quickly stopped her just before she could rush out of the car. He carefully studied her darkened expression, and then extracted a smallish box from his pocket. Please take this with you. It's a present. While roaming around the city of Los Angeles, there was this one thing that seemed to have drawn her interest. As she was busy with meetings and thus unable to personally buy it, S.A.E. Jean had bought it behind her back after he caught her gaze with his acute intuition of the wolf. This is Hazeline. She dazedly looked at the gift in her hand. Well, isn't that the thing that makes sound when you open it? I thought you were interested in it. S.A.E. Jean. The thing, she was looking at with complicated emotions two days ago a music box. Ah. I should get going. Take care of yourself. S.A.E. Jean. Leaving behind those words, S.A.E. Jean drove off. Honestly. Didn't he hear my advice Hazeline? Watching the car moving further away, Hazeline muttered without much strength. The exporting potions not only helped to increase the fame of Kim S.A.E. Jean and his guild, it also had the effect of two countries solidifying their relationship. The U.S. president held a conference to personally announce the deal, and Kim S.A.E. Jean had been invited to the Blue House, even. Whatever the case may have been, when he returned home, he also returned to his daily routine. Sometimes as Jean Sehan, sometimes as Kim S.A.E. Jean, sometimes as a monster. 
In the meantime, Jean Sehan's rank had increased to mid-tier after only two months of activity as the special employee from Eden. And it seemed that he could hit his goal of upper mid-tier before the end of that self-imposed six months deadline. However, as the time continuously flowed forward, the ominous atmosphere for the world became worse and worse. The frequency of monster incidents soared higher and higher, and hundreds of people lost their lives every day. Although the loss wasn't as serious in South Korea where the foundation of potion and weapon supply was well established, in places such as Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, etc., etc. The situation had deteriorated so bad in several third world nations that there was no more point in governance anymore. I got called into action eight times in one single day, even it was really difficult, you know. USAE Young. And now a morning in the middle of September, the time when summer was slowly coming to its inevitable end. Kim Sae Jean yawned inwardly as he listened to USAE Young's complaints. If that's the case, take today and tomorrow off. S.A.E. Jean. It's not as simple as that dad won't give me a time off. U.S.A.E. Young. I'll speak to him. S.A.E. Jean. Really? That might work. U.S.A.E. Young. Kim S.A.E. Jean's influence had become such that he could let one night miss the mobilization order without too much trouble. U.S.A.E. Young energetically dived into his arms. Tyreeing. Suddenly, the mobile phone went off. Both USAE Young and Kim Sae Jean's eyes focused on its direction. He moved slightly faster than her, reaching out and snatching the phone away. Who is it? Asked USAE Young. Oh, it's nothing. Sae Jean. Making a half-hearted excuse, he sent his reply, and then placed the phone down. On the LCD of the phone facing downwards. The name Hazeline was showing on it. Chapter 105. Dark Elves Hated Light. No one knew the exact reason why everyone simply accepted it as a fact, and in all honesty, the reality was also like that as well. So, most of the homes belonging to Dark Elves were painted in achromatic colors or in black-gray. Heck, quite a few of those houses didn't have any lighting fixtures, even. Inside a dark room truly fitting for a Dark Elf, Hazeline was lying on the bed, gazing deeply into the boxy LCD screen exuding a lone light that brightened this forlorn space. The contents on the screen that drew her interest was thus. Kim Sae Jean verified account. Shkim. Guild Master, the Monster the Orc Blacksmith High Tier Hunter. Followers 45,345,874 currently following 10. Probably the most famous person among the younger generation, Kim Sae Jean. The number of followers were well over 45 million, highest in Asia. In other words, as many as half the population of the entire Korean nation. No wonder, what with this much interest shown by the general public, every once in a while photos and posts uploaded to his social media profile would become topics of news. Why are there so many pics of him with women in here? Hazeline pouted visibly as she carefully studied each and every photo appearing on his profile. There were a ton of selfies uploaded to it, but almost half of them were taken with different women. Of course, the frequency of those pics being uploaded drastically decreased ever since he began dating USA Young, but still there were literally endless posts and reposts made by several women who were shamelessly wagging their tails. And many of these ladies had social status that even made Hazeline seem a bit plain in comparison. Hey, wait a minute. Even I, as an elf, recognize that person. Ah oh oh. I must be going crazy. Hazeline finally woke up from her unnecessarily fevered participation of the social media movement, and flung away her phone to a corner of the bed. Although she found herself pathetic and hopeless for doing this against a man who already had a girlfriend but somehow, things had become like this lately. Of course, she did think about that man every now and then. He was eloquent, was a gentleman and had good manners. Initially, her thoughts of him wasn't on the level of a deep, deep interest but rather, something more common, something like he's a nice guy, that kind of admiration. However, as their interaction over the matters related with potions increased in frequency, the depths of her feelings began growing deeper as if she was getting seduced by his innate scent the real decisive blow came in the forms of two unexpected battles and one heartfelt gift. 
And so, nowadays, whenever she was left alone at home and feeling a bit sentimental, her head would be filled with S.A.E. Jean's face. But this was definitely not love. For an elf, the meaning of love was far more graver than dying itself, and so when an elf fell in love, one couldn't carry on with his or her daily life anymore. Hazeline knew that she was still very far from that. Very. However, at the same time, she recognized her condition as a very bad omen as well. On top of that, the situation was even worse than the last time. After all, he already had a lover. Fool. Hazeline let out a long sigh, her eyes instinctively moving back towards her phone. It would have been nice if her feelings remained where she might think about him whenever she felt lonely but such a thing was not possible for an elf. In the end, she blamed her complicated emotions as the result of her species' unique instincts, and picked the phone back up. Just when is he going to send back a reply ah, uh, maybe? There was no reply whatsoever until now for a text message she sent to him over two hours ago. But rather than getting annoyed, worries filled her up first. What, are, you, doing, now? You, still, haven't, replied, yet maybe, is, there, something, wrong. She read each word carefully before sending the message. She then slowly lowered the phone down and her gaze drifted towards the top of the desk. A charming little music box, shaped like a piano, was calling out for her attention. She wordlessly approached the music box and touched it. Accompanying the gentle, soothing music note, a faint scent of a certain someone drifted along in the air. The date was 9th of September, the opening day for the seminar held by the World Monster Organization, also known as WMO. This time, it was being held in Seoul, South Korea. The biggest reason for this was due to the appearance and propagation of the hero orcs or Korean orcs, as they were referred to as, whose origins still remained a mystery. There are four ranks within the hero orcs, the orc warrior, the orc jaguar, the orc senior, and the orc chieftain. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin was attending this seminar. Since she was the only human being who could enter the village of the hero orcs, she was invited to speak as the sole authority on all things hero orc. Rather strangely, there is no rank of great warrior with the hero orcs. That's largely due to them not having the hierarchy-based division of ranks, although they do show admiration and respect towards the older generation. Kim Yurin. Her role here was to convey the information on hero orcs to these professors and scholars who came from all across the globe. That is why, I propose using the term senior, in lieu of great warrior, to denote that admiration and respect shown by the orcs. From everything she had observed so far, hero orcs possessed far greater intelligence and wisdom compared to regular orcs. They were able to make a basic reasoning and even knew how to be considerate towards others as well. All these interesting information definitely showed the difference between them and other types of monsters, so all the scholars here zealously took memos while nodding their heads non-stop. How can you tell the ranks apart? Unnamed scholar. A middle-aged white man asked in fluent Korean. That's a good question. Like other normal orcs, you can tell fully grown adults apart from juveniles by their body sizes, and for the adults, you can use their epidermis as the yardstick. The bluer it is, higher the rank it has. Kim Yurin. In that case, can we still estimate one's age with its hair? Another unnamed scholar. Yes. There's no change to that fact. Kim Yurin. What is the current estimated size of the village? Yet another unnamed scholar. There are around 1,000 individuals living there, and about half of that number are fully grown adults. Kim Yurin. As expected from a bunch of scientists, the attendees continuously threw lots of questions laced with significant amount of curiosity. That resulted in Kim Yurin's part in the seminar going on for one extra hour. For then, shall we end it here? Thank you all for coming. And finally, Kim Yurin quickly escaped the seminar hall while being showered with applause and headed to the car park and as soon as she set off, she headed straight towards the monster field. I'm gonna be so, so late. Today was the scheduled day for the sparring with the orc. There was a grin on her face without her even realizing it. You've become stronger. An afternoon with harsh sunlight pouring down. While wiping away the streaming sweat, Kim Yurin said to the hero orc. 
Lately, all their sparring sessions ended in a draw. In the beginning, she won most of the encounters, but the orc continued to grow stronger the wilder each sparring became. Of course, she too grew stronger as well while sparring with him, so a disaster such as losing had been prevented so far. Wordlessly, the orc sat down and leaned against a huge tree trunk. Judging by how he was breathing angrily through his nose, one could tell that he was unhappy with the spar ending in yet another draw. Even this much is still quite amazing, really. Although I look like this, I'm the world's fiftieth strongest knight, I'll have you know. Kim Yurin. Her skills that were getting better by sparring with the orc she was able to achieve this career-high worldwide knight ranking as a result. While advertising her own strength, Kim Yurin sat down next to him. She silently studied the orc's mood. Thankfully, the orc didn't show any signs of avoiding her. Thanks to you, I'm also getting stronger. Kim Yurin. Speaking like so, Kim Yurin carefully placed her head on his shoulder. When she took a quick glance, the orc didn't even seem to think about her at all. She began enjoying the perfect combination of a gently blowing breeze and a wide, dependable shoulder. Oi. Suddenly, the orc opened his mouth. Kim Yurin's body shook for a brief moment, wondering if she should take her head away but then, decided play dumb. We stop doing this, from now. S.A.E. Jean the orc. Excuse me? Kim Yurin. But then, what he said next made her unable to sit still, and so, out of utter shock, she quickly detached her head from his shoulder. The orc stared right at her and slowly continued on with his words. Don't come here anymore. S.A.E. Jean the orc. Although the orc's facial expression was cold and indifferent, Kim S.A.E. Jean actually was doing this for her sake. The hit list. Not too long ago, the linked-up vampire apostle brought along a new piece of information. Vampires had compiled a list of individuals who could get in the way of achieving their goals, and that kill list had entered the hands of the vampire lord. Apparently, Kim S.A.E. Jean's name was rightfully occupying the top position on that list. Without a doubt, the recent episode with the Duerkshanese happened because of the list. And Kim Yurin occupied the second spot. Unfortunately, it was too DN easy to predict Yurin's current routine. Meaning, it would be so much easier to ambush her. After all, she'd willingly show up at the orc village all by herself twice a week. But, but why so suddenly? Kim Yurin. Her eyes were trembling hard. She looked utterly devastated, but the orc remained cold. But, but. But why, for what Kim Yurin? I'm bored of you. S.A.E. Jean. He was unable to say the kind of excuse she might have accepted easily, only warning her off without offering a proper explanation. This, the last time you enter. Next time you want to enter village, be ready to kill, or be killed. I already tell other orcs. S.A.E. Jean the orc. What? What the heck is that? You should tell me the reason first, so I Kim Yurin. She desperately ran up to him, unable to comprehend it all. However, the orc simply grasped the mace with his hand and swung it towards her. Ayuk. Wait. Stop fighting and let's talk, talk. Kim Yurin. She backed off quickly enough, but she couldn't prevent her body from taking some damage from the sudden attack. She didn't give up, though, and continued to demand explanation from him, but the orc stuck to answering with violence. As the seconds ticked by, even the other hero orcs began casting hostile gazes towards her direction. You, you BD. And so, all she could say was this one curse word before beating a hasty retreat. Kim S.A.E. Jean the orc's eyes stayed with the departing back of her. The blood seeping out from the wounds he had inflicted on her fell like teardrops, leaving deep trails behind. Why are there so many applicants? S.A.E. Jean. A call from Zhou Hansung was waiting for the heavy-hearted S.A.E. Jean's arrival back home. The subject of the discussion was the qualifications of the potential griffin riders to assess each knight who wished to ride on the back of a griffin. It looks like almost every upper-mid-tier knight in the country have applied so far. The view of griffins being an effective means of policing in the near future has already become widespread, sir. And also, what with the current state of affairs being as is this and that point seems to have combined into one and so many people have applied as a result, sir. 
As an aside, the number of griffins managed by the monster now was 30, which prompted the establishment of the Griffin Rider Certification Law. Obviously, the people responsible for awarding the certificate was the Monster Guild. Did the Knight Orders give out their permissions? After all, the lease fee will be nothing to laugh about. S.A.E. Jean And interested parties related to the Monster Guild were suspecting that these griffins would later become an important source of revenue. It of course had to do with the leasing fee a call-out lasting for half a day would normally require the Knight's Orders to cough up somewhere north of 100,000. Although SAE Jean did feel it was still on the side of being too cheap as riding on griffins was rated as the number one in the most cost-efficient way of traveling by the Time magazine. But any higher than that, it wouldn't mesh well with the current market conditions. Yes, they sure did, sir. And related to that topic, the Dawn Order requested for the purchasing of a griffin if it's possible. They promised to give us a substantial amount if we do. When Jo Hansung said those words, USAE Young's ear perked up while she pretended to watch the TV on the side. Have they prepared a suitable nesting area and trained the staff accordingly? SAE Jean. Nod, nod. Even before Jo Hansung could make his reply, USAE Young was busy nodding her head. Kim SAE Jean chuckled slightly after realizing that her influence played a big part in this request being made. Yes, sir. They seem to have benchmarked our nesting area and constructed theirs close to our own, so even Raoul might be able to adapt easily. By the way, Raoul was the name of a female griffin that USA Young really, really liked. TL, really, author. You and your bad naming sense. In that case not sure about selling, but what about a 10-year lease? Tell them we'll go with that. SAE Jean. As soon as those words left his mouth, USAE Young silently punched the air in celebration and hugged his back tightly. Yes, sir, I understand. All right, then. Please take care of the rest. SAE Jean. Ah, that's right. The Foreign Affairs Minister has contacted us as well, sir. There seems to be a big backlog of countries requesting for export of potions and griffins, starting from the nations of the EU bloc. Mr. Hansung. I'm leaving the matter of meeting them to your discretion. Sir. Zhou Hansung dazedly spat out a single word reply. Chuckling to himself, SAE Jean was about to end the call, only to hear the urgent voice from the other side telling him not to. Is there something else? SAE Jean. Yes sir, there is one more thing. This is the important one. What is it? Zhou Hansung took in a deep breath. The date for the Leakins press conference has been set. Chapter, 106 After receiving the general summary of the information ahead of time, the Korean government requested a delay of three months for the press conference, till late November, saying that they needed to make their own preparations. They also requested that, in order to minimize mass panic and confusion, the wording and the sentence structures should be softened up a bit. It seems that Miss Yu Song and the members of the National Assembly who are friendly with the Dawn have given us a great deal of their considerations, sir. I heard that the administration was going to announce the findings of the Likin as if they had uncovered it first. Zhou Hansung. Is that how it was? Anyhow I understand. But what a relief this is. I thought they might simply choose to ignore us. SAE Jean. Bureaucrats didn't like uncertainty and instability, almost every single one of them. That was the reason why one often saw the government hurriedly trying to fix the mess only after the actual event had come and gone. I think it's only possible due to the name value of the Lekin, the man who had correctly predicted the Red Moon, sir. I know, right? Well, Mr. Hansung, I know you're busy, so let me not keep you from your work. S.A.E. Jean. Yes, sir. Take care. Please give me a call if you need anything. SAE Jean ended the call there. USAE Young waited by his side quietly until then, before carefully asking him. Seriously now, won't our country be destroyed at this rate? USAE Young. It's not going to, so don't you worry. SAE Jean. Kim Yusone said that he saw countless boss level monsters and many cities being decimated in his dreams, however what he saw was not the past that had already happened. No, that was the undetermined future that could be changed at any time. 
Since he was planning to expose everything, including the hit list compiled by the vampires, there were literally a CP ton of variables still left to play yet. Look, there are so many geniuses in our country as we speak. Including you, too aren't you the youngest ever upper mid-tier in history? It's quicker than Miss Urin by two years, right? SAE Jean. Three years. USAE Young. She bashfully corrected him and then fell into his arms. The youngest in the world well, really. It's all thanks to Appa. USAE Young. Murmuring the words that were hard to tell whether she was boasting or praising SAE Jean, USAE Young rubbed her face against his chest. Ah, right. By the way, I really had no idea that Appa could fight so well like that. I got really shocked, you know. Didn't know Appa was on such a level USAE Young. Suddenly, she began saying something he couldn't quite catch. What are you talking about out of the blue? SAE Jean. Mm. You don't know. USAE Young. USAE Young tilted her head, before pulling out her phone and then logged on to the official page of the Dawn Order. Here. Someone uploaded the CCTV footage when Appa got ambushed by the Duerk Chernese, and the whole thing's getting really hot right now. But whom, maybe because the vid is circulating only within the Knights' communities, is that why you didn't know? USAE Young. Ah. The story about SAE Jean being under heavy assault in a foreign country was already a big news locally. It was to a point where the president of the USA had expressed his regret, even. Wait a minute. What is this SAE Jean? He got somewhat concerned so he snatched USAE Young's phone away. Duerk Chinese could only be seen with naked eyes so they didn't show up on the CCTV footage, but. His concerns became reality. The Kim SAE Jean shown on the screen was busy thrusting swords and spears and other types of weapons at empty air. Ah, that. Even though it looks a bit weird without anyone else there, your movements alone looks really good, you know. Really nice. Plus, those weapons, you are using mana to form those weapons, right? How did you do that? Every knight in the country is seemingly dying of curiosity right now. Some are saying, isn't that like, exceeding the levels of regular sword aura and stuff? As if she too wanted to know, USA Young asked him, her eyes sparkling with genuine curiosity. No, uh, it's not what you think, it's just my trait. SAE Jean. Is that so? Anyhow, everyone on the Dawn's forum are praising it non-stop. There are even talks of asking you to take the night exam, since it's DN shame to waste your talent away. USAE Young. Kum. R, really? He couldn't tell whether that was only her opinion or not, but now that he heard this much praise, the footage felt a bit different to him somehow. The sight of him rapidly slashing the empty air with the mana sword was. In that case, should we spar for a while? SAE Jean. It was more than enough to make his shoulders straighten up. But USAE Young lightly shook her head and then said. No, well, I want to do the other type of sparring instead of that one. Her face flushing deep red, she pushed her face towards his lips. SFX for doorbells ringing. Unfortunately, the other type of sparring that was all ready to begin got blocked by the sudden intrusion of the doorbells, causing USAE Young to frown very deeply. She then grumpily stomped towards the front door and then shouted in dissatisfaction. Who is it? That was her anger-ridden loud shout that not one person had heard of until now. What the uh it, it's Kim Yurin. Uh is Mr. S.A.E. Jean home? I wanted to talk to him regarding the appearances in the talk shows. Stunned silly by this development, USAE Young signaled SAE Jean with her eyes and then, hit herself in the dressing room rather promptly. Buried among all the eerie events where the huge number of monsters appeared seemingly out of the blue regardless of time and location, several unexplainable incidents began taking place as well. Several reporters, wizards, alchemists, and even knights all these people were met with puzzling accidents and died during the hours where most would be fast asleep. Although the SID suspected foul play, as there was not one shred of evidence recovered, they could only think of them as victims of the aforementioned unfortunate circumstances. Excuse me, Miss Yurin. Did you hear me? Surely, you can also tell that this is an important matter, no? SAE Jean. 
Of course, SAEG knew very well that those deaths were linked to the hit list. That was why he was in the middle of speaking the hard truths to Kim Yurin, who came to see him regarding her work in the entertainment business. Unfortunately, she didn't seem to hear him at all. All she did was to mumble continuously about quitting the entertainment industry altogether while carrying an utterly dejected facial expression. People are dying left, right and center, Miss Yurin. But in these dangerous times, you are planning to enter the monster field all alone late at night? That is not only reckless, but also S.A.E. Jean. You don't have to worry about me. I'm not someone who will easily crumble because of an ambush. Kim Yurin. But still, we don't know what. Even if it's like that, that's not the issue at hand here. I'm quitting the industry not because of the reasons you think, but I fear that I've been focusing too much on the entertainment side of things. As a knight, I should concentrate on my original duties, instead. And that's one of the reasons why I roam around in the monster field as well. So, I would really appreciate it if you can respect my wishes. Kim Yurin. Saying that there was nothing else left to say, Kim Yurin stood up from her seat. After letting out yet another long sigh, she bowed her head and left. What should I do about this now? S.A.E. Jean. Without a doubt, her current state was because of the orc. After Kim Yurin left, S.A.E. Jean began massaging his aching head. Is she gone? U.S.A.E. Young. But there was no time to worry about this matter. And that was because, creeping up on him stealthily like a cat, U.S.A.E. Young jumped on him with a strangely flushed face. A week after Kim Yurin quit the entertainment industry. Completely unaware of the passage of time, Kim S.A.E. Jean was busy drifting along on the ocean. The waves of the East Sea caressed his skin, and the gentle breeze as well as the warm sunlight made both his mind and body to feel rather lethargic. His current appearance was not of a human but the Leviathan. The Leviathan naturally grew bigger without him needing to do anything the body had grown to 140 centimeters long now, so it was too big to call it Athene anymore, and the power this body carried also saw a huge increase as well. To understand how powerful he had become, not one hyena-like opportunistic sea monster dared to get close to him as he just floated on the water, doing absolutely nothing. Yuong. From a distance, a wave crashed into him. Of course, it wasn't a naturally occurring phenomenon but S.A.E. Jean trying to appease his boredom with a bit of impromptu surfing by controlling the water. Paeyang. The cresting wave tickled past his skin and created a roller coaster ride for him in an instant. Another for Ma, Mother, T.L., okay, so, this random bit of utterance here is our MC suddenly reciting a poem written in the 40s by a Korean poet Yun Dong-ju, called, T.L. as Counting the Stars at Night. There is an English translation of it floating around the web, done by a bloke named Alex Rose. I'm using his version here. SFX for Weapons Colliding While he was peacefully reciting a poem and blissfully enjoying the tranquil calmness of it all, out of the blue, he could hear the harmonious noises of weapons and mana colliding from a distant beach. When he raised his head a little to take a gander, he spotted three knights and an ogre having an intense battle over there. S.A.E. Jean began observing the scene of this untimely battlefield. Two men and one woman, affiliated with Goryeo Knight's Order. It was one of the orders that were practically pleading with S.A.E. Jean of late. That was probably because, the Dawn Order which previously occupied a similar position in the rankings had soared past them and flew towards the heavens. Currently competing against the Raven for the top spot, while other rivals were busy forcing their way from below, threatening them. Mm -hmm. However, out of the three over there, S.A.E. Jean realized he knew the lone female of the group. It was Yong Eun Ji. She had been constantly contacting him through his SNS profile, or via the guild as if her order, well, ordered her to do so. Well, doesn't that look a bit dangerous? S.A.E. Jean. Just now, the sword of one of the knights got broken by the ogre's club. The strength of this particular ogre seemed high, as it was a two-horned grey ogre, known to be a cumbersome monster to fight against. The flow of the battle seemed to be on the knife edge. Looked like the knights were holding on thanks to the effects of potions, but... After observing the battle for a while longer, S.A.E. Jean decided to help them out a bit in order to test the rapidly growing Leviathan form's current level of combat strength. He opened his mouth wide and gathered mana there. Goo. 
he changed the naturally occurring mana resonating and converging in his mouth into the element that ogres were weak against, fire. Dot. At the sudden transformation of the atmosphere, storm winds whipped up violently and large ripples expanded out on the water's surface. Boasting a deep crimson color, the flames gathered near the leviathan's maws and formed a distinguishable shape, before firing out like a dragon's breath attack in the blink of an eye. Phew. Unfortunately, the sound effect was still quite a bit lacking, mostly thanks to his young age. Still, the flames gathered in front of his mouth exploded out forward like a giant pillar of fire. The pure flames of hell burned the sea water and the atmosphere around it and in less than a moment's breath, it arrived at that distant beach and covered the ogre's entire torso. Kayak. Yung Un Ji. Eu, Eu A. What the FCK? The hyperhot boiling flames of the breath melted the ogre's upper body in one blink, and at this display of overwhelming destructive might, not only the knights, even SAE Jean was shocked out of his mind. Wah, what the hell is this SHT? SAE Jean. Right then, Yong Un Ji pointed towards SAE Jean's direction after searching the surroundings in a hurry. Panicking somewhat, he quickly dived underwater to escape. The three knights dumbfoundedly stared at the spot where the mysterious creature spouting that flames was just now. What was that? Asked Yong Un Ji. It dived under the water's surface just now. One of the male knights answered, his face still slack from the shock. You know I can also see that, right? Yong Un Ji. Could it have been a dragon? Ha. Huh. Yong Un Ji. I mean. The male knight pointed at the ogre's half-melted corpse. That incredible pillar of flames didn't stop at simply blasting away the ogre, but it also blazed past and burned a huge circular hole in the thick forest behind them. But well, if that was really a dragon, it should have flown away instead of diving underwater, right? Yong Un Ji. You think so too? It sure is weird, seeing a creature with wings dive into water. Yep. It really is weird. Yong Un Ji. All three of them continued to stare at the distant ocean in awkward silence for a while, hoping that, maybe, the creature might pop back up again. Finding out that the leviathan form possessed this much might prove to be both a great harvest and yet another matter to worry about for SAE Jean. If this form grew up a bit more, then defeating all those boss-level monsters appearing in the future would be a piece of cake but on the flip side. If the only condition for the continued growth was the passage of time, then it also meant that he'd fail at trying to rein in the instincts that were on par with that incredible might pretty soon as well. SFX for the phone ring. As he drove home while filled to the brim with worries, SAE Jean's phone suddenly went off. It was from Hazeline, according to the LCD screen. Hello, Miss Hazeline. What can I do for you? Ah, Mr. SAE Jean. Well, nothing in particular, although I'm calling you because, I was thinking, now that a meeting for the potion export deal has been scheduled, wouldn't it be nice if Mr. SAE Jean also attends it? When will it be? It's next week Tuesday. Has a line. Next week Tuesday he muttered to himself while combing his memories to see if he had anything scheduled that day. Other than getting achievements as Jean Sehan, though, he had nothing lined up. But, uh, do I really have to show up? SAE Jean. However, he felt too lazy for that. After all, it wouldn't be wrong to say he was currently living three separate lives so, he'd like to not go to meetings where his presence wasn't absolutely needed. Ah well even if you don't come but, it'll be better if you do. I mean, if Mr. SAE Jean does show up, the other party will think, we're being treated fairly and stuff like that. And when the news spreads around, other countries will compete with one another in order to not lose out, right? And so, we lead them on a game of chicken. She began explaining in a haphazard fashion suddenly. In that case I'll be there. Oh, you promise? Yes. Then, see you there. All right. I'll see you then. Their business had come to an end. Puzzlingly, though, Hazeline spat out a wistful sigh and didn't hang up first. Uh, so, should I hang up first? Hazeline didn't reply. She acted this way lately. For some reason, she had been calling him for trivial matters, and the emotions hidden in her voice seemed quite far removed from normal as well. 
Is there something else you'd like to talk about? Actually, you see, I went to a certain restaurant. I'm hanging up. Ah. Wait. This is an interesting store. Kim S.A.E. Jean resolutely hung up. Chapter, 107. If you are having problems seeing the chapter list on the indexes and front page, please delete your entire browser cache. Unfortunately, that is currently, the only way to fix the issue at the moment. Thank you. It was a day in early October, as leaves were dying in the autumn winds. On a beach located somewhere near the East Sea where the public access was strictly prohibited, quite a few knights stood there, busy watching the vast blue ocean. Every single one of them were here to satisfy their curiosity, but funnily enough, the rate of gender split was 7 to 3, there were far more female knights than males present. And yes, most of the guys who came here did so for the ladies, rather than the sea itself. A hatchling of the ocean, you say? With an expression that said how unconvinced he was, a male knight asked a female knight. Yes. Apparently, it appears on every weekend. The female knight replied with a bright smile. Although this was still a part of mid-tier monster field, everyone present all suffered from high enough ranks and spare time and so, they showed much leisure while treating this beach as a perfect spot for dating. And the reason why they had gathered here? A single rumor quietly spreading among the ranks of mid-tier and above. A hatchling of the ocean. A cute and charming little monster that floated on the ocean's surface. Those knights who came earlier to take a look said the creature even smiled and waved its hand at them. Just wait for a little bit longer. I hear it's really, really cute. Yeah, well. Doesn't matter to M. Oh. There it is. Then, someone pointed towards the water's surface and shouted out loudly. Surprised by this outburst, everyone quickly changed the direction of their gazes and sharpened their eyes. And sure enough, there it was, a single life form floating around lazily like a buoy. Its body may have been slightly on the wrong side of being wide and flat, but thanks to its cute puppy crossed with seal countenance leaving a favorable impression behind, it was nicknamed the Hatchling of the Ocean. Wow! Female knights raised a huge fuss and began taking photos. Many guys present thought that the resulting images wouldn't be nice since the distance was too far, but then, their collective jaws fell to the floor when they spotted one or two ladies whip out cameras equipped with wide-angle lenses. Hey, wait a minute here. It might be cute and all, but still, if that thing is really a hatchling, then... Uh, shouldn't we kill it now? We have no idea what that thing will morph into in the future. Unnamed idiot knight. What he said was true, even monsters like Trainos that resembled a rhino, looked cute and cuddly when young, grew up to be a violent and vicious bastard. On top of that, didn't someone mention that this hatchling was capable of shooting out a breath attack? Huh. You wanna kill it? What nonsense are you spewing out right now? Almost instantly, Sharp and hostile stares focused on this guy. He quickly mumbled something about it being a joke while he scratched the back of his neck. Kim S.A.E. Jean came out to the East Sea twice a week. He was thinking that, since he couldn't do anything about the growth of this leviathan form that only needed the passage of time, he might as well enjoy the ocean in the meanwhile. After all, the sea gave peace and tranquility to those who were strong, thus affording him some time to sort out his thoughts alone. They showed up again. However, a handful of ruffians began appearing to disturb his peace lately. Maybe it was because he was still stuck in some kind of transition period in its growth, this athony form moved rather slowly in water. And that was why he chose to swim as close to the land mass as possible. Ood as if the rumors had gotten around, way too many onlookers had come around to gawk at him. Initially, since the number was low, he thought their actions were cute and so didn't feel too bothered by them. Hell, he even performed a public service and waved his hand at them, too. But as time went on, more and more people showed up, and whenever they saw S.A.E. Jean, they began screaming, Kayak, Kayak. Dot. So, how could he get so much needed peace and tranquility in this chaos? Even worse, as S.A.E. Jean was doing his best to suppress his rising irritation. Shouldn't we kill it now? The words caught in his sensitive hearing caused his blood to boil in anger. Speaking some harsh words there, aren't you? 
And so, S.A.E. Jean decided to put fear of God in them, and then, began controlling the sea. Woom! From the bottom of the ocean, an ominous vibration could be felt. Soon after, the sounds of the night's cheering stopped. All of them dumbfoundedly stared past S.A.E. Jean the Athony, towards the vast ocean. And then. Rather than cheers, they began screaming at the top of their lungs, and then, began running for their lives without even looking back. Only then did S.A.E. Jean realize something had gone terribly wrong, so he turned around to see what was happening. Kugu. A massive wave that was over 30 meters tall was crashing towards the coastline like an undulating life form. Phew. Oh. So, a leviathan can become this strong while in the water, huh? That was S.A.E. Jean's dazed thoughts just before he got swallowed up by the immense wave. Around 20 minutes later. Stealthily changing back to the human appearance, S.A.E. Jean was hurriedly walking within the monster field. Thankfully, he regained his composure in the middle of the wave and weakened the ferocity of it, so the actual damage to human lives should be minimal, but. Unfortunately, trees, plants, sand, whatever as far as his eyes could see, were all soaked to the bone by the sea water. What a troll move this was. Whenever he walked, water splashed below his feet. On top of that, the urgent notification sounded loudly from his smart watch, relaying an emergency message. From the Ministry of Public Safety and Security Emergency Situation. October 8, 1613. 20 meter high tsunami waves detected on the coast of the East Sea. We urge all the residents living near the East Sea in Kongwan Province as well as knights currently in the monster field to evacuate the area immediately. S.A.E. Jean scratched the back of his neck while reading the message. A momentary lapse in controlling his powers had led to a huge mess. I better run away. Kim S.A.E. Jean hurriedly moved his feet. But as he was running away in haste, he couldn't help but come to a standstill after finding a rather familiar silhouette in the distance. Her long hair tied in braids and pulled up in a clean style, revealing a white and slender neck a narrow waist and contrastingly well-endowed hips, the woman who was just as stunning even from behind, Kim Yurin. He heard that she came to work to Monster Field every day, currently, she was staring at a certain place while completely soaked from head to toe. S.A.E. Jean slowly walked towards her, who looked kind of lonely. Miss Yurin. At his gentle call, she ended up getting spooked rather wonderfully. Um. Guildmaster. What are you doing here? Kim Yurin. Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled almost imperceptibly. I was out hunting, but then, a tsunami just so happened to rush in. But what are you doing here, Miss Yurin? Looks like you got done in by the waves, didn't you receive the emergency notification to evacuate? No, I, uh, did receive it, but... Kim Yurin. She swallowed the rest of her sentence down in slight bitterness. At the end of where she had been looking at, was the village of the hero orcs. The sudden waves did hit the surrounding mud walls but thankfully, there didn't seem to be any further issues beyond that. We're told to evacuate, so let's go. S.A.E. Jean. Kim Yurin alternated her gaze between the village and S.A.E. Jean before powerlessly nodding her head. Soon, the two of them began walking through the monster field. Probably because of the effects of the tsunami. The entire monster field seemed cloaked heavily in deep silence, as if all the monsters and knights had ran off to somewhere safe and dry. They conversed while crossing the wet forest. Well, S.A.E. Jean was the one talking, while Kim Yurin just listened. You seem to lack energy for some reason lately. S.A.E. Jean. Pardon? Ah. No, it's just that, I've been feeling the wall. Recently, worries about things like, can I grow even further than this have been entering my thoughts. Is that so? To think that a highest tier knight thinks of such matters. S.A.E. Jean. It was right then. From somewhere, a strange fluctuation of mana could be felt. Kim Yurin too had sensed this oddity and quickly unsheathed her sword. There is something out here. Guild Master, please stick behind me. The moment her expression hardened, the atmosphere changed rapidly. Now, they could sense the flow of mana more openly, and she quickly dragged S.A.E. Jean to her rear as if to hide him and vigilantly surveyed the surrounding areas. 
I also know how to fight, Miss Yurin. However, Kim Sae Jin formed a weapon with mana and stepped forward. Just now, a certain scent of blood tickled his nose. Being able to hide one's presence and scent to this degree meant that the guest this time was not going to be a simple pushover. Looks like them carrying out the hits on the hit list wasn't an unrealistic feat, after all. Sae Jin. SFX for smoke rising suddenly. Then, smoke began pouring out and four humanoid shapes rose up from the ground. Out of the four, three of them were totally covered in red robes, but this one guy alone had his face fully displayed. Pale white skin and eyes dyed in the colors of blood. The handsome man smiled in an entirely suspicious manner and looked at both Sae Jean and Kim Yurin's direction. A pleasant day's greetings to you both. And we should thank the advent of one unexpected calamity, as we are finally able to grace each other's company. Inside this rather desolate forest, a man wearing a formal black tie suit greeted the two in a stiff manner of an European nobility that matched his western face. I am Count Rahamed. I've woken up from a long slumber and made this arduous personal journey in order to reap both of your lives with my own two hands. The tone of his voice was deeply exaggerated and theatrical. Sae Jean and Kim Yurin both narrowed their brows dumbfoundedly at the sudden entrance of this anachronistic man. What the hell was up with this strange stage actor like dude? Then, Sae Jean remembered it. Rehamed. After a short murmuring later, Sae Jean's eyes opened wide. Ah. Now he understood why this name rang a bell. The house of Count Rehamed. A renowned noble back in the other world, Rehamed even served as a margrave in a certain corrupt kingdom, even though he was a vampire. In other words, his skills were quite considerable. Of course, his house had been in decline for ages already. And when he came to earth, he fell into a coma because of all the vampire hunting back in the past. The vampire lord might have granted the man his second life, but still, his ability could not be dismissed as something trivial. In terms of the actual combat prowess, Rahamed was a powerful figure that none of the current vampire lord descendants could ignore. The vampires in the Rahamed house could control blood at will. Not only their own, but the others as well, provided the target had come in contact with the Rahamed blood. The viciously cruel and battle-loving Rahamed carried about 23 times more blood within his body, and slaughtered all living things who obviously couldn't live without blood. Or so Sae Jean had heard. Sae Jean also heard from the spy he had planted amidst the vampires that this Rahamed was someone to watch out for. Who is this crazy bastard? Kim Yurin. Ah ha ha ha. For a lady, your words are rather unrefined, no. Rahamed. Kim Yurin sharply glared at the vampires. Then, Rahamed smiled leisurely and expelled blood out from his body. And it sure was a grotesque sight to behold, blood endlessly pouring out from all the holes in his body, eyes, nose, ears, sweat pores, etc., etc. What the hell is that? Kim Yurin. The blood exiting into the air spread widely around like a red mist. Kim Yurin had covered herself in the ever-reliable mana barrier, but she sensed a certain trepidation from that red mist so she quickly took several steps back. A mana barrier? Ha ha ha. I'll have you know, such petty trickery will not aid you today. Rehamed. The thinly dispersing blood particles were smaller than mana, no bigger than atoms, in fact, and could easily permeate past the mana barrier and enter through one's skin. And if a minute amount of that blood entered the target's body, then, boom. The blood contained within the body would explode. And with this. This will be our fourth successful mission. Rehamed. Rahamed thought about the hit list and a grin broke out on his face. And when the red mist slowly approached his targets. His blood in gaseous form suddenly coagulated back into liquid and fell down to the ground. Ha! Huh. Rahamed. Falling into a confused state of panic, Rahamed tried to control his blood once more. Unfortunately for him, the blood on the ground didn't even budge as if it had turned into a stone. Miss Yurin, looks like we don't have to worry anymore. Sae Jean. Meanwhile, Sae Jean glanced at Rahamed and chuckled. This was the reason why Sae Jean remembered Rahamed's name so clearly. Blood was a form of moisture, but not all moisture was blood. 
To figure out which of the two was superior between the ability to control all moisture and the ability to control only blood, one didn't need to think too deeply about it. Fortunately, my trait seems to overwhelm his. SAE gene. Of course, as SAE gene's skill proficiency level was still low, the vampire would hold an advantage in terms of area of effect, but that much could be overcome with Kim Yurin helping him out. What crazy nonsense are you blabbering on about, you knave? Rahamed. The previously dazed Rahamed took offense at SAE Jean's words and roared out at the top of his lungs in an unbridled rage that could rip the heavens apart. He then extracted even more blood out from his body and changed it into numerous shapes that resembled needles before shooting them out. Rahamed believed that, without a doubt, this barrage of blood needles would pierce through the gaps of mana and definitely kill the two targets. What? But, why? I say, why? Rahamed. Too bad. Just like before, his blood powerlessly liquefied as soon as it got near the two and fell to the ground. Rahamed stomped on the ground like a petulant child and exploded in a fit of rage. I, I will, rip apart those two scums with. Rahamed. Unable to calm his soaring anger, Rahamed extracted even more blood out from his body again. Kim Yurin was busy tilting her head in confusion, unable to figure out what this vampire was trying to do, while SAE Jean was barely holding back his laughter from leaking out. Eu, you. Rahamed. Out from Rahamed's entire body, blood rose up powerfully. Seeing this, SAE Jean thought that, if left alone, this Rahamed guy would keel over automatically after tiring himself out. Chapter, 108. But, what Kim Yurin? Just leave him be. It'll be better for us if he tires himself out like that. SAE Jean. Kim Yurin and SAE Jean looked at Rahamed, their eyes shining with interest. The vampire's body had swelled up like a puffer fish while he continued to struggle it almost seemed like he'd go pop at any moment now. But still, Guildmaster, do you have an inkling as to what is happening here right now? Kim Yurin. Meanwhile, Kim Yurin asked SAE Jean as she glanced at him with the corner of her eyes. She found this situation totally not understandable. Out of the blue, a tsunami wave swept by without warning, then Kim Sae Jean appeared out of seemingly nowhere, and then, getting ambushed by a crazy guy and his gang, to boot. Ah, uh, that. Well I did tell you, right? Currently Sae Jean. Go ah. Uh. Rahamed. Before Sae Jean could explain, with a loud roar, the vampire's amassed blood pounced on them like a raging sea current. The blood wriggled around like a living being, but still, it fell to the ground powerlessly as soon as it got near SAE Jean's vicinity. Currently, there have been a lot of unexplained incidents. These guys are the culprits responsible. SAE Jean. Culprits. Kim Yurin. Yes. The Leakin said that the vampires are planning something really big and evil, and this is apparently their first step. Getting rid of those who might cause trouble for them later on the so-called hit list, in other words. SAE Jean. Why are you telling me about such an important matter only now? Kim Yurin. Falling in a silent daze for a moment, Kim Yurin suddenly shouted out, flustered. Another demonstration of how heavy the Leakin's name value was, right there. We've already set the date for the press conference to do that exactly. And I've mentioned this to you before, remember? That it's dangerous for you to move around alone. SAE Jean. You well, you did, but but still, you should have told me the details Kim Yurin. But the rumors have spread around already, though. SAE Jean. For now, they have remained tight-lipped at the government's request. But rumors of the leak and planning to announce something big as well as the existence of a certain hit list had been in circulation within the financial world and between nights for some time by now. Is, is that right? I've been preoccupied lately, so Kim Yurin. E.U. Ah. Uh. Another abnormal roar resounded out in the middle of their conversation. In any case, you're saying that person over there is a vampire? Kim Yurin. Yes. You can tell that he's an evil doer pretty easily, no? SAE Jean. Kim Yurin nodded lightly and poured mana into her sword. Sharp and chilly blue mana clung on to the surface of the slightly chipped blade. Sir Rahamed, 
please get a hold on yourself. Unnamed Vampire Goon Only when that razor-sharp threat surfaced did the other vampires begin trying to stop Rahim's madness. Looking as if he had lost over half of his original strength, Rahim finally stopped his crazed rampage. And while working hard to restore his calm demeanor, a thin smile slowly formed on his lips. Ha ha ha. How regrettable. That was your only chance to lessen the suffering and pain, but you have voluntarily surrendered such a wondrous opportunity. Indeed, it was regrettable for SAE Jean as well, as Rahamed changed tactic and unsheathed the sword mounted on his hips. It was crimson colored as if made out of blood at the same time, other three vampires began reciting a chant. Miss Yurin. Please maintain a certain distance from me while we engage the enemies. S.A.E. Jean. Now that Rahamed had lost his stupidity for good, S.A.E. Jean too had lost all the leisure as well. And whatever happens, do not let that sword touch you. S.A.E. Jean. That blood-red sword in Rahamed's hands there really was blood soaked into the blade. No matter how superior S.A.E. Jean's trait was, as long as the moisture wasn't airborne, he couldn't control it. So, even the smallest cut would prove totally disastrous. I've been fighting for over ten years now. So, don't worry about me. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin was confident, as always. S.A.E. Jean let a slight chuckle out and concentrated mana into his hand. The blue-colored mana shifted into a weapon that was perfect for the foe at hand, a lengthy spear that could help him maintain a safe distance. Go. Unnamed Vampire Goon. Unfortunately, the opponent wasn't only Rahamed. Before they knew it, the chanting of the other vampires were complete, and countless monsters were summoned to the area. SFX for a loud roar of a monster. The owner of the roar that shook the earth was the guardian of the underworld, Cerberus. Hundreds of gargoyles blanketed the sky above. Giant worms wiggled and burrowed their way out from the ground, accompanied by hundreds of creatures such as golems and ghouls. Against this horde, a lengthy spear wasn't going to cut it. So, S.A.E. Jean stealthily changed the shape of the weapon. And when Kim Yurin accidentally saw the newly formed weapon, her eyes went extra round. In his hand was a blue mace. You know how to wield that. Kim Yurin. A mace was avoided by most of the knights as it was a difficult weapon to master. Firstly, the might of this weapon heavily depended upon the wielder's physical strength rather than the proficiency in controlling mana. And then, because of its unusual shape, concentrating mana into a blunt form to fit the weapon was also incredibly hard as well. Let's talk about that later. S.A.E. Jean. Too bad, Kim Yurin couldn't get to hear his answer. Kung. 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 Triggered by Rahim's roar, all the monsters surrounding the two rushed in. S.A.E. Jean swung his mace towards the incoming flood of monsters. Every swing of the mace ripped asunder the very air they breathed, and each strike turned golems into crumbs of stone, while ghouls were shredded apart into pieces. He didn't bother with things like technique. Just a single, complete swing of that mace was enough to blow up dozens of monsters into smithereens. That is Kim Yurin. And Kim Yurin's eyes went even more rounder than before, as she even forgot about the grave situation she was in and observed S.A.E. Jean's fight. It might have looked like he was swinging that mace willy-nilly with total disregard for separating enemies from allies, but hidden within that simple whirlwind of destruction, there definitely was a rule of some kind. Enemies approaching closer were killed off relying only on brutal strength. And the moment when an attack was about to land on him, S.A.E. Jean struck the ground instead and caused a massive quake. And during the opening created by that very quake, he dashed in and landed a deadly blow to the monster's head. Quahong. The mace slammed on the ground once more and yet another powerful tremor erupted out. Just like that, with a few well-timed mace slams on the ground, the entire battlefield turned into a land of unbridled chaos mired in cruel viciousness. Only things left behind on the broken and jutting landscape was a scene straight out of hell, torn and mangled bits of flesh and blood showering and littering everywhere. How can he fight like that orc? Kim Yurin. Although the overall power and the ferocity were so much weaker, that battle style was something Kim Yurin was intimately familiar with. She was sure of it, since she had sparred countless times with the hero orc chieftain. 
Of course, it was currently impossible for her to agonize over how S.A.E. Jean seemingly had absorbed and used the orc's fighting style as if it was his own. The mist of monster's blood clinging on its body, the Cerberus spewed flames of hell from its three mouths before bearing its vicious fangs and pounced on her. Hop. However, such summoned creatures were easy for Kim Yurin to deal with. For her trait desideratum, imbuing the purpose of snatching the life away from a living being was impossible even against the most insignificant creatures but the story changed drastically if the recipient was a summoned. As long as she wasn't fighting against a monster like the Leviathan, which couldn't be summoned without a catalyst or be unsummoned without getting rid of that said catalyst. Cancelling the summoning was actually far easier than knocking the creature out. Cool. Although it was the slightest of tickles by her sword, the Cerberus couldn't even finish its roar before disappearing completely. Of course, it was still the guardian of hell. Yurin sensed nearly 20% of her mana reserve draining out of her. She then quickly kicked the ground and headed towards the three vampire wizards who were trying to redo the summoning. You despicable scum. Rahamed. Rahamed ignored Yurin shooting past him and focused only on S.A.E. Jean. He was like a prize racehorse looking only forward he even slaughtered monsters summoned by his men when they ended up blocking his way. You insolent fool. Rahamed. Arriving in front of S.A.E. Jean, Rahamed grandly slashed out with his sword. The blood-red sword drew a half-moon arc as it successfully sliced apart S.A.E. Jean's mana mace in two. A thick smile crept up on Rahamed's mouth, and as his prized blood sword was about to thrust into S.A.E. Jean's chest. Rahamed sensed a threat of looming death coming from behind and he quickly rolled on the ground to avoid it. Almost at the same time, a lone blue spike shot up from the ground the vampire was standing on moments ago. He didn't even have time to wonder what the hell that was the threat of death brushed past his senses once more, and then. Kook. Another blue spike shot up and sliced open a wound on Rahamed's body. What sort of cheap trickery is this? Rahamed. The blue spikes continued to inundate him even in the middle of his shouts. SFX for sharp things flying through the air. The spikes no longer appeared only from the ground, but also started pouring down from the air as well while making ear-piercing whistles. Rahamed hurriedly beat a hasty retreat, but those blue spikes didn't give him any breathing room whatsoever and persistently chased him down. Rahamed thought of getting assistance from the fellow vampires, but when he took a glance, he could see that the situation over there was just as bad as here. No, it looked actually worse. A single sword slash from Kim Yurin easily sliced apart one of the vampire wizards and his magic shield, and the rushing gargoyles trying to protect their owners couldn't even leave behind a scratch mark on her mana barrier. A bunch of useless irk. Rahamed. Just as his focus shifted for a brief second, a mace was thrown towards his way. Rahamed could only issue a short cry as the weapon struck him right in the middle of his forehead and he collapsed on the ground. Yut. As soon as Rahamed was out for the count, S.A.E. Jean turned all his attention towards the rest of the monsters. However his consciousness began to drift away. As expected, trying to control external mana not of his own placed too much of a burden on him. The whole thing didn't even last one minute, yet as things stood, he probably didn't even have much mana left in him to form another weapon. Wake up! Just as his mind was blacking out and the boiling instincts were about to burst forth from within and replace the human, Kim S.A.E. Jean. A lone shout from somewhere stabbed his ears. S.A.E. Jean struggled hard to regain control of his fading consciousness, and resolutely opened his eyes wider. He then grabbed the head of a ghoul with a voracious, drooling jaw and crushed it. SFX for a sword slash. After that, a crystal-clear sword aura swept across the battlefield, slicing apart all the monsters surrounding him. On a certain area within the monster field, there were shredded bits of flesh and blood strewn about everywhere the ground was completely devastated, not one spot avoiding destruction. Pant, pant. Within this bloody hell, S.A.E. Jean was sitting weakly on the ground, trying to catch his breath. This battle would have been a piece of cake if he changed into either the orc or the lycanthrope, but as a mere human, he literally had to go through hell. And now, he was beset with the type of fatigue he had never ever felt before in his entire life, something that could only come after squeezing every ounce of mana out from himself and moving his body to the absolute physical limit. 
Kim Yurin's condition was marginally better. Although totally covered in sweat, she still had some strength left to stand unassisted. However, she was currently pouring that strength into making her brain spin a bit faster. She recalled the sight of SAE Jean wielding that mace once more. Someone once said that, each and every fighter had their own unique way of fighting. SAE Jean's way was incredibly similar to that of the hero orc. Even the appearance of him roaring out while rampaging around was the same, too. Kim Yurin turned to focus her gaze on him. He certainly looked a lot weaker than the orc, sitting on the ground and panting heavily still, she observed him for a long, long time with a pair of suspicious eyes, before opening her mouth. Mr. Kim Sae Jean. A sudden intrusion of a cold voice pricked his ear drums. Ye, yes. He turned his head to look. Kim Yu Rin was staring at him with an incredibly sharp pair of eyes. As she stared at him, several questions regarding this and that floated around in her head. A similar battle style to that of the hero orcs and previously, he said he was friendly with the hero orcs and could arrange a meeting with the chieftain. And now that she thought about it, she began to wonder why he had been using the name the orc, when working as a blacksmith. So, let's say, hypothetically Kim Yurin. Her voice was heavy and serious. S.A.E. Jean's body trembled imperceptibly as if he too sensed the warning signs. Maybe, just maybe Kim Yurin. She then stopped talking there. What is the relationship between this man and the orc? He probably cannot completely deny having any ties with the orc. There is definitely something wrong here. Definitely something. Um, what should we do about that guy over there? Kim Yurin. Unfortunately, she couldn't spit out what she was thinking about, and ended up pointing at Rahane who was lying sprawled on the ground. Ah. Ah uh, well, let's apprehend him, for now S.A.E. Jean. Feeling panicky inside, S.A.E. Jean did his best to maintain a poker face while he grabbed Rahane. Chapter, 109. What are you going to do with that vampire? Kim Yurin. Inside the British luxury SUV, Kim Yurin's favorite ride. TL, a Range Rover, perhaps. Kim Yurin signaled towards the quietly prone Rahamed on the back seat using her eyes and asked. Hmm. Well, I could hand him over to the SID something like that. SAE Jean. SAE Jean had half a mind to make sure the vile BD would never wake up again, since it seemed the unconscious vampire was far too strong for the dark energy link to properly work. But then, he didn't want to give up on earning yet another bit of achievement by bringing this guy in, as cheap as that sounded. Also, it was still illegal to summarily execute a vampire without going through a proper trial. Humph. Kim Yurin snorted once. No more conversation happened after that. He did try his best to initiate one, but her facial expression was way too stiff for that. It was as if she was locked into some serious thought process or some such. Since S.A.E. Jean had something to feel guilty about anyways, he decided to follow the old mantra of doing nothing leads one down the middle path, dot. Wait. What are you doing? S.A.E. Jean. We're going the wrong way. S.A.E. Jean. Unfortunately, though Kim Yurin wasn't paying attention to her driving and as a result, she missed the off-ramp and ended up going straight ahead. She hurriedly looked around for a chance to turn the vehicle around, but well, they were on a piece of road where making a U-turn was impossible. W, why didn't you tell me sooner? Kim Yurin. After giving up, she sent a gaze full of resentment towards S.A.E. Jean in the passenger side. Why are you getting angry at me? S.A.E. Jean. I've never driven on this road before. And it hasn't been long since I got my license, so I'm not that good a driver yet. But here I am, tasked to bringing Mr. S.A.E. Jean back home Kim Yurin. Only after going the wrong way did Kim Yurin concentrate on her driving. And time relentlessly marched on. Twenty minutes, thirty minutes, forty minutes crossing a distance which ten minutes would have sufficed, cost them one full hour, and worse still, they were. Wait, isn't that the city of Pyongyang? S.A.E. Jean. From Kangwon province to Pyongyang in one hour. As expected of an extraordinary invention, the mana car. T.L. Oh, so it's not a Range Rover, then also, oops, looks like there is no South Korea in this novel, just a United Republic of Korea. 
don't feel like going back to old chapters and changing them, so, oh well. Kim Yurin. To drive all the way till Pyongyang from Kangwon without the aid of a map truly impressive, Miss Yurin. Great driving. S.A.E. Jean. All Kim Yurin could do at S.A.E. Jean's sarcastic remark was to pout unceasingly and silently steer the car. I wonder, how long will we need to go to Kangwon from here? S.A.E. Jean. If you don't stop now, I will leave you behind here. Kim Yurin. As far as she was concerned, that sounded like an effective warning, but for S.A.E. Jean, it was actually not a bad suggestion to consider. I can take over driving for you, if you'd like. But besides that, why haven't you turned on the sat-nav? S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean reached towards the center console to switch on the GPS navigation. However, she slapped his hand away while narrowing her brows. I have my pride, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Please do not interfere. Kim Yurin. Pride? What pride? S.A.E. Jean dumbfoundedly stared at her. A pair of stiff Azrock hands grabbing the steering wheel tightly her neck cranked out like that of an elderly turtle while her face contorted unnaturally as she surveyed the surroundings no way in hell something like pride had a room in that. I just hope that we get there within two hours S.A.E. Jean. Coo, coo. It was then, the drunkard, lying on the back seat showed signs of waking up. S.A.E. Jean quickly formed another mace and slammed it hard on the forehead of the waking vampire. Kong. Accompanied a dull sound of impact, Rahim's face sank back down the seat cushion. By the way, how long has it been since you started using a mace? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin asked after observing him doing his thing, but then. No way. You entered the wrong road, again. S.A.E. Jean. What? No, no, that can't be. Kim Yurin. One hour it was, for them to reach Pyongyang from Kangwon. But the return trip took two solid hours. While regretting the decision to ride on Kim Yurin's car right down to the bones, Kim S.A.E. Jean finally made his way back home. S.A.E. Jean went to speak to Yu Song regarding what to do about Rahamed. He suggested that, since there were a few suspicious individuals within the ranks of the SID, the captured vampire should be locked up in the underground prison located below the mercenary company HQ where mana couldn't be wielded. She consented to the idea. After the meeting ended sooner than expected, Yu Song handed over a magazine about knights over to him. The Knights Academy's most famous martial arts quickest to become a mid-tier, Jean Sehan's technique. Slow motion of the footage, breakdown of fist and foot movement, reading the flow of the fight, etc., etc., a thorough lecture containing all this, and more. The number of learners attending the lectures of Jean Sehan's Jean Mudo School has exceeded 300. The approval rating of the learners show no sign of decline only the continuous upward climb. TL, I left Jean Mudo as is. It actually means, real martial arts, so, uh, I'm sure you'll agree leaving it in Korean sounds more impressive. Several cadets have been seen without carrying a weapon within the academy grounds of late, and such behavior is not being looked down on either. And we at XX Magazine, are proud to present to you a timely interview with a hero emerging from the darkness like a rapid meteor blazing across the sky. It was about Jean Sehan. S.A.E. Jean's brows furrowed as he read the article. You've become a real celebrity, huh? Yu Song. There was a leisurely smile hanging on Yu Song's lips as she looked at him. Ever since she had climbed to the position of the Minister of Monster Affairs, she was constantly reminded of Kim S.A.E. Jean and his influences. Bosses that constantly got on her nerves were no more even those petty attempts to hinder her saw a sharp decrease, them unable to publicly challenge her and remaining only as nothing more than some weak yapping behind her back. It was the first time in her professional career where she could experience a stress-free work environment every single day, so she was understandably happy. But, this might become a bigger problem if I get more famous than this SAE Jean. In reality, the identity of Jean Sehan was one-time use only. Although S.A.E. Jean said his goal was to reach the high tier during the interview, the main aim was to get to the upper mid tier instead, where he'd gain the access to the information he was looking for. The original plan was to have the upper mid tier Jean Sehan meet with an untimely accident before he could become a high tier, thereby leaving behind a tragic but juicy story for all. 
Arg, don't worry about that. A hero is an existence that gifts hope to the masses even in his death. Besides that, I see you've been getting along very well with fellow knights, eh? Yubek Song. Yubek Song clumsily dug out a mobile phone from somewhere. It was indeed a mobile phone. S.A.E. Jean's eyes opened wide after witnessing something he thought he'd never see, since all of their communication involved landlines or via those magic notebooks right up until recently. You bought a mobile phone. S.A.E. Jean. Yep. Yu Song showed him an image from the internet search results. It was of Jean Sehan, E. U. Jean, and Go Yun Zhang. Seeing this, S.A.E. Jean let out a forced chuckle and reached out towards the phone only to have his hand angrily slapped away by Yu Song, who carefully embraced the phone in her chest as if it was the most precious treasure in the whole world. No touch. T.L. L.O.L. Actually, it's supposed to be you're being rude. Ah. Oh, sorry S.A.E. Jean. Afterwards, she continued to fidget around the phone with those small hands of hers. And whenever she found something funny, she'd laugh out loud like a kid and told him to take a look. It was as if for someone like her who had lived a dreary life without a phone until now, she had finally discovered a whole new world to explore. S.A.E. Jean quietly studied her for a while. Funnily enough, he didn't feel bored watching her. He could only blame her gently swaying tail and that pair of twitching cat ears on top of her head. You know that the Leakins press conference is next month, yes? S.A.E. Jean. Mm -hmm. Of course I know. You Beck Song. And do you also know that, as a slight exaggeration, the contents are related to the end of the world? S.A.E. Jean. She didn't even bother to answer him. After all, with her ears standing stiff and her eyes opened wide, she was totally immersed on a video she found online. It must have been a very interesting video, indeed. Figuring that he had to snatch that phone away for the conversation to progress, S.A.E. Jean slowly reached out, but. S.F.X. for a low, threatening growl. He had to withdraw his hand when he saw her glaring at him while baring her fangs, growling. S.A.E. Jean could only stay there and witness her completely engrossed in the wonders of the internet for the next twenty minutes, before leaving the place with the words, I should get going now, another meeting to go to. Unfortunately, that video didn't end until then. Curious as to what she was watching so intently, S.A.E. Jean took a peek. He found her watching an episode of the program Animal Kingdom that featured daily lives of untamed tigers in the wilderness. Chuckling to himself, S.A.E. Jean left her office without a proper send-off. Walking towards the car park, he quickly climbed aboard his car and set the destination on the sat-nav to a certain restaurant in Kangwon province. With a good timing, his phone rang at the same time. Hi, Mr. S.A.E. Jean, where are you now? The friendly voice of an elf, Hazelines, came out of the receiver. I'm on my way as we speak. What about you, Miss Hazeline? I'm also getting ready to set off. Riding on a bus. A bus? Yes. S.A.E. Jean checked the time and the destination. There was enough room to spare, fortunately enough. In that case, wait for me at your place. I'll come and pick you up. Pardon? No, no, you don't have to do that. Oh. If you feel that way, then. I'll be waiting for you at home. Hazeline hurriedly ended the call. Smiling slightly, S.A.E. Jean turned on the ignition and stepped on the accelerator. Over here. After around five minutes, he could see a woman wearing a thick robe waving her hands through the windscreen. He was about to hit the brake to slow the car down, but then, felt the deeply suppressed urge to play a prank rush out and take over. Huh. W, where are you going? Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Over here. He. Stop. Has a line. He deliberately didn't stop the car and continued on. When he took a glance though the rearview mirror, he saw Hazeline hurriedly running after the car, looking rather flustered. This went on for another 200 meters or so. Thinking that he should probably end it here, he stopped the car and opened the passenger side door. Pant, pant. Pant, pant. 
Panting heavily thanks to the untimely sprint done with all her power, she grabbed the door frame real tightly and shot him a glare he was sure of Hazeline glaring at him, even though the hood was covering her eyes. But Sae Jean maintained a nonchalant expression and held open the door. Ah, my apologies. Forgot where you lived. Sae Jean. Pant, pant forgot. Really? You were not like this before, but you seem to have developed a mischievous streak lately. Would you like to taste the bitterness of a magic spell? Has a line. Get in. Or else I'll move the car again. Sae Jean. She pulled the hood off as soon as she sat down on the passenger seat. She seemed unhappy, sweat from the unnecessary exercise sliding down on her face. However, the strands of wet hair clinging on to her skin only made her look more alluring. Shall we go? Sae Jean. While on their way towards the restaurant, she didn't talk but continuously recited something to herself. Judging by how official the words sounded, they must have been either a script she had prepared in advance or the breakdown on various information she wanted to present. And they arrived at the restaurant located in Seoul after 20 minutes of driving. TL, oh boy. Seoul isn't in Kamwon province. Author made a mistake here. However, the scene surrounding that place was quite something else to behold. There was a limo with the national flag of France draped all over it, as well as dozen escort vehicles filling up the entire parking lot, not to mention the countless bodyguards carrying swords on their waists guarding the area. What the did the Prime Minister come personally or something? S.A.E. Jean. He did. Has a line. Ha. Huh. S.A.E. Jean. Prime Minister Roland has made his way here personally. That's why the meeting had been delayed slightly, to accommodate his busy schedule. But, I didn't hear of such a thing. S.A.E. Jean. Oh, you haven't? I'm sorry. It's probably because Mr. S.A.E. Jean has a habit of ignoring other people's phone calls. Hazeline spoke as if it was nothing much and entered the restaurant. Kim S.A.E. Jean stood there dazed for a bit, before finally moving his feet after one of the bodyguards walked over to his direction. Unlike with the USA, the meeting with the representatives from France who had all flew over to Korea personally, concluded rather smoothly. After hearing the French Prime Minister greet him in Korean, saying it's an honor, S.A.E. Jean found himself unable to speak properly but Hazeline was quite the opposite, speaking her piece out like a professional. So much so, it was impossible to tell that this woman was the very same person who stuttered like there's no tomorrow during the seminar back then. At the end of the two-hour-long meeting, it was decided that the next country to receive the potion exports would be France. S.A.E. Jean quickly ran back to his car and extracted a weapon he crafted from the trunk, and gave it to the Prime Minister as a goodwill present. The French PM returned with his entourage, pleased as a punch by the gift. Looks like everything went well. S.A.E. Jean. Watching the distancing cavalcade of limo and escort vehicles, two of them stood there, smiling in satisfaction. And as they headed towards the parking lot while still carrying that smile, they heard a voice calling out to them. Appa. It was cold and hard, but a deeply familiar voice. Hazeline and S.A.E. Jean simultaneously turned around to look. S.A.E. Young. S.A.E. Jean. It was you S.A.E. Young. As if she had just left the knight's order for the day, she was still wearing her order uniform as she stood there, staring at the two. Her eyes as she alternated her gaze between them were indescribably cold. You two seem to have gotten real friendly lately. U.S.A.E. Young. Oh, this is because of work S.A.E. Jean. I already know that. The restaurant is owned by my family, after all. But I'm asking because you two seem really happy together, is all. USAE Young. She walked in heavy footsteps, opened the passenger side door and climbed in first. Appa, why aren't you getting in? USAE Young. At her chilly voice, SAE Jean's body shook in fear, then he looked over at Hazeline. She too seemed deeply flustered as she pulled the hood over her head. Miss Hazeline, would you like to SAE Jean? Nope. I, I'm going home alone. It's fine, fine. It's not that far, anyhow. Has a line. Huh. No, wait a second S.A.E. Jean. I'm telling you, it's fine. Everything's cool, 
so please, quickly go. S.A.E. Young, take care. Hazeline. You too, Uni. Bye. At Hazeline's fervent dissuasion, S.A.E. Jean had no choice but to enter the car and start the ignition. Through the mirror, he could see her lonely back as she walked away. Chapter, 110. Although the ignition was turned on, the car hadn't moved. I'm fine with you two meeting up for work, but I also prefer if you don't get too familiar with her. USAE Young. Sitting on the passenger side, USAE Young spoke at the dawdling SAE Jean. Unlike other times, her voice was chilly and hard. SAE Jean didn't reply back. I'm Appa's girlfriend, right? Don't I have the right to ask for things like this? USAE Young. Only then did he turn his gaze towards her. Within her wet eyes, he saw the reflection of his own heavy expression. You're right. S.A.E. Jean. He returned his gaze back to front and pressed the accelerator. They drove past Hazeline by the roadside, standing there and waiting for the light to change on the pedestrian crossing. U.S.A.E. Young stared at the side of his face for a short while, before lowering her head and sighing out weakly, muttering out some words under her breath. I'm sorry. But Appa will understand if you were in my shoes USAE Young. Without saying anything, he gently grasped her hand. This is this Appa taking action without words. USAE Young. She deliberately asked in a cheerful manner. Yeah. He answered her, albeit reluctantly. November. The eyes of the entire world had gathered on the dawn night's order. The reason was the Leakin's press conference. Here, the number of people making quite a noisy scene easily exceeded the original capacity of 3,000 for the Dawn Order's main auditorium that acted as the venue for the conference. These people were a disorganized collection of reporters, knights and even wizards, whose nationalities and species were hard to determine. Also related to this conference, according to a certain memo leaflet doing the rounds within the financial world as well as between the Knights' Orders, there were quite a few speculations going on at the moment. Some said, the Leakin was planning to reveal the true cause for all the monster incidents happening of late some posited that another red moon would pop up soon or even, maybe that the Leakin was going to reveal himself to the public. Most of the folks gathered here carried the opinion that the first option was likely the correct guess, while they waited for the arrival of the Leakin spokesperson. Hyung Nim, what do you think? Reporter 1. How should I know? Don't talk to me. I need to make a call to the director reporter too. It's plenty chaotic here without me talking to you all. He's here. Reporter 1. For a short length of time, a quiet stillness visited the noisy auditorium buzzing with anticipation. When the front door to the stage opened, the main character of today's gathering walked in, a steady rhythm of his shoes hitting the ground echoing in the hall. Kim S.A.E. Jean. Carrying a mannerism and a facial expression of a man intimately familiar with the proceedings, S.A.E. Jean climbed up to the lectern and stared at the camera lenses. At the same time, countless camera flashes went off, but he didn't even blink once. Seeing how relaxed he appeared, several women started blushing for some reason. Just as the explosion of camera flashes lessened, S.A.E. Jean began speaking the issue at hand. Initially, he presented a set of an easily digestible data, designed to hopefully make the listeners place a bit more of their faith and trust in the seemingly baseless words that were soon to follow. Things such as the density of mana increasing drastically within the monster field, as well as the increasing frequency of boss-level monsters being spotted around world, etc., etc. But what does all of that got to do with the Leakin? Reporter One of the reporters asked out aloud. Kim S.A.E. Jean lightly nodded his head once, and then, finally spoke out the contents of Kim Yusone's dream vision, disguised as the Leakin's prediction. The Republic of Korea as well as the world, turning into hell on earth after appearances of countless boss-level monsters in this terrifying future. The devastated landscape had transformed into a playground of monsters, and mankind were nothing more than snack for them. When his presentation concluded, there was only silence remaining in the auditorium. What the Leakin had put forth was the end of the world. Even if he was the one who correctly predicted the advent of Red Moon, this was still a difficult notion to accept. Please, you need to believe him. S.A.E. Jean All S.A.E. Jean could do now, was to say those words and leave the stage. 
In reality, he had nothing left to say anyways. There was no more data compiled and no evidence to back up the claim either. The loud, roaring questions flew towards the departing SAE Jean's back, but he didn't answer any one of them, simply choosing to exit the auditorium. And later that day, the Korean peninsula exploded, figuratively speaking, of course. Almost every TV station and internet forum tried to dissect SAE Jean's press conference. Some of them treated him as a pure nutcase others said that it was quite a reasonable, rational prediction based on reality. However all those opinions, criticisms and insults had to stop, a week after the conference. That was because, on the safest location within the monster field, and less than three months after the appearance of the boss-level monster bird, another boss-level monster called the Flesh Golem had made its unwelcome appearance there. A creature crafted entirely by combining flesh of numerous monsters and people its might was dependent on the number of ingredients used, and as such, was quite a formidable monster to deal with. And this particular golem was over 70 meters tall and 34 meters wide. In order to fill up such a huge body with flesh, viscera and bones, one would need at least a thousand creatures, so there was no need to mention how obscenely powerful this monster was. Instinctively knowing only to walk forward and destroy everything standing in its way, the flesh golem moved its gigantic feet and stomped its way across the monster field and headed towards a heavily populated city. The estimated time of its arrival is 20 minutes. Kim Yurin. And naturally, the government and knights hurriedly constructed a defense line to counter the threat. Unfortunately for them, the golem's speed was just too fast. Although almost 100 knights with upper mid-tier rank had gathered after the emergency call-out orders were issued, they still lacked enough time to construct a proper line of defense. Can't we receive the aid of the hero orcs again? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin cautiously asked her father, Kim Hyun Suk. But he shook his head. Unlike the time with the monster bird and the red moon, the route is too different. Understand that we are not going to receive their aid this time. Kim Hyun Suk. This golem's destination wasn't Seoul but Busan. The monster was ignoring the mid-tier hunting ground and was cutting straight through the coastline within the high-tier ground. And that was also the reason why the line of defense was set up by the coast of the East Sea. Understood. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin let out a sigh and nodded her head. Kikiek. Right then, cries of a griffin could be heard from the sky. Thinking that monsters were attacking, Stunned knights quickly looked up. Thankfully, although it was indeed a monster, it also wasn't an enemy. Mounted on the chest of the griffin was the navy blue colored crest of the Dawn Knight's Order, and there was a knight riding atop the flying creature. It was the grand entrance of the famed griffin rider. It was such a cool appearance, almost every knight gathered here, even the upper mid tier ones, through undisguised looks of envy. Both of them are from the Dawn. Kim Hyun Suk. Hearing her father's bitter mumbling, Kim Yurin could only scratch the back of her neck. It was true about the old saying, that seeing the rise of a rival made one's stomach ache. No doubt, the Dawn Order would score big coverage worldwide, when the boss raid proved to be successful and the resulting footage were broadcast to the public. Commander Kim Hyun Suk, Sir. Soon after, knights affiliated with the National Defense Force and tanks camouflaged in shades of green rolled up into the beach. What will be our plan of action here, sir? The man in charge of the military forces inquired hurriedly. Kong, Kong. As soon as those words left his mouth, the towering silhouette of the flesh golem could be seen in the distance, and the unsettling tremor from each stride it took could be felt underfoot as well. Firstly, lure the monster onto the beach. Tanks will fire at the enemy once and retreat. They will only get in the way. Kim Hyun Suk. Kim Hyun Suk laid down the order as he unsheathed the powerful sword Graham that shone as brilliantly as the sun itself. Subordinate knights nodded their heads and dispersed quickly. Is this your first battle with that sword, master? Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin too unsheathed her sword and asked. It is indeed so. However I see that your sword is damaged slightly. Oh. Uh, yes, but as long as my mana can easily enter it, it's sufficiently good for me. Ask him for a favor. Kim Hyun Suk. Pardon. 
Kim Hyun Suk used his sword to lightly tap hers and smiled. It may be a branded goods, but it's already 30 years old now. It's time to change it. Aren't you a friend with Kim Sae Jin? Kim Hyun Suk. Ah, but, still. Take a good look at my sword. See how brilliantly clear its shine is. Was he trying to show off, even under this type of a situation? Kim Yurin took a quick glance at her father and pouted deeply. Regretfully, though there wasn't a lot of time left for her to carry that pout around. Kong. Kong. The tremor became louder and harsher. And on the blurry silhouette of the gigantic monster, a pair of blood-red eyeballs could be seen now. SFX for whirling noise. On the cannons of the tanks, mana began gathering like a whirlpool. Their aim was to intercept the golem's relentless march. At the same time, every knight present roused their mana up on their bodies, mana barriers strengthening their bodies and defenses, and on their weapons, or as matching the shapes of the various weapons they carried. And so, the deadly battle began proper. A fierce battle will unfold on a beach nearby. As soon as Sae Jean heard of the news, he thought this was the perfect opportunity to truly gauge the Leviathan form's depth of power. And also, maybe because it was a surprisingly docile creature that didn't take action unless its territory was breached, the threat of his ego being overtaken had not occurred once yet. Honestly, even with Athony form having grown to such a size, he still hadn't encountered the threat of it encroaching on his consciousness at all. He quickly crossed the monster field in a lycanthrope's appearance and quickly dived into the East Sea, transforming into the baby leviathan. And while riding on the rough waves, he rapidly swam towards the site of the battle. Wow, this body has gotten bigger now. Even the scales have changed color. The size had grown to a point where it could at least rival the height of a middle schooler, while the previously white scales had taken on a tinge of azure. When he looked at his own reflection on the water, the jaws seemed to have begun resembling a leviathan a little bit more, in the way it protruded out slightly. Even the fangs seemed to have gotten sharper as well. As expected, staying in water makes the growth of this form to accelerate. He caressed the undulating ocean waves and began to enjoy the impromptu bit of surfing. When he arrived on the scene, he witnessed one hell of a fight unfolding over there. No one could tell just where such an abomination came from, but regardless, it had to be acknowledged that the flesh golem was indeed a chimera-like creature of marvel. Kim Sae Jin observed the battlefield from afar. Seeing the sword auras rising from 100 plus knights over yonder, he could tell for sure that each and every one of them were people with unrivaled status. But then, the flesh golem proved to be a difficult opponent as well. Monsters fell from the giant golem's body they were its clones, each of them carrying battle strength exceeding that of a regular mid-tier knight. On top of this, quite unlike the image it presented with its massive body, the golem itself attacked with precisely controlled magic at the wizards who were lending assistance towards the battle up front. Sae Jean fell into a dilemma, wondering what he should do next. He couldn't dare to use his breath in fear of hitting those knights near the golem, but to sit here and do nothing was just. But soon enough, he came up with an idea. Almost nothing was known about how the leviathan of the legends attacked. People only knew that it could fire off a breath, just like a dragon. But Sae Jean thought it would be a regretful waste if he only relied on breath, when he had a skill that allowed him to manipulate the element of mana and water itself, affording him near-endless possibilities. I wonder, can I do it? For now, Sae Jean fired a stream of water towards the flesh golem. It was to understand the makeup of the golem using the leviathan's innate trait. The stream of water entered the golem's flesh, before exiting shortly after and flew back, landing on his scales. That was the end of the reconnaissance. Although he didn't have any correct material to build himself a flesh golem, he still understood how to make a golem. And so, he began pouring his will into the ocean current. As soon as he did that, the water rose up as if a giant mountain was about to break out of its surface, and then. A gigantic blue golem twice the size of the flesh golem revealed itself to the world. Immediately, heavy silence descended on the battlefield. Not only the knights, even the flesh golem too, stopped what they were doing and stared. One would be hard pressed to find a situation where the words absolutely overwhelming be more apt than this very moment. 
Its massive and impressive body reminded everyone witnessing it of the Titans from the folklores, and from those two blue eyes looking down on the battlefield, an indescribable pressure emanated out, causing everyone to feel suffocated. That is. Oh, FCK your mama. Unnamed knight. Not only one, but now there were two. Was this the entrance of yet another boss monster? Several knights were about fall down in utter despair, when. Wong. The titan of the ocean swung its huge fist. Knights hurriedly escaped from the vicinity, and almost right away, an incredible shock wave exploded out and seemingly swallowed up the whole world. Everyone's view was blocked by the torrents of sand and water drops crazily whirling around in the air. Even the branches of vegetation on the distant mountains broke off from the tremendous impact. Listen up, take care of the injure. But when the dirty cloud of dust began settling down and their view became clearer knights couldn't help but fall into another bout of stunned confusion. No, it was more like their brain ceased functioning altogether. They just stood there, staring. The huge fist of the titan was currently pushing down on the head of the flesh golem and not the knights. What the hell is going on? One of the knights dazedly muttered, giving voice to the very thought everyone else was having at that moment. Chapter 111 Quahang. A destructive shock wave shook the earth, and the titan's massive fist squashed the head of the flesh golem. SFX for a low growl. As if it got stunned by the sudden attack from what it thought was a fellow monster, the flesh golem let out a strange low frequency groan and retreated a little. Too bad, the blue titan didn't give a rat's ass and threw yet another massive punch, this time aimed at the golem's chest. Quite unlike the huge bulk that blocked out the sky, its movement was rather stylish to behold. Kuong. The flesh golem crossed its arm to block the incoming attack, but still suffered a grievous injury, one of its arms separating from the body. Angered by the immense pain, the golem let out a roar half filled with rage and the other half with agony, and dashed towards the blue titan. Now that it lost pretty much all its reasoning, it no longer displayed that deft application of magic and clones anymore. It just went for the midriff of the titan and tackled it to the ground. Splash! Falling into the East Sea, the flesh golem struggled in the water, but still swung its fist at the titan. But well, the shift into a new battleground presented a big problem for the monster. The fuel for the leviathan's titan was water of the ocean. In other words, it would never be defeated as long as it was in a body of water. SFX for expansive swings of a large fist. The flesh golem's violent punches constantly landed on the body of its target, but the blue titan didn't even try to defend itself. No, it simply counterattacked while letting the hits in. From the apocalyptic throwdown of two giant monsters, sparks of mana flew away like shooting stars. The battle slowly tilted towards the blue titan's favor as time passed. The flesh of the flesh golem continuously fell off, yet the titan's wounds were recovering constantly by all that sea water surrounding it. I'm getting dizzy here. However, there was that thing about mana of the summoner who brought forth the titan, Kim Sae Jean, constantly decreasing at an alarming rate. Thankfully, though the leviathan form possessed a mana reserve tens of times larger than his regular human appearance, so he wasn't too worried about that for now. Furung. Following a large and disturbing sound of explosion coming from the punches of two giants landing successfully, a piece of flesh stripped off the flesh golem and caused large ripples of water to splash all around. None of the knights witnessing this by the beach dared to intrude upon this battle meanwhile, drones belonging to knights' orders and media corporations buzzed away in the air, redirecting their camera lenses towards the giants. Kuong. Quang. Kuong. Quang. Although most of the drones had their wings and lenses damaged by the massive shock waves generated by the relentless and chaotic battle for supremacy happening right before them, a few still managed to endure and capture the resulting footage. What the hell is going on here? DN am I dreaming or something? Knight stared dazedly at this unexplainable situation for the next three minutes, before finally realizing why they were there in the first place, which helped them regain their focus. Regardless of what was happening, that blue titan was their ally. So, it made sense to work together and destroy that grotesque golem. Everyone, charge! Kim Hyun-suk cried out and dashed forward. 
SFX for energy something something shooting out. From his sword Graham, a powerful fireball shot out and inflicted a deep wound on the flesh golem's arm. The golem roared at the top of its lungs in unbridled rage, but the titan didn't miss its chance and thrust forward its massive blue fist into the golem's open mouth. Quajik. The fist connected so splendidly, the golem's mouth almost came loose. Towards the tottering flesh golem, countless knights rushed in and swung their weapons. Sharp, focused mana encased each and every one of those weapons, creating different silhouettes of weapon auras as the golem's body gradually became the proverbial Swiss cheese. SFX for a painful moan of a monster. Thanks to the unexpected alliance of the Blue Titan and the Knights, the Flesh Golem issued a sorrowful wail as it crumbled into a heap of disgusting pieces. However, although this battle had come to an end, Knights couldn't really relax at all. Would this Titan now turn its unwelcome attention towards them and attack? Well, such a worry proved to be a needless worry. The Blue Titan dissolved into several streams of water and disappeared into the sea altogether. And when the Titan suddenly vanished, Knights quickly followed the strands of mana leaving from the remains of the Titan. And sure enough, on the surface of the undulating sea over yonder, there was a single creature. Its entire body was covered in pale azure scales, and its eyes were unfathomably deep as if to demonstrate its intelligence. Unlike its adorable countenance, the aura this mysterious creature exuded was undeniably noble so much so, it proved impossible to stick whatever careless adjective one could think of to this being. What is that? Knights murmured to themselves and carefully studied its appearance. But, as if it was feeling shy from all the attention pouring on it, it immediately dived under the water's surface and disappeared from the view. The battle has ended. Mop up the remains of the golem. It was then, Kim Hyun Suk's energetic voice resounded. Pretty much every knight here was pooped out from fatigue, but still had to move their weary bodies since the superior officer issued an order. The subjugation of the flesh golem unexpectedly ended with very low casualties. And the footage containing the very reason for that the handiwork of the Leviathan spread out like wildfire the following day. However, since no one really knew about how the baby version of Leviathan looked like, the world took to calling it the unidentified life form and emphasized the fact that it played the crucial role in defeating the flesh golem. Of course. Judging from those shiny scales and deep, clear eyes, it could very well be a leviathan. There were a few experts who posited as so. Unfortunately, these experts were actually scholars focusing on the field of history and folklore, so real experts related to all things monsters summarily laughed them out of the room, berating them for their baseless assumptions. The leviathan was the world's laziest and because of that, relatively safe beast of legends. Plus, its normal territory was located in deep oceans, so it was argued that there was no way it would roam around the coastline of the East Sea. Could it be a divine beast? USAE Young. And currently, the armchair expert operating out of Kim S.A.E. Jean's home, USAE Young, took a look at this and that on the Dawn's official forum using her phone before spinning out her own interesting theory. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, a divine beast. Remember that black turtle living near China not too long ago? And people keep saying that the Azure Dragon and the Leviathan have broadly similar set of abilities, the only difference being their names, you know. So you're saying this creature is the Azure Dragon of the East? Dumbfounded, S.A.E. Jean pointed towards the face of the baby Leviathan, which kind of resembled a puppy no matter how one cut it. Right up until then, even he was impressed by how cute it looked in the photo. Yep. But I'm not the only one with that opinion right now. A few Dawn Order Knights are thinking like this already. Gimme that. Let me see. S.A.E. Jean. U.S.A.E. Young was telling the truth. The Dawn's official forum was filled with Azure Dragon, this and Azure Dragon, that. He thought that the Dawn was filled with best of the best, but now now, he realized they too possessed capacity to spout unfounded rubbish. See? What did I tell you? But still, it feels like all these huge things happen only in Korea lately. There are the hero orcs on land, and in the sea, we got a bona fide Azure Dragon now ah. Right, right. Look, the Azure Dragon supposedly guards the eastern direction, right? The East Sea is to the East USA Young. It's not like that, so you can tell them to stop with this nonsense. 
What the? How does Appa know that for sure? USAE Young. Since he couldn't say it's me, so I'm pretty sure about it, SAE Jean just let out a fake cough and gave the phone back to her. But when USAE Young got her phone back, she quickly studied his mood for a bit, before asking him in an obviously manufactured leisure. Op, Appa should give me your phone too. Mine. Why? Ju, just give it to me. Appa also took mine just now, so this is fair. Although her logic didn't quite sound right, SAE Jean didn't argue and gave her his phone. She quickly snatched it off his hands, and as if afraid of having her activity seen, she brought the phone right in front of her eyes and hurriedly moved her fingers. And about three minutes passed like that. After confirming that he hadn't made any suspicious contact with Hazeline, she let out a relieved sigh, chucked the phone on top of the dining room table and dived into his arms. Appa always grumbles like an old man, but still ends up doing everything I ask of you. What are you talking about? No, well it's nothing, really. She spoke hard to understand words while unbuttoning S.A.E. Jean's shirt. Exactly one week passed since the subjugation. And the situation became exactly as USAE Young had predicted. The baby Leviathan had morphed into the baby Azure Dragon of the East instead, and the world raised a huge fuss, saying that the Azure Dragon would become the guardian of the East Sea. Hell, even the government got suckered into this popular opinion and believed it. They were currently in the middle of combing the entirety of the East Sea for the evidence of this baby dragon that would no doubt become a huge asset to the national security in the future. How are you handling Rahamed so far? Ignoring all these chaos, Kim Sae Jean went to visit Kim Yusong. The veteran mercenary's complexion had become a lot worse than before. We're taking a good care of him Kwim. The ploy of using special pharmaceuticals to control him is also progressing favorably as well it won't be long before we are able to extract all the information we need. But besides all that, Kim Yusong tapped the top of his desk, and a hologram projection rose up. And in this projection, a web page of a cafe named the Deity of Four Directions, Azure Dragon. What will you do about this, sir? Kim Yusong. Ah, this, well, ah, uh, SAE Jean. In my opinion, I think this is a good development, sir. Before SAE Jean could finish, Kim Yusong stepped in the middle. This is good. SAE Jean. Yes, sir. Without a doubt, the frequency of boss monsters appearing will only increase from now on but if there is a being that can give rise to hope to our allies and instill despair in the hearts of the enemies. Then that's all for the better, I believe. More importantly, as a leviathan, you can easily fight against any boss-level monsters alone, so you will become a great pillar of strength for this world. Kim Sae Jean wordlessly scratched the back of his neck after seeing how ardent and fervent Kim Yusoon seemed to appear. After all, wasn't this like a formation of a suicide squad to keep the end of the world at bay or something? Ah, well, that is A.E. Jean. Also, truth be told, it was my idea to create this cafe. Of course, if you, the guild master, wishes it, I will reveal to the world that it's not an azure dragon but a leviathan, instead. Huh. No, wait, but why S.A.E. Jean? At this sudden confession, S.A.E. Jean's eyes went extra round. Your abilities are indeed truly an incredible thing, Guild Master. The Leviathan is a monster that possesses divinity, and so, if you can continue to appear as one and learn to utilize its powers in full, then this old man will not have any more wishes left. The eyes of the strangely urgent Kim Yusong were not only filled with his desperation, but streams of blood as well. Kim Sae Jean couldn't say I can't do it to the face of a man who looked like he might vomit blood any time now. Yes. Well, uh, my parents seem to have been fighting them, so I should do the same, too. But forget about that for a second, and please drink this. There is blood pooling in your eyes. S.A.E. Jean reluctantly replied and handed a potion over to Kim Yusong. It was a high-grade potion that one couldn't even buy in the market even if one wanted to. Ho 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 thank you. Kim Yusong made a somewhat relieved and leisurely smile as he received the potion. After finishing up the meeting with Kim Yusong, S.A.E. Jean headed to the guild's training facility as usual to train, only to find an unexpected guest waiting for him there. Ah, you finally came, Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. 
It was Kim Yurin. She was smiling at him while carrying various items on both of her hands. What are all those? S.A.E. Jean. It felt wrong to come with empty hands so I brought along some stuff. Kim Yurin. You mean, all of them? Yes. It's nothing much. It's just some electronic items, a wrist watch, and a wallet, and Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean tilted his head slightly, but he still took the gift packages and placed them down on the table in the lounge. But, why did you go to all this trouble, Miss Yurin? Is there a favor you'd like to ask me for? Ah. Uh. Oh, uh, a favor, you say I don't particularly have one, but the thing is Kim Yurin. She began contorting her face to form an unnatural smile while slightly shaking her hips. Why is she trying to dance provocatively all of a sudden? S.A.E. Jean's face reddened slightly, before belatedly spotting a sword tied to her hips. She didn't have a scabbard to hide it, and even with a single glance, he could tell that it was chipped pretty noticeably and didn't look all that threatening anymore. Looks like your weapon's durability has fallen greatly. S.A.E. Jean. Ah, you think so? Ah. But what happened to my scabbard? Although her acting needed a lot of work, S.A.E. Jean did find her attempt quite funny, so he grinned slightly and opened his mouth. There's no need to beat around the bush, Miss Yurin. I'll help you. I'll even give you a discount as well. Are, really? In that case, I. Four. Five million dollars. Of course, you don't have to worry about its resulting quality. I'll definitely craft a weapon that'll rank in the top three of the branded goods rankings. S.A.E. Jean. Foe, 4.5. Watching Kim Yurin's face gradually lose color, S.A.E. Jean couldn't hold it and began chuckling out loudly. Yes. I can't go any lower than that, I'm afraid. S.A.E. Jean. Ah, uh, yes. I, I also am P, P, prepared, as well. Kim Yurin swallowed her saliva noisily and nodded her head. Actually, though, her real reason for this visit wasn't just about her weapon. There was something else far more important. Something she just had to find out. She even spent one whole night staying up, researching and worrying about this thing. By the way Mr. S.A.E. Jean, besides all that. At her voice suddenly becoming razor sharp, S.A.E. Jean's shoulders trembled slightly. Yes. Would you like to spar with me for a little bit? Chapter, 112 If you are having problems seeing the chapter list on the indexes and front page, please delete your entire browser cache. Unfortunately, that is currently, the only way to fix the issue at the moment. Thank you. A spar. Why, all of a sudden? S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean backpedaled. However, Kim Yurin took a quick step forward and got closer to him. Although I did give you my assessment before, I've never really fought you with my utmost yet. Kim Yurin. I, uh. E-I-I, don't be like that and let's do this thing once and for all. Kim Yurin. S.A.E. Jean took a quick glance at the clock. It hadn't even been ten minutes since he arrived at the training facility, and on top of that, he was decked out in training suit as well so, to go home now was just a bit. Come on now, let's do this. Kim Yurin. Kim Yurin showed off Ejio which was quite unlike her, while she dragged the helpless S.A.E. Jinto the middle of the training facility. While still carrying an unsure expression, S.A.E. Jin went to pick the practice sword, but Kim Yurin shook her head in disapproval and handed him a mace, instead. Look, here's a mace you can use. You wielded it so well back then. Kim Yurin. Still carrying that smile of hers, she forcibly squeezed the mace into his hands. S.A.E. Jean. He looked at the mace and fell into a thought. Kim Yurin was definitely suspecting something. Every single action he takes from here on could flame her suspicions even more. Before he could organize his thoughts properly, Kim Yurin approached him like a bolt of lightning and swung her sword down. She didn't load the weapon with mana, but the power and accuracy displayed were still incredible, so S.A.E. Jean had to put all his effort to swing the mace and defend himself. That sudden burst signaled the beginning of the duel between a mace and a sword. S.A.E. Jean put just over a half of what he was really capable of during this sparring session. 
but it proved impossible to completely mask all those little habits that his body had accumulated over time, and now, Kim Yurin was sitting on a chair, seriously pondering about something while her frown deepened further. Fuo. Oh. She spat out a sigh. Truly, she felt that there were parts that resembled the hero orc. Definitely so. Did that mean Kim Sae Jin studied under the hero orc? Well, he did say something about him being friendly with a subordinate of the orc. But remembering back to those times when she went to the orc village, she couldn't recall ever seeing any traces of him there. Maybe. She looked at Sae Jin who was stretching his limbs at that moment. Monsters that could change into humans were very rare, but they existed for sure. Called the The Monster Man, she even personally hunted one before. But Kim Sae Jin definitely wasn't like that. Looking at his history, no one could argue that he was a monster in disguise. In that case. Maybe, it was the opposite. In other words, a human that could change into a monster. And, there was certainly one ability blessed onto the human race that could make such a thing plausible, the trait. Dot. Mr. Kim Sae Jin. Kim Yurin cautiously called out to him. Yes. Sae Jin. Um, if it's not too much trouble. Can I ask what your trait is? Kim Yurin. My trait. Ah, uh, well. Yes. But if you feel uncomfortable talking about, then you don't have to tell me. Kim Yurin. Really? In that case, I won't tell you. It's a taboo, after all. Sae Jin. Kim Sae Jin made his displeasure known and bounced out of the training facility in hurried steps. Eh. Kim Yurin stared at his back in a dumbfounded daze. Chilly winds were blowing now, and some regions had already welcomed early s. Eins of snow with warm smiles. The sights of people walking around wearing thick padding could be seen, and stores selling scarves and gloves increased in numbers. The arrival of a new season seemed to possess the power to bring forth such changes to the scenery. I hear that Portugal is on the brink. Won't the world really come to end at this rate? E.I., come on now. The conversations taking place on the streets were fused with the seasonal wintry chill. Just over a month had passed since the earth-shaking press conference, and chaos had truly visited the world. The total number of monsters were increasing explosively, and boss-level monsters constantly popped up. As if the monster bird incident of Korea was just the beginning, stronger and scarier monsters turned the world upside down. The situation had worsened so much. It became no longer possible to maintain a functioning government in regions that fell behind in terms of forming an acceptable defense against monster threats as well on the development of Knight's Orders, regions such as Southeast Asia and the continent of Africa. This triggered an unprecedented refugee crisis and thus became another big worldwide issue. However, from that incident with the monster bird, and to the recent flesh golem, the Republic of Korea suffered little damage to itself while it fought off those threats when compared to other nations. And one of the reasons for this was, unlike others, all because of a certain mysterious supernatural force. The Leviathan. A being that the world took to calling as the Azure Dragon. But something is strange. Sae Jin. Kim Sae Jin quietly muttered to himself as he read the words off the pages of, A Deity of Four Directions, Azure Dragon. Dot. Quite different from the name that sounded like a swindler's operation, the website itself was thoroughly well designed and laid out. The Azure Dragon related notifications, open forums, notice boards, etc., etc. The simple but luxuriously decorated site didn't have much traffic, but at the same time, it seemed that there were a few dedicated individuals keeping things going steadily as well. It's like the site is in a sleep mode, but still, the Azure Dragon is fast becoming the guardian entity of the Korean Peninsula. Kim Sun Ho Kim Sun Ho replied with an energetic voice. Sae Jin came to see Kim Yu Son, but the illness of the old man had flared up and so, he was having a meeting with his son, Sun Ho, instead. Okay, fine. But. Just how are you planning to utilize this cafe? Sae Jin. Ah, uh, about that. So, I've got this idea, how about we do it like this, sir? There is this old movie called The Spider MN, you see, and in it, it uses roughly the same idea as mine. 
Kim Sun Ho continued with his words in a somewhat happy voice. His suggestion was rather simple. The owners of the website were Kim Sun Ho, Kim Sae Jin, and Kim Yu Son. And among them, Sae Jin was the Leviathan. And so, Sae Jin would inform them of the next place where the Leviathan was going to appear, and that info would pop up on this website. TL, there was a thing like that in Spider Man movies? Hmm. Through this method, which implied that this website was in some sort of communication with the Azure Dragon, it would earn a huge amount of fame and people's trust. And they would be able to instill the idea of the Leviathan, or in this case, the Azure Dragon, being the ally of humanity. However, when looking at the big picture, isn't that fraud? SAE Gene. Pardon? Well, that, uh, well. No, it likely isn't. It'll probably be okay, as long as we are not found out, Guildmaster. Kim Sun Ho. This whole thing about not getting found out didn't sound kosher, so SAE Gene narrowed his eyes and glared at Kim Sun Ho. W, well, if such a thing is a fraud, then, uh, acting as the Leakin, the Guildmaster would end up serving multiple lives in ten. Oh. Sorry. Kim Sun Ho. Kim Sun Ho hurriedly tried to come up with an excuse, before lowering his head and scratched the back of his neck. Sae Jean looked at him and chuckled slightly. Although Kim Sun Ho seemed to be scared of his boss in the beginning, it was as if he had gotten a lot more comfortable now and his attitude had lightened up. Sae Jean preferred this, as it was like dealing with a friend. Also, Sae Jean didn't expect to see the father of a child to be so immature as well, either. Anyhow. I've already uploaded the coordinates where you will be for today. Of course, no one will believe us now, but I already called up a friendly news network, so. I'm pretty certain that they will send someone over. Kim Sun Ho. Sae Jean nodded his head. But then, Kim Sun Ho's expression hardened suddenly. Ah, uh, also, it seems like that Bathory woman is showing signs of movement, Master. Kim Sun Ho. She is? Yes sir. Not sure what's gotten into her, but for someone who doesn't want to breathe the same air as humans, she's been seen walking around the outside quite a lot lately. But what's odd about her behavior is that she's been seen wandering around the coastline. Looks like she is thinking about the Azure Dragon, Guildmaster. In that case, if I'm lucky, I might get to meet her, then. Sae Jean. Sae Jean's eyes shone brightly. As long as Leviathan was not on solid ground, it was basically invincible within the ocean. After all, the ocean was like an infinite source of mana to him. No, Guildmaster, if you are unlucky, then you'll get to meet her. However, Kim Sun Ho's rebuttal was rather blunt. What do you mean? It's still too difficult against the Bathory woman, sir. She alone brutally slaughtered dozens of highest tier knights back when the war between races was still a thing. Even with the Leviathan form, as a baby, you're asking for the impossible. Kim Sun Ho. She's that powerful. Currently, his Leviathan form was strong enough to fight against the flesh golem, albeit by using a special technique. But even that was not enough to stand up against this Bathory woman. That's correct, sir. The descendants of the Bathory family enjoy this unique trait passed down genetically where, by paying the price of fellow vampires' lives, they become much more powerful than before. Not sure how that works, but well, that weird story about Bathory bathing in blood. That story came about because of this trait, sir. Kim Sae Jean understood then. Back then, the number of vampires who died during the war between the races easily went past a hundred thousand worldwide. After ending the meeting with Kim Sun Ho, Sae Jean changed into the Leviathan and swam in the East Sea. Currently, even at a casual glance, his length and weight had blown up at a crazy rate. He only swam in the East Sea three times a week, but still. It seemed that his growth accelerated due to him using this form's abilities rather vigorously of late. Most importantly, though, he still hadn't felt the dangers of his ego being overtaken by the creature's instincts, not like with the orc or the lycanthrope. This led to Sae Jean questioning the veracity of the widely understood nature of the Leviathan that people accepted as fact. He even thought that maybe, this powerful creature of the ocean wasn't a monster, 
but a being sitting on a higher plane of existence than mere humans. They said the Leviathan would turn violent when its territory was breached, but. Well, wouldn't humans do the same too, under the circumstances? There was no creature alive that allowed others to freely break into their homes, after all. There it is. Hearing the voices coming from afar, S.A.E. Jean quickly assumed a serious facial expression and corrected his posture. The appearance of a baby leviathan being pushed around by the waves had suddenly transformed into an omnipotent deity. Be quiet. Carefully take its photos. Easy, easy. The camera lens pointing towards him was located on top of a yacht. In other words, there was a boat carrying people in this dangerous part of the East Sea. If it was in the past, this would have never happened in a million years, they probably had to cross areas filled with sea monsters to get here. Well, everyone. There it is, the Azure Dragon. Looks like it has grown in size a little, but it still exudes that noble and unwavering aura. A reporter whispered to the other passengers. S.A.E. Jean glanced at the label stuck on the camera. They were from the station KNS, a friendly broadcaster, the one Kim Yusone secretly gave a heads up to, as a thank you for all the favorable articles written about the Monster Guild. Now, the East Sea trade route has been stabilized thanks to the influence of the Azure Dragon. All the regular sea monsters as well as the flying monsters previously found near here are busy migrating away from the East Sea, after being thoroughly suppressed by the dragon's presence. Right now, the economic value added to the country because of the Azure Dragon cleaning up this region has been calculated to easily exceed 1 billion. Of course, not all ocean-bound monsters ran away. Every now and then, an aggressive sea monster did appear and challenged him. Just like now. E.U. Herc. The yacht began swaying uncontrollably as the heavy waves rose up all of a sudden. At the same time, darkness seemed to descend on the world, and a monster revealed its ugly mug from under the water's surface. Red eyes and horrifying fangs jutting out from its maws, it was a monster called Ness, the dominant creature of this area, before the Leviathan showed up. TL, Korea is pretty far from Scotland, so not sure how the Loch Ness monster has ended up there, but this is a work of fiction, so anything goes, I guess. That, that, that. Someone from the yacht. As expected, it became a state of full-on panic on the yacht. The escort knights belatedly unsheathed their weapons, but everyone knew very well that no knight could defeat a sea monster when on the sea. The reporter looked at the leviathan with a pair of pleading eyes. Kuhyung. Kim Sae Jean the baby leviathan snorted dismissively, and slowly moved his body. The Ness monster growled and expelled mana in a threatening manner, but well, it was all kind of laughable, really. He was planning to use his breath and easily blow the creature away, but then, he thought about the camera. It was true that one wanted to show off a bit if there was an appreciative audience watching the action. He thought for a bit on what he should do, before a good idea popped in his brain. He then quickly poured his mana into the ocean. SFX for a sudden gust of heavy winds. Violent winds suddenly whipped up like a thunderstorm and shook the sky, and on the body of water where the Ness was swimming, the ocean began to split open. And after all that mass of water parted away as if a world of vacuum had formed there, the previously hidden main body of the Ness was dramatically revealed to the world. Unfortunately for the monster, the sea water was basically its life. The Ness desperately pedaled its limbs in the air where there was not a drop of water as it began drying up from the tip of its tail, until finally, even the red light circulating in its eyes dissipated away. This should be enough, then. Kim Sae Jean returned the violent storm of winds and the massively split ocean back to their original calm state, and then took a quick glance at the yacht. Even while experiencing events exceeding his wildest imaginations, the cameraman showed off his true professionalism and continued to film everything away. Ah! Uh. Inside the minds of these folks, who were all dazedly staring at the baby Azure Dragon, this creature had become even more wondrous to behold. To split open the sea like that. They had read that before, but, that was from the Bible. And more importantly, the one who performed that miracle was the omnipotent God. S.A.E. Jean took one more glance at the dazed group of people, before diving deep into the water. He was going to absorb the Ness's mana crystal. Overall growth, 10% achieved. Acquired the skill, Ness's evil eye. 
life forms coming in contact with the sea monster's glare will be unable to move for a short period of time. Divine creatures will be unaffected by this skill. This skill can only be used during the sea monster form. Although it was an alert window he hadn't seen in a long while, rather than feeling happy, SAE Jean found himself utterly stunned at its contents. This is only 10%. To think that such an overwhelming strength was only 10% of its true might. SAE Jean couldn't help but praise the greatness of the Leviathan. Chapter 113 A certain video footage was being played inside the editing suite of a media company called Gutnayam Daily. In it, one could see an azure dragon yawning and stretching its limbs while floating on top of the ocean surface when, all of a sudden, the sea monster Ness made its entrance. It was one of East Sea's most infamous monsters. Facing the provocation of this Ness, Azure Dragon began radiating charm filled with wondrous leisure outward. And when the adorable Azure Dragon opened its eyes wide open and glared, the sea containing the Ness split completely apart, just like how Moses split the Red Sea. In the end, Ness couldn't even do anything and died a death of drying up like a jerky and then, the Azure Dragon triumphantly dived under the water's surface. Holy cow! This is some serious SHT. P.D. Kim, how the hell did you capture this footage? Thanks to the power of this massive, exclusive scoop, even the chief director of the Guknayam Daily, Park Yung hyuk had to make his way to the editing suite. Maintaining a slim smile, P.D. Kim hyun did his best to rein in his overflowing pride and tried to appear as humble as possible. We had received a call from the Monster Mercenary Company. A notice of the Azure Dragon's potential appearance had popped up in a website called the Deity of Four Directions, Azure Dragon, and they wanted us to verify the veracity of that claim. Hume to verify, huh? Yes, sir. I also thought it could be nothing more than some swindlers trying their luck, but since the mercenary company made the request, I had no choice but to check it out. Chief Director Park scratched his chin as he thought about something. If that mercenary company suddenly asked one of his men to verify the claims of a fishy-sounding website, then that could only mean well, they were doing things in a sort of roundabout way. Okay, so who is the owner of that website? Don't tell me, it's also Mr. Kim Sae Jean. Director Park said as he began typing on the keyboard. On the screen of the editing room's computer, that video footage was replaced by the website A Deity of Four Directions, Azure Dragon. They were denying it, but I think it's quite likely. I mean, Kim Sae Jean did say he could communicate with monsters. And coincidentally, the ones to tip us off was the monster mercenary too, so. Is that right? In that case for now, keep everything to yourself. Our station has been surviving thanks to Mr. Kim Sae Jean, so don't you dare FCK this one up. Guk Nayam Daily was a big multimedia conglomerate that also owned the station KNS, but the truth was, it had been lagging behind their rivals due to experiencing numerous hardships and headwinds in the past. However, from a certain point in time, things changed beginning with the Monster Guild revealing important information through Guknayam only. And they even made an entertainment show which didn't seem all that promising on paper with USA Young, Ju Ji Hyuk, Yi Hai Rin as well as other famous members of the Guild. And now, they had become so intimate, that some were openly wondering if the monster had acquired the media outlet or not. And that led to the prestige of Guknayam to naturally soar at a remarkable rate. At minimum, they no longer heard these damnable words, KNS. Ah apologies, you guys are a bit from the agents of knights and celebrities. No, in the case with knights, their eyes gleamed dangerously as they actively tried to jump in with both their feet. After all, there was this shining backer called the monster behind Guknayam now. Director Park closed his eyes and began comparing the turbulent, difficult past and the good times of now, falling deeply into a state of pride at how things had turned out. Ah, uh, by the way, P.D. Kim. Then, suddenly, he began glaring at P.D. Kim. Why, yes. You are being rude, saying Kim Sae Jean this and Kim Sae Jean that. You better address him with a SSI at the end no, you start calling him with a NIM attached, understand? It's now Kim Sae Jean NIM. Got that? Even if he's not around, you use the honorific. If you don't, you might end up having a slip of a tongue during an interview or something. 
It seemed that Kim Sae Jin had already become a religion for Director Park. Ah. Yes, sir. P.D. Kim scratched the back of his neck and replied in a reluctant manner. Repeat after me. Kim Sae Jin Nim, Kim Sae Jin Nim, Kim Sae Jin Nim. In the middle of the winter. For the purpose of going out on a date, Sae Jin brought U.S.A.E. Young along to the Monster Mercenary Company HQ. Numerous modifications, new additions and repair works must have had some contributions here, because the Mercenary Company building not only failed to resemble a garden shed constructed out of plywood. It instead looked far more pristine, imposing, and impressive than a regular Knight's Orders HQ. As expected of the world's best mercenary company. As an aside, there were now more than 30 mercenary companies established around the world, making the title of the world's best all that more meaningful. The infrastructure looks clean and well thought out. S.A.E. Jean S.A.E. Jean looked around the interior and showed his admiration. The lobby, the front counter, the board with jobs listed, etc., etc. What he saw here was a space that perfectly blended the story tradition of the freedom-loving mercenaries and the cutting-edge technology of the present. Thank you. Well, after the story of how well designed our systems are, as well as superior benefits and bonuses we offer, current and former knights are tripping over each other to register as our members. Kim Sunho. Kim Sunho said, his voice overflowing with pride. Oh, really? S.A.E. Jean. Ing. Even within my dawn order, a handful of knights stealthily submitted their papers to the Monster Mercenary Company. They initially denied doing it as if their lives were depending on it, but when they got admitted in, poof, they left, just like that. Did you know how speechless I was back then? USAE Young. USAE Young replied in Sun Ho's stead with a slightly sour face. Ha 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 it's true. In my opinion, I think the clincher is the no-cost artifact rental service the company offers. Ah, since we are talking about that, would you like to go and take a look? Kim Sun Ho. The no-cost artifact rental service. It was a service where various artifacts of TM the monster company, known for their intricate design and outstanding performance, were rented out for free. It was also perhaps one of the exclusive benefits the monster mercenary company offered that all the other knights orders was envious of. Mercenaries who worked for the monster could rent out an artifact carefully crafted by the lead designer of the undisputed number one desired artifact brand as voted by the Knights TM for free. As an aside, the job title of lead designer was coined by people not from the company and that title belonged to none other than Kim Sae Jean, of course. I'm also kinda curious. Appa, can we go? USAE Young. Well, sure. Let's go. S.A.E. Jean. Please, this way. Kim Sun Ho. Kim Sun Ho assumed a bright smile and led the way. The interior of the rental office, simply named Artifact Service, was definitely not simple at all. The incredibly massive safe and the state-of-the-art security systems seemed to possess a brutal ambience and made one shrivel away just by their presence alone. Has there been any theft attempts? S.A.E. Jean. No, sir. This security system here is bulletproof. Kim Sun Ho. Very good. S.A.E. Jean. Since there were quite a few number of people waiting to rent out artifacts inside the office, they couldn't stay for too long. They spent ten minutes there exploring, before leaving that place and headed to the break room. Wow, this place, looks way better than in the photos. U.S.A.E. Young. The break room, over 200 Pyong in size, was impressively kicked out, enough even for USAE Young to show how pleasantly surprised she was there were liquid refreshments and food available. And even facilities such as snookers and 10-pin bowling were installed here. TL, 1 Pyong 3. 3,058 square meters. I'm sure this is one break room that knights of various orders are most envious of. We're different from knights orders in that, our members are free to spend their time any way they like. Kim S.A.E. Jean wrapped his arm around the shoulders of impressed U.S.A.E. Young and pulled her closer, before observing the activities of the mercenaries with great interest. Hey, dude. Did you check this out yet? This a deity of four directions, Azure Dragon, website. Oh you mean that CP about some fairy tale? In the middle of all that, 
USA Young overheard a conversation that tugged at her curiosity. She stopped in her tracks for a bit and eavesdropped on the two male mercenaries. No, man. Really? Haven't you seen the news? The site has predicted the location where the Azure Dragon was going to appear. And you know what, it was true. It's obviously a bull CP, so how can you believe in this SHT? The number of visitors to the website Azure Dragon had exploded as soon as its existence was mentioned on the television. Of course, since the site was ready for such an eventuality, the servers ably handled all the increased traffic. And so, the website had become really famous now. Still, a part of the population mocked others who believed in the site's claims, calling it nothing but a fairy tale. It's not bullshit. Didn't you hear that rumor about Spain trying to get in touch with the site owners in official capacity? You know just how many sea monsters are out there. Oh. So, who are the site owners, then? How the hell should I know that? Some say, it's definitely the guild master Kim Sae Jin. It was then, a single alarm went off from the mercenary clock. TL, don't ask me, either. No clue what this mercenary clock is. I'm just TLing it as literally as possible. Hey, hey, hey. Looks like the job rewards are finally in. Let's go and get it. Uh. Really? Let's go, then. Next round is on the person with the lower. But when they stood up to leave, Kim Sae Jin and USAE Young were standing right behind them. Both of them froze on the spot thanks to the unexpected entrance of these two people, who were basically, practically, figuratively speaking, their bosses. You should be on your way, said USAE Young. The way she talked to Sae Jin and when addressing other people were completely, utterly different. There was not a speck of emotion contained in her indifferent voice, for the latter case. Misunderstanding the cold tone of her voice, the two mercenaries began wrecking their brains earnestly in order to remember what they had done wrong. Unfortunately, there was one. They did allege that Sae Jean was the owner of that website. We're sorry. Two mercenaries spoke in heavy voices and suddenly, knelt down on the ground. Huh. What are you doing all of a sudden? Flustered, Sae Jean and Usae Young waved their hands around in panic and meanwhile, Kim Sun Ho watched the proceedings, full of interest. On the uppermost floor of a certain hotel. Inside this darkly decorated penthouse suite, a news program was unexpectedly being shown on a giant TV screen. The Azure Dragon has helped people out today as well. The infamous monster that attacked the filming crew of KNS, the Ness, was killed by the dragon. This miraculous event was captured on film by the brave reporter of KNS. I want to make that thing my pet. So, what do you think? Bathory. At Bathory's words, the apostle lightly bit his lip. He kind of expected this outcome, after seeing the appearance of that unknown life form. Bathory had this unexplainable thing of finding monsters more adorable than actual people, after all. Ha, ha ha well, that is we're just a bit too swarmed with work, so at the moment to tame such a monster, we might end up committing away a lot of resources, my lady. Bathory. The apostle did his best to beat around the bush, but Bathory's gaze that was sharper than the sharpest blade remained pointing at him. I know that. But well I want it so much, so what can I do? Besides, that creature killed my Ness, too. So, don't you think it's only fair that that baby monster takes over the empty spot of Ness in my life? Bathory. Within the blood of vampires, demonic energy flowed naturally. So, it was incredibly rare to see a vampire getting attacked by monsters. Instead, more often than not, there were cases of them being rather friendly towards one another. Well, rather than being friendly, it was more like vampires manipulating monsters using their unique seduction magic. Of course, what you said is hundreds time, thousands time, ten thousands times correct, but that, that creature seems just too powerful to be fully tamed. Hey you! Are you trying to diss me or something? It's easy for me, if it's only that strong. And on top of that, it's still a baby. No matter how resistant it is, beat it up real good a few times, and it won't fight back no more. Don't you think it will be useful once we tame it? And most of all Bathory. 
Bathory pointed at the kid on the TV screen and licked her lips in a somewhat suspicious manner. Look how adorable it is. Look at it cocking its eyebrows to appear dignified. I just want to bite it so much. Kaya. It'll die if you bite it, though. The apostle somehow was able to swallow back his retort. He really felt like killing himself. Just how was he going to capture a creature that was being called the deity of the East Sea, and the king of infinite oceans? It wasn't like Bathory herself was going to help anyway, either. Besides that, I'm pretty sure that even the Lord will like it. I mean, the Lord already owns four pet monsters a basilisk, a Cerberus, and, and. You can find more information on the Azure Dragon in the website A Deity of Four Directions, Azure Dragon. Bathory's head snapped towards the direction of the Apostle in an instant. You heard that, right? Bathory. Why, yes, my lady. This servant has heard it. But. But what? Are you standing there waiting for your neck to fly off your body? Bathory. Ah, the, that is no, uh. The Apostle stood there hesitantly, his face now nearly full of tears. But he hurriedly ran out of the room after Bathory stomped down on the floor with her high heel. Almost at the same time. Wah! Kim Sae Jean was in the middle of realizing just what a bear living in a zoo must have felt like. No matter what he did literally anything he could hear people raising cries of cheers from the side. When he shook his tail and jumped into the water. Shouts of joy rose up. And when he opened his mouth wide and yawned. Wah! Again, another shouts of joy. When he floated there and did nothing but blink his eyes. Wah! Even then, people cheered out. Seriously, where the heck did this cruise show up from? S.A.E. Jean scratched the back of his neck with his front limb as he looked at the ship full of people that started to follow him around from some time ago. Wah! Just like before, another shouts of cheer. A few. Seeing the label TM on the side of the ship, it seemed that Joe Hansung saw yet another opportunity and quickly started a new line of business as soon as the East Sea was cleared out, but. Fu Wu. They were beginning to annoy him. S.A.E. Jean the baby leviathan let out a long sigh. Wah! And that was followed by yet another bout of cheering. Hearing the same thing over and over again irritated him so much, so S.A.E. Jean spitefully spat out a stream of water. SFX for a sound of water exploding in the air. The stream of water shooting up into the air spread open like an umbrella and showered down on the heads of everyone on board the ship. Kya wa. But instead of screaming, they rewarded his hard work with even louder cheering and laughter. That was a great show displayed by the guardian of the East Sea, the Azure Dragon. The guide shouted out loudly. Just who could it be? When S.A.E. Jean took a glance why, it was Zhou Hansung, of course. S.A.E. Jean had entrusted him with very important work, but there he was, enjoying a holiday. Anger boiled in S.A.E. Jean's mind suddenly, so he shot out a thin and long jet of water and smacked the back of Zhou Hansung's head. Aak. Zhou Hansung let out a big cry as he squatted down on the floor. Satisfied, S.A.E. Jean let out a snort. The people enjoying the cruise didn't even care about Zhou Hansung's condition and continued to shower S.A.E. Jean with appreciation. As an aside, he learned later that Zhou Hansung was actually on the ship that day because of work-related matters. All those on board were potential future investors from the financial world, apparently. Chapter 114 Inside a cold and grey room, where not even a single ray of light could penetrate. A lone woman, choosing to wear a thick black robe even indoors, was looking at the screen of her phone while sitting on a couch, while letting out a long sigh. Two weeks. Two weeks, since the last time she chatted or sent a text message to with that man. She thought about a lot of things in the meantime. Unfortunately the deeper her thoughts became, the more she wanted to see him. Hazeline had always thought about him constantly before, but the emotions of a person know, an elf was a really crafty and cunning thing, indeed. She was fine with totally giving up because she couldn't see him, but then again, she also found it patently unfair that she was not allowed to see him. That's Mr. S.A.E. Jean, all right. Swearing out like a sailor on shore leave, 
and totally ruining the pristine images of commonly accepted elven personalities in the process. Hazeline finally stumbled across the article about the website A Deity of Four Directions, Azure Dragon. The Hero Orc, the Bipedal Wolf, the Goblin, and now, even the Azure Dragon. Seriously, now it seemed like there was nothing he couldn't change into. Should I go and see him? Apparently, there was a cruise package that, when lucky, could see the dragon in the flesh. Alternatively, since she was beset with a surplus of cash recently, she could go and buy herself a boat, what with the market for yachts going through something of a revival at the moment. Actually, she already had got herself a speedboat that ran on magic power. She heard that it was fast becoming a fashionable thing to own one among the wizarding community, so she got herself one. She also had driven it to those locations where the Azure Dragon was spotted previously. Although he wasn't there, the cooling ocean breezes did help her unwind from all the stress that had been accumulating until now. For no, I shouldn't. After completely accepting the fact that she had feelings for Kim S.A.E. Jean, she knew she had to step back and take stock of the situation. She didn't want to do this. She felt frustrated. But in order to not repeat the mistake of the past, she had to stop. No matter how honest elves were as well as how much emphasis they placed on their emotions, going at it twice was just too much for her. A relationship that shouldn't be, and that couldn't be, needed to stay within the realms of movies and TV dramas. And that's what Hazeline had decided on. But before long, right there on her phone screen, it now showed a new post from SAE Jean's SNS profile which was uploaded on 14th of January. His smile as displayed on the screen was really open and bright, in an obvious contrast to her darkened room. 20th of January, the day of Day Han, also known as the day the winter would begin with a vengeance. TL, basically means big major cold and denotes the coldest day in the year. Apparently. Shrug shoulders. As usual, Kim Sae Jean came out to the East Sea to swim, only to receive a phone call from Kim Sun Ho unexpectedly. From the Chinese? Sae Jean. Yes sir. One of our mercenaries who went for a job in China has found that there seems to be some kind of a rumbling over there to kidnap the Azure Dragon. Ha! Huh. Why would they do that? Have they lost their DN minds? Sae Jean frowned deeply. Under the soles of his bare feet, Sands of the wintry beach stuck tenaciously if he couldn't get to swim today, he was going to get quite cross. Well, it seems like the sentiment of the Azure Dragon belonging only to their cultural heritage has seen a surge in popularity. And not just the Chinese population, but even their government seems to think that way. Also, our government has apparently received a polite request to lead the Azure Dragon away as well. Of course, the administration promptly refused to do so, saying that it's a nonsensical request to begin with. What the foo they even cooked and ate their own black turtle, so what the hell are they even thinking? The black turtle, a divine beast that used to live in China. But the Chinese government killed it, in order to solve the massive financial crisis they were facing at the time. According to their excuse, it was a mercenary troop that illegally carried out the deed, but well, there was just no way in hell that any sane country would leave alone a band of mercenaries that had caused such a huge chaos. I know, right? Since we don't know what's going to happen, we changed what information can be accessed depending on the user's level on the website but still, be careful out there. I got it but, you don't have to worry about me. When out in the open sea, I'm pretty much invincible. From his experiences so far, there was no creature alive that could defeat a leviathan within the oceanic environment. Both Kim Yusun and his son, Sun Ho, had stressed that Bathory was far more stronger but because of the leviathan's pride, he found himself questioning that very idea. It was not that surprising, really how often could one find a creature that easily soloed a boss-level monster. Still, I'm sure it'll be better to keep your guard up, sir. By the way, are you planning to swim today as well? Yes. I'm going to be alright over here. Instead. Please find out for me just how close Jean Sehan is to becoming a upper mid-tier knight. Yes sir. Understood. Sae Jean ended the call with Kim Sun Ho and dived into the ocean, transforming into the baby leviathan. The moment he came in contact with the cold water, his mind cleared up and the fatigue of the day disappeared altogether. 
he couldn't tell whether he was addicted to this feeling, or if this was the feared side effects of the Leviathan form's growth. But he knew very well that, he'd be unable to stay still if he didn't come to the ocean at least three, four times a week. Garung, Garung. A warm smile crept up on his face as he entrusted his body to the ocean's currents. The brightly shining sunlight and gentle undulation of the ocean even the chilly winter winds felt refreshing to him, who possessed thick scales all over his body. It was almost like drinking a refreshing glass of cold water in the middle of a hot summer day. And so, that was how he swam on this peaceful and calm ocean. He even had the time to gaze at the migratory birds busy moving about in the air trying to avoid the grip of winter and thought aren't they Muffin's favorite type of snack. And so, about thirty minutes had passed like that. S.A.E. Jean sensed a strange flow of mana. He definitely felt this sensation, even though he was as good as half asleep at that time. The flow seemed to enclose the surroundings and it only grew stronger. However, this was the sea. Also, he didn't feel threatened by it, so he ended up not minding it at all. And that was how it proved to be too late, by the time the sky suddenly became dark and the space where he was swimming became isolated from the rest of the world. The surrounding world simply vanished, including the sea, and only darkness remained where he was. S.A.E. Jean hurriedly opened his eyes and looked around. An isolation barrier. Was this China's doing? But wasn't this too fast? S.A.E. Jean's brain spun really quickly as he tried to figure out what the hell was going on, but when he took a whiff of a certain smell coming off silhouettes of people appearing from the darkness, his expression hardened. We will now carry out our mission as planned. Smelling like blood and speaking in an unknown language they could only be the vampires. Initially, there was only one, but then, the presences began increasing quickly. Two, four, eight, then 16 S.A.E. Jean couldn't help but swallow his saliva in nervousness at the alarming increase in vampires' numbers. Its appearance is really cute, isn't it? Can I touch it once we knock it out? A female vampire pointed at S.A.E. Jean and muttered something. He couldn't understand a thing she said, but she still gave him the creeps, so he slowly backtracked a bit. Even you're acting like this now. Don't be careless, for this creature can deal with a boss monster alone. I'm not being careless. When this woman smiled and opened her arms wide, a crimson-colored whip suddenly materialized in one of her open palms that was the signal the rest of the vampires all produced their weapons and readied magic spells. Whatever the case may have been, these vampires were targeting him. For now, S.A.E. Jean suspected that they were here because he had disrupted their plans by killing the flesh golem. Do I need to fight as the Leviathan? S.A.E. Jean fell into a dilemma. It was more than likely that the Leviathan form was the most powerful monster form he possessed right now. But in this space where there was no water, it might be prudent to change into another form. He quickly looked at the darkness surrounding the area. The Leviathan form allowed him to understand all types of mana flow that he came in contact with. Although this place looked like the inside of an isolation barrier, it actually was not. Most likely he was trapped in a fissure, the space existing between different worlds. And so, S.A.E. Jean was finally enlightened on just how all those monster incidents happening all over the world were being carried out. If these bastards could artificially create fissures, then calling out monsters would be easier than taking a candy off from a baby's hands. In that case, even the leak in form might not be enough. If it was just a barrier, then he could shatter it in the lycanthrope form, but now now, he decided that it was better to battle his opponents as the Leviathan. Attack. And when the leader type vampire spoke that one word. Vampires easily numbering past forty began their organized assault. Mana spears, whips, swords, fireballs, pale blue ice crystals, flaming arrows, etc., etc. Countless magic spells rained down on him a symphony of colors from spells dyeing the dark world in shades of rainbow. S.A.E. Jean gazed at the phenomena produced by the agitated mana, and then perfectly replicated every single one of them. Although there wasn't any seawater, the mana filling up the body of this baby leviathan was more than capable of producing brilliant and awesome magic effects. Quahang. The attacks unleashed by both the vampires and the leviathan, without a doubt, belonged to the same category of magic. 
But vampires immediately realized as soon as their attacks collided, that the gap of density and strength between them was definitely not in the same category at all. Qark. Qa. The copied magic easily overcame the attacks of vampires and countless spears and tyrannical storm winds swallowed them all up in one go. It was such an overwhelming might, not even their screams of pain and terror could survive within the shock waves of the magic-induced explosions. It is really strong. Not for nothing it's called the King of the East Sea. The female vampire leisurely muttered. Seeing her, S.A.E. Jean felt something was wrong. How could she be that relaxed, when nearly half of their original forty-odd group had been killed? Not too long after, S.A.E. Jean understood the source of her leisure. From the darkness, more vampires made their entrance. And this time, there were lots more of them. Let's try this again. As soon as the leader type finished murmuring his words out, numerous magic spells formed on the hands of the new vampires. S.A.E. Jean bit his lip. Oh. Look at it biting its lip. How cute. Will you just shut the FCK up? The amount of mana he wasted replicating all those magic spells was around 10% of his total reserve. However, if he held back from using attacks that consumed a lot of mana, like breath, and utilized skills such as Warrior of Reversal to the fullest, then he should be able to withstand their assault for 20 more times. Hopefully, I can end this before then. S.A.E. Jean's face hardened as he expelled mana. All around him, drops of water bubbled up. At first, they looked fluffy and rather adorable, but these water bubbles suddenly shot out towards the vampires, and then. They are explosives. Run. Kahahang. As soon as arriving near the targets, they caused a huge explosion. And so, an unending battle that seemingly repeated itself over and over, began for real. Magic spells as A.E. Jean never had the chance to use until now continued to rock the fisher like crazy. However no matter how many he killed, vampires kept on rushing at him like tsunami waves. To see these beings with low overall population to use the human wave strategy panicking S.A.E. Jean then belatedly found out that these bastards were actually nothing more than artificial dolls. They were so well constructed, he could only discover this cruel fact after touching one accidentally. Unfortunately, his situation didn't improve just because he discovered their trick. He thought about using a spell that would blow up the entire space within the fissure, but then. It would be meaningless if the few of the vampires who knew the ins and outs of the fissure's construction could simply slip out and slip back in during the explosion itself. And like this, wastage of mana continued on. This this might be troublesome. As his mana reserve ran out, his consciousness began to blur, and his body started to feel lethargic. He desperately fought off the uncontrollable fatigue, but in the end, stopped all his movements and slowly closed his eyes. Wow. Is it finally over? It's crazy strong. Elder, we ended up wasting over 1000 mana crystals today. Looks like we'll be scolded by the Lord. That's still better than being on the receiving end of Lady Bathory's fury. Just as the breathless vampires came closer and touched his unmoving body. SFX for things receding quickly. Suddenly, winds blew, and the world regained its lost color. As the darkness receded and the nature returned back to its normal state, cold seawater embraced the drying skin of the baby leviathan. Ow, SHT. And SAE Jean regained control of his blurring consciousness and abruptly opened the blue eyes of the leviathan. When his consciousness cooled, the only thing filling up his head was pure rage. He didn't care just how this trap was broken, not at this moment. He let out an angry roar without realizing it himself. When he did that, a storm violently whipped up over the ocean and the waves began powerfully rocking back and forth. Condition fulfilled, the sea monster's fury. The instinctive fury of the sea monster who was nearly defeated. The overall growth of the sea monster form will increase by 10%. The species unique trait has been added. Can only be acquired by divine existences. S.A.E. Jean felt his point of view suddenly rising up higher. Those damnable vampires became a lot smaller than before, and in the distance, he could see a boat carrying the person responsible for disrupting the fissure's formation. And on that boat, someone he didn't expect to see, Hazeline, was lying down on the floor in complete exhaustion. 
Oh! Holy cow! The Leviathan had grown twice the old size, and it was now glaring at the vampires with eyes full of hostile intent. After seeing this appearance where the definite trace of the real dragon could be felt, they even forgot the situation they were in and could only express their admiration. S. Since the event has unfolded this way, we should evacuate. Vampires tried to run away by changing into fog, but S.A.E. Jean wasn't going to let them. In the blink of an eye, seawater rose up in circular shape and formed a huge dome, and all the vampires who got trapped inside began carrying looks of despair. Chapter 115 Inside the gigantic dome of water created by the Leviathan, the flow of mana to the outside was completely blocked off, rendering vampires' unique movement magic spells utterly useless. On top of this, they couldn't summon hundreds of dolls they used to fill up the fissure, which only left a dozen apostles behind. So, what should we do now? Try contacting Lady Bathory, for now. Bothering their future queen with this matter might result in their limbs being torn off, but well, judging from the murderous look the enraged eyes of the Leviathan were giving off. It seemed the monster wanted to rip them apart and then blow them up into specks of tiny dust to boot. It was obviously more preferable to just lose an arm or a leg instead. Um, ah well, I tried that already, but this barrier might be made out of water, but there aren't any gaps there, you know? Teehee. Looks like we're pretty much screwed now, don't you think? How can you laugh at a time like this? The leader-type vampire glared at the female apostle and bit his lip. Too bad, they weren't even given enough time to pick faults with each other. Kugaguk. The surface of water they were standing on rumbled violently, before being overturned by a truly terrifying aura and tried to swallow them up. Left with no choice, apostles began reciting magic spells. Although they were like a bunch of fireflies burning away in front of the mighty sun, the pride of the vampires under the Bathory banner didn't allow them to give up without a good fight. Oh, well. We are prepared to die here, so you should escape alone, Elder. Your role of creating artificial dolls is crucial to our success. And more importantly, you already know this that we can be reborn as your dolls anyways. The female vampire never lost her leisurely smile. The leader looked around, and saw other apostles looking back at him with determined expressions. Very well. The leader murmured lowly. And all of a sudden, other apostles began vomiting blood. This blood flowed over the water's surface and rose up to become a barrier against the incoming violent waves. I shall see all of you again later. Of course. Please do hurry up, though. It was her job to open up the escape route. She vomited out blood one more time, this one aimed towards the wall of the water dome forcibly embracing them. SFX for things melting. The moment that corrosive blood came into contact, the wall of seawater melted and a hole so small that a single particle of dust might go through was created. And the leader-type vampire immediately changed into fog and escaped through there. TL, hmm, water melting. That's a first. So, one of them made it out of there but the female vampire, who was stumbling around weakly now, no longer had sufficient mana left even to let her continue float on the water. Her body began to sink to the bottom of the ocean. I really hate being in pain, though. She quietly muttered as she witnessed the sight of the sea monster in a dragon's appearance angrily pouncing on her comrades. SFX for things shattering. The blood barrier created by exhausting the life forces of the vampire apostles was shattered in an instant by the dragon's jaws, and then. Huge, destructive waves caused by the leviathan violently crashed into them, swallowing them up in the blink of an eye. After the battle had come to an end. Kim Sae Jean the Leviathan lowered his long neck until his sight was on the level with Hazeline's yacht. Although now looking more masculine, the face of the creature still possessed some cute bits here and there. Ha <laughs> ha. She smiled weakly and raised her body up, before gently stroking the large creature's wet and soft nose. The Leviathan closed its eyes and accepted her patting. It was to express his gratitude for her timely aid. But then, Hazeline stopped patting him and began to explode out in laughter. It's okay to change back to a human now, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. The Leviathan's body trembled ever so slightly. But even with that small movement, the sea reacted rather violently. Right now, 
thanks to your actions, there is an emergency warning out for strong winds and heavy seas, so please, don't shake around so much. She spoke up to here and then, lied back down on the yacht's floor. She didn't even have any energy left to talk anymore. She did spend considerable amount of mana trying to locate the physical link that connected the fissure to this realm of existence, as well as to destroy it, after all. Those damnable vampire bastards had placed the linking talisman at such a ridiculous depth of the ocean, one might have needed a submersible to get there. Fuwu. As she let out a long sigh, a splash of water could be heard, followed by the leviathan changing into S.A.E. Jean as he climbed aboard the yacht. You figured it out already. S.A.E. Jean. It wasn't really difficult to connect the dots, you know I mean, with the exception of Mr. S.A.E. Jean, where in the world can you find monsters willing to help people out? But still, it is really incredible you can become a dragon. Just what is the limit of your trait? Hazeline. Hazeline stared at S.A.E. Jean as she muttered out. Feeling somewhat embarrassed, S.A.E. Jean scratched the back of his neck as he sat down on one of the seats available. But, how did you know where I was going to be? S.A.E. Jean. Eh. At his wonderfully simple question, Hazeline found herself panicking somewhat. The truth is, I sail on my yacht almost every day, hoping to run into you. And just like always, I also came out today to drift around but then, I sensed a strange flow of mana and decided to check it out. Obviously, she couldn't say this out aloud. And, nowadays, many sea monsters have disappeared, right? So I, uh, this has become a bit of fashionable pastime for wizards now. Thing is, the ocean is the origin of all nature, so the density of mana here is so much higher. So, just by breathing in the air of the sea, mana is replenished, the society is stabilized, the world becomes a brighter place Hazeline. And so, you found me coincidentally. S.A.E. Jean. Yes. And please, don't talk to me anymore. Feels like I'm dying right now. Hazeline. She cut off the conversation there, and as if to show her refusal to answer any more questions, she lied down on her belly. So, S.A.E. Jean took a good look around the yacht, hoping to pilot it instead of her. The grey-coloured vessel was of a decent size, and its smart, clean interior seemed to match her personality to A.T. So, how do I control this boat? S.A.E. Jean. He asked as he played around the helm. Since he couldn't see a normal ignition, he thought this boat could be a mana-operated magic equipment. Hello. When he didn't hear any reply, he tilted his head and turned to take a look. Snore, snore. Hazeline's rhythmic and calm breathing could be heard. She had fallen asleep. S.A.E. Jean stood there, studying her appearance for a while. Her thick robe was soaked throughout and was clinging to her body, proudly showing off her beautiful curves. Kiam. It was truly a bewitching appearance. Spitting out a fake cough, S.A.E. Jean hurriedly pulled his attention away and focused on the display surrounding the helm. It seemed that the goblin's craftsmanship was able to display its amazing usefulness here, as he could get the hang of how to operate this boat pretty quickly. SFX for motors coming to life. When he sent in some of his mana, the speedboat showed signs of movement. Thankfully, he had enough mana to pilot this thing. Thanks to the leviathan form growing by extra 10%, his mana reserve was overflowing right at this moment. TL, the author has changed yacht into a speedboat for Hazeline's vessel in the middle of the chapter. Either he forgot, or doesn't know the difference between the two I've TL'd it as it appears on the raw. Please don't blame me for being inconsistent. Kagagung. Unfortunately, he couldn't control that newly acquired power properly, and ended up vigorously pouring more mana in than necessary and that caused the speedboat to soar up high into the sky like a cruise missile being launched. Wow! Kim S.A.E. Jean exclaimed out in admiration and enjoyed this high-speed cruise, but then, he heard a loud scream of a woman from his back. Stunned silly by this cry, he quickly brought the vessel to a stop and took a look backwards. Hazeline was whimpering pitifully while holding her head tightly. Sob whimper. It seemed that, because of the sudden acceleration, her body was launched up into the air and then crashed down, thereby causing some damage. S.A.E. Jean felt responsible and slowly approached her. Are you alright? S.A.E. Jean. Gee, 
Go away. I'm fine. Fine, I said. Hazeline. Unfortunately, all she did was to cover her face with her hands and angrily pushed him away. Let me take a look. S.A.E. Jean. No. Just go away. Hazeline. Wait a minute. I said, just go away. She shouted out and wildly shook her head, and at the same time, a thin stream of blood trailed her chin and fell down. S.A.E. Jean traced the blood all the way back to its origin, and confirmed that it was her nose. Here. He quickly handed over an emergency potion to her and returned to the helm. This time, he poured in only the adequate amount of mana, and did his best to maintain a steady pace as he piloted the vessel. And so, about ten minutes passed by, and before long, Hazeline stealthily made her way next to him. The potion did its job and healed both her internal and external wounds, and she appeared to be perfectly healthy now. SFX for a soft humming of a song. S.A.E. Jean glanced at Hazeline as she began humming out a song. Her windswept hair facial features that a divine potter must have poured all his considerable might to mold into perfection and then. Her remarkably flawless pale skin calling this the most magnificent view in history seemed entirely appropriate at that very moment. Miss Hazeline. He cautiously called out her name, which made her turn her head and look at him. And when their eyes met, her body shook noticeably, but she didn't avert her gaze. Why, yes. Hazeline. I want to thank you for today. You really saved my bacon back there. He smiled warmly as he spoke. In other words, that smile was directed to her. She stared at him in a daze for a little while, before breaking out into a short chuckle and gently grasped his hand holding the helm. If you want to thank me, treat me to a meal sometime later on. And you're not supposed to hold the helm that way not like how you hold the car's steering wheel. She began fixing his grip on the helm, one finger at the time all the while, feeling her chest fill up with this sensation of satisfaction. Oh. So, I'm supposed to hold it like th huh? S.A.E. Jean. Too bad, this romantic scene came to an abrupt end real fast. In the distance, by the land where they were returning to, they could see vicious storm winds and tsunami waves powerfully assaulting the coastline. Didn't I tell you? That there is an emergency warning out for strong winds and heavy seas thanks to you, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Hazeline. Seeing the chaos over yonder, Hazeline let out a hollow chuckle. D.N. it, it's happening again. The Leviathan form is just too powerful and it's hard to control its strength properly. S.A.E. Jean. Ah, well. It's totally understandable for a Leviath what did you just say? A Leviathan? Suddenly, she cried out in alarm. He could definitely see panic written large within her extra-large rounded eyes. Why, yes. But what's the matter? Did something happen? S.A.E. Jean. No, nothing at all it's just I thought it was an azure dragon, but to think, it was actually a leviathan. Hazeline playfully distanced herself from him. S.A.E. Jean simply chuckled and grasped her wrist, pulling in closer. Her face blushing slightly at this light skinship, she stood right next to him as if she had no choice in the matter. After that incident had come and gone, this and that happened. The unseasonal storm caused by the Leviathan, named Supreme, brought about extreme weather conditions and heavy rainfall to the entirety of the Korean peninsula then. There was a huge explosion at the Kangwon province's most luxurious hotel romance of dawn, which destroyed a portion of the top floors. And finally, less than a month after the flesh golem was defeated, another boss-level monster made its entrance. It's also in the Kangwon province this time as well. Are you planning to go? Asked Kim Sun-ho. Kim Sae Jin was looking at a piece of an official document in his hand and had been pondering for a while now. It was the so-called request for cooperation. Dot. The government sent it over to Sae Jin and the monster, after realizing how grave the situation truly had become. And on this paper, there was a list of names requested to participate, and lo and behold, Kim S.A.E. Jean was among those. They are even calling in high-tier hunters as well. S.A.E. Jean. Mm -hmm. Ah, it seems so, yes. Well, the scene of you fighting had been recorded, after all. Kim Sun-ho. Well, that's true, but... 
actually, it didn't really matter. A boss level monster was a gold mine of experience points and nice, juicy bonuses. And if he participated in a boss raid as a human, no doubt he'd acquire new skills as well. What do you think, Mr. Sunho? In my opinion I believe it's correct to participate, boss. Of course, there is a chance that the government is actually trying to keep you in check with this, but if you, the guild master, participate in the raid, it'll be the case of noblesse oblige, a good chance to solidify our image in the public eye. With this chance, you'll become a bona fide savior. Hmm. On top of that, I hear the boss is a lot weaker than that monster bird from before. Kim Sun Ho. Kim Sae Jin's head tilted to the side in confusion. A lot weaker than the monster bird? Then, why not go with a small elite force, just like back then? Sae Jin. Oh, that. After the incident with the flesh golem, the government decided to take command from now on whenever a boss monster appears, so it's no longer possible to do that, boss. Ah. Aha. SFX for a mobile phone vibrating. Almost at the same time, Sae Jin's phone went off. Kim Sun Ho signaled with his eyes that it was fine, so Sae Jin pulled it out from his pocket. There was a single text message. I'm outside now. Where are you now, Mr. Sae Jin? Is it from Miss USA Young? Kim Sun Ho asked with a content smile on his face. However Sae Jin couldn't make a proper reply. All he could do was to evade the subject altogether. And that was because, the name shown on the phone screen wasn't USA Young, but Hazeline. Chapter, 116 If you are having problems seeing the chapter list on the indexes and front page, please delete your entire browser cache. Unfortunately, that is currently, the only way to fix the issue at the moment. Thank you. After ending the meeting with Kim Sun Ho, SAE Jean headed off to a famous restaurant with Hazeline who was waiting for him outside. Each of the tables were partitioned off in this restaurant, which meant it was perfect for someone like SAE Jean who was just too well known by pretty much everybody. Excuse me. You're going to participate in the boss raid? But why? Hazeline. In the midst of having a quiet meal, Hazeline suddenly let out a loud cry as her eyes went extra round. To show how shocked she was, she even ended up inadvertently squashing the meat of a fish she had been carefully cutting into. I thought that it might be for the best. S.A.E. Jean. No, wait, why does Mr. S.A.E. Jean have to go? Besides turning into monsters, you aren't that good at anything else, though. Hazeline. What do you mean by that? Haven't you seen that video of me fighting all those Duerkshanis online? Hell, the number of views for that is already past 10 million now. Hearing Hazeline's words that could either be interpreted as words of worry or a barely disguised insult, S.A.E. Jean's eyes narrowed to a slit. No, that's not it. What if you encounter a situation where you can't deal with it as a human? Your trait might be revealed to the rest of the world. Something like that won't happen, so don't you worry about that. Besides, you know, I got this feeling that, even the current me as a human can easily defeat you, Miss Hazeline, said S.A.E. Jean, while smiling brightly. Hazeline reciprocated his smile with her own for a short while, but then, her expression hardened very soon as if her pride had been damaged by his claims. It's nice to be treated as a damsel in distress, but you won't even last ten seconds against me. Hazeline. At Hazeline's cold voice, this time it was S.A.E. Jean's pride that got wounded. Ten seconds. Hmm. Back then, when you got ambushed, just who was it that came to your rescue? If I remember correctly, a certain someone was just standing there, lost and confused, did I see that wrong, I wonder? S.A.E. Jean. Quajik. Chopsticks in her hand suddenly snapped in half. Back then, that weird barrier prevented mana from following my orders, didn't it? Don't you know that mana is more important than life itself for a wizard? If they didn't deploy that stupid barrier, I wouldn't have needed your help in the first PL. Yes, yes. I got it. You're indeed the A-class wizard, Shenarine. Please don't push my buttons and make my old temper to flare up. Even though I look like this, as an elf wizard, my pride knows no bounds. 
one could say the true essence of the modern-day wizards consisted solely of stubbornness, ego, pride and unshakable confidence. In other words, a wizard was incredibly proud of her abilities, but if one considered that said wizard to be an elf on top of it all. It didn't take a genius to figure out how crazy stubborn she would be. Okay, fine. However, just what kind of work did you do in the past? I heard you mention the mafia, the triads, etc., etc., back then. S.A.E. Jean. Hearing his question, Hazeline narrowed her brows as she picked up new chopsticks. Her hand movement was quite rough, her desire to warn him off the topic rather apparent in her mannerisms. You're better off not knowing. Hazeline. Kim S.A.E. Jean's expressions hardened. It sure didn't feel good to be treated as a weakling, unfortunately. If you're like this, would you like to spar with me after the meal's over? S.A.E. Jean. He suggested as he sipped the cold water. Meanwhile, Hazeline had to lower her head to make Sue. Ree he didn't see her lips trying to curve upwards in a grin. But what will you do if you end up getting killed? Hazeline. Ha. Wow. I don't even know what to say to that. Okay, then let's meet up again tomorrow. I shall take a look whether you have the qualifications to participate in that boss raid or not. Hazeline. Yes, fine. We'll see. We'll see. S.A.E. Jean replied back bluntly, while Hazeline was laughing inside her mind. She was pleased by the fact that they were able to smoothly plan out yet another appointment, just like that. In order to counter all the chaotic monster incidents happening lately, the Korean government temporarily created the Monster-Related Disaster Management Task Force. And currently, inside the briefing room located within the task force's HQ in the main city of Kangwon province, a meeting was taking place. This boss monster is a brand new type that hasn't appeared before until now. Its outer appearance resembles a cat with a big 5-meter body, but it seems that the monster's specialty lies in its ability to manipulate minds. It has somehow gained control of many monsters within the monster field and has created an army. The identities of those in the meeting were who's who of the Knight Society. Kim Yurin from the Raven Order, Vice Order Master from Goryeo, Daebeek, etc., etc., all of them were individuals wielding tremendous influences. In order to combat this enormous army, Unlike the last two boss raids where only the knights with tiers higher than mid. Upper mid had participated, this time we are going to call on the knights with lower tiers, as well as hunters with upper mid tier rankings. Ah, hang on for a second there. It's related to what you just said. Is it true that person is also going to participate in this boss raid? Oh Jung Hyuk. The vice master of the Daebeek order, Oh Jung Hyuk, carefully tested the waters. After becoming a highest tier after his achievements got publicly recognized, he was walking around lately with his shoulders and back stiff from ego. Obviously, he was busy showing off, with the excuse of this being the resulting pride of a highest tier or some such. Yes, he said he will. Ha! Huh. That means we must be especially considerate towards his needs. If, for some reason, something untoward happens to him, that will be a great misfortune for this nation. Oh Jung Hyuk. This was an expected response from the Daebeek order, after all, they were able to rise up through the rankings solely due to the monster's generosity and support. What do you all think? Oh Jung Hyuk. Oh Jung Hyuk took a glance at Kim Yurin. His eyes told her to follow up on his words, but she could only avoid his gaze while looking decidedly embarrassed. Still, as a high-tier hunter, it's only right for him to participate. I think it's already a show of consideration from our government by requesting him to join in this raid. Besides, didn't he say he'd participate with his own mouth? Kim Suho. It was then, Vice Master Kim Suho from the Goryeo Order let his displeasure known. It seemed that, since the trilogy's founder, Kim Yak Sane, was the Order's master, and that the negotiation with the monster had collapsed some time ago, they were planning to be in an openly hostile relationship now. How the hell do you refuse such a request? From the beginning, they should have excluded him because of his circumstances. It's not always the best to stick to the conventional rules all the time. If the guild master of the monster is going to join in this raid, what would other countries think of us? Oh Jung Hyuk. 
Obviously, they would go, what a fair-minded and advanced nation. What do you think? Kim Suho. What did you say? Is it fair in your country if your president enters the battlefield personally? Oh Jung Hyuk. What a strange example. Is Kim Sae Jin a president already? Obviously he's not. Also, since he's no longer active in the front lines, and he's a hunter only in name now. Kim Suho. Aha. You're being too careless with your remarks. Oh Jung Hyuk. A sudden outburst of argument over Kim Sae Jin became incredibly heated in the blink of an eye. There were quite a few members of the trilogy present, so the two sides were split equally down in the middle. And so, the briefing room had become the ground for the totally unnecessary factional infighting. Everyone, just stop what you're doing, right now. Didn't Mr. Kim Sae Jin say he will participate? Kim Yurin. Finally, unable to endure it any longer, Kim Yurin shouted out. Ha! Even the night Kim Yurin is saying such a thing. Oh Jung Hyuk. Was this a display of over the top near religious fervor? Oh Jung Hyuk slammed his palm down on the table and clicked his tongue. Mr. Kim Sae Jin did so many good things for you guys, yet you're acting so ungratefully. Oh Jung Hyuk. What do you mean by that? I shall call him right now and confirm his intentions, once and for all. Will that be fine? Kim Yurin. Kim. At her declaration, all the others kept their mouths shut. Some of them even looked at Kim Yurin with eyes of undisguised envy. After all, being able to call Kim Sae Jin on a personal level meant that she was that close to him. SFX for continuous ring tones. They could hear the sounds of the phone's ringtone over the speaker. Everyone tensed up and waited, and waited, and then, waited for some more. Unfortunately, what greeted them at the end of all that waiting was a voice of a woman saying. The person you wish to call is busy. Please call again later. A loud chuckle broke all that graveyard-like silence pervading the briefing room. With you acting like that, obviously he wouldn't answer your call. Oh Jung Hyuk. Oh Jung Hyuk's lips twitched in a barely contained satisfaction. I, I shall call him one more time. Kim Yurin. No, that won't be necessary. He isn't going to answer it anyways. No, no. Wait a minute. For now, let's postpone that discussion after confirming with him at a later stage, and resume the rest of the meeting. For some reason, the mood inside the briefing room turned for the better at the expense of Kim Yurin's embarrassment. And as the meeting resumed, she continuously glared at the phone while carrying a sullen expression. But by the time Sae Jean called her back, it was one hour after the meeting had come to an end. 1st of February The defensive line was constructed on the passage lying between Seoul and the Kangwon province. Because of the boss's ability to mind control many other monsters, there were numerous knights, hunters and wizards gathered up by the line this time. And, if one were to pick someone rather special amidst them. Then, it would be a certain someone who was neither a knight nor a wizard, but a measly hunter. W. Wowzers. Isn't he that Kim Sae Jin? It's my first time seeing him in the flesh. He's really as incredible as rumored, right? Almost everyone gathered by the defensive line continued to glance at the high-tier hunter Kim Sae Jin's direction, but none dared to approach him. And as he stood there, being on the receiving end of all those envious stares, out of the blue, for griffins flew in the sky above his position. Even though they carried riders on their backs, these creatures temporarily ignored their commands and circled above Sae Jin as if to give their greetings. Oh. So this is where you were, Guild Master. I was looking for you just now. Not only that, many high-ranking government officials, as well as vice masters of well-known orders and several highest-tier knights came over, bowing their heads and requested for a handshake, too. One or two of them suffering from lack of patience tried to talk to him about this and that business-related matters, but Sae Jin politely told them such things should be discussed after the current calamity was addressed first. It sure was an awkward spectacle that didn't fit the description of a battlefield. And as expected, he is surrounded. Hazeline was loitering on the background, unable to find a good timing to get a word in. As she was in a dilemma, wondering whether to swallow the brave pill and step forward or not, 
USAE Young appeared out from somewhere and occupied a place right next to SAE Jean. When Hazeline saw the two of them together, a sigh from the depth of her heart automatically leaked out. She forced herself to show up here because she was worried, but now, seeing the two of them together, it was likely her heart would ache bitterly for a long time. Excuse me. Which wizard tower did you come from? It was then, Hazeline heard a really familiar voice from her back, and her scalp tingled in coldness. It was just a simple voice, but still, she could feel her temperature rise up, and cold sweat began forming on her forehead. Hello. Kim Yurin spoke again as she tapped on the thick robe wearing Hazeline's shoulder. Hazeline's breathing quickened. Sensing a strange change in atmosphere, Kim Yurin tilted her head, and then. Miss Yurin. We're ready to start the operation, ma'am. Understood. At the call of her subordinate, she quickly returned to her original position. Phew. Hazeline did her best to rein her wildly beating heart and let out a long sigh, before falling into yet another dilemma. Should she go away now, or should she stay and take a look for a bit longer? Lamentably, it proved to be too late to escape from this place. That was because, in the far-off distance, the marching army of the monsters could be seen. Small and medium-sized monsters such as gnolls, hogs, trolls, orcs were being accompanied by larger lifeforms such as ogres, wyverns. And basilisks it was truly a once-in-a-lifetime spectacle, seeing so many monsters working together to form an army in marching forward like that. TL, I've no idea what a hog monster is. Did a bit of research, but the closest I could find was some character from Overwatch. I never played that game before, so totally no clue whatsoever. Shrug shoulders. There's more than expected. Kim Sae Jean lightly bit his lower lip at the sight of the 5,000 strong army of monsters. The front of the marching pack consisted of weaklings, but the numerous boss level monsters such as basilisks, three headed ogres could be seen in the distance as well. This won't turn out to be more difficult than the flesh golem, right? Although there were a lot of enemies, almost every single highest tier in Korea had gathered here. As long as there were no unforeseen events, like the Red Moon suddenly occurring or something similar, they should be able to overcome this crisis relatively safely. SFX for a sword being drawn out. Kim Sae Jin unsheathed his sword from his hips. A pure white scabbard, and the jet black blade that perfectly contrasted it, a sword so beautiful and intricately crafted, all the surrounding knights froze in their tracks, totally forgetting the current situation and dazedly staring at it. Don't tense up, let's do this thing properly now. Sae Jean. Sae Jean took a glance at the female knight next to him who was staring at his sword, and lightly tapped on her shoulder while chuckling slightly to himself. Ye, yes. Oh, yes. That's right. The Knight of Eden, E. Eugene, shouted out in her frozen state. To run into a familiar face here, although he wasn't Jean Sehan currently, S.A.E. Jean still found it rather a welcome coincidence. Quahang. It was then. The cannons fired mana projectiles and signaled the beginning of the battle. With a loud explosion, projectiles accurately slammed into one of the faces of the three-headed ogre. All personnel, charge. And with that loud roaring, the entire world seemed to bathe in the blue hues of mana. Chapter, 117 Thanks to such a wild variety of monsters rushing in like tidal waves, all the carefully laid plans were thrown out the window and the entire battlefield descended into pure chaos. It was somewhat unavoidable, since each monster possessed different strengths and weaknesses, but still, no one could have imagined things would devolve into such a hectic free-for-all, where blood and flesh flung around like crazy. Whatever the case may have been, Kim Sae Jean continued to swing his sword. Perhaps surprisingly, there was no sword aura wrapped around his blade. Yet, wherever it went past, space and mana shattered into pieces, and monsters' bones and flesh were sliced apart. This was the result of a certain, ambiguous ability imbued to the sword, called, Slice Through Anything, its level at a frightening sea. Wow! While he stood there admiring the sharpness of his own creation, another monster jumped towards him. Before he could respond, USAE Young stepped forward to defend him. Appa, don't let your guard down, no matter what. She shouted out and stuck next to him, 
then proceeded to fire numerous sword auras to many different directions. Quahan. Fern. Quahang. The countless beams of sword aura exploded and carved out many craters on the ground, making sure that no monster could approach her current position. She might collapse the whole ground at this rate, thought Sae Jean as he looked at Usae Young busy firing out more beams of that scary sword aura. All the while deeply appreciating once more just what kind of a little monster he had inadvertently created here. Here's the reason why so many people want to get my mana tattoos done. Seriously, how big has her mana reserve become now? Actually, the government officials were busy asking Sae Jean for a big favor almost every day at the moment, some might even say begging at this point, due to all these terrible monster incidents. They were asking him not to limit the recipients of the tattoos only to his guild members, but to other knights as well, after setting a fair enough price point for all, of course. Sae Young, I'm gonna get out of here for a while. All this smell of blood is making my head dizzy. Leisurely observing her combat prowess for a short amount of time, Sae Jean chuckled again and told you Sae Young. She quickly rejoiced at this and shouted at him. Go, now. Hurry. She was supposed to ride on a griffin while fighting, but had to come down to the ground because she was worried about Sae Jean's safety. She didn't doubt his abilities, not at all, it was just that, she feared for those unseen accidents happening to him. Arg, come on now. There are so many of them. At the end of her wild, non-stop sword aura firing, surrounding monsters had all went away for a short amount of time. Seizing the chance of this breather, Sae Jean handed over the sword to you Sae Young. Take this, Sae Young. Appa, you're still here. Quickly get going. What is this? A present. Actually, I brought this here so I can give it to you. TL, really? In the middle of a battle? What the? He smiled as he handed the sword over. After all, he was her boyfriend, so he should have given her a proper gift other than things like several magic tattoos, many different artifacts, and... Ah. I did give her a lot of stuff already. Oh well, whatever. Although I'm still her boyfriend, it's true T. Had I haven't given her any weapons since the blacksmith tournament way back when. USAE Young dazedly stared at the sword. A beautiful, powerful sword exuding a noble aura, its body darker than the night sky and its scabbard whiter than snow. After swallowing down her saliva, she then looked at her own sword. With that innate ability of growing even more powerful the more monsters she defeated with it, there was no doubt that it had become a sword that was far better than some masterpieces right now. However, in this very moment, even a casual glance told her all she needed to know. The sword Sae Jean gave her was on the level of a national treasure. Hurry and take it. This smell of blood is giving me a really nasty case of migraine. Kagagagang. The noisy tremor of monsters rushing in could be heard once more. Only then, she took the sword and shouted back at him. T, thanks, Appa. Really, seriously thanks. But still, you gotta go, now. Leave this place to us. She quickly pushed Sae Jean's back. And he chuckled as he left the area. Whatever, now that he, as Kim Sae Jean, had participated in the boss raid, now it was time to earn proper achievements. A fierce battle between thousand plus knights and hunters, against monsters that easily numbered past five thousand. Knights were slowly getting fatigued from the continuous assaults of monsters that didn't give them one moment of rest. The number of monsters had definitely decreased, but still, many of the combatants felt sick to the stomach, looking at the damnable critters seemingly endlessly lining up through the entire horizon. Pant, pant. It was the same story with E. Eugene. Her mana was at the proverbial rock bottom, and the hand gripping the sword was trembling from the numbness. Are you okay, Eugene? From somewhere, she heard Go Yunjong's voice. He was making a worried face towards her direction. Just as she was going to wave her hand to show she was more or less fine. Right behind him, a large ogre appeared out of nowhere and slammed its huge fist down at Go Yunjong's head. E. Eugene's eyes became wide open in panic. Yunjong. Her screams rang around loudly Go Yunjong raised his head to see, and then. 
Suddenly, a shadow rapidly drew in close, a man, the ends of his clothes fluttering in the wind, flew in like a bullet and threw a fist towards the ogre. A simple punch shattered the ogre's arm, and then, blew up the rest of the large monster's torso. TL, one punch. Yeah cue the OPM theme music. E. Eugene dazedly looked on, as the man leisurely landed on his feet. The man who killed the ogre with one punch was none other than Knight of Eden and her colleague, Jean Sehan. A juicy. Didn't you say you weren't coming? Fully understanding what just happened, she smiled and called out to him. Focus first, focus. Looking slightly embarrassed, Kim Sae Jean aka Jean Sehan threw out another punch. A monster trying to prey on him got hit by that fist in the face and got obliterated into bits and pieces. Mr. J, Jean Sehan. T, thank you for your help. Escaping from the clutches of death, Go Yunjong patted down his pounding chest and walked up towards Jean Sehan. E. Eugene's eyes were sparkling brightly as she waited. I told you to focus. Kayak. E. Uark. Pulling the two dead tired newbie knights to his rear, Jean Sehan powerfully kicked and broke the leg of an orc warrior nearby. For my achievements. The boss monster is still around, so catching that guy should be enough. Kim Sae Jean used partial beastification to become Jean Sehan, so he was now far more powerful than his normal appearance. Plus, as Jean Sehan's trait, he could freely use his claws as well. The current situation was, Sae Jean faked an illness and left the battlefield temporarily, and then, rejoined it as Jean Sehan. This was the golden opportunity to rise up to the ranks of upper mid-tier in one go. He obviously couldn't miss this chance. And after jumping into the middle of this heated battle, he utilized various skills and killed many monsters. Among those skills, Chain Claws showed off its particularly terrifying might. As this skill allowed a single chop with his claws to rebound off one enemy and continue on to the next one uninterrupted, there could be no other skill better suited for this kind of large-scale melee jamborees. However, his real aim wasn't simply this, killing lots of monsters. No, in order to rise to the rank of upper mid-tier, he had to catch the crafty boss monster that was hiding somewhere and busy manipulating thousands of minions. Sae Jin Jin Sehan activated the senses of the wolf and searched for the traces of this hidden boss. As his viewpoint widened, both his sight and hearing increased manifold. Incredible amount of information flooded his optic nerve like a crashing tidal wave. And as a result, he was able to spot a certain cat-like creature hidden among several large monsters. And its feline body was also pretty big. Although it sure had a cute face, Sae Jean had no plans to make it easy for this creature. He kicked the ground and like a bullet, stormed forward towards his new destination. And it only took a blink of an eye, he arrived in front of the cat while shocking sonic booms exploded behind in his trail. Sae Jean then grabbed the monster's neck tightly, and here. He ran like his but was on fire towards where he had spotted Kim Yurin earlier on. Well, it was still a bit of a stretch to defeat a boss-level monster as a human, after all. W, what the? Who the heck are you? Kim Yurin's eyes went extra round at this sudden turn of events. However, he simply shoved the face of the cat at her direction. I'm not interested in a pet right now. Kim Yurin. No, wait, this bastard is their Leah. SFX for a cat's threatening growl. At that moment, the boss cat showed its resistance and swung its sharp claws at Sae Jean's arm. He quickly let go of the monster and retreated, by this time, Kim Yurin realized what was going on, so she quickly slashed out with her sword. This is their leader. Sae Jean didn't stop there, and called for reinforcements. That caused the attention of numerous knights to redirect, and they began approaching this damn cat's position. The boss cat made a weird facial expression and its head turned this way and that, busy searching for an escape route, but. There it is. It's the red-eyed cat. It was already surrounded by dozens of knights. SFX for a cat's far less threatening growl, in fact, sounds more like it's getting flustered. The boss cat growled with just that bit less enthusiasm, and on its forehead, a waterfall of sweat drops began pouring down. And, a week after the end of the defensive battle. 
Countless reporters and filming crews as well as knights were present inside the Tower of Eden. They were here to bear witness to the ascension ceremony, marking Jean Sehan's historic, fastest ever rise to the rank of upper mid-tier. The youngest ever upper mid-tier knight was still USA Young, but to equal her rank in only six months, Jean Sehan was the first in the world to achieve the feat. Until now, Jean Sehan poured all his efforts for the betterment of the society at large, and his exemplary actions towards the interest of the public makes him a role model for others to follow. For these reasons, the Tower of Eden now declares that the knight Jean Sehan has ascended to upper mid-tier. With an avalanche of cheering and hand claps, Jean Sehan was given the platinum medal that only the upper mid-tier knights could receive. Thank you very much. Bowing his waist in a solemn manner, Jean Sehan climbed down the stage, and as the person with the title of fastest ever to become a upper mid-tier, he had to talk to many other knights on his way out. Back then, the sight of you fighting against many monsters left a deep impression on me. I was really stunned by it at first, but thanks to your efforts, we were able to end the battle rather easily. Kim Yurin Attending the ceremony as the representative of the Raven Order, Kim Yurin smiled and offered her hand for a shake. Jean Sehan Kim Sae Jean grasped her hand and nodded his head slightly. It was a wonderful, very manly fighting style. I really liked it. If there is another chance in the future, let's fight together side by side, again. You're overestimating me. Oh, so this is where our hero was. And after he shook the hands of several vice order masters such as Oh Jung Hyuk, Kim Yak Sane and company. Kim Sae Jin Jin Sehan stood before the throng of reporters. Many questions came flying towards his way. What was his plan, moving forward the reasons why he donated most of his monthly salary, even though he still lived in a rented apartment his thoughts as the newest upper mid-tier, the fastest to get to the rank, etc., etc. Sae Jin only chose to answer those that sounded easy to reply. It's a simple reason why I donate most of my salary. This short life, when I leave it, I do so with a pair of empty hands. And when the time comes, I don't want to have any lingering regrets or desires, so I simply try to help others as much as possible. It was an answer that implied the fast approaching death of Jean Sehan, but the unaware reporters only showed much fervor at this display of selfless generosity. And after this press conference came to an end, Sae Jean approached the officials of Eden and informed them of his intentions to visit the upper floors of the tower. Officials didn't stop him. No, they gladly allowed it, telling him to go and take a look at his new office on the 60th floor. Thank you. He replied while doing his best to hold back a smile from forming on his face. After he climbed into the elevator, he didn't press the button for the 60th floor, but for the 81st, labeled Classified Information Archives. He didn't feel like wasting time anymore, since this character was going to be killed off very soon anyways. As the elevator ascended to the 81st floor, many thoughts ebbed and flowed in and out of his head. His father and his mother, just what kind of secrets did they possess that got themselves killed? And just what kind of secret made Eden actively step forward and silence everyone? It was then, the communication crystal vibrated inside his inner coat pocket. Before he could answer this call, he activated the senses of the wolf and observed his surroundings. Maybe it was because this elevator was used exclusively by the Eden's Knights, there were no recording devices or CCTV cameras. Hello. It's me, Yu Bek Song. What are you doing right now? I'm on my way to the 81st floor. Kim Sae Jin smiled slightly. Hearing that childish voice trying to sound like an experienced old timer, he couldn't help but recall her appearance and thought that she was one funny woman. Already? Yes. Looks like death isn't too far away. Indeed. Kim Yu Son wished deeply for the character of Jean Sehan to die. It was the same story for Yu Bek Song as well. But, how will you do it? However, the method was a problem. He already had a will prepared and ready. Starting off with the words I am fully prepared to live a life where I could die at any given moment. This will was written by Kim Yusone. And boy, it was truly something else. It was written so beautifully, he feared that it might even find a place within the Korean language textbooks. I'm working on it. Since there are lots of accidents lately. 
Ah, uh, maybe, I could go on a job to that romance hotel and then the Bathory. That's definitely out of the question. Bathory is seriously one dangerous woman. And instead of letting them realize their hideout has been compromised, we need her to continue staying there in the meantime. The information on Bathory was only known to Yu Bek Song, her closest aide, Kim Yu Son and his son Sun Ho, and finally, Kim Sae Jin. In that case, as the conversation continued, the elevator had finally arrived on the 81st floor. Ah. I'll call you later. Kim Sae Jin ended the communication and took a look in front. Somewhere within this extensive library that took up the entire floor, the truth about his parents, as well as himself, were hiding. He felt anticipation and tension building up. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. And then, to be on the safer side, he drank a special potion given to him by Hazeline that could calm his mind. Then, towards the scanner, he brought his upper mid-tier identification card, and he took a large step forward. 50 out of 50 left for next week's first sponsor chapter. Chapter, 118 Although he was finally inside the very archive he'd been dying to enter looking around this incredibly vast place, inside of his head was rapidly turning blank. All his life, he never held what someone might refer to as a relationship with books. So, right now, he didn't even know where to begin on how to find what he was looking for in this humongous library. Also, as every bit of these stored information was top secret, there was obviously no kind-hearted secretary or a librarian to help him out either. Hmm. S.A.E. Jean looked around to find if there was an equipment of some sort that could help him browse through the info stored here. But well, there was no such thing since there was also no such thing as a browsable secret information, after all. In the end, he had to dig through each and every information contained in this library. On these documents created by magic, many, many events were recorded in detail. Such things as the time period when the first fissure showed itself being well over 60 years ago, to a certain terror incident with explosives. Which wasn't even a terror-related crime at all, but instead an act of sabotage performed by the government, instead. They were the kind of incendiary stuff that might have made conspiracy enthusiasts nutjobs with their collective pants. But too bad, what he really wanted to find out didn't want to reveal themselves at all, at least not initially. And so, as he was busy reading through various secret information, the sound of the elevator doors opening could be heard. And then, sounds of high heels stepping onto the floor following that. S.A.E. Jean put away the info he was reading back into the storage. At the same time, the footsteps ended, and he could feel a gaze directed at his way. And just who you might be. Hearing that rather sweetly flowing voice of a woman, S.A.E. Jean slowly turned his head around, and found a blue-eyed blonde foreigner looking at him. She was an incredible beauty, but S.A.E. Jean could smell a certain whiff that no human should emit in the first place. I'm Jean Sehan. That faint but undeniable whiff of blood. It was so faint, if he was not in Jean Sehan's appearance using the partial beastification he'd never have caught on to it. His fist clenched tightly before he knew it. Oh. Jean Sehan, the one who became an upper mid-tier today. S.A.E. Jean did his best to maintain a poker face. He hadn't even found the information he was looking for yet, so it had only proved disadvantageous if he reacted too suspiciously here. So. Why have you come here? No, besides that. Isn't it too early for you to enter this place? In her voice, a faint trace of hostility could be heard. I'm also an upper mid-tier. S.A.E. Jean. Of course, I know. You may have the qualifications to enter, but that doesn't mean you are allowed to. What does that supposed to mean? S.A.E. Jean. At S.A.E. Jean's sharp reaction, the blonde woman let out a short laughter. Think of it as an unwritten rule, okay? There are lots of shocking secrets hidden in here of course, Eden's oath forces you to never reveal her secrets, but normally. When you've been an upper mid-tier for at least half a year, you are given the rights to enter this place only after having a face-to-face -face interview with a highest tier knight first. What kind of bullshit is this? Kim Sae Jean wordlessly glared at her. Are you dissatisfied? No. But I am curious. Who are you? S.A.E. Jean. Oh, right. 
you wouldn't know about me very well. My name is Mary Chellen, Eden's high-tier knight. I came here recently, after a stint over yonder in Great Britain. Mary Chellen it was a somewhat familiar name. It felt like S.A.E. Jean had heard it somewhere. But more than anything, even her name felt wrong, somehow. I'd like to stay for a bit longer. After all, it's a friendly suggestion, and not an enforced rule. Isn't it? S.A.E. Jean. Is that so? Well, aren't you quite the daring type? Mary Chellen. In that moment, a faint killing intent rose up, but she skillfully dispersed it as soon as it leaked out. Seeing her like this, an idea came to S.A.E. Jean the perfect scenario on how Jean Sehan might die. But, well since a beautiful knight has suggested it, so S.A.E. Jean. S.A.E. Jean smiled as he walked towards the elevator. The tragic scene where a hero would meet his end had vaguely taken shape in his mind, but there were still too many things left to finish to find out all the info related to his parents. As well to figure out how the hell these stinking vampires had infiltrated the ranks of Eden. A wise decision. Mary Chellen. It was difficult to read Mary Chellen's expressions as she watched S.A.E. Jean's back while he climbed into the elevator. It was a somewhat grim face, hard to tell whether she was smiling or glaring. Leaving the tower, Kim S.A.E. Jean Jean Sehan decided to walk back home. However, not long after, he sensed a tail following him. That forced him to stay as Jean Sehan, unable to change back, and he had to head towards Jean Sehan's rented apartment instead. He arrived at the newly constructed apartment building, where Jean Sehan had supposedly rented out a room. He entered the lift, arrived on the uppermost floor and punched in the security pin for the door. He entered the place as if it was really his own home. Mm. The apartment was kept nice and tidy, although no one had been in here for the last six months or so. He even picked up the faint scent of a certain person as well. Did Miss Hazeline do this? Well, this apartment building was actually owned by Hazeline, so. For the time being, he took off his coat and took a quick glance outside. He spotted unnatural flickering of the shade cast by the office building across the street, as well as picked up on a faint, nearly indiscernible hint of movement outside. Still there, huh? There were two of them. Judging by their lack of vampire unique bloody smell, they were most likely normal humans under some kind of mind control spell, or maybe, could even be those artificial dolls as well. Closing the curtains, he put the kettle on as well as the television. When he fell into the comfy couch, his body felt comfortably numb and his mind seemed to settle down for some reason. Was it because he was always with USA Young back in his other place? To be alone, like this, it was. SFX for a door suddenly unlocking. It was then, the security pin was keyed in and the front door suddenly opened up. Surprised out of his skull, SAE Jean immediately dashed towards the door, grabbed the collars of whoever it was that opened it, and slammed the person down to the ground. Kayahak. Quang. Accompanying the dull sound of impact was a cry of a woman. SAE Jean didn't stop there and grabbed tightly both her wrists with his hand, and then, pulled her hood off. His body reacted purely out of instincts before he could stop himself, but actually, he was already beginning to think that this woman appeared to be a rather familiar figure. Ah, uh, a hark. Hey, that hurts. I said, that bloody hurts. With the hood pulled off, a beautiful face slightly covered by messily tossed golden hair and a pained expression was revealed. And it was Hazeline. Lou, let me go, right now. Hazeline. Why is Miss Hazeline? S.A.E. Jean. I came here to clean the place. What the F.C.K. do you think you're doing? Hazeline. S.A.E. Jean hurriedly undid the restraint only then, and she shot him a resentful glare full of anger while still sprawled on the floor. This hurts like hell, you know. I think it could be fractured seriously, why are you so DN violent? While massaging her red and swollen wrists, she angrily growled at him. All S.A.E. Jean could do was scratch the back of his neck, feeling really apologetic. I'm truly sorry. But why are you suddenly wearing that particular robe? S.A.E. Jean. The robe she was wearing currently was specially crafted for her by T.M. and featured such attributes as high-level stealth as well as many others. 
So when she appeared like this without any prior hint or notice while SAE Jean was in somewhat of an alert state well, he couldn't really be blamed for being a little bit paranoid. I told you, I came here to tidy up the place. That's why I wore this robe. I really like this robe, you know. But besides all that, it was you who asked me to take care of this place, so why are you acting like this all of a sudden? Has a line. Wait a minute, when did I ask you to? You told me to help you conceal Jean Sehan's real identity. Hazeline. Hazeline spoke as she wiped the slight hint of tears from the corners of her eyes. Well, I did say that S.A.E. Jean. She already knew that S.A.E. Jean was Jean Sehan. No, actually, it was more correct to say that he got found out. Although his face was covered with thick beard, and he always wore a pair of sunglasses, there were still some similarities between Jean Sehan's face and that of Kim Sae Jean's. And it proved to be nigh on impossible to fool the discerning eyes of a certain elf alchemist wizard who could divide medical ingredients right down to individual grains. The real clincher in this story, though, was Sae Jean's own stupid self, who, after receiving Hazeline's rather sneaky but clever probing text message that said Mr. Jean Sehan, what you're doing? Freaked out and hurriedly called her to find out how she knew. W, well, please take a seat in the meantime. I'll go and get you a cup of coffee. S.A.E. Jean. He helped Hazeline to the couch and hurriedly prepared the coffee. She continued to massage her still aching wrists while observing his busily moving back. Really how bizarre Hazeline. Do you want it black? Yeah. I prefer black. Soon enough. Hazeline relaxed her back against the couch, while her lips began curling upwards. To unexpectedly run into him in this manner it seemed that her luck today was not bad. Honestly speaking, she was loving this sudden encounter, so much so that her feet nearly burst out in fancy dance moves. For the following week after that encounter with Mary Chellen, S.A.E. Jean continued to dig through the classified information of Eden. And whenever he did, less than thirty minutes later, Different knights appeared each time and suggested that he should leave most of them were normal humans, but two, three of them were vampires. And the more he got on the nerves of these vampires, the clearer the dangers reaching out towards Jean Sehan became. The frequency of being tailed increased, and he even got ambushed by monsters as well and there were moments when mind-controlled citizens attacked him out of the blue. It was easy to see that they really had something big to hide. It seems that, many information vampires don't want to be revealed are indeed stored in Eden's archives, sir. That must be the reason why they have infiltrated it, despite the risks. However, those records are created by using magic, so they can't be destroyed or moved to elsewhere which leads to their attempts to disrupt you, instead. Still, were you able to locate the info you were looking for? Kim Yusone. The voice coming out from the communication crystal belonged to Kim Yusone, someone S.A.E. Jean hadn't talked to in a long time. Feels like I'm getting close. I've finally found some stuff related to the things I've been looking for. S.A.E. Jean. In that case, that is a rely cough. S.A.E. Jean heard a dry cough that didn't sound good at all. Um, well how are you feeling nowadays? S.A.E. Jean. I'm feeling fine, thank you. My body is old and it has its good days and bad ones, so you don't have to worry about me, sir. Kim Yusone spoke in a clearly fake lively manner. Unfortunately, compared to the past, there was a distinct lack of energy in his voice. S.A.E. Jean was about to say how worried he was, but. Then, about the potion I sent over to you the other day S.A.E. Jean. Well, sir. I need to get going now. As for the rest, you should call Sun Ho Cough you should talk to him cough, cough. Before S.A.E. Jean could finish his sentence, Kim Yusone ended the communication first. And almost at the same time, his phone vibrated. When he took a quick glance, a text message from Hazeline was there, asking him if he was coming to Jean Sehan's home today. Sure enough, because he had been acting as Jean Sehan throughout the week, he ended up interacting with Hazeline a lot more than before. Three times this week already, he evaded those pesky tales and took a break in this rented apartment, and Hazeline came over while carrying delicious food. All of this was enough to make him feel guilty about neglecting USAE Young, so he typed a short reply and sent it. No, not today. However, 
different from the contents of the text message, SAE Jean changed into Jean Sehan and headed to the Tower of Eden. As he stood there on the corner of Eden's classified information archive, SAE Jean's hands holding the documents were trembling noticeably. His back was soaked in cold sweat, and a dull ache invaded his brain. Finally, after two weeks of non-stop hard labor, he had found it the documents containing information on his mother, Jean So Young, and the father whom he didn't even know what he looked like, Kim Jehyuk. Ha! Wiping away the stream of sweat off his forehead, SAE Jean slowly opened the documents. And very carefully, he began reading each line of text with all his focus. Trying his best to calm his quaking heart, he spent the total of five minutes reading the first page, but then. Jean Sehan. A chilly voice drifted towards his direction. Maybe because he was too focused on the documents, SAE Jean couldn't even detect the presence of another person. Almost jumping out of his own skin thanks to shock, he quickly turned around to see, and found Mary Chellen standing there. You aren't supposed to look at that. Give it to me. Mary Chellen. She reached out while exuding a thick layer of killing intent. If there was a color assigned to describe killing intent, then the aura coming off of this woman would no doubt be the color of blood. Can't do that. S.A.E. Jean. But he didn't back down. Is that so? Well, then do what you want. I already gave you a fair warning. Mary Chellen. S.A.E. Jean was getting ready for battle that could break out at any moment, but she simply turned on her heels and left. Chapter, 119. Kim S.A.E. Jean's mother, Jean So Young, and his father, Kim Jae Hyuk. Both of them were originally Knights of Eden. For some unknown reason, his mother got into an argument with several high ranking officials of Eden, which promptly got her fired from her post. As written by Eden, the record stated it was her rebellious streak to blame. Whatever the case may have been, after leaving Eden, she changed her job to that of a mercenary and killed many non human races. Then, on a certain day, after operating as one of the finest A ranked mercenaries for some time, she went off on a particular mission to hunt down vampires as she would have usually. During the mission, though she ended up encountering the offshoot of the vampire race, Miss Faratu. At first, she did try to kill all of them. But then, she was won over by their persuasion according to Eden, being deceived and not only did she not kill them, but she even began taking care of many matters for them on her own volition. In the midst of doing all this, she became pregnant with S.A.E. Jean. She deliberated on what to do, and in the end, chose to stop what she had been doing until now and return to Eden's fold, in order to request for their protection. As a result of siding with the Nisferatus, she ended up becoming the target for the vampire's hate. Unfortunately, Eden's protection was negligent at best, and led her to die at the hands of the Bathory vampires. Kim Sae Jean carefully read every word of the information on his mother first. However, when he turned the page over and the information on his father entered his eyes, his mind completely shattered into tiny bits and pieces, making it impossible to even form a single coherent thought. His father, Kim Jehyuk, was a third-generation Mayan. TL, Mayan Monster Man. We'll use this term from now on. A monster man is a monster that can change into a human's appearance. The story went like this. Well over 70 years ago, when the world's governments were still trying fruitlessly to conceal the existence of fishers, Kim Jae-hyuk's grandfather stepped onto this planet. Was it because he was a half mayan He longed to attain pure humanity. And so, he settled down peacefully, fell in love with a human woman, and lived a long and rather fulfilling life, quite unlike most of his peers who were quite a bit more keen on roaming the earth and causing all sorts of mayhem in their wake. And two generations later, Kim Jae-hyuk was born. But hell, he wasn't even aware of himself being a third-gen Mayan at all. During his teenage years, he placed all his trust in his trait and acted like a low-rent thug, but he met Jean So Young, which became the catalyst to turn his life around. To be with her, he worked hard to become stronger and entered Eden. And he even created with her a child that kinda resembled himself. But thanks to the Bathory's scheming, he died without being able to take a look at the face of his own son. This, what the f. The truth about his father being a Mayan was incredibly difficult to swallow. To make sure he didn't read it wrong, 
SAE Jean noisily went through the documents over and over again until he couldn't remember how many times he did that. But the documents were indifferent to his turmoil even the strain of Kim Jae-hyuk's DNA, recovered after his death, had been captured and stored within this archive. Only then, SAE Jean began to faintly understand just why he was granted such a strange trait. Dot. The mysterious powers called trait, born after the world's natural laws became distorted, seems to be completely random most of the time, but it can also be recorded into one's genes as well. This occurs when a life form jumps between two different worlds and lose most of its original strength, so the laws of the original world will try to augment. This was an excerpt from a thesis Kim Yusone gave SAE Jean to read. Back then, they were just a random soup of words he couldn't really understand, but now. Countless strands of thoughts rushed in like tidal waves in his head. Nothing but chaos ruled his mind, and he felt a sickening dizziness that almost made him throw up everything in this stomach. Even regret began hounding him, asking if it was worth knowing this part of the truth. Before long, he was plopped down on the floor. He didn't even have energy to stand up, only quietly holding his aching head. But his pain didn't want to go away. His blurred eyesights confused him, making it hard to tell whether he was in a bad dream or not. I didn't reveal my trait because I was worried about being mistaken as a Mayan. But ha! Huh. I was a Mayan for real. He laid there on the floor for a long, long time, before letting out a hollow chuckle mixed in with resignation. Still suffering from confusion of mind, SAE Jean exited the tower to breathe in some cold air. But there was no strength in his legs and that caused him to stumble around like a drunk. It was a not-so-late afternoon, and there were lots of people going about their daily lives on the streets. Parents walking hand in hand with their children's students, laughing and walking to wherever their feet took them these were the displays of love and bond between family and friends. Something SAE Jean had not been able to experience while growing up. As he silently took in these sights while aimlessly drifting forward, too many restless thoughts invaded his head once more and complicated his emotions further. Firstly, should he go and meet the group called Nesferatus, the ones who had some sort of a connection with his mother? But then, what? What should he do next, after meeting them? Ha! SAE Jean stood still and let out a soft sigh. Then, a handful of people hesitantly got closer to him. They saw the Eden's insignia and recognized Jean Sehan, and began asking for his autographs as well as to take selfies with him. He forcibly squeezed out a smile and said yes. After talking to people and taking care of their wishes, SAE Jean resumed his walk. He walked for unknown amount of time without saying a single word. On the opposite side of the pedestrian crossing, he spotted a person covered in a robe. The hood covered her head, so her eyes and nose couldn't be seen, but she was definitely staring at him. The evidence was that thick smile etched on her lips. SAE Jean slowly made his way towards her. And as he did so, the smile on her lips became brighter and brighter. He did tell her not to come but, the sense of weakness that had taken root in his mind reared its ugly head. For him right now, confused and uncertain, he needed someone to lean on, at least for a short while. And as he continued to walk towards her location. Suddenly, the world darkened. A small part of the curtain of darkness that seemed to swallow every bit of light, including even that of the fading sunset, transformed into a shape of a giant fist, and then descended down on Hazeline's head. DN it. SAE Jean madly dashed towards her direction. He powerfully embraced the totally unaware woman, who still carried that smile, and activated the scales of Leviathan to the absolute maximum. Quahahang. A huge explosion of impact reverberated, and shortly after, screams began ringing out on the once calm roadside. Are you alright? Trapped underneath the rubble inside the crater, SAE Jean asked her. A few. You gave me such a fright, you know. Even if you hadn't acted, I would have blocked it just fine Hazeline. From within his embrace, a voice filled with fake criticism leaked out. When he took a sneaky glance downwards, Hazeline was there, busy fidgeting around uncontrollably, while both her cheeks were dyed in crimson red. I'm asking you, are you unhurt? S.A.E. Jean. You are overreacting right now. Maybe Mr. S.A.E. Jean is mistaking me for a helpless child in her teens. I hate being treated like that, so from next time onwards, 
please be more mindful of that. Hazeline. Hazeline seemed to be deeply embarrassed for some reason, as she was desperately trying to sound more assertive than usual. Well, in that case, my bad. Looks like I made a mistake in rescuing you. S.A.E. Jean. Giving her a blunt and obviously unhappy answer, S.A.E. Jean lifted the rubble off himself and stood up. The scene outside the crater was even more hellish. Several unidentifiable beings of darkness were busy killing people and destroying buildings, their forms taking on the various shapes of large fists, blades, dogs and even monsters. But why? S.A.E. Jean stared at this horrifying sight and asked the rather obvious question. This was without a doubt, the handiwork of the vampires, but why did they go to all this trouble? All he did was to take a gander at his own complicated origins as well as the mystery of his parents' deaths. But to cause such a huge incident that could pull forth the focus of the entire world, just because of those information? Wasn't that like killing an ant with a knife designed to butcher cows? The risk associated with this move was simply too high for the supposed reward on offer. What are you waiting for? Isn't this the time for the hero to step forward? While he stood there in a dilemma, Hazeline spoke up as she tapped on his shoulder. Hero. When he heard that word, a light bulb went off inside his head. Now that he thought about it, the perfect opportunity had unexpectedly arrived in front of him, hadn't it? Miss Hazeline. S.A.E. Jean intensely stared at Hazeline. Her face reddened once more as his sharp and manly face focused only on her, and she took a step back. But she didn't forget to reply in a manufactured calmness. W, what's the matter? Today, I need your help. I'm going to die today. S.A.E. Jean. Before she could show her terrified shock after hearing his declaration, S.A.E. Jean pulled out the communication crystal and called a certain someone. Mr. Kim Yusone. Ah, uh, sir, it's me, Kim Sun Ho. It seemed that the graveness of the situation had been already transmitted to him, as Kim Sun Ho's voice sounded urgent. Are you aware of the current situation? Yes, boss. The government already requested us for an aid, so six Griffin riders have been dispatched as we speak. And also, with the issuing of emergency notice, several mercenaries are heading over there as well. Ah, uh, is that so? Anyway, Mr. Kim Sun Ho. Jean Sehan will die today. Boss? Ah yes sir. I'll give Miss Yubeksong a call and also deploy the operatives right away. Ending the magic communication, S.A.E. Jean asked Hazeline with a playful voice. Just in case, do you know of any magic spells that can place a person in a state of suspended animation? S.A.E. Jean. I might know one such spell Hazeline. Oh, so you do. He honestly didn't expect such a spell to exist. S.A.E. Jean got impressed by Hazeline's ability as a wizard all of a sudden, while clenching his fist tightly enough to emit cracking noises. Well, in that case let's get going, then. S.A.E. Jean. No, wait a dn minute. You should explain yourself first you. Hazeline. Mr. Sunho should be arriving soon hear the rest from him. S.A.E. Jean. Kwahan. When S.A.E. Jean pressed forward into the air with a terrifying might, a huge shock wave shot out in a straight line and blew away all the darkness in its wake. And as the darkness lifted and the scenery became clearer, a mother hugging her child and screaming her heart out could be seen. He changed course almost instinctively and ran towards her, immediately destroying a dark figure shaped like a person hovering near her. Kyuk. The tightly closed eyes of the mother slowly opened in confusion when nothing happened. And a face of a smiling man filled up the entirety of her vision. Please, do not worry. I'm from Eden. As soon as he was done with the hero cosplay, as he expected, a BD emitting that foul smell of vampires attacked him. The stinking BD, covered in head to toe by the darkness, ran up to him and swung its blade without a care or regard for anything. Clang! Claws and the blade collided, sending countless sparks to fly off. But well, the enemy's blade simply crumbled into pieces after that single collision. Checking his broken stump of a sword for a bit, the darkness stealthily took a step back and surveyed its surroundings. As expected of Korea that boasted the best level of super-quick response time and suppression in the world allowed, 
spirited cries and calls of sharp manna from the arriving knights resounded out all over the area. Since the situation had become critical, the smelly BD was forced to reveal its trump card. It stood still all of a sudden, and then began reciting a strange chant. There was no sound muttered, only its lips moving incessantly. It recited for the next ten seconds straight, and when that was over, the darkness that was shrouding the sky suddenly retracted and concentrated into the shape of a huge meteor high in the air. It didn't burn like a huge fireball should, nor did it emit any thunderous noises. Yet, as it rapidly descended with nary a whisper on the ground, the sight of it alone was enough to instill a sense of total despair in the hearts of all civilians watching it. What would happen, if something that terrifying fell? Countless civilians lifted their fear-filled eyes towards the sky to look, while some of them quickly began running away with their trembling legs. Kek. Work hard. Vampire. As Kim Sae Jin Jin Sehan fixedly stared at the falling meteor, the smelly BD let out an equally odious grin and disappeared from the spot a sneer, saying it'd like to see how Sae Jin might deal with this. And almost right away, he felt a blood-red pair of eyes focusing on him. It looked like that, this meteor was the sure kill hidden weapon prepared to destroy Jean Sehan for good. But for Kim Sae Jean he was feeling so happy inside right now, he almost wanted to thank these fools who had laid out the perfect stage for him. Looking at the giant black meteor falling towards the earth, Sae Jean summoned forth every drop of mana in his body. If it was on that level although it wouldn't be easy, he should be able to deal with it. Mr. Sae Jean. He thought he heard Hazeline's voice. She was lying on the ground, mimicking a wounded survivor. Sae Jean gave her a signal with his eyes, and then. Kwahang. He kicked the ground hard and launched into the air, becoming a single blue line that shot towards the falling meteor. In that moment, the eyes of the civilians focused on that line. Even the knights, who were busy cutting apart the darkness, stopped what they were doing temporarily and stared at that remarkable sight. Chapter, 120 Sae Jean shot forward like a bolt of lightning and arrived at the edge of the meteor. Right away, the incredible temperature of the DN thing wrapped around him as if it wished to melt him down completely. Thanks to this scary heat, the armor set he painstakingly created was melting like wax. He didn't expect this. Panicking somewhat, he quickly activated both the Warrior of Reversal and the Leviathan Scales. Only then the heat finally became somewhat tolerable, allowing him to reach out towards the meteor's surface. It was boiling hot, irregularly shaped, and covered in pure darkness. He wondered briefly what he should do with this meteor but an idea came to him soon enough. Now that he thought about it, there was no need for him to smash it up with his bare fist. The mana body. Couldn't he freely control mana at will? All he had to do was to rely on this power and change the composition and property of this meteor he could reduce the killing power to zero, but raise its visual and auditory impact to an absolutely terrifying maximum. Concluding his thoughts up to here, he placed his hand on the surface and poured his mana in. Then, the once quiet meteor began humming uneasily and its surface began wavering as it kept falling to the ground. For Kim Sae Jean, this was a good sign, but for everyone else watching from the ground below, it was an incredibly worrying change. W, what the hell? It's gonna explode. The jet black meteor quivered as if it was going to explode. It was as if a fireball was getting ready to expel its own flames out. Civilians and knights looked on and cried out in despair. But the actions taken by Kim Sae Jean the next moment was enough to extinguish that despair out of their hearts. He clasped the meteor tightly with both of his hands, and expelled mana out from the bottom of his feet like a rocket, and carried the huge black object back up into the sky. He soared higher and higher, as if he was prepared to die together with the meteor. From the perspective of the villain who caused this incident, it must have looked like a courageous decision completely out of their previous expectations. Seeing this amazing scene straight out of their wildest dreams, everyone forgot to run away and continued to look on, completely dumbfounded. What they were seeing was a lone man lifting the heavens up, and it was an utterly heroic sight to behold. This should be far enough. He pushed the meteor higher and higher until he arrived at the middle of the sky, then he clenched his fist as tightly as he could. And then slammed his fist down on the meteor, its property already changed to something else. Quahahang. 
the world was swallowed up by gigantic explosions. The meteor was bathed in pure white light and blew up into countless fragments. Terrifying shock waves swept out and destroyed nearby buildings, and debris flung in the air to every direction. Knights moved quickly and swung their weapons in order to protect the civilians from the falling debris. Before long, the dozens and dozens of explosions finally came to a stop. And a small gasp leaked out from someone in the crowd of civilians. Up on the sky high above their heads, Jean Sehan was falling helplessly, his eyes deeply closed. After blowing up the meteor, S.A.E. Jean withdrew the remaining energy from his body and retracted his mana. Actually, there wasn't anything left to retract in the first place. He spent every drop of his mana and he actually couldn't exert any strength to his body, after all. Whatever the case may have been, as soon as he lost the support of mana, he began free falling from the high altitude. Initially, the speed of falling was so great that it became hard to breathe due to the air pressure building up. But soon enough, the speed decreased by a huge amount and his descent became far more comfortable as a result. Probably Hazeline was to thank for that. SFX for a gentle swoosh. Slowly settling down on the ground like a falling autumn leaf, a slim smile slowly formed on his lips as if to say this had been a plentiful satisfying life he had lived. The only thing remaining now, was Hazeline's magic to cap off the perfect finale. Are you alright? However, a scared cry of a woman slammed into his ear canals with vengeance. His head hurt from the high decibel of that cry, so he minutely cracked open his eyes to look, only to find Hazeline's shocked and worried face filling up his vision. Answer me, are you alright? When S.A.E. Jean didn't reply, she began bursting out in tears and shook his body. What the hell is she doing? Panicking inwardly, somewhat, S.A.E. Jean couldn't endure it and ended up opening his eyes a little wider and coughed out weakly. At the same time, countless eyes focused on him. Too bad, Kim S.A.E. Jean was determined to die. He slowly reached out with his shaking hands and gently stroked her cheek. And then. What are you doing hurry up with suspended animation magic thingy already? He whispered a rapid firing of words so low that only Hazeline could possibly hear it. She immediately realized it, quickly closed her mouth that was hanging loose in O shape, and after wiping her tears away, began chanting a magic spell. Thank you. This time, S.A.E. Jean spoke loudly enough so others could hear him. As he staged the final moments of his death, the flow of mana controlled by Hazeline entered his nostrils. Almost in an instant, his consciousness began to blur. This feeling was far too complicated to describe. And so, he passed out, seemingly dead, while showing the whites of his eyes. Since such a sight was somewhat unfitting for the final moments of a hero, Hazeline carefully closed his eyelids. Soon after, deathly stillness visited the world. There were so many people and knights standing here, yet not a murmur or breathing could be heard. They simply stood there, dazedly taking in the end of a true hero, who was lying there comfortably. Those melted armor pieces, his skin and flesh charred and burnt black his gently closed eyes and on his lips, the last smile he'd ever make. Just what compelled him to sacrifice himself like that? Just why was he making that satisfied smile as he lay there? Hazeline stealthily checked the atmosphere around her, and then. Sob. Started a rather amateurish performance and beat her chest. This prompted a few of the tearful onlookers to slowly approach her in the dead. Man. On the other hand, Hazeline was panicking inwardly as the prospect of being surrounded by strangers was fast becoming a reality. Please, make way. Before she was completely surrounded, though thankfully, a team of paramedics prepared by Kim Sun Ho arrived on the scene. Pushing away the wall of crowd, they quickly loaded Kim Sae Jean onto the ambulance and drove off to somewhere. In front of the Korean National Hospital, where the entry was strongly regulated due to special circumstances of the patients resting inside reporters from all corners of the globe had set up a camp. They all wore the kind of neat, tidy clothes that didn't stand out. They were also uncharacteristically keeping silent while waiting for the announcement from the doctors. Ha! Although there were a lot of people present, the only sound in frequently breaking the silence was those long sighs. A miraculous life, a tragic death under the dark sky where rain fell like tears from heaven, no one was brave enough to raise a fuss over the life and death of a bona fide hero. 
and they waited for a long time, while the anxiety kept assaulting them. Finally, they saw through the front entrance's glass a doctor with a pale face walking towards them. Reporters hurriedly got ready and waited for this man's arrival. My name is Kim Hark Du. Kim Hark Du, a renowned surgeon who performed his operations while extracting the maximum amount of effects from various potions, faced the throng of reporters and nervously swallowed his saliva. Night Jean Sehan didn't suffer any fatal exterior wounds. It was on the level where an operation was deemed unnecessary, and potions would have been sufficient to heal his wounds. At the good doctor's opening statement, all the eyes of the reporters went extra round. But that was not the end he sighed out deeply and continued on with his words. However by momentarily exploding several times past his limits and squeezing out every ounce of mana he suffered the condition of mana deviation, and so. His head hung down as if he couldn't face the crowd anymore. 2051, Monday, 17th of March. Night Jean Sehan has been officially declared as killed in action. Not a single camera flash went off. As the sounds of falling rain sorrowfully echoed in this lonely place, reporters lowered their heads in heavy silence. Officially, Jean Sehan was dead. And the aftermath was as Kim Yusone had predicted a hero's death would ignite the spark of hope in the masses. A nationwide, nay, a worldwide mourning took place to remember his passing. Within the open arena in front of the historic Gwangwaman Gate, civilians voluntarily built a platform for people to come and pay their respects to Jean Sehan. The headlines appearing on various newspapers around the world portrayed him as a hero and competed hard against one another to get the latest news out. All the while, the Korean government was deliberating on whether to give the man a national funeral or not. Jean Sehan died a true hero. But the legacy of his life where he gave it all to the bitter end for the good of everyone and the society at large, as well as the martial arts school founded in his honor, Jean Mudo, will continue to shine in our world. Currently, this was the Gwangwaman Gate where a memorial service was being held in honor of Jean Sehan. Innumerable amount of people had gathered here, shedding tears and listening to the words of remembrance. Seriously, hasn't this blown out of proportions too much now? Kim Sae Jean had come here along with Yu Sae Young, but he just couldn't get rid of this fear of things snowballing out of control. A star has fallen. Yu Sae Young. The service had come to its conclusion Yu Sae Young leaned against Sae Jean's shoulders and murmured in a lonely voice. Since Sae Jean had no clue what to say here, he simply nodded his head. That guy, I hear he will be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yu Sae Young. Really? Ing. Getting inducted into the Hall of Fame was perhaps the greatest medal of honor a knight could hope to receive, so much so that it was often called the Nobel Prize for the knights. As knights from the entire world were scrutinized and selected, there had only ever been five knights from Korea to be inducted into this Hall of Fame so far. That's nice, said Sae Jean as he placed a chrysanthemum flower in front of Jean Sehan's portrait. I hope you can find never-ending happiness over there. U.S.A.E. Young. Not thinking about anything, he stood there in a silent prayer mode, but then, heard U.S.A.E. Young's way too serious voice from the side. He was somehow able to hold back a wry smile from breaking out. Another two weeks passed by since then. When the emotional memorial services came to their natural end, rational questions and suspicions began rising in the public's minds. Just who were the ringleaders behind the death of Jean Sehan? The rage of the public and knights began to boil over when someone posited that the vampires were the ones responsible. Sure enough, a public demonstration took place, with its attendees demanding the extermination of vampires. And even the president of the country, in the televised speech, clearly expressed his regret and anger, promising to uncover the true villains and make them answer for their crimes. And so, on a certain early morning, when not a single day of peace had passed by in a while, a bluish light and a slightly cold air woke Sae Jean up from his sleep. The bed next to him felt empty so he looked around, and found you Sae Young busy applying makeup so early in the morning. Are you going somewhere? Sae Jean. He asked as he yawned out loudly. A woman applying makeup was at her most busiest. But still, her short answer kind of stuck a needle in him. What's the occasion? And where are you going to? S.A.E. Jean. To a ball. U.S.A.E. Young. 
Sae Jean narrowed his eyes. She said she was going to a ball, first of all, something didn't quite sound right. No, it stank, actually. After all, in a ball, didn't men and women dance together or some such? And why are you going there? Sae Jean. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's nothing, really. It's actually a gathering of top 100 businesses in the country, but because of the recent incident, it's going to be really boring, I think. USAE Young. Really? But why are you getting ready alone? Can't I come with you? TL, yeah, why can't he? I mean, his guild probably makes way more moolah than some of those top 100 businesses if one seriously thinks about it. He scratched the back of his neck while asking her. USAE Young made an apologetic smile and shook her head slowly. I also want to do that, but my dad and grandpa will be there, too. Kim SAE Jean's eyes became even more narrower. For some weird reason, USAE Young didn't want to introduce him to her father and grandfather. Weird, since both of them didn't even object to their relationship. Well, fine. Actually, I also am going to meet someone today. A woman, as a matter of fact. SAE Jean. What? Having his ego properly poked with a needle, SAE Jean launched his own low blow counterattack. That caused USAE Young to furrow her brows and react seriously. Why? And with who? USAE Young. I promised Miss Hazeline a good meal, you see. Why? Am I not allowed to go? SAE Jean. Ah. Nope. It's okay. Have fun. Eh. However, she was unexpectedly easygoing with her reply. Seeing this, Kim Sae Jean couldn't help but be dazed slightly. He was joking about the meal thing, actually. Appa should meet up with her and console her properly, you know. I mean, Uni must be suffering a lot right now. USAE Young. A question mark floated on top of Sae Jean's head. Console her. She was suffering. What the heck was she suddenly talking about? Seriously, her lover passed on like that, so can you imagine how hurt she is right now? Appa needs to properly help her out, you know. Ah, uh, right. You don't have to do it too properly, though. Finishing up with beautifying herself already, she got up from her seat and lightly tapped on Sae Jean's shoulder. She then put on a coat, picked up her handbag, and left the bedroom. Stuck in a total daze, Sae Jean's eyes chased after her departing back. Hazeline's lover what the hell was that all about? Could it be? Suddenly, a thought flashed by in his mind so he quickly accessed his phone, still not completely convinced of the possibility. He couldn't find anything remotely like what USAE Young was talking about in the regular portal sites, but on the forums of the Dawn's official page, it was the hottest topic being discussed there. A tragic but passionate love story between an elf and a certain knight, that was.